it is with the doctor prescribed death and Bela Lugosi's performance we again hope to keep you in suspense Professor Antonio Basile has a theory but let him tell you about it as a psychologist I have worked out a theory a theory I know to be sound I contend that a person who has decided to kill himself can very easily be turned from this desire to the desire of taking the life of another. I can prove my theory. And if necessary, that is exactly what I will do. Yes, Professor Antonio Basile has a theory. But only a theory. And he's worried about what his publisher will say. So he visits the editor, whose name is Hellman. Hellman finishes the manuscript and tosses it on the desk. Professor Basile leans forward eagerly and... Well, Hellman, what do you think? Professor Basile, it's purely conjecture, simply a theory, and I wouldn't advise publishing it. I worked on that theory for a long time. I'm positive of it. I know it'll work. Suppose it will. What good is it? What good have you accomplished if you can prove it'll work? <laughs> Are you laughing at me, Helen? It's so silly. An ordinary human being has suffered reverses. He's sick of it all. He wants to leave it all behind. And you say he can be changed to want to kill someone else. I do. Self-destruction and the destruction of other life are closely related in the mind. The dividing line is very thin. It's ridiculous. And you won't publish it? Ranger would fire me. Why? He told me that, in his opinion, you should be in the asylum. Mr. Granger said that. Does he think I'm insane? <laughs> How do I know? Herman, Mr. Granger didn't say that. It's you who thinks I'm crazy. You've never liked me. For some reason, you are trying to tear me down. Well, we'll see, Mr. Herman. We'll see. Now, wait a minute. I'll show you whether my works are illogical. I show you whether I'm insane. Oh, calm down. <laughs> I'm going to make you eat those words. I know you don't like me, but I'm going to prove that my theory is sound. Good night. Wait a minute. What's it? Wait. You wait, Herman. You wait. Yes, wait, Herman. Wait. Professor Basile, seething with resentment, rushes from the office and strides angrily down the street. Insane, huh? I'll prove my theory. I'll find the subject. I'll find someone who wants to change his own life. And so Basile goes home, late for dinner. He finds a note from his wife, Myra, saying she's decided to attend the opera and will be home around 11.30. Then Professor Basile gets an inspiration. He goes to the bridge over the deep canyon. The bridge called Suicide. And strangely enough, he hasn't long to wait. As he stands against the railing in the fog, a figure appears a few feet beyond, stops, prepares to leap. Don't do it! Wait a minute! Listen. Huh? That's very silly. Let go of me! Oh, no. I couldn't do that. I need you. I don't need you. Don't you know this is uh, against the law? You're not an officer. You can't stop me. It's 500 feet to those tracks below. Hard steel rails. 
And don't believe what they all tell you about not being conscious of what's happened. You'd know. People don't die instantly. Let loose. They lie in agony for minutes and sometimes for an hour. It's a horrible death, I know. How do you know? I'm a doctor. Doctor? Yes. I can tell you much simpler ways, much less painful ways and quicker. You're a nice young girl, an intelligent girl. You wouldn't want it to happen this way. Maybe after I talk to you a while, you wouldn't want to do this at all. No. No. But come on. Let's talk it over. Maybe a few minutes talk will change the entire picture for you. What could you do to help me? If you come, I'll tell you. There's a motive bag of your wanting to do this, and I'd like to know what it is. Nothing doing. Haven't you any relatives? Any loved ones you'd like to do something for? Yes. Then if you'll talk with me for a while, maybe I can find my way clear to help those people. Come in, please. Well, what do you want to know? Now, sit down first. Are you hungry? No, I'm not that broke. It isn't poverty. I knew that. I could tell by your clothes. Now, first, why did you come here? Why? Why, because you talked me into it. <laughs> See, you're not afraid of me? Afraid? In my frame of mind. What could I lose? Suppose I told you that I really brought you here to kill you. Kill me? <laughs> uh, you know, you're a very pretty girl, don't you? Yeah. That doesn't always mean so much. The right man, it might. That's what I thought. But I found out it didn't mean a thing. Ah. Then it was because of a man. I knew it. Really? How did you guess? I'm a student of psychology. I'm Professor Antonio Basile. I see. And you want to know what makes me tick? You want to know the reason behind my action tonight? That's right. I would like to know what happened to make you want to kill yourself. Suicide is a mental aberration. Yeah? I'd like to know what preceded the decision to destroy yourself. And what you thought about until the moment I stopped you on the bridge. What good will that do me? You said you weren't broke, but you also said you had some loved ones you'd like to do something for. I meant I wasn't broke to the point of being hungry. I have a few dollars. But you suggested help for someone in larger terms. Yes, I did. Who is the loved one? My mother. You are her only means of support? Yes. And you intend to kill yourself? Yes. That's being selfish, isn't it? Selfish? Yes. You are concentrating solely on self. You think so? What else? The first law of human nature is self-preservation, right? I suppose so. The second law is the preservation of family. Yeah. So you decide to deny the first law and destroy yourself. And as a consequence, deny the second and leave your mother alone and in need. You indicate a form of insanity. What would be normal? To destroy the other person. The one who has done you wrong. Have you hurt him? No. Then the one who has done wrong should be the one to suffer. You have no legal recourse? Legal recourse? No, I haven't, I'm sorry to say. And you would kill yourself to let your poor mother suffer because of the wrong of another. Why shouldn't he be the one to suffer? I suppose you're right. Why shouldn't he? What happened after all? Why not tell me about it? Were you married? No. Never seemed to find time to get around to marriage. What's your name? Gladys. Gladys Tanner. How long had you known him? Almost four years. And you always thought he meant to marry you? Yes. Until three weeks ago. Yes? On July 1st, he had to leave town for a week on business. Said he was going to Kansas City. When he came back, he seemed to be too busy to see me. Then a week ago, I found a snapshot along with several others in his desk in his home. May I see it? Certainly. It's a picture of him and another woman. 
But the picture was not taken in Kansas City. It was? No. It was taken on the beach at Atlantic City. And it's dated by the finisher, July 3rd. Since he returned, he's refused to see me. Yesterday, he finally said he didn't care to see me anymore. That I'd better forget him. But it isn't so easy as that, is it? No. I figured I'd done something. And blame myself. Do you... Um, do you know this blonde woman in this uh, snapshot? No. Then it must be a woman uh, he has met uh, recently. You've known him for, for four years. I don't think you are to blame. He's the one in the wrong. And he should be made to suffer. How? You were going to kill yourself. Why should you? Kill him instead. He double-crossed you. He deserves it. Now, let me go a little deeper into the situation. Whenever a person has reached the conclusion to take his life... You are sure you have made up your mind, Miss Tanner? Positive. Now... If you're careful, you won't be caught. No. But whether you are or not, I'm giving you this check for a thousand dollars made out to cash to be sent to your mother only after the man is dead. Write his name on this pad. There you are. I will know what has happened by the newspapers. Now you will be told payment until I learn that you have gone through with it. It'll happen tonight. Very well. You are sure? You are determined? Absolutely. Nothing could stop me. Very good. But just what would happen if I did get caught? You won't get caught if you follow my instructions. I know. Now, here is a small revolver. It'll fit easier in your purse. That's all you need. Be sure to wipe your fingerprints off and leave the gun near the body. Well, goodbye, Dr. Basile. Goodbye, Gladys. And good luck. <laughs> Professor Basile watches Gladys as she crosses the street to the dimly lighted bus stop. Then he rushes to his car and drives away. A few minutes later, he comes to a stop at Hellman's house. Hellman, the editor who ridiculed his theory. Just a minute. Oh. Hello, Basile. Good evening, Herman. Thought I'd drop out to have a little chat with you. Well, why this time of night? Kind of late, isn't it? Eleven. Didn't think that was late for you. No? Uh, come in. Thanks. Sit down. What's on your mind? I want to talk to you about my theory you ridicule so definitely. My theory about suicide. Oh. Well, I just don't believe it, that's all. And I said I'd prove it, didn't I? Yes, but what are you getting at? It's going to be proved. My theory is going to be proved tonight. Oh, well, that's fine. Go right ahead and prove it. I don't like you, Hellman. I never liked you. And I know you don't like me. I can't help that, Basil. What are you staring at? Is there someone here with you? Certainly not. Why? That's a woman's purse on the Davenport. Hmm? Oh, my secretary dropped by earlier this evening with the manuscript. She must have forgotten it. She's not here now? Of course not. Then I'll continue. I found a subject. A girl who was ready to commit suicide because a man jilted her. In a few hours, I was successful in changing her thoughts from suicide to homicide, and she is going to kill the man tonight. What do you think of that? There may be a dozen murders tonight. Ah, but you know which one I mean. You know about this murder. What do you mean? Because I'm going to tell you who the victim is going to be. You know who the intended victim is? Why don't you stop it? <laughs> You're insane, Basile. Hopelessly insane. You think so, Herman. The whole idea is mad. Too utterly ridiculous for words. <laughs> no, 
no sane man would ever think of such a useless, senseless idea. And for heaven's sake, stop laughing. I'm thinking about the victim when he learned. Who is the victim? Martin Harriman. Me? Yes, you. <laughs> I don't believe you. You will this time. Who is this girl? I know no girl who'd want to kill me. This one does. Now. Oh, nonsense. However, I wouldn't put a past you to hire someone to do something like this. No, no, this girl is no fake. This girl is serious, deadly serious. You probably hypnotized some poor woman, figuring she'd never remember what happened. Oh, hell, man, you underestimate me. Maybe I do underestimate your evil mind. But believe Put up your hands, Hellman. Get away from the desk. I'll just take care of the gun, Hellman. That's better. Well, since when did you start carrying a gun, Basil? Ah, a gun? Don't be silly. This isn't a gun in my pocket. It's just my pipe. See? <laughs> well, what do you hear, Hellman? Uh, nothing. Oh, yes, you do. I heard it, too. A sound on the porch. I leave now. The back way. I put your gun in the kitchen. And I'll be very careful to remove all my fingerprints. You insane fool. Oh, fancy you. You, Hellman, you are going to help prove my theory. <laughs> Good night, Hellman. Crazy devil. I'll have him locked up before he gets across town. Good evening, Mr. Hellman. Huh? How did you get in here? Through the patio door. What do you want? I wanted to talk to you. Very strangely. <laughs> You're just imagining things. And what are you doing here? I wanted to tell you something. Yeah? What? When you first indicated to me that you were through with me, I was terribly hurt. I thought all along that we were to be married. I couldn't understand. I tried and tried to think of something I'd done to cause our breakup. And then I happened to find this snapshot in your desk. Snapshot? Take a look at it. Kansas City. No, Atlantic City, New Jersey. You and a blonde. And the date is stamped on the back. A business trip. Ha! Huh. Well, what about it? I just wanted you to know that you weren't so slick. I wanted you to know that I knew about the blonde. That I knew you'd lied. Now that you've told me, what good does it do you? A lot of good. First, I thought you came here for money. How could you think such a thing? Well, I think you'd better go now. <laughs> I'm going. Goodbye, Morton. And good luck in your new venture. What venture? This one. Gladys. Gladys! And wish me luck in mine. Gladys stands staring a moment at the body of Hellman, then wipes off the gun, drops it to the floor, takes the professor's check from her purse, steps to Hellman's desk and writes a note. Then she puts the note in an envelope with the check, addresses it, stamps it, turns out the lights, and steps out into the dark street. At the corner, she drops the envelope in the mailbox and disappears. Professor Basile heard the shots. His theory worked. Hellman will torment him no more. The perfect crime. So he can go home to his wife now and go to sleep. Myra. Myra. Huh? What? Oh, oh, Antonio. What are you doing asleep on the Davenport? Do you know what time it is? It must be after midnight. I've been waiting for you. How was opera? Oh, fair. Nothing to brag about. Who sang the lead? Bill Chiotti. He wasn't very good. Bill Chiotti? Mm-hmm. He's a poor old fellow. A fellow? I thought they were uh, doing Ida tonight. No, they switched because someone was ill. Ooh, they just as soon have stayed home. Have a night, Cup Myra? No, thanks. I'm tired. I think I'll go to bed. 
I belong presently. Good night. Then the night passes and the morning comes. The professor rises cheerfully and prepares for breakfast. Then... I get it, Myra. Yes? Are you Professor Basile? Yes. May we come in? We'd like to talk with you. Of course. What is it you want? Is your wife in? Yes. We'd like to see her, too. Myra! But what's this all about? What is it, Antonio? These men are from detective headquarters. They want to talk to us. Really? What about? May I ask where you were last night, Mrs. Basile? Certainly. I went to the opera. And what time did you get home? Oh, I imagine it was around 11 or shortly after. Mm-hmm. Were you at home last evening, Professor? Well, I was at the club and got home about 12.30. By the way, uh, do you know Morton Hellman? Certainly. What about him? He's been murdered. Murdered? Good Lord. When? Around midnight last night. I found him this morning. How terrible. Why, I've known him for years. He was editor-in-chief of the company publishing my writings. I'm a psychologist, you know. Yes, I know. But uh, what do you want to know from us? We weren't connected socially with Hellman. Uh, just in business. Did uh, you know him, Mrs. Brasile? Yes, yes, I knew him very slightly. Do either of you know of anyone who'd have reason to kill him? Uh, certainly not. Everyone thought highly of him. Did you ever hear of a girl named Gladys Tanner? Gladys Tanner? No. Did you know of a Gladys Tanner, Mrs. Basile? No. Is this your purse, Mrs. Basile? Why, of course it is. That's the one I gave you last Christmas, Myra. Oh, yes. I must have lost it downtown. Where did you find it, Lieutenant? At Hellman's home. Hellman's home? Well, how in the world? Good heavens, but... We how... found it on the sofa. Well, I can't imagine how it could get there. And this is the revolver that killed Hellman, found on the floor beside him. What? No fingerprints on it, however. What? My... May I see it? Why, Myra, this is your gun. I bought this for you two years ago when I went on the lecture tour. Yes, I think it's mine, but it just doesn't make sense. Did you have the gun in your purse when you lost it, Lysa? Well, I... Perhaps I did. I'm so confused now. I can't remember. I think, Myra. I think it is, it is terrible. Oh, I know. Oh, dear, I feel ill. Did you ever fire this gun? Yes, once last year up in the mountains. I wanted to see how it worked. Ever reloaded? No, I'd never reloaded it. I, I just didn't think about it. Maybe I did put it in my purse. Why, I don't know. And, and whoever found the purse may have used the gun to... Oh, I just can't seem to think. This gun misfired on the first two shots. The other three killed Hellman. This is the most amazing piece of coincidence I ever heard of. Why would my wife want to do such a thing? Why should she get to Hellman? She hardly knew him. Are you sure about that, Professor? Of course. Well, sorry to say that I don't believe her. What? This is ridiculous. This is going to be a shock to you, Professor, but here's a snapshot we found on Hellman's desk. Taken in Atlantic City last July. Good heavens. Why? This is you, my... You and Hellman... You were at your mother's in Florida in July. <laughs> Myra, look at me. What does this mean? I can't. I can't. And I can't believe such a thing. <laughs> May I have the purse, the gun, and the photo? <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, but I'll have to take her down to headquarters. But I didn't kill him. I didn't. I wouldn't. I loved him. <laughs> Myra. You better pull yourself together. You'll have to go back. You'll want photos and fingerprints? Yes. You better get it ready, Myra. <laughs> Certainly looks bad for her. Great it does. Looks like an open and shut case. Oh, uh, will you come along too, Professor? Oh, certainly. And so it all worked out beautifully. Not quite as the Professor had planned. But then he changed his plan from the moment when Gladys Tanner showed him the snapshot taken in Atlantic City. And he realized that the girl's fiancé was Hellman and the blonde was Myra, his wife. He had no intention of allowing Gladys Tanner to kill Hellman until he saw that snapshot. And when he recognized Myra's purse in Hellman's home, he decided to let Gladys kill him and the blame be placed on Myra. The perfect crime. 
But several hours later, after fingerprints and many questions, the professor is just about to be dismissed when Sergeant Rankin steps into the room and speaks quietly to Lieutenant Davis. What is it, Rankin? I stayed at the seal's place, as you said. Well? A few minutes ago, a special delivery letter came for the professor. This will knock your eye off. Read it. Mm -hmm. Well, it fits perfectly with the writing we were trying to make out on Helm's desk letter. Professor, here's a letter sent special delivery to you a few minutes ago, postmarked last night. Read it. Dear Professor Basile, your theory worked a certain degree. You convinced me I should kill him. Uh, I should kill him, uh, but when that gun you gave me uh, misfired twice, I, I almost quit. Go ahead, Professor. Read on. Then as I looked at him on the floor, the feeling of self-destruction came back. I'm going ahead with my plan. Here's your check. I won't need it. Besides, I lied to you. I lost my mother long ago. Better luck next time. That is Tanner. And a half hour ago, they found her body beneath Suicide Bridge. Well, Professor, your perfect crime has failed. Failed? Yes. Failed. Wonderful but... setup on paper, but your theory backfired and you're up for murder. But I didn't kill him. But you planned it and you're as guilty as Gladys. He's paid her penalty. Now it's your turn. No. No. I won't. I won't be hanged. Never. Drink and drink. <laughs> And now the doctor lies on the sidewalk, 17 stories below. His entire theory worked in reverse. Network Replay continues after the news to one. This is The Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Miss Mary Astor, one of Hollywood's most charming and resourceful actresses, and a lady who is no stranger to the art of keeping audiences in suspense. Ask anyone who saw her in the Maltese Falcon or across the Pacific. The story called In Fear and Trembling by J. Donald Wilson is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with In Fear and Trembling and Miss Mary Astor's performance, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. At the edge of the cliff, overlooking the sea, sits a grey stone mansion, weather beaten by the storms of several decades. To this mansion, Gilbert Durant brought his bride, Lucia, uh, that was four years ago. Gilbert and Lucia were quite happy until a year ago, when Lucia's half-sister Beverly came to live with them. Gradually, something began to happen. Lucia felt it. Felt that some insidious horror was beginning to gnaw at her happiness. She began to know that Gilbert's ardor was beginning to cool. He became more absorbed in his writing. Then she felt the cold clamminess of the great stone structure creeping about her, clutching at her heart. Anyone who saw her could tell that fear was growing in her mind, a fear of something which she could not or would not explain. One evening, Lucia, having excused herself at dinner, tossed on her bed in a fretful sleep. No. Don't. Don't. Get away from me. Ah! Mrs. Durant, Mrs. Durant, what's wrong? Oh, Betsy, come in. 
What on earth is wrong? Oh. Why were you screaming? Oh, Vincent, I, I must have been dreaming. It was horrible. You're white as a ghost, and she looked like a lady. Yes, I know. Oh, Mrs. Vincent, I can't stand it. It's driving me mad. So it makes the fourth or fifth time I dream the same thing, the same in every detail. I've never heard you scream before. No. Well, it's probably because... What? Oh, it always comes a little closer to me. Tonight it almost reached me. It? What do you mean? I don't know what it is. It's a figure. A human figure, but I can't tell whether it's a man or a woman. It comes through that door and walks slowly across the room with its arms outstretched, reaching for me. Are you sure you were dreaming? Now that I think of it, it isn't like a dream. An ordinary dream. Its reality seems to carry over even... After I'm awake. That's what's made you so ill. This dream, if it is a dream, means something. Is that what you think? It's a, a premonition. Perhaps. What time is it? Nine o'clock. Where's Gilbert? Your husband went horseback riding over an hour ago. Did he go alone? Your sister went with him. Beverly? Why didn't he ask me to go? Well, you've not been yourself lately. Not been feeling well. Yes, yes, of course. Well, if you're feeling better, I'll go back to my room. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, I'll be all right. Thank you, Miss Benson. Good night. Good night, ma'am. Beverly. Gilbert. <laughs> Lucia lay there for a while. Staring wild-eyed at the patch of moonlight on the bedroom door, listening, waiting. Then, as the clock struck half past ten, the door opened, and a figure stepped into the room and moved noiselessly through the moonlight to Lucia's bed. Suddenly, Lucia opened her eyes. No, no, no! Lucia, what's wrong with you? What are you doing in my room? I just wanted to know how you felt. How long have you been standing there? Oh, just a few seconds. I, I was dreaming, I guess. I, I, when I woke up, you startled me. Why were you yelling, don't, don't? I don't know. I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> I talked with Dr. Handy about you today. I told him how run down you were, and he suggested that I get a tonic for you. I'll drop in at the drugstore on my way home tomorrow evening. Uh, a tonic? Yes. What? Well, what is it? Oh, I don't remember. Something, something in strychnine. Strychnine? Yes, he said it would give you an appetite. Where have you been, Gil? Oh, I've been riding. Nice moonlight night. Very pleasant. Did Beverly enjoy it? Yes, she's an excellent rider. I've decided to buy that filly from Thompson. Going over there tomorrow afternoon. Is Beverly going with you? Yes. She's a good judge of horseflesh. Why? Nothing. I just asked. Well, good night, Lucia. See you at breakfast? Uh, Yes. Good night. Something, something, and strychnine. Something, something, and strychnine. Lucia jumps from her bed, rushes down to the library, snaps on the light and steps to the shelf holding the encyclopedia. She runs her fingers down the long line of books, L-M-N-O-P-R, and then she stops. And stares. The S to T is missing. Then she sees it on the desk, the missing volume. She rushes to the desk and stares down at the open page. Yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Beverly. I'll leave the deal entirely up to you. Up to me? Oh, Gil, that's not fair. Why not? <laughs> but suppose she turns out to be a lemon. I don't think she will. Because you're going to have the job of training her. Oh, you certainly flatter me. <laughs> Not in the least. Oh, good morning, Lucia. I just realized what time it was. You'll be leaving in a few minutes. Well, yes, it's nine this very minute. But a step on it. Uh, more coffee, Beverly? No, thanks. How do you feel, Lucia? Uh, better. Much better. You better eat something. No, no, I can't. At least some coffee. Yes, I'll have some coffee. I've got to run. See you later, Lucia. Yes, Gil. And I'll see you this afternoon at 2, Beverly. Yes, I'll meet you in town at 2. Oh, Gil, don't forget Lucia's medicine. No, I won't. Goodbye, Lucia. Are you meeting Gil in town, Beverly? (laughs) Yes, he wants me to decide on that filly he's interested in. Where did you learn so much about horses? Oh, seems to be natural. 
Why don't you get interested in horses, Lucia? Why should I? What are you interested in? Well, I am interested in a few things. My husband in particular. <laughs> you don't act interested in anything. Really? Well, if you'll take my advice, you'll snap out of this coma and get some pep. Does Gil like women with pep? No man cares about a woman who sits around and moats. I think you're a hypochondriac. Do you? You should do something about it. I intend to. I intend to do something about it. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Get out and do things. Play games, golf, tennis, swim and ride. Maybe this medicine will fix you up. You know all about it, do you? What is it? Oh, I don't know. It's a, a tonic, a, a builder-up. Or... I wish I could believe that. But at least you can try it. won't hurt you. No? <laughs> I wonder. Oh, come in, Dr. Handy. Well, Lucia, why did you call me out here? What's wrong? I just couldn't make it into town. Oh, it can't be as bad as all that. Did Gilbert talk to you about me yesterday? Mm, I saw Gil for a few moments at the club during lunch. Said you were run down. Did you give him a prescription for me? Oh, never do that until I've examined the patient. You didn't give him a prescription? Well, no. What did you suggest for me? Oh, I don't know. Mentioned a few tonics he might get for you. Spoke of beef iron and wine and cherry and egg and... Uh, oh, I don't remember what else. Then you mentioned nothing specifically. I don't think so. I see. Now, what seems to be wrong with you, Lucia? I don't know exactly, but something has been happening to me that, well, frankly, I'm afraid I'm losing my mind. <laughs> we all feel that way at times. I'm serious. Things happen to me in the night. What sort of thing? At first I thought they were just nightmares, but when you have a nightmare, you wake up and the fear is gone. You realize the truth. But this vision that comes to me haunts me through the waking hours as well. Vision? Something, I think it's a person, comes through my bedroom door, comes toward my bed with outstretched arms as though it intends to strangle me. Each time it comes a little closer. And my fear is that eventually it will get to me before I wake up. I see. You always dream the same dream? If it is a dream, yes. And who is the person? Oh, I don't know. You don't think it's really a dream? No. I think it's a premonition. Hmm. Have you any basis for such a fear in real life? Is there someone or something that you're afraid of? Doctor, I'm convinced they're not dreams, that I'm not asleep. Oh, nonsense. I'm positive they're not mere dreams. Well, I think it's all due to your rundown condition. You probably don't sleep as soundly as you should, so you transfer sounds in the night to dreams and nightmares. That's exactly what I mean. If I'm only half asleep, I may be transferring actual movement and sounds into dreams. In other words, if someone slams a door in the night, I may half hear it and attribute it to a dream. Yeah. All right. All right. But then perhaps I'm not dreaming. Don't you see? Hmm. I think you'd better come into town and have a thorough physical. You mean a checkup by a psychiatrist? Oh, I may have someone help me. It's the usual thing, you know. Oh. Oh, don't end me. I'm so drunk. No, 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 no. Everything's going to be all right. I'm afraid. Afraid that, that I'm going to die. That someone is trying to kill me. Oh, you're not going to die. That's ridiculous. I'll call you and make an appointment. <laughs> That's better. Very well. In the meantime, try not to think about it. Keep your mind on the brighter side. Yes. I'll try. All afternoon and on into the evening, that awful gnawing of jealousy and fear occupy every moment. Gill and Beverly, how could they do such a thing? And how far will they go to get you out of the way, Lucia? Will they stop even at murder? Sleep, Lucia? No, I'm not asleep. How are you feeling? I, I seem to have developed a headache. Have you eaten anything today? No, I didn't care for anything. Well, this will help you. Better take a dose now. I'll measure it for you. What is it? Oil. It's the tonic. Did Dr. Handy prescribe it? 
Oh, yes. Yes, he did. Where's Beverly? Down in the library. Did you buy the horse? Yes, Beverly thought she was a fine animal. I didn't know Beverly knew so much about horses. She's a horsewoman after my own heart. Is she? Rides like the wind, too. She had intended to go home tomorrow. Is she staying on? She's got to. I wouldn't think of her leaving now. Why not? Well, for one thing, she's going to train the horse. And what else? Why, nothing else. Hey, here, take this. It's a little bitter, but you'll get used to it. Jill! Go ahead, it won't hurt you. I don't want it. And why not? It has poison in it. Well, I suppose it does have a little, yes. But only enough to act as a tonic. I don't want it. I won't take it. Are you going to act like a child? Take it and quit arguing. I won't. I won't. Take it. Swallow it down. I can't take it. You're impossible, Lucy. I'm afraid. You need this medicine, but you're so confoundedly stubborn, you'd rather sit around and mope all day. Very well, there it is. You can take it or not. I'm disgusted trying to help you pull out of this. Good night. No, 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 no. Wait, Gil. I'll take it. I'll take it. I don't care whether you do or not. There. I've taken it. (laughs) <laughs> Terribly bitter. Well, that's more like it. Now I'll take another dose around 11. Gil, where's Mrs. Benson? Why, I told her she could have the night off. Thought she might like to spend the evening in town. You, you let her off? Yes, she's been sticking pretty close lately. Yes, yes, she has. Good night. Good night, Lucia. <laughs> What's wrong, Gil? You look upset. I am. Lucia didn't want to take it. No? Why not? She's afraid of medicine. What are you going to do? She finally took a dose of it. But if I know her, she'll never take another drop. She's got to take it, Gil. You've got to figure out a way to make her take it. It can't be disguised. It's too bitter. Try something else. I'll try and coax her into it again. Isn't there something that tastes more pleasant or... Or something you could put in milk or orange juice? Mm, I don't know. But I'll find something. Of course you will. You've got to. She's... Wait a minute. There's someone listening outside the door. Oh. Oh, sir. Well, Benson. What are you doing standing here in the dark? Why, I was just going upstairs to see if Mr. Durant wanted anything before I went out. I see. Now, by the way, I'm staying home for a couple of days, and I thought that since you've been staying so close to the job, you'd welcome a few days' leave. Leave? Why, yes. But Mrs. Durant may prefer that I stay. I think you'd better take a little rest yourself. You needn't come back till Friday. But I... I don't need a rest. You come back Friday. Yes. Very well. But that night, for once, the good Mrs. Benson disobeys orders. Two minutes before 12, she returns to the mansion. No lights are burning. So she makes her way quietly through the back entrance, slips up the stairs, and taps lightly on Lucia's bedroom door. Mrs. Durant? Mrs. Durant? Then she turns the knob, opens the door, and snaps on the light. Mrs. Durant, are you here? Then Benson steps quickly toward the bed. The bed is empty. But a horrible sight meets her eyes. Blood. Blood all over the bed. Get me the police department. All right, Mrs. Benson. Now, just calm down and tell us what happened this evening. Well, earlier in the evening... Mr. Durant told me that I could have the night off since I'd been staying close to Mrs. Durant for some time. And then later, he said, he decided to let me off until Friday. I didn't want to go, but he insisted. Was there anyone else in the house? Yes. Mrs. Durant's half-sister, Beverly. Did you leave the house? Yes. But I sneaked up the back stairs and told Mrs. Durant I'd be back about midnight. Hmm. If you had till Friday, why did you come back at midnight? Because... We were both frightened. Of what? Well, Mrs. Durant had been having premonitions that someone was trying to kill her. Who was trying to kill her? She didn't know, but she was terribly frightened. Is that all? No. Her husband tried to get her to take some medicine he had brought home. She refused, and he got angry. 
How do you know he was angry? I... I heard him talking about it to Beverly. They were in the library. And he told Beverly that Lucia was stubborn. Beverly said that he'd have to think of some other way. Did Mrs. Durant suspect her husband and Beverly of trying to do away with her? Yes. Yes, she did. She was convinced that Mr. Durant and Beverly were in love and wanted her out of the way. I see. Mm hmm. Well, so you came back tonight because you anticipated that something was going to happen. Yes. The house was dark, so I came up the back stairs, knocked on her door. When I got no answer, I came in, turned on the light, saw she was gone, and then I saw the bed all covered with blood. <laughs> she wouldn't take the poison. So they did it another way. That's what they planned in the library. Where are they now? Any idea? Well, they didn't expect me back tonight. So they're probably gone to dispose of the body, intending to come back here and clean the place up later. I see. Anybody else know about Mrs. Durant's fears? Yes. She talked to Dr. Hanby. I called him right after phoning the police and told him about it. He knows. Dr. Hanby, Captain Drake, what in the world is the meaning of this? From all indications, Mrs. Durant has been murdered and the body disposed of. Dr. I understand Mrs. Durant told you that she was afraid that something was going to happen to her, that she was going to die. Who told you that? Mrs. Benson here. I see. Well, she did call me in this morning. She'd been having strange dreams. Premonitions, she called them. I called them hallucinations. Who'd she think it was? Well, she couldn't tell whether it was a man or a woman, but someone was always approaching her bed with outstretched arms, trying to choke her. Do you think it was more than a dream? She was a sort of hypochondriac. I I asked her to come into town where I could give her a thorough examination. I didn't take her story too seriously, but this certainly puts a different slant on the entire picture. Yes. We haven't found the body, but I have men out looking now. We'll find it. Here's Mr. Durant and his sister-in-law. They found them about half a mile down the beach. Oh, how are you, Durant? What in the world goes on here? What's wrong, Doctor? Take a look at that bed. Good Lord. What happened? Lucia. What? Where is she? We thought you might enlighten us on that point. What do you mean? Where is she? Is... Is Lucia dead? Oh, Gil, what... What What happened? We think your wife has been murdered. Murdered? But I... What are you doing here, Mrs. Benson? I thought you were gone until Friday. Why did you tell her to go until Friday? I I thought she needed a rest. She'd been having long hours. Where is Lucia? Where have you and your sister-in-law been? Why, I slipped upstairs and saw Lucia was asleep, so we decided to take a little ride down the beach. It was still early. Mm Mm-hmm. Didn't take anything with you? Certainly not. What do you mean by that? What would we take? I don't know. I just ask. Did you two try to get Lucia to take some medicine? No. Wait a minute, Beverly. That won't do any good. Yes, we did. Lucia was run down and needed a tonic. But she refused to take medicine. Why did she refuse? I don't know. Maybe she was afraid of being poisoned. Poisoned? Why should I want to poison her? Lucia was my wife. How long has your sister-in-law Beverly been here with you? Well, I don't know. Quite some time. Just a minute. Are are you inferring that that Gil and I... I'm not inferring anything. I merely ask you a question. Well, Gil, tell him that... Just a moment, Beverly. Mrs. Benson, what have you been saying? What did you tell them? I told them the truth. You think I planned to kill Lucia, is that it? Yes, you and this woman. You're out of your mind. You tried to get her to take some medicine. She knew you were in love with her sister and that you were trying to poison her. And how did she come to that conclusion? She had premonition. That means nothing. And besides, I heard you talking, you and Beverly, planning the whole thing. What? She's lying. I heard you. And when you realized Lucia wouldn't take the medicine, Beverly said you'd have to think of some other way. Some other way to what? To get rid of her. To kill her. There must be some... Dr. Hanby, you know better than this. Do you think I had a reason back of wanting to know about various medicines? Well, no, no, I didn't, not at the time, but now... Now what? Well, I'm sorry to say it all adds up to something suspicious. Seems more than just coincidental. Do you... Do you think I killed Lucia? Look about you. Look at the room. What else am I to think? What was the tonic you tried to give your wife? It had strychnine in it. Is that right, Durant? Oh, yes. It was one of the things Dr. Handy mentioned. It was uh, uh, iron, quinine, and strychnine. Did you mention that, Doctor? Well, I suppose I did. It's a commonly known tonic. Did you add anything else to it, Durant? Certainly not. How about it, Sergeant? What's the report? The bottle contained iron, quinine, and strychnine. 
and a heavy content of arsenic. Arsenic? But, but that isn't possible. I put nothing in it. Where would I get arsenic? It was in there just the same. Good heavens. Do Doctor, this isn't true. You know it isn't. I hate to say it, Gil, but the evidence looks bad for you. Benson knows what this is all about. She's lying. She knows Gil wouldn't do such a thing. She's back of it all. Why? I don't know. But believe me, I'll find out if I have... That'll do, that'll do. Under the circumstances, I think you'd all better come down to headquarters so we can keep you separated. Come on. And no more talking. After 48 hours, hours of relentless grilling, endless questioning, Gil and Beverly are released on a writ of habeas corpus. Weeks go by, and Lucia's body has not been discovered. So the district attorney makes a public announcement that no murder charges can be preferred against them due to lack of corpus delicti, the failure to produce the body, Lucia's body. Then one evening, Beverly and Gill talk in the library. Beverly, I... I want you to know how wonderful I think you've been. You stuck right beside me, never lost your nerve, and... Well, you're one girl in a million. Oh, thanks, Gil, but it isn't over yet. They won't stop their search for Lucia's body, and... And if they find it, we haven't a chance. I know, but what can we do about it? Well, why couldn't we leave the country? Together? Not necessarily. They'd be sure to follow us. But we could go separately in, in different ways and... And meet someplace later on? Is that what you mean? Yes. That's what I mean. It seems a bit mad. That would be equal to an out-and-out -out confession. Oh, but Gil, if they find Lucia's body, we haven't a chance. It's too strong against us. We could never come back, Beverly. What of it? I don't want to die, Gil. And I don't want anything to happen to you. Beverly, I... Oh, I don't know what to say. I'm frightened, Gil. I can't stay here with such horrible fear hanging over me. I'll go mad. If you don't go, then I will. I'll leave tonight. Please, Beverly, I need you more than ever now. Please don't go. Don't worry, Gilbert. She won't leave you. Oh, she Heavens, Lucia. I won't let her leave you. I'll see that you both go together. And stay together for a long, long time. Lucia, what? Lucia. We thought you were dead. Disappointed, aren't you? Where have you been? What are you going to do with that gun? You thought I was dead. Well, I'm not. I'm live enough to pull this trigger. I've been hiding for weeks. And I've been behind those curtains for the last 20 minutes. I heard every word. Now I know you're in love with each other. Now I know you wanted to do away with me. In love? Beverly and I... From the day she came here, she took you away from me. I did not. We never thought of such a thing, never. Never entered our minds. Why lie about it? You've let your imagination run away with you, Lucia. You're insane. You think so? Well, if I am, it's your fault. Yours and Beverly's. You've driven me insane, both of you. I had a plan to get even with you to make you pay for what you've done, but it failed. What plan? You see, I didn't know about the law of corpus delicti, but I do now. And this time there will be a body. Two bodies. Yours and Beverly. You're a suspicious-minded devil, Lucia. I, I plan to trap you on a murder charge. My murder. But it's going to be your murder now. You were convinced that Beverly and I were in love? Of course. I never needed a dream or a premonition. I cut myself and smeared blood on the bed and disappeared. When I found they couldn't touch you without the corpus delicti, I came back to kill you. Lucia, you fool. You vicious-minded fool. I'm going to tell you something. And go ahead and shoot me, if you will. Lucia, not until now, this very moment, has the thought of loving Beverly ever occurred to me. You never loved Beverly? No. But I can tell you this, Lucia. Now that I've seen you as you really are, I could never love you again, never. Gail! Wait, Beverly. But I... I, I was sure I, I was... Convinced that you and Beverly were... You were sure only because your warped, jealous mind convinced you that there was something between us. You mean I... You I... certainly made a sorry mess of your life, Lucia. Then I... All I've done is... Kill your love. Oh, Gil. Yes, Lucia. And you've no one to blame. No one but your own miserable self. <laughs> Gil! Lucia! Don't, Lucia! Oh, Gil. Gil. Yes, yes, Beverly. But it's... It's probably the best thing for her. And for us. And 
so closes In Fear and Trembling, starring Metro-Golden-Mayer's Mary Astor, tonight's tale of Suspense. The broadcast originated in Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when another of the screen's lovelier leading ladies, Geraldine Fitzgerald, will star in the uneasy drama called Will You Walk Into My Parlor? William Spear, the producer, Ed Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin, the musical director, Lucian Morrowick, the composer, and J. Donald Wilson, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our distinguished star this evening is the stage and screen favorite, Mr. Paul Lucas, whose performance is in The Lady Vanishes, and in the stage production, The Watch on the Rhine, you will recall with pleasure. Tonight's tale of suspense is a story by John Dixon Carr, Fire, Burn, and Cauldron Bubble. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so with Fire Burn and Cauldron Bubble and the performance of Paul Lucas and the other members of our company, we again hope to keep you in... Drury Lane Theater presents the distinguished American actor Myron Willard in Shakespeare's Macbeth with magic effects especially designed by Ludwig von Arnheim. Historic Drury Lane Theatre, a relic of old London. On this site, in the cramped and crooked lanes of Aldwych, there has been a playhouse since Nell Gwynne sold oranges in the pit. The present theatre, though modernized, is heavy and darkened with time. By daylight, it is a dinginess of red plush seats, haunted by old ghosts. But at night, when the lights bloom for some new production... When the murmur of a crowd fills the carpeted aisles and the orchestra begins to tune up, it is kindled with that strange magic before the rise of the curtain. Right this way, sir. E12 and 13. Program. Pocket. Thank you. No, madam. This is row E. Your seat to G4. And backstage, where nerves crawl and there is a tendency to scream, the three witches of the play are huddled around the peephole in the curtain, looking out into the audience. They are hideous-looking creatures, these witches. In grey rags like cobwebs. But as they speak... Oh, dear, I am scared. Don't let it bother you, darling. You can't even see the audience when the floats are on. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing except the size of the take at the box office. You won't even have to worry about that tonight. Look out there. You two are shaking as much as I am. Now, don't pretend. All right, all right. Everybody's jumpy on first night. 
What I can't understand is why they want to use young girls as witches. And then make us talk in cracked voices as though we were 80. Double, double, toil and travel. Fire, burn, and cauldron, trouble. Oh, oh, what's that? Katie, darling, it's only one of the ghost effects. You've been hearing it for weeks at rehearsals. I will say this for Marin Willard, as an actor and a manager, too. He's the first one who's ever had a real professional magician to do the ghost effects for this ham show. Oh, are they serious? Look there. Where? Out in the audience in the second upper box on the left-hand side. Oh. Don't you see the woman who's just coming in? Yes, I can see her. Not a bad-looking bit of goods for her age. What about her? But that's Marcia Blair. Marcia Blair? You don't mean you've never heard of her. I can't say I have either if it comes to that. Move over, Ivy. Give us a squint. Marcia Blair used to be Mr. Willard's leading lady. She was a very great actress 15 years ago. Oh, 15 years ago. She's had a terribly romantic history. Well, she's made lots of money and retired from the stage. Then she married some horrible no good and... Do you see that tall gray-haired man standing beside her? Well, he doesn't look much like a no good. That's not the man I mean, Celia. That's Howard White, her second husband. Oh. They say he loved her for years and followed her about and practically worshipped her. But she was married to this no good and wouldn't get a divorce. Then the no good died, I suppose. So Marcia Blair and her faithful Howard got married. Yes. I remember reading in the paper that they've been married one year tonight. I... I expect they're very happy. Well, I'd be happy, too, if I had a mink coat and a string of pearls like that. Well, you've got to admit she's beautiful. All right, Katie, if you say so. I used to go and see her act when I was a little girl. She... she was kind of an idol. I wonder what they're saying to each other up in that box now. I wonder what they're saying... I wish you wouldn't be so uneasy. Nothing can happen to you here. You're uneasy yourself, Howard. Yes, I suppose I am a little. Howard, I know I shouldn't be talking like this on our first anniversary. But that's what worries me. What if Barry isn't dead? What if he isn't dead? Oh, listen to me, darling. Your late husband, heaven condemn his soul, died in New York more than a year ago. We have proof of that. Well, then who wrote those letters to me? I don't know, dear. Somebody playing a joke on you. Joke? If you marry him, Marsha, you won't be alive a year from then. Joke. But you're married to me, my dear, and you are alive. Shall I quote you something from another play, Howard? Well? The Ides of March are come. I, Caesar, but not gone. And it's still two hours. Two hours to the time we were actually married. Oh, look here, dear. This is carrying an obsession too far. It would be just like Barry to wait until the last moment. Just to make it worse. You knew him. Yes, I knew him. He was a genius. I suppose so. As a mere businessman, I never quite understood this theatrical temperament. Uh, except yours, of course. Barry was a greater actor than Myron Willard will ever be. Barry could play anything, from a cockney to King Lear. His skill at makeup wasn't merely good. It was terrifying. Oh, Howard, I am frightened. Suppose he's managed to get close to us tonight and, and yet we can't see him. Well, the music started, Marcia. I, I shall have to go. Must you go, Howard? Really? If I break this appointment with Ferndale, dear, the deal will be called off. And since I haven't got too much backing anyway, I... All right, dear. I understand. Go ahead. Unless you wanted to come with me. And Miss Myron's opening tonight? Oh, I couldn't do that. I tell you, you'll be perfectly safe here, dear. Of course, Howard. I know that. You're in full view of 3,000 people. Nobody could attack you. The only door to this box is guarded. Outside that door will be Miss Fenton, who's devoted to you, and the chauffeur who's even more devoted to you. What could happen, dear? Nothing, of course. And I'd prefer to be alone anyway. Yes, I rather guess oh, that. Oh, please, dear. It's just that I can't endure anybody being with me when I'm watching a great play. But that doesn't include you, darling. Then, if you'll accept these, madam, in honor of our first anniversary... Oh, Howard! But they're lovely... Of course I'll accept them. And here's a program. Got everything else you need? Yes. Yes, I think so. I'll just open the door to the passage to make sure our watchdogs are on guard. Yes, they're out there, all right. Good night, Marcia. See you in an hour or two. Good night, Howard. And good luck.
Miss Fenton, Bradley. Yes, Mr. White. Yes, sir, anything wrong? Miss Fenton, you've been my wife's companion secretary for five or six years. Yes, Mr. White, and I've loved every minute of it. And you, Bradley, you haven't been my chauffeur for quite so long, but they tell me you're an ex-wrestler. That's right, sir. Champion of the Shoreditch Athletic Club. And in my prime, though I says it shouldn't, as good a man as ever climbed through the ropes. Now, you know your instructions, Bradley. You trust me, sir. Nobody gets into this here box tonight unless it's over my dead body. Nothing must happen, do you understand? Nothing. Please, you're as white as paper. As for you, Miss Fenton, I'm afraid it's a little awkward. I know I ought to ask you to go in and join Marcia, but... Oh, you needn't apologize, Mr. White. I know she doesn't want company. She'll be leaning forward with her elbows on the box rail, just as she always does. She isn't merely watching a play. She's acting, Lady Macbeth. Every line, every gesture... Oh, and I don't mean to disturb her. You you won't leave this door, either of you. You trust me, sir. If... Oh, no. Well, anything wrong, Bradley? It is a very rummy-looking cove coming along the passage, sir, wearing a big black cloak with a red lining. Oh, that man, Bradley. That's only Herr von Arnheim. He's a professional magician and escape artist. I was just wondering... Excuse me. Don't worry, Mr. White. We'll look after her. Von Arnheim. I see Von Arnheim. Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake the gory lux at me. I beg your pardon? <laughs> and I beg yours, my friend. I was merely quoting a line from the play. You are not leaving the theater. Surely not walking out on Macbeth. I'm afraid I've got to. Oh, that's a pity, my friend. You will miss some of my best effects, to say nothing of Shakespeare's. <laughs> when Banco's ghost appears at the table. I don't want to hear any more about ghosts, thanks. Banco's or anybody else's. I imagine you mean your wife's late husband. You've heard about it, then? Yes, your wife has told me a good deal. She seems to think that in my profession I might have some charm over demons or spell against ghosts. You know, Von Arnhem, in a muddled kind of way, that's what I've been wondering myself. Uh, unfortunately, no. I am all too human. But your problem interests me. And I confess it worries me. What is you? What about me? As I understand it... Her first husband was a half-mad American actor who later went completely mad and died in New York. His, uh... Oh, what's the word I want? Our obsession? Uh, that's it, obsession. His obsession was Marcia Blair's eyes. Yes, always her eyes. They seemed to hypnotize him. It is not new, you know. You'll find the same motive, the eyes of a beautiful woman, all through the works of Edgar Allan Poe. Then, as I understand it, after this man's death, she began to receive a series of letters. Foul letters. Apparently written by him and threatening her with some rather horrible form of death if she married you. I tell you, Barry Lake is dead. He can't get up out of his coffin. Oh, getting out of coffins, my friend, is not so difficult. I have done it myself. Oh, please stop joking, Van Arnheim. You don't happen to be dead. True. There is that small difference. Um, is your wife here in the theater tonight? Yes. She wouldn't have come here except that it's Marin Willard's first night. And we haven't seen Marin, either of us, in years. She's back there in box mm, D. So I hear. Uh, I was hoping uh, that you might invite me to share the box. Uh, look here, old man. I, I don't want to seem inhospitable, but... Uh, she doesn't want company? Well, that's about it. Well, then walk back a little distance with me, this way. So that you can see the stage from the back of the dress circle. Now the orchestra has stopped and they'll ring up in a moment. There. Look at it. Look at what? The stage, man. The lights have gone out. All except the dim yellow footlights shining at the curtain. The last cough, the last murmur, the last rustle of program dies away in one vast breathing hush. The curtain goes up. Let go of my arm, Von Arnheim. I've got to leave. Now, what are the stage directions? A desert place. Thunder and lightning. Enter three witches. When, indeed, I wonder. I beg your pardon, Van Arnheim. Do you no, speak? No, it was nothing.
the London newspapers for that year, 1936, you may read how Myron Willard triumphed at Drury Lane as Macbeth. But tonight, as the clock ticks on, there is another drama in the dimly lighted corridor outside Box D. There sits Miss Louise Fenton, Marcia Blair's companion secretary. Beside her, burly and broken-nosed, is Big Jim Bradley, the ex-wrestler. And when more than half an hour has passed... There's the applause, Jim. That must be the end of the first act. Yes, I hear it. Nothing's happened. But take my word for it, nothing's going to happen. Oh, she's such a likable person, Jim. And I think one of our greatest Shakespearean actresses. Oh, I don't much care for this Shakespeare business, Miss... You give me a good movie with gangsters in it. It's my style. Oh, you don't understand, Jim. I've seen her as Juliet, as Rosalind, as Portia. In our own drawing room without any props. I've heard her as Lady Macbeth, too. And you should see her eyes. Her eyes, Miss? Yes, you should see her eyes when she delivers that speech. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal end. Hey, Miss, look there. What is it? That foreign-looking cove in the black cape coming along the passage now. Easy. I beg your pardon. You are Miss Louise Fenton, aren't you? Uh, yes, my name is Fenton. What is it? I am looking for Arnheim, a friend of Mr. White's. And I must see Marcia Blair at once. No, you don't, Governor. You're not going in there. Why not? Because nobody goes in there. Not if it was the king himself. That's orders. Now, listen to me, both of you. When the lights went on, I happened to be looking at Box D from the other side of the theater. And I think yes. there is something wrong. But there can't be anything wrong. Jim Bradley and I have been sitting here the whole time. Except, of course... Except when? Well, except when I went in there for a few seconds. You went in there, Miss Fenton? May I ask when that was? Well, it was after Mr. White had gone and just before the play started. I went in to ask if she wanted anything. She said she didn't, so I came out again. And Bradley's been with me all the time, except when he went to get a drink of water up the corridor. That's as true as gospel, Captain. One moment and listen to me. Marcia Blair is leaning forward across the railing of the box. Oh, but that's nothing, Herr von Arnheim. That's the way she always is. Does she always fall forward with her arms held straight out and her head down on her arms? You better be careful, miss. It's a trick. Trick? Why not open the door and see for yourselves? Would that do any harm? No, I... I suppose it wouldn't, but... Oh, there must be some mistake. We haven't heard a sound from in there. There couldn't be anything wrong. You open the door, Miss Fenton. I'm going to hold tight to this gentleman, just in case. <laughs> Quiet, please. Quiet. What is it, Miss? Oh. Walk in there with me, both of you. Please go carefully, as though nothing were wrong. Mm. You don't want to attract attention. Now. Oh, help on, on I. There's blood all over her face. Yes. And don't begin screaming again, Miss Fenton, when I tell you she's dead. Bradley? Uh, yes, sir? Pick Miss Blair's body up and carry her out into the corridor. In another minute, we'll have the whole theater wanting to know what's wrong. All right, sir. You win. But what about the people in the other boxes? Won't they see? They've gone down to the bar to get a drink. They won't see anything. Hurry. Uh, uh, she ain't no lightweight, the poor lady ain't. Uh, steady, does it? Uh, Hold the door open. That's got it. Now, close the door. Shall I put her down on the floor, Governor? Yes, better do that. I never took those threats seriously. That's what I blame myself for. And if something did happen, well, I, I thought he'd attack her. I never thought he'd hide away across the theater and fire a shot. And you were quite right, Miss Fenton. Marcia Blair was not shot. She... she wasn't shot. No, take a look at the wound. Oh, I can't look at it. She was stabbed. Stabbed through the right eye oh. with a narrow, sharp blade which entered her brain and killed her instantly. Not a pretty death, but a quick one. You seem to know a lot about this, Governor. Perhaps I do, my friend, and perhaps I can guess a lot more. You mean somebody stood out there and threw a knife at her? Like a ruddy music hall turn? No, I don't mean that either. There's no knife in the wound and none in the box. The murderer took it away. It took it away? Exactly. Help on Arnheim, please wait. You're not saying someone climbed up from outside, 20 or 30 feet from the floor, and stabbed poor Marcia in full sight of 3,000 people? That, Miss Fenton, is what the evidence seems to indicate. But it's impossible. Yet it happened. There is Marcia Blair's body. 
What's that? Oh, it's the warning bell for the second act. People will be coming back here anyway, any minute. What are we going to do? <laughs> Magical effects by Ludwig van Arnheim. Very few persons knew that there is a dead woman in the theater. But at the end of the play, it is a different story. The crowd files out, past a cordon of police. The lights are extinguished. The great theater is dark and mumbling with echoes. See the stage now? Only the battens or overhead lights pour down a pale blaze on two men who stand grotesquely against the background of Dunsinane Castle. One of these men is Howard White, very near collapse. The other is Myron Willard himself, still wearing his makeup still wearing helmet and chain mail. And when Willard speaks... Howard! Howard White! Confounded man, can't you hear what I'm saying? Excuse me, madam. I... This is almost finished. Oh, not that I'm blaming you, old man. Thank you, madam. It's traditional, you know, that Macbeth's an unlucky play. But up to the very end, I thought I'd never done better. Eleven curtain calls. No, twelve. Uh, how did you like my tomorrow and tomorrow speech? Hmm? I'm sorry, madam. I'm afraid I didn't hear it. Oh, I... Yes, poor old Marcia. She'd have hated to die like that. Marcia was proud of her eyes. Always nearsighted as an owl, but too vain to wear glasses. Uh-huh. There's Von Arnheim looking at us from under the castle archway. Von Arnheim! Did you call me, my friend? You are rather difficult to recognize under all that Macbeth makeup. Yes, I was just thinking the same thing. Uh, never mind that. Uh, where are the police now? At the moment, Mr. Willard, the police are in your dressing room. They are using it for questioning. Uh, no reception tonight, of course. No, but I thought you might be interested in two items of information that police have just discovered. Well, uh, go on. We had a fairly full house tonight, I believe. Fairly full. Every seat was reserved. Reserved, yes, but not occupied. I don't follow you. One box on the ground floor, box E, to be exact, was empty. Reserved and paid for, but empty. And box E, oddly enough, was just underneath the one occupied by Marcia Blair. Well, all the same, I still don't see quite what you're... Now, our next item of information comes from an usher. An outside eye seat in the stores, very close to that empty box, was occupied by a very curious stranger who arrived late in the dark and slipped out again by a nearby exit a few minutes afterwards. Just one moment, Von Arnheim. Are you saying this stranger climbed up and attacked Marcia in full view of the audience? No, my friend. The murderer did not approach from that direction. Then he must have reached Marcia through the door, guarded by a bed in Miss Fenton? No, not from that direction either. Confound it, man. It must have been one way or the other. Not necessarily. Well, tell me how. Don't you think I've got enough troubles already without this nightmare on top of it? Help on Arnheim. Help on Arnheim. Oh, you must take it easy, Miss Fenton. You must not excite yourself. Have the police yes. been... Yes. Pre- Look, you've got to help me. They won't believe me. They won't believe the young lady, sir, and that's a fact. I tried to help her all I can, but there's things I can swear to and things I can't. You see, I did go into that box. Oh, just for a couple of seconds, I admit it. But no other person went in or could have got in. So they say, or at least they're hinting that I killed her. But I swear I never touched her. Who was questioning you, Miss Fenton? Inspector Grimes or Sergeant Blake? I'm... Well, I'm not sure. The sergeant, I think. Then I shouldn't worry if I were you. Inspector Grimes knows better. 
He's guessed, in fact, exactly what I have guessed. You seem on rather familiar terms with the police, my friend. I am, Mr. Willard. I am. Anyone who practices escapes from handcuffs, sacks, chests... And stage boxes, perhaps. Stage boxes, if you insist. Excuse me. Isn't that Inspector Grimes in the wings now? Yes, and he's nodding his head. Then I can tell you, I think, what you want to know. Well, if you do happen to know anything, it's your duty to speak up. Poor Marcia seems to have had some ridiculous idea that her former husband, Barry Lake, was still alive. Her fears weren't justified, of course, and she wasn't killed by any dead husband. I beg your pardon. Her fears were justified, though not quite in the way she believed. And she was killed by her husband. Then Barry Lake is still alive. No, Barry Lake is dead. You don't mean Marcia was really killed by a ghost. No, I mean she was killed by her devoted second husband. Mr. Howard White. Do you you know hear what they say? That's not true. It's a slanderous statement. I, I'll have you in court for it. I, everybody knows how devoted I was to Marcia. Your devotion, my friend, was devotion to her money. And your business affairs have been shaky for a long time. That's not true and you can't prove it. Marcia Blyer was inclined to be, shall we say, a little close-fisted with money. That's true anyway. It's she a lie, a lie. willing to marry him, but Mr. Howard White knew he'd never touch a penny unless he killed her. He wrote the letters himself. Herr von Arnheim, he can't be guilty. She was alive after he left the box. He wasn't anywhere near her when she died. Perfectly correct, Miss Fenton. He wasn't there, and yet he killed her. Exactly. But you and Bradley can supply the clue that will hang him. Uh, Me, sir? I don't know nothing. No, I don't either. I think you do, if you'll put your mind to it. Do you remember what Howard White said to her just before he left the box? Uh, Yes, he said, Good night, Marcia. See you in an hour or two. And she answered... Good night and good luck. No, I mean just before that. I... Well, there wasn't anything. You see? It's a slanderous statement without any proof. It's an insult to my position in the stock exchange. Wait. I do remember something rather queer. Think, Miss Fenton. Think. He said to Marcia, jokingly, if you'll accept these, madam, in honor of our first anniversary. And Marcia said, Howard, they're lovely. Of course I'll accept them. That's right, sir. He did say it. And what do you think he was referring to, Miss Fenton? What was he asking her to accept? Well, I imagined it was flowers, a corsage or something like that. Did you see any flowers in the box or pinned to Marcia Blair's gown? No. I've come to think of it, I didn't. Then what did he give her? Don't look at me, sir. Now, here is a woman who is very nearsighted, yet refuses to wear glasses. But she can accept a pair of... Opera glasses. Miss Lie, you can't prove it. Yeah, hold on, sir. Go. You better stay here, Governor. Thank you, Bradley. But the place is surrounded with police. But I still don't understand. Now, what happens when you lift opera glasses to your eyes and they are not in focus? You turn the little wheel in the middle to bring them into focus. For Marcia Blair, it was deadly. You mean the, the glasses had... Yes, been... they were specially constructed glasses, Miss Fenton. They were invented by a French criminal years ago. That little wheel is a little trigger. It releases the spring of a sharp, thin blade which strikes through the eyes into the brain. Oh, don't, please. You can't prove it. Marcia Blair died instantly. The glasses torn from her eye by their own weight dropped over the box rail to the carpeted aisle below. The only witnesses who might have noticed would have been the people in the box just underneath. And that box was empty? By arrangement, yes. Even if anybody did see them fall, Howard White was prepared to remove the evidence instantly. You haven't forgotten the curious stranger. Curious stranger? I mean, the man who slipped in after it was dark, took an aisle seat just under the box, and slipped out again a few minutes later. It's a pack of lies from start to finish. You can't prove a word of it. I beg your pardon, my friend. Didn't you see Inspector Grimes nod to me a moment ago? Well... You are going to hang, my friend, for one of the neatest and cruelest crimes in my experience. The police have just found those opera glasses with a neat set of fingerprints in the side pocket of your motor car. And so ends Fireburn and Cauldron Bubble, starring the distinguished actor Paul Lucas. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is your narrator, Ted Osborne, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, same time, when Nancy Coleman stars in Fear Paints a Picture. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, 
Robert Salmon, studio technician, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our distinguished stars tonight are two of the world's acknowledged masters of the art of suspense. They are Mr. Charles Lawton and Miss Elsa Lanchester. Mr. Lawton, who will soon be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, The Man from Down Under, is here to play a remarkable character, created by England's noted thriller author, Agatha Christie. A mild-mannered character whose initials were ABC and about whom revolved a series of savage murders, all neatly and alphabetically arranged. ABC was stamped upon all his belongings, those being his rightful initials. And ABC was stamped, too, upon the large railway timetable he always carried. But there was nothing so odd about that detail, since no traveler in the British Isles would dream of planning a journey without consulting this famous railway schedule, the ABC. And so, with the ABC murders by Agatha Christie, written for radio by Robert Tallman and William Spear, and with the performance of Charles Lawton, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. When the time for closing bell rang in the public library, Alexander Bonaparte Cust started, picked up his battered briefcase with the almost faded initials ABC closed the book he had been reading and shuffled over to the librarian's desk. Um, it's a most interesting book, librarian. I should like to come back sometime and read it on a chapter of it, if I may. Quite. Uh, yes, Mr. Clark. Can I help you, sir? No hurry. Uh, well, I'll be going along now. Thank you. A rum little chap, that. What do you think he was reading? Studies in epileptic somnambulism. Medical stuff, eh? Oh, I say, the little fellow left his briefcase. I'll catch him at the door. I say, sir, just a moment. You left something. Oh, dear, it's my briefcase. I'm terribly sorry. I seem to be getting more and more forgetful lately. Why, only the other day I left it on the counter in a tobacco shop. Lucky you have those initials. Not many people with the initials A, B, C sticks in your mind. What do you mean by that, sir? Well, after all, they're the first three letters of the alphabet. Practically the first thing we learn, you know, isn't it? Our A, B, C... Don't mention those letters to me. They brought bad luck to me in more ways than one. Really? How's that? <laughs> Well, I used to be a travelling salesman, and I used to carry one of those railway timetables in my pocket, the threepenny kind, in which they list the towns and all the railroads alphabetically. Oh, of course. Printed right on the cover, isn't it? Hey. A, B, C. Yes, that's right, sir. Well, stockings was my line, sir. I did door-to-door -door selling. Whenever I finished one town, out would come that timetable, and I'd look up the next stop on my route. I got sick of the sight of that A, B, C railway guide, I can tell you, sir. It was like a symbol of failure to me. One dingy little town after another and all listed in that railway guide with ABC printed on the cover. My own initials staring out at me from every newsstand and every dirty little railroad station in the Midlands. Oh, come on. It couldn't have been as bad as all that. Matter of fact, I never noticed it till I began to get the headaches. Oh, you suffer from headaches? Yes. Hmm. Have you seen a doctor about it? Oh, no, no. I wouldn't want to see a doctor about it. I already know what brings the on. Well, if you'd rather not talk about oh, it... Oh, no, I... no. It isn't that at all, sir. It was just uh, such a long time ago. During the last war, in fact, uh, Chateau Thierry. Uh, Chateau Thierry, oh, I yeah. say, what a coincidence. I was in the thick of that myself. Where yes, is, uh, we hmm. must get together for a drink one day to talk over old times. Franklin Clark is my name. Oh, I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Clark. My name's Cust. Alexander Bonaparte Cust. Well, they must have expected great things of you, giving you a name like that. I'm afraid they did, Mr. Clark, yes. Oh. I'm very much afraid they did. Mr. Cast. Oh, Mr. Cast. Who is it? It's me, Mr. Cast. 
I brought you out a spot of tea. Oh, it's you, Miss Marbury. That was very thoughtful of you. Oh, nonsense. <laughs> you know, Mother dotes on you. Oh. You're her favourite lodger. In fact, why, Mr. Cust, you're packing your things. You're not leaving us, are you? Oh, no, I'm just taking a little trip over the bank holiday, you know. Now, now, don't try to deceive me, Mr. Cust. You're embarrassed. Without owing us, aren't you? No. You needn't be, Mr. Cuff. Really, you needn't. Oh, you, you are a nice girl, Miss Marbury. You really are a nice girl. As a matter of fact, I'm not going just for the bank holiday. I've uh, something rather important, some oh. very important matters to take mm -hmm. care of. You know, it's very possible that my mother didn't have me christened Alexander Bonaparte Cust for nothing. Mm -hmm. Oh. Have you got a position, Mr. Cuff? Well... What is it? Well... Oh, come, Mr. Cuff. <laughs> you can tell me, can't you? Well, Miss mm -hmm. Lily, I can tell you this much. I shall be travelling quite a lot. In oh. fact, uh, where did I leave that ABC railroad guide? Oh, yes, here it is. Uh, first stop, Andover. Andover? That's not very far. No, no, no. But I must be getting on if I don't want to miss that train. Now, let me see. Have I got everything? There's my spectacles and my overcoat, my typewriter, my walking stick. Did I ever tell you the history of this walking no. stick, Miss Marbury? It's a Scottish piece, very old. It's oh. always is it antique. You know, they used to kill people with these back in the days of the old clan wars in Scotland. I wonder how many heads this one has bashed in. Oh, Ooh. Mr. Cuss. Oh, please, what a terrible way to talk. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, Miss Marbury. I am a little bit surprised at myself talking like that. It must be my new job. It's gone to my head a bit. That's it. It's gone to my head. Mm. Have you got an aspirin by any chance? I've got an aspirin. Yes, gentlemen? What'll it be? A packet of gold flakes for me. Yes, sir. And the other gentleman? Three Havanas, the shilling cigars. Havanas? You gentlemen must be up from London. That's right. Is that your name on the window of this shop? <laughs> That's right, sir. Olivia Asher. Been in business right here in Andover and right here in St. Andrew's Place for 20 years. Mm, all A's. Andover, St. Andrew's Place and Asher. Funny, ain't it? <laughs> Never so much as crossed the line before. Well, Mrs. Asher, we're from Scotland Yard. We have reason to believe there may be a homicidal maniac at large in Andover. <gasps> God, blonde. We don't want to frighten you, Mrs. Asher. For all we know, this may be just a practical joke. You see, we received an anonymous letter, typewritten, and signed ABC. ABC? This murderer, if there's anything in his story, is planning a series of murders. His mania seems to be centered on the alphabet. If he follows his plan through, his first murder will be committed in Andover, and the victim will be a person whose name begins with an A. The Lord help me, sir. You don't think... We don't think anything. Scotland Yard has taken its precautions. Oh, a woman takes a terrible chance. There's probably nothing to be alarmed about, but it won't hurt to keep a sharp lookout. Who's next on your list, Mackenzie? Next is Arthur Atwood. All right. Let's be on our way, then. Good day, madam. Mm, don't worry. Thank you, sir. And good day to you, sir. A murderer lunatic in Andover of all places. Yes, sir. What'll it be for you, sir? These. That'll be one and six, sir. I said that'll be... Oh, no, no, no! <laughs> Homicidal maniac in Andover. Alphabet murderer to strike next to Bexhill. Latest on ABC. Oh, boy, let me have one of those. Oh, yes, and you just stand it, Both. Here you are. Oh, thank you, sir. 6.30 newspaper sensation. Nasty business, eh, mister? Oh, yes. Very, very. You never know with lunatics. They don't always look bomber, you know. Sometimes they look the same as you on me. Eh? Yes, I suppose they do. Oh, it's a fact. Sometimes it's the war on them. Never been right since. Uh, yes, I expect you're right. You know, I don't hold with wars. I hope this will be the last. You don't hold with wars, eh? Well, young man, I don't hold with plague and sleeping sickness and famine and cancer, but they happen all the same. And murder happens all the same. They can't prevent them. Well, I'm sorry, sir. I, I expect you had a rocky time of it in the last one, eh? Yes, yes, my, my poor head's never been the same since. I get terrible headaches. Oh? Well, I'm sorry about that, sir. Well, sometimes I hardly know what I'm doing. You don't say. I forget things. You know, for instance, I could have sworn I had an ABC railway guide in my pocket an hour ago. Do you know they found one of them ABC railway guides on the poor tobacconist lady that he murdered? Who? Oh, he? ABC, whoever he is. Maybe he don't know himself. Never stop to think of that. Maybe he's so bomb he don't remember. I wonder. Train for Waddington, Dorchester, Ben. 
Bexhill, Bexhill. Did he say Bexhill? That's my train. Well, goodbye, young man. Goodbye. Again, police trudging Todd Roger on which murder notes were written. To strike at Maxwell, latest on ABC Alphabet Murderer. May I have your order, sir? Uh, well, I don't think I'll have the am I? I'd am for breakfast. Oh, yes, I think I'll have a mutton pie. One well, mutton pie. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the matter with you? You're trembling, young woman. Is something wrong? Oh, sir, if you only knew. I have to walk home tonight, after they close up here. And there ain't hardly a light in Benson Terrace where I live. Benson, Benson Terrace in Bexhill? Yes, sir. You're afraid of the ABC murderer, aren't you? He follows the alphabet, don't he? That was the way he done in Andover. Hey, and does your name begin with a B? Barnard's my name. Mary Barnard. Oh, dear me, Miss Barnard. <laughs> Well, I don't like to appear forward. Well, anyway, I'm old enough to be your father. Would it make you feel easier if I saw you home tonight? Oh, you don't know, sir. You just don't know what it would mean. <laughs> well, what time do they close up here? Nine o'clock. All right, I'll wait outside for you. <laughs> At nine o'clock? All right. Ladies, waitress brutally murdered in Bexhill. ABC strikes again. ER, sir, Scotland Yard receives third murder note. Alphabet murderer to strike again in Cheston. Yes, sir. Third class single to Cheston. Uh, give me a pint of half and half, please. Yes, sir. There you are, sir. You up from London, sir? Uh, yes, I, I I come directly from London. Ah, salesman? Stockings is my line. Hey, rough going these days, what with rationing, eh? Well, well, well. It isn't my old friend Alexander Bonaparte Cousin. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't remember. We you. met in the library, remember? Oh, in London. Yeah. Yes, had quite a talk. Yeah. Franklin Clark, remember? Yes, of course. You'll forgive me, Mr. Clark. My memory, it seems to be getting worse and worse. But you must have come under better times, Mr. Cuss. New oh. briefcase, I see. Nice, bright, new initials. Well, I got a job shortly, shortly after I saw you, Mr. Clark, from uh, Ballinger Limited. Stockings is my old line, you know. But to tell you the truth, I haven't been doing very well. Oh, those headaches again? Yes, the headaches. And the murders. The murders have upset me something terrible. Oh, well, you're shaking like a leaf, man. No. Hey, Jonathan, a brandy for Mr. Cust. Oh, he needs it. Sir. The trouble with you, Cust, is you're inclined to be morbid. I remember that book you were reading the day we met. Stuff about epilepsy. Well, it might be epilepsy, mightn't it? What? Well, they discharged me from the army before the war ended. Uh, you see, I had a kind of a fit, you know. And Never then... had anything like it again, have you? No, I didn't have a fit again, just the headaches. I forget what happens, hours at a time. Do you know, once I was sitting in a station waiting room and a newsboy came by and I bought a paper from and it was all about that first murder... In Andover. Oh. It said the police had got another note, another typewritten note, Mr. Clark, and the murderer was going to strike next in Bexhill, and suddenly I realised I was in Bexhill, hmm. and I'd been in Andover the day before when the first murder happened. Well, how did you happen to go from Andover to Bexhill? Well, that's the way I'm supposed to go, on my route, selling the stockings. I'm supposed to take the towns alphabetically. Oh, well, then it's not so surprising you should have been in Bexhill after all, is it? Just a coincidence. Oh, well, I, the waitress in Bexhill there, I... I walked home with her that night, Mr. Clark, the night she was murdered. Oh, good heavens, Cusk, you don't think you killed Mary Barnard, do you? I don't know, Mr. Clark. It said in that book that people who have had epileptic fits often do things and don't remember them. They even commit crimes. I said good night to her, and after that well, I don't know note, what I... The notes, those typewritten notes, wouldn't you have remembered if you'd written them? I don't know. Well, now, I know a little something about psychology myself, Cust. And I'd stake everything I own on the fact that the man who wrote those notes was conscious of what he was doing. Do you really think so, Mr. Clark? Positive of it. Now, pull yourself together, man. Incidentally, my sister-in-law lives here in Cheston. My brother is Lord Cameron Clark, and I oh. happen to know she needs some new stockings. Oh. Pop over there in the morning, will you, and show the old girl your line? Oh. Here, here's the address. 
Might cheer you up to make a, a good thing. Oh, I'm huh? sure it would, Mr. Clark. I'm sure it would. Well, good night, Mr. Clark, and thank you again for all your kindness. Good I'm night. sure, sir. Good night. Oh, wait a minute. You've forgotten something again. Oh, dear me, that's my typewriter. I shall certainly need that. Oh, oh. Well, well, to type up my report to the Home Office in case I should make that sale tomorrow. Oh, of course. Oh, yes, yes. yes. By the way, Cus, better watch yes. out. Somebody in Cheston is going to be murdered tomorrow. Aye. Old ABC is up to the letter C, you know, and your uh, name is Cus. Uh, oh, I say, good heavens. Mine is Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for your generous order, Lady Clark. I hope you'll be pleased. Uh, this uh, line of woolen line of stockings is uh, one of Ballinger's best buys right now, Lady Clark. My brother-in-law told me that you'd had some unfortunate times lately, Mr. Cuss. Yes. But I really did need the stockings, and I should... Hello be... again, Cuss. Hello, oh, sir. Stuffing myself with bacon and eggs. Make a sale, old boy? Oh, yes, Mr. Clark. Thank you very much. Good, sir. good. Louise is filthy with money, and her ladyship's legs are in constant need of recovering. Oh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> yes, <sir>. really. <laughs> she, she wanted the stockings. Well, uh, thank you very much, my lady. I hope I shall have the privilege of serving you again next year. Goodbye, Mr. Cust, and good luck. Cheerio, Cust. Such a nice little man, Franklin. He's a bit off his nut, I'm afraid. Last night he tried to convince me that he was the ABC murderer. His initials, you know. He has minor lapses of memory. That little man, a murderer? Oh, really, Franklin. <coughs> good Lord, what was that? <coughs> well, the maid. Where's that girl? What's going on? In the master's bedroom, my lady. You better go with her, Mr. Franklin. Carruthers, whatever are you doing here? Oh, my lady, the master, Lord Clark, has been murdered. What? Stabbed with a knife. Oh. It's all over blood. Murder? Oh. Good heavens. Why, look, look there on the floor. A railway guide, an ABC. Take me out of here, Franklin. Oh, yes. Louise, I'm sorry you had to see this. Oh, Cameron. My poor Cameron. Who never made an enemy in his life. The man who did this was a maniac. And I'm afraid I know who he is. He always carried a walking stick with a heavy carved handle. That's how the other murders were committed, with a heavy stick. But he oh. wasn't carrying his stick today. Must have grabbed a knife up there somewhere to kill Cameron with. But when? Were you with him every minute? Well, I went upstairs to get my checkbook. It took me a little while to find it. That gave Custis opening. Oh, do you think that all that time... Oh, no. No, I'll never forgive myself, no, Franklin. No, none of that now, Louise. The important thing now is to stop him before he can commit another murder. But what are you going to do, Franklin? I'm going to the police and see if they'll let me help. Let's have a look at this ABC railway guide he left beside poor Cameron. Hmm. Look here. All checked. See there? Andover, Bexhill, Churston. Each with a check mark after it. No. Oh. Oh, where's the next one? Ah, see? See London. He's through with ABC, he's gone home, and I'm going after him. Yes? Well, Mr. Cust, come in. Whatever kept you away so long? Miss Lily, I've got to talk to you alone. Oh, well, I'll go up with you. I want to show you the new curtains I'll put up in your room oh, anyway. Oh, you are a nice girl, Miss Lily, really. Well, yeah, nice let girl. me carry one of these, Mr. Cust, a typewriter. No, 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 I'll carry my own thing, oh, thank oh, you. Oh, Mr. Cust, you're trembling. Oh, dear, you do look a fright. Uh -huh. Look, I'm going to straighten and get you a hot foot bath. No, no, not now, please, not now, Miss Lily. There's no time for it. What is it, Mr. Cust? Close the door and lock it. Are you in some trouble, Mr. Cust? I'm in terrible trouble, Miss Lily. I want you to hear the story first from me. You're the only one who has ever been my friend. Oh, I've had a lonely life, Miss Lily. Oh, poor Mr. Cust. Poor Mr. Cust. That's what they always say about me. Poor Mr. Cust. I thought you were different. I don't take on so, Mr. Cust. It was only a manner oh, of speaking. Oh, you don't need to worry. I'm all right now. I never get two spells in one day. Spells? Mr. Cust, I don't understand. What, what well, you, you... you heard of the ABC murders? Oh, shocking affairs. But, Mr. Cust, why, why are you Lilly, saying Miss Lily, the to... police will be here at any minute. Please let me finish. I don't want you to think harshly of me, Miss Lily. I didn't plan it ahead. My instructions told me where to go. Some people can't help what they do. There are diseases. Epilepsy, for instance. You do things you don't remember. You commit crimes. And I'm like that. Oh, Mr. Cust, I can't believe it. When I was a child, Miss Lily, they used to badger me about my name. My mother worshipped strength. She named me after the strongest people she knew about in history. Alexander and Bonaparte. But nobody ever called me by those names. They called me ABC. ABC. 
I used to dream I was boiling in a kettle of alphabet soup. I was a terrible disappointment to my mother. Mr. Cust, you're unsettled and tired. You've got to hear me out, Miss Lily. Oh, you oh, got... my now, own listen to me, Miss Lily. I couldn't... Cust... Uh, I could have been a hero oh. once in the army in the last war. I was happy. I could have made something of myself. Then I started getting the Let headache. Me go, Mr. You Cust... must hear me out, Miss Lily. I started forgetting things after they discharged me from the army. Shop, they called it. I used to have dreams. Oh. I was a great ruler. The oh. destiny of men was in my hands. I had the power of them, of life and death. Let me go, Flop. Please let me go. First, there was Andover, that tobacconist. I can't even remember what she looked like. Then there was Bexhill. I walked home with a waitress from the station restaurant. She was murdered, too. In Chester, I sold a dozen pair of stockings to a lady, and while she was upstairs getting her checkbook, her husband was murdered on the floor where I was waiting. And now I've come back here. Maybe the alphabet charm is over. Or is it? This is London. Hell, your name is Lily. Are you trying to frighten me, Mr. Cust? I am trying to convince you. You, murderer? <laughs> I'd soon believe it. Uh, my own mother. What about this? Look at it. Oh, uh, no, no. Look closely at it. I found it in my briefcase when I came on the train, Miss Lily. This night murdered a man in Churston just three hours ago. No! Oh, now, there, there, Miss Marbury. Don't take on so. He's all end got pretty as you please in the next room. But, but he was such a nice man. I, I still can't hardly believe it. Is this the night he threatened you win, Miss Marbury? Yes. We just got here in the nick of time, eh, Groom? Hey, that's a wicked-looking knife. It's the Churston murder knife right enough, Mr. Clark. No doubt of it. Well, let's take inventory. Typewriter. Checks with the murder notes. Walking stick. Same markings as on the heads of the first victims. And the psychiatrist's report says the murders were premeditated and the notes could not possibly have been written except by a person who was conscious and in his right mind. Well, that breaks down any idea Cust may have had of entering an insanity plea. Right. I think he'll sign the confession without any difficulty. Bring him in. Bring the prisoner in. Well, Cust, are you ready to sign your confession? I don't know, Inspector. A moment ago I was certain I must have done it. But why? That's what worries me. Why? Mr. Clark, why do you think I did it? You're wasting valuable time, Cust. I don't care why you did it. You killed my brother and I want to see you hang for it. I don't care how balmy you are. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Talking to our Mr. Cust in that bloodthirsty manner. I don't know what's getting into the gentry, I'm sure. He tried to murder you, didn't he? Well, he couldn't help himself, poor thing. He's been terribly upset of late. You are a nice girl, Miss Lily. You are a nice girl. The, really, the murders were willful and premeditated. They couldn't have been premeditated, Mr. Clark. Why do you say that, Cust? Well, because I didn't go to any of those places of my own choice. I had my instructions from Bellinger's Limited. And those instructions were sent to me after the police got the warnings of the murders that were printed in the paper. There never were any such instructions. We ransacked all your things, Cust. There wasn't any letter of instructions, was there, Inspector? No. Oh, yes, there was. All right, we'll ring up Ballinger's. May I use your telephone, Miss Marbury? Oh, certainly, Inspector. The number is Regent 3313, Inspector. Oh. Ballinger's, are you there? Put me on to personnel. Oh, Mac, start packing those exhibits, will you? All oh, right, sir. Uh, Chrome speaking, Scotland Yard. But what day did you employ a commercial traveler named Alexander Bonaparte Cust? No, Cust. A.B. Cust. Initials A.B.C. Yes, yes. Never employed by you. You're absolutely certain? Did you send a man to Andover or Bex Hill last week? Not on your route. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Too bad, Cust. I guess this knocks out your last goose of a chance, doesn't it? No, Mr. Clark. Because, you see, the instructions were in the letter, and that letter is right in this room. Well, let's have a look. Come on, Mackenzie, give me a hand. Let's go through these things again. It won't do you any good to look there, Mr. Clark. I have the letter. Would you like to see it, Mr. Crumb? It's here. Well, I'll be... Where did you get that? It wasn't on him, Inspector. I'll swear to that. Where did you have this hidden? Uh, well, Inspector, it isn't generally known, but I do wear a small uh, hairpiece. Not out of vanity, mind you. I find it necessary for the business. Let's man. see that letter. Oh, gladly. 
Dear Mr. Cast, in clothes find advance, typewriter is being posted today, you will... Oh, what a lot of nonsense, Inspector. Look at the typeface of that letter. It's obviously written on Cust's typewriter. Yes, that's right, Mr. Clark. And the man uh, who he wrote said... that letter was the murderer. Cool as you like, he sent the typewriter to me and instructions on one of Ballinger's letterheads and the money and everything else. What kind of stunt are you trying to pull here, Cust? No stunt. It's just that when you made that telephone call, Inspector, and Ballinger said I'd never work for them, I knew that the typewriter must have been sent to me by the murderer. And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to me that the murderer must be Mr. Clark. What? No. Why, this is too utterly fantastic, Inspector. Really, I... Well, I, the murderer would have to add to know something about me. Something I'd never confided to anyone but to Mr. Clark about my, well, my headaches. I'd been reading a book in the public library, Inspector, a book on epilepsy, and it seemed to me that what I suffered during the last war might have been epilepsy. And it was on my mind, see? It said that epileptics might commit crimes and not remember them under certain conditions. Without that to go on, the murderer couldn't possibly have pinned the crime on me. That works two ways, Cust. You might have told me that story deliberately, just so you could cook up this story now. Well, I couldn't cook up your fingerprints, Mr. Clark. And I'll wager anything. Your fingerprints are on that letter. Oh, come now, really. Well, that's easily settled. We can do it right here. Won't take a moment. Take us out of Mr. Clark's fingerprints, Mackenzie. You examine the prints in the letter meantime. Right, Inspector. Just press your fingers down firmly on this ink pad, Mr. Clark. What is it, Mr. Clark? It's quite simple, really. Yes, yes, it's so simple it isn't even necessary. I'm afraid this is necessary, Mr. Clark. Only a matter of routine, you know. But... I tell you it isn't necessary because Cust is right. I am the murderer. You? But wait, then... You killed your brother Cameron Clark so that you would inherit the estate? Yes, exactly. But the others, the A and B murders in Andover and Bexhill and... I committed them, all of them. Yes, but... Come now, gentlemen, surely you'll give me credit for thinking this thing through. If only my brother Lord Clark had been murdered, I, being the only heir, would have had a lot of explaining to do. So I invented my own little crime wave to make it appear as though he were just one of the victims of a homicidal maniac. And I must say, it almost came off, thanks to the, the unknowing cooperation of Mr. Cust here. Thank you just the same, Mr. Cust. You're very welcome. Oh, I mean... oh, Mr. Cust, I knew you couldn't be a murderer, not really. Oh, you are a nice girl, Miss Lily, really, you are but a nice headaches, girl. headaches, Mr. Cust, why don't you go to an oculist? Those headaches, maybe you just need a new pair of glasses. I think I'll do that, Miss Lily. Do you really think... Of course, I'll wager that's what's been the trouble with me all along. You know, you need someone to take care of you. Oh, I do, Miss Lily, I do really... If only you... Oh, but no, you couldn't ever think... What, of... Mr. Cuff? Well, I mean, Miss Lily, I was just thinking it would be really too much to ask anyone. Mrs. Alexander Bonaparte cast it. But when we're married, please don't wear that toupee. It's very conspicuous. Oh, you are a nice girl, Miss Lily. <laughs> really, you are. I do hope... Uh... People won't call you Mrs. ABC. And so closes the ABC Murders, starring Charles Lawton with Alsa Lanchester and Bramwell Fletcher. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Agnes Moorhead will return to our stage as star of the suspense play called She Overheard Murder Speaking. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin and Lucian Mahowick, conductor and composer... And Robert Tolman, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
This is the Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is one of the most compelling actresses in America today, Miss Agnes Moorhead. Miss Moorhead returns to our stage to appear in a new study in terror by Lucille Fletcher called Sorry, Wrong Number. This story of a woman who accidentally overheard a conversation with death and who strove frantically to prevent murder from claiming an innocent victim is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with Sorry, Wrong Number and the performance of Agnes Moorhead, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Operator, I've been dialing Murray Hill 70093 now for the last three quarters of an hour, and the line is always busy. I don't see how it could be busy that long. Will you try it for me, please? I will be glad to try that number for you. One moment, please. I don't see how it could be busy all this time. It's my husband's office. He's working late tonight, and I'm all alone here in the house. My health is very poor, and I've been feeling so nervous all day. Ringing Murray Hill 70093. Hello? Uh, hello? Is Mr. Stevenson hello. there? Hello? Hello? Oh, hello, George. Yes, sir. This is George speaking. Hello? Who's this? What number am I calling, please? I'm here with our client now. He says the coast is clear for tonight. Yes, sir. Where are you now? In a phone booth. They don't worry. Everything's okay. Very well. Now, you know the address. At 11 o'clock, the private patrolman goes around to the bar on 2nd Avenue for a beer. Be sure that all the lights downstairs are on, eh? What? There should be only one light visible from the street. At 11.15, a train crosses the bridge. It makes a noise in case her window is open and she should scream. Oh, hello. What number is this, please? Okay. I understand. Now make it quick. As little blood as possible, huh? Our client does not wish to make us suffer long. Will a knife be okay, sir? Well, a knife will be okay. And uh, do you remember the other details? Yeah, yeah, I know. Remove the rings and bracelets and the jewelry in the bureau drawer. That's right. Our client wishes it to look like simple robbery. Don't worry. Everything is going to be okay. All right, then. Be sure to... Oh! Oh! Oh, how awful! How unspeakably awful! Your call, please. Operator, I, I, I've just been cut off. I'm sorry. What number were you calling? Why, it, it was supposed to be Murray Hill 70093, but it wasn't. Some wires must have got crossed. I was cut into a wrong number, and I, 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 I've just heard the most dreadful thing. Something about a murder. And, uh, operator, you'll simply have to retrace that call at once. I beg your pardon. May I help you? Oh, I, I know it was the wrong number, and I had no business listening, but these two men, they were cold-blooded fiends, and they were going to murder somebody, some poor innocent woman who was all alone in a house near a bridge, and we've got to stop them. We've got what to... What number were you calling, please? Well, that doesn't matter. This was a wrong number, and you dialed it for me, and we've got to find out what it was immediately. What number did you call? Oh, why are you so stupid? Well, what time is it? Do you mean to tell me you can't find out what that number was just now? 
I'll connect you with the chief operator. Oh, I think it's perfectly shameful. Now, look, look, it was obviously a case of some little slip of the finger. I, I told you to try Murray Hill 70093 for me. You dialed it, but your finger must have slipped, and I was connected with some other number. A- and I could hear them, but they couldn't hear me. Now, now I simply failed to see why you couldn't make that same mistake again on, on purpose, why you couldn't try to dial Murray Hill 70093 in the same sort of careless way. Murray Hill 70093, I will try to get it for you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Murray Hill 70093 is busy. I will call you with 20... Operator! Operator! Uh, Operator, will you answer me? Your call, please. Well, you didn't try to get that wrong number at all. I asked you explicitly, and all you did was dial correctly. I'm sorry. Uh, What number are you calling? Oh, can't you for once forget what number I'm calling and do something for me? Now, I want to trace that call. It's my civic duty, it's your civic duty to trace that call and apprehend those dangerous killers. And if you won't... I will connect you with the chief operator. Please. This is the chief operator. Oh, uh, chief operator, I want you to trace a call, a, a telephone call immediately. I don't know where it came from or who was making it, but it's absolutely necessary that it be tracked down because it was about a murder that someone's planning. A, a terrible, cold-blooded murder of a poor, innocent woman. Tonight at 11.15. I see. Well, can you trace it for me? Can you track down those men? I'm not certain. It depends. Depends on what? It depends on whether the call is still going on. If it's a live call, we can trace it on the equipment. If it's been disconnected, we can't. Disconnect? If the parties have stopped talking to each other. Oh, but, but of course they must have stopped talking to each other by now. That was at least five minutes ago, and it didn't sound like the type who would make a long call. Well, I can try tracing it. May I have your name, please? Mrs. Stevenson. Mrs. Albert Stevenson. Now, but, but listen... And your telephone number, please. Oh, Plaza 42295. But if you go on wasting all this time... Why do you want the call traced, please? Why? Well... Oh, no reason. No reason. I, I mean, I, I merely felt very strongly that something ought to be done about it. These, these men sounded like killers. They're, they're dangerous. They're going to murder this woman at 11.15 tonight, and I thought the police ought to know. Have you reported this to, to the police? Well, no, no, not yet. You want this call checked purely as a private individual? Yes, yes, but meanwhile... I'm sorry, Mrs. Stevenson, but I'm afraid we couldn't make this check for you and trace the call just in your say-so as a private individual. Well, I... We'd have to do something more official. Oh, for heaven's sake. You mean to tell me I can't report that there's going to be a murder without getting tied up in all this red tape? Why, it's perfectly idiotic. Well, all right, all right. I'll call the police. Thank you. I'm sure that would be the best way to... It's ridiculous. It's perfectly ridiculous. Oh. Your call, please. Uh, The police department. Get me the police department, please. Thank you. Bringing the police department. Precinct 43, Sergeant Martin speaking. Uh, Police Department, uh, uh, this is Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Elbert Smythe Stevenson of 53 North Sutton Place. I'm calling up to report a murder. I I mean, the murder hasn't been committed yet, but I I I just overheard plans for it over the telephone, over a wrong number that the operator gave me. I've been trying to trace down the call myself, but everybody is so stupid, and I I guess in the end you're the only people who could do anything. Yes, ma'am. Well, it it, it was a perfectly definite murder. I, I heard their plans distinctly. Uh, uh, two men were talking, and they were going to murder some woman at 11.15 tonight. Uh, she lived in a house near a bridge. Are you listening to me? Uh, 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 yes, ma'am. <laughs> and there was a private patrolman on the street. He was going to go around for a beer on 2nd Avenue, and, and, and there was some third man, a, a client, who was uh, paying to have this poor woman murdered. Uh, they were going to take her rings and bracelets and, and, and use a knife. Well, it's it's unnerved me dreadfully, and I'm not well. Oh, I see. Uh, 
When was all this, ma'am? Oh, well, uh, about eight minutes ago. Oh, I... then you can do something. You do understand. Uh, what is your name, ma'am? Uh, Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Albert Stevenson. And your address? Uh, 53 North Sutton Place. 53 North Sutton Place. That's near a bridge, the, the Queensboro Bridge, you know, and, and and we have a private patrolman on our street, and, and, and Second Avenue... And what was the number you were calling? Murray Hill 70093. But, but that wasn't the number I overheard. I, I mean, Murray Hill 70093 is my husband's office. He's, he's working late tonight, and I was trying to reach him to ask him to come home. I'm an invalid, you know, and uh, it's the maid's night off, and I hate to be alone, even though he says I'm perfectly safe as long as I have the telephone right beside my bed. Well, we'll look into it, Mrs. Stevenson, well, and we'll see if we can check it with the telephone company. But the telephone company said they couldn't check the call if the parties had stopped talking. I've already taken care of that. Oh, you have? Yes. And personally, I feel you ought to do something far more immediate and drastic than just check the call. What good does checking the call do if they stop talking? By the time you track it down, they'll already have committed the murder. Well, we'll take care of it, don't you worry. Well, I'd say the whole thing called for a search, a complete and thorough search of the whole city. Now, I'm very near the bridge, and I'm not far from 2nd Avenue, and I know I'd feel a lot better if, if you sent around a radio car to this neighborhood at once. And what makes you think the murder's going to be committed in your neighborhood, Oh, ma'am? well, I, I don't know. Only the coincidence is so horrible. 2nd Avenue and uh, uh, Patrolman and the bridge? 2nd uh, Avenue is a very long street, ma'am. I know. And you know how many bridges there are in the city of New York alone. Oh. Not to mention Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, and the Bronx. I know. How do you know there isn't some little house out on Staten Island on some little 2nd Avenue you've never even heard about? Oh. How do you know they're even talking in, about New York at all? But I heard the call in the New York dialing system. Uh, maybe it was a long-distance call you overheard. Oh. Uh, telephones it's... are funny things. Yeah. Look, lady, why don't you look at it this way? Supposing you hadn't broken in on that telephone call. Supposing you'd got your husband the way you always do. You wouldn't be upset, would you? No, I suppose not. Only it, it, it sounded so inhuman, so cold-blooded. Well, a lot of murders are plotted in this city every day, ma'am. Well, we manage to prevent most all of them, but a clue of this kind is so vague. I... Isn't much more use to us than no clue at all. But surely you... Unless, of course, uh, you have some reason for thinking this call was phony and that somebody may be planning to murder you. Me? Oh, well, no, I hardly think so. Well, I, I mean, why should anybody? I, I, I'm i alone all day and night. I I see nobody except my maid, Eloise, and, and she's a big girl. She weighs 200 pounds. She's too lazy to bring up my breakfast tray. And the, and the only other person is my husband, Albert. He's crazy about me. He just adores me. Wait, on me hand and foot has scarcely left my side since I took six, twelve years ago. Well, and there's nothing for you to worry about. Well, I... Now, if you'll just leave the rest of this to us, but we'll take care of it. what will you do? It's so late. It's nearly eleven now. We'll take care of it later. Well, will you broadcast it all over the city and send out squads and, and, and warn your radio cars to watch out, especially in suspicious neighborhoods like mine? Lady, I said we'd take care of it. I... Just now, I've got a couple of other matters here on my desk that require immediate attention. Oh, good night, ma'am, and thank you. Oh, yes. You, you idiot. Oh. oh, now why did I hang up the phone like that? Now you'll think I am a fool. Oh, why doesn't Albert come home? Why doesn't he? Oh. Your call, please. Operator, for heaven's sake, will you ring that Murray Hill 70093 number again? I can't think what's keeping him so long. I will try it for you. Well, try, try. Oh. I'm so nervous. I'm sorry. Murray Hill 70093 is busy. I will call you. I can hear it. You don't have to tell me. I know it's busy. If I could only get out of this bed for a little while. If I could if I could get a breath of fresh air or just lean out of the window or or see the street. Hello, Albert? Hello? 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 Oh, what's the matter with this phone? Hello, hello. Hello? Hello? 
Oh, for heaven's sake, who is this? Hello? 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 Operator, I don't know what's the matter with this telephone tonight, but it's positively driving me crazy. I've never seen such inefficient, miserable service. Now, 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 look. I'm an invalid, and I'm very nervous, and I'm not supposed to be annoyed. But if this keeps on much longer... What seems to be the trouble, please? Well, everything's wrong. I haven't had one bit of satisfaction out of one call I've made this evening. The whole world could be murdered for all you people care. And now, now, my phone keeps ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing every five seconds or so. And when I pick it up, there's no one there. I'm sorry. If you will hang up, I will test it for you. I don't want you to test it for me. I want you to put that call through, whatever it is, at once. I'm afraid I cannot do that. You can't? And why? Why, may I ask? The dial system is automatic. Oh. If someone is trying to dial your number, there is no way to check whether the call is coming through the system or not. Oh, th- unless the person who is trying to reach you complains to his particular operator. Well, of all this stupid... And meanwhile, I've got to sit here in my bed suffering every time that phone rings, imagining everything. I will try to check the trouble for check you. Check it, check it. That's all anybody can do. Oh, what's the use of talking to you? You're stupid. <gasps> I'll fix her... Of all late impudence. Oh, how dare she speak to me like that? How dare she speak to me like that? Oh. Oh. She's good there. Your call, please. Young woman, I don't know your name. But there are ways of finding you out. And I'm going to report you to your superiors for the most unpardonable rudeness and insolence that has ever been my privilege. Give me the business office at once. You may dial that number direct. Dial it direct? I'll do no such thing. I don't even know the number. The number is in the di- directory. Or you may secure it by dialing information. Now listen here, you... Oh, what the you... Oh, dear. Oh, for heaven's sake, I'm going out of my mind. Out of... Hello? Hello? Stop ringing me, do you hear? Answer me. Who is this? Do you realize you're driving me crazy? Who's calling me? What are you doing it for? Now stop it, stop it, stop it, I say. Hello? Hello? If you don't stop ringing me, I'm going to call the police, do you hear? The police! <laughs> oh, if Elbert would only come home. <laughs> oh, let it ring. Let it go on ringing. It's a trick of some kind. And I won't answer it. I won't. I won't, even if it goes on ringing all night. (laughs) Now, what's the matter? Why do they stop ringing all of a sudden? What time is it? Oh, where did I put that clock? <laughs> Five to eleven. Oh, oh, they've decided something. They're sure I'm home. They heard my voice answer them just now. That's why they've been ringing me. Why no one has answered me? Call that operator again. Oh, oh where is she? Why doesn't she answer? Oh, operator. Why doesn't she answer? Your call, please. Where were you just now? Why didn't you answer at once? Give me the police department. I'm sorry. Just a minute. Oh. Oh. I'm uh, sorry. The line is busy. I will call you. Busy? Busy? But that's impossible. The police department can't be busy. There must be other lines available. The line is busy. Oh. I will 
try to get them for you later. No, no, I've got to speak to them now, or it may be too late. I've got to talk to someone. What number do you wish to speak to? I don't know, but there must be someone to protect people beside the police department. A, 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 a detective agency. A, a... Uh, you will find agencies listed in the classified directory. But I don't have a classified directory. I, 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 I mean, I'm too nervous to I look it up. I will connect you with information. Know. Perhaps she will be able to help you. No, no. Oh, you're being spiteful, aren't you? You don't care, do you, what happens to me? I could die and you would <laughs> Oh, stop it! Stop it! I can't stand anymore! Hello? What do you want? Stop ringing, will you? Stop it! Hello? Is this Plaza 42295? Uh, yes, I'm... I'm, I'm sorry. This, yes, this is Plaza 42295. This is Western Union. Yeah. I have a telegram here for Mrs. Albert Stevenson. Yeah. Is there anyone there to receive the message? Y- y- yes, I- I'm Mrs. Stevenson. The telegram is as follows. Mrs. Albert Stevenson, 53 North Second Place, New York, New York. Darling, terribly sorry. Tried to get you for last hour, but lying busy. Oh. Leaving for Boston, 11 oh. p.m. tonight on urgent business. Back tomorrow afternoon. Keep happy. Love. Signed, Albert. Oh, no. Do you wish us to deliver a copy of the message? No. No, thank you. Thank you, madam. Good night. Good night. Oh, oh. oh no. No, I don't believe it. He couldn't do it. Not when he knows I'll be all alone. <laughs> It's some trick. It's some trick. Some thing. Some thing is trick. I know. Oh, I'm so nervous. Oh, what is the answer? Your call, please. Operator, try that Murray Hill 70093 number for me just once more, please. You may dial that number direct. Oh. You. Oh. Oh. Oh, he's gone. Oh, Albert, how could you? How could you? <laughs> oh, I can't be alone tonight. I can't. If I'm alone one more second, I'll go mad. I don't care what he says or what the expense is. I'm a sick woman. I'm entirely <laughs> This is information. May I help you? I I want the telephone number of Henchley Hospital. Henchley Hospital? Yes. Do you have the street address? No. No, it's somewhere in the 70s. It's a very small, uh, private and exclusive hospital where I had my appendix out two years ago. Uh, Henchley, H-E-N-C-A. Well, will you please hurry and, and uh, please, what is the time? You may find out the time by dialing Meridian 71212. Oh, for heaven's sake, I've no time to be dialing. The number of Henchley Hospital is Butterfield 70105. Butterfield 70105. Henchley Hospital, good evening. Nurses Registry. Who was it you wished to speak to, please? I want the nurses registry at once. I 
I, I want a trained nurse. I want to hire immediately for the night. I see. And what is the nature of the case, madam? Nerves. I, I, I'm very nervous. I, I need soothing and, and companionship. You, you see, my husband is away, and I'm... Has it been recommended to us by any doctor in particular, madam? No, but I really don't see why all this catechizing is necessary. I, I, I just want a trained nurse. I was a patient in your hospital two years ago, and after all, I, I do expect to pay this person for attending me. We quite understand that, madam, but these are war times, you know. I know that. Registered nurses are very scarce just now, and our superintendent has asked us to send people out only on cases where the physician in charge feels it's absolutely necessary. Well, it is absolutely necessary. I'm a sick woman. I'm I'm very much upset, very. I'm, I'm alone in this house, and I'm an invalid, and, and, and tonight I overheard a telephone conversation that upset me dreadfully. In fact, if, if someone doesn't come at once, I'm afraid I'll go out of my mind. I see. Well, I'll speak to Miss Phillips as soon as she comes in. And what is your name, ma'am? Miss Phillips? And when do you expect her in? I really couldn't say. She went out to supper at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock? But it's, it's not 11 o'clock yet. Oh. Oh, my clock has stopped. I thought it was running down. What time is it? Just, just 15 minutes past 11. What was that? What was what, madam? That, that click just now in my own telephone. As though someone had lifted the receiver off the hook of the extension telephone downstairs. Well, I didn't hear it, madam. Now, about this... But I, I did. There's, there's someone in this house. Someone downstairs in the kitchen. And they're, they're listening to me now. They're listening! Uh, I won't... I won't pick it up. I won't let them hear me. I won't let them hear me. I'll be quiet. I'll be so quiet. And they'll think... Oh, oh but if I don't call someone now, while they're still down there, wait, there'll be no time. going to murder me. And, and you've got to get in touch with... You... Oh. oh, there it is. There it is. Did you hear it? He's, he's put it down. He's put down the extension phone. He's, he's coming up. Ah. Oh, he's coming upstairs. Okay, give, give me the police department. The police department. Oh. Give me the police department. One moment, please. I will connect you. I can hear him. Oh, I can hear him. He's coming near me. Oh, I know it. Hurry. Hurry. Hurry, please. Police Department. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Must have got the wrong number. Precinct 43, Sergeant Martin speaking. Police Department, Martin speaking. Police Department, Martin speaking. Oh, Police Department? Police Department. I'm sorry, must have got the wrong number. But, but don't worry. Everything's okay. <laughs> So closes Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Agnes Moorhead. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, 
who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Mr. Donald Crisp and Mr. John Loder will star in the suspense play called The Extra Guest. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin, the musical director, and Lucille Fletcher, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. If you have been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so with five canaries in the room and the performances of Ona Munson as Anita, Osa Masson as Fifi, and with Lee Bowman as Ronald Denham, who tells the story, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. The trouble was, you see, that a whole apartment vanished. It's true. A flat disappeared straight out of that apartment house. And the dead man disappeared with it. No, I'm not crazy. And in spite of what they said, I hadn't taken too many drinks. You see, I was getting married to Anita in another two weeks. And Jimmy Westlake gave a bachelor party for me. Well, hang it, it's a situation that might have happened to you. The party was at the old Cap and Bells Club on Lower Fifth Avenue. And it wasn't a brawl. Jimmy Westlake was in the chair, I admit. But nothing could have been more quiet... More dignified. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. If those dopes over there will kindly get away from the piano and sit down at the table, I have another toast to propose. Excuse me, Mr. Westlake. Excuse me, please, sir. Yes, Uncle Cato, what is it? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Westlake, but you ain't gonna bust the glasses on this toast, is you? And why shouldn't we bust the glasses, Uncle Cato? Why shouldn't we bust the glasses? Oh, but Mr. Westlake, if you keep on busting the glasses, there ain't gonna be no glasses left. For well, that sad eventuality, Uncle Cato, we will simply start busting the plates. Isn't that fair enough, boys? Oh, look, Jimmy, don't you think you'd better tone the gang down a little? Be quiet, Ron. You're only the group. Yeah, I know, Jimmy, but... Gentlemen, I regret to tell you this, but the protesting voice you just heard was that of our guest of honor, Ronald Denham. Now, we all know Ron, and we all like him. But I am sorry to say he is not himself. Where now is the terror of nightclubs, the chorus girl's friend? I say it to his face, he is sober. But we like him just the same. Friends, guests, and bachelors, I give you the groom. Please, gentlemen, don't bust the glasses. Hey, come on, Ron. Come on, say a few words. That's right, Ron. Get out. Now, look, boys, I thank you for all the good words, and I don't want to be a wet blanket on the party, but it's nearly midnight, and I've got to get home early. Oh, don't you understand, boys? I'm a reformed character. Yeah, how's Fifi Latour? Yeah. I haven't seen Fifi for over years. She doesn't mean anything to me anymore. He thinks he does protest too much. Oh, now, look, I'm marrying the sweetest girl in the world, but Anita's a little, well, straight lace. Oh, you know how it is. What's more, there's my Uncle Rufus. Uncle oh, Rufus. Anita and Uncle Rufus. Uh, Anita and Uncle Rufus have apartments in the same building as I have. And what's more, they're on the same floor, and that's not all. 
Tom Evans, the fellow I share my hey, flat with. Hey, wait a minute. Where is Tom Evans tonight? Yeah. What's the matter with him? Tom works for Uncle Rufus, and he doesn't drink. Oh, he works for hey, Uncle Rufus. Hey, fellas. And he never fellas. takes a drink. Oh, he works wait. for Uncle Rufus. Quiet, you baboons. Quiet. He's a broker, and he's never in to drink. Now, wait a minute. Will, will you put yourselves in my place? My girl and my uncle and my best friend, Tom Evans, are all expecting me to come home from this party in an ash cart. Sure. And I'm going to fool them. Oh, and I have a heart, can't you? Uncle Rufus must be a pretty tough egg, isn't he? Oh, he's all right, but after his first million dollars, it went to his head. <laughs> Has he got any human weaknesses? Yes, he keeps canaries. Oh, oh no, not the kind of canaries you're thinking. I mean the kind that go tweet-tweet in cages. <laughs> oh, what's the use? What do you say, gentlemen? Shall we allow this pure in heart to wind his way home? Well, he's got a drink to the bride, though. That's right, Ron. Can you, as a chivalrous gentleman, refuse to drink to the bride? You can't, and you know you can't. Uncle Cato. Yes, sir, Mr. Westlake. Get a beer mug from the sideboard there. Fill it with champagne. Oh, now, wait a minute. Jim. Yeah. One more drink won't hurt you, Shirley. Just one little drink? Well, no, I suppose not. Fill it up, Uncle Cato. All right, I'll have one more drink, just in honor of the occasion. But that's all. Do you understand? That's absolutely all. <laughs> Yes, sir. 098 Park Avenue. Hey, 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 mister, mister. Hmm? Come on, wake up. Hmm? Uh, what's wrong? Well, you're home, mister. This is the apartment house. Oh, yeah. Yes, of yeah. course. All right, thanks. Here we go. Easy now. Uh, Are you sure you're all right? Yeah. Yes, I, I'm all right. I, I've been to a bachelor party. Yeah, sure, I know. Well, take it easy now. I can't see straight. The whole street's going around. The funny part is, I only had a couple of drinks. They, they must have put something in that last. Well, it's none of my business, Mister. But I wouldn't tell that to the missus if I was you. It's absolutely true. Oh, sure, sure. I know. I. Know. And I haven't got a missus, not yet. My word of honor, I'm a reformed character. I have nothing to do with any woman except Ronald Denham. As I live and breathe, it is Ronald Denham. Fifi Latour. Oh, Cherie, how good it is to see you. I look everywhere for you. I cry my eyes out. But I don't find you. What are you doing here? I live here, Fifi. I moved. I... Oh, you tried to get away from me, yes? Yes. Uh, no, no, I'm, I mean... Well, here's your money, driver. Night. Oh, good night, sir. It's a friend of yours, lady. You better take care of him. I'd take care of him. Yes, you bet you. My poor Ron. I forgive you this time. Because you've been under rascal dazzle and you need someone to take care of you. You live in this building yet? Yes, fifth floor, I... Oh, good. I take you to your apartment. No. No, no. You say no, eh? And why not? Because you mustn't go in there. Oh. Oh, there's an old woman. What? Oh, yes? Well, uh, yes. The, the fact is, Fifi, I'm going to get married. Married? Oh, no, for heaven's sake, Fifi, don't make a scene in the middle of the street. Oh, you break my heart, eh? Right in the middle of Park Avenue, you take my heart and you break it bang, bang. Fifi, please. Now I tell you what you do. You will take me to your apartment this very minute. No, definitely no. You will give me one cigarette and one brandy. You will tell me what this means. Oh, I warn you, by golly, I start screaming so they can hear me at City Hall. I can't do it, Fifi. All right, then I start screaming. No, wait a minute. Oh, of all the times in the world you had to pick this. Do I go alone, Cherie? Yes or no? Well, if I do take you, Fifi, will you promise to be good? Cherie, I am always good. You won't kick up a row or start banging at doors. Oh, if Anita heard of this. Anita? And who is she? Oh, never mind. I'm too groggy to argue. Come on. I remember going into that building. Dim religious light, deep carpets, an automatic elevator that you work yourself. I remember stepping into that elevator because the floor creaked. I remember pressing the button for the fifth floor. I took Fifi with me, and I took her into what the champagne told me was my own flat. Maybe you think that's funny, but it won't be funny much longer. Either the door of the flat was unlocked or my key fitted it. Anyway, I, I remember stumbling through the little hall inside, getting a light on, and into the living room. I remember sitting back in an easy chair, thanking the Lord I was home. Mind if I take my coat off, Cherie? Look, Fifi, couldn't you just go home? I 
want to talk to you, Cherie. And this is one very nice flat. I like it. Thanks a lot. You and Tom Evans, you have good taste in furniture. We didn't choose the furniture, Fifi. This girl of yours chooses it, I suppose? No, it comes with the flat. Oh, you mean? Well, these are furnished flats. They're all furnished exactly alike, except for the personal things you bring yourself. Like that picture on the wall behind me. What picture, Julie? The painting of the clipper ship over there. <laughs> but, Julie, <laughs> your eyes are funny and you cannot stay straight. There's no picture on that wall. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Why you jump up? We... We don't own any bronze bookends. And the, the lampshades are different. And, Fifi, we're in the wrong flat. Oh, well, then that explains everything. Explains what? It explains about the canary birds. What canary birds? When we first come in here, I think I hear a lot of birds sing. And I think, ooh la la, this is a funny taste for one denim and Tom Evans. But the... Uncle Rufus. Great Scott. Uncle Rufus. This uncle of yours, he keep canary birds? Yes, five of them. But this isn't his flat. I know his flat as well as I know my own. Where'd you hear the singing? Behind that door over there, where I point. That ought to be the door to the dining room. But, what was that? Oh, it is a car backfire. Maybe yes. Maybe no, unless they keep cars in the dining room. That was a gun. It came from the dining room. Yeah, I think so. Quick, let's get out of here. Oh, no, we don't. I've been pushed around tonight till I'm good and mad, and I'm just about crazy enough to find out what this is all about. You're not going to open that door. You just watch me. There's a light in that room anyway. Oh, you know. Look under the sill of the door. Not a very bright light, but... Ron, don't do it. Stand back now while I get the door open. Hmm. Dining room. But not Uncle Rufus. And... Five canary birds. Five canaries in cages, all in a line. Where in Satan's name are we? Oh, sure, I don't know. Whose flat is this? Who except Uncle Rufus would keep five canaries? I tell you one thing, though. And then I go out of here. Well? There's somebody watching us. Where? That swing door to the kitchen is partly open. But don't look. How the devil can I see it if I don't look? There's somebody standing behind it. I see the light shine on his eye. Quiet, Fifi. Hello there. Hello there. The door move a little more. He's pushing it. Oh, excuse me, sir. We didn't mean to barge in here. We're not burglars or anything like that. We got into the wrong flat, that's all. I want to apologize if we... Straight out through the door. Flat on his face. What's the matter with him? Why don't he move? I've got an idea, Fifi. It's because he's dead. He was a little fat man with eyeglasses and a spade-shaped beard. He looked foreign somehow. And there was a bullet hole over his heart. You ask me what happened then? I don't know. Fifi turned and ran. At least I think she did. I bent over the man to make sure he was dead. And then something hit me. As though it hadn't been enough of a nightmare already, I, I could hear that blackjack strike the back of my skull. And everything exploded. I couldn't get my breath, and I, I seemed to be swimming in dark water. The next voice I heard wasn't Fifi's at all. It, it was Anita's. And... Ron. Ron Denham. Oh. Oh, my head. Oh, Lord, my, my head. Well, I'm not at all surprised. What, what's that, Anita? I can't hear you. I said I'm not at all surprised. Of all the disgraceful, dissolute objects I ever saw. Anita... Where am I? Oh, darling, as though you didn't know. But, but I don't know. My head feels like a, like a printing press in full blast. Well, you're out in the main hall, dear, on the fifth floor, sitting on the stairs beside the elevator shaft. That's true. But how did I get here? Oh, now, really, Ron. I, I must have been carried here. That's it. By your drunken friends at the club? Well, I don't doubt it in the least. No, Anita. No, you don't understand. I left that party early. I was cold sober. But the low hounds wanted to see me come home in bad shape. So they could... So they, they put something in my glass. Oh, naturally, Ron. Whiskey or champagne? Oh, no, Anita. I mean a drug of some kind. I was dizzy when I got here. Just as I was getting out of the taxi, I met... Well, go 
on, dear. Whom did you meet? Uh, nobody, Anita. Nobody at all. I came up here to what I thought was my own flat, but it, it wasn't my flat. It was somebody else's. There were a lot of canaries singing and a dead man with a bullet hole in his chest. And... <laughs> well, this sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? Yes, dear, it certainly does. Yeah, but it's true. <laughs> oh, Ron, I suppose I've got to forgive you. I always do forgive you. Now run along like a good boy and sleep it off. Hmm? Listen, Anita, there's a dead man in one of these flats. A dead man? In which flat? Well, that's just it. I don't know. You're not saying it's on this floor. Yes, I definitely remember pressing the button for the fifth floor. Suppose you listen to me, dear. Now, don't make faces and rumple your hair. Just listen. There are only two other apartments on this floor. One is your uncle. It wasn't his. I'll swear to that. Well, and the other is mine. You don't think I'm hiding a dead man? No, it wasn't your flat either. Well, then where is it, darling? A whole flat can't vanish and take the dead man along, can it? No. But I'll tell you something else, Anita. I've seen that man's face somewhere before. Well, whose face? The dead man's. Thick eyeglasses, square black beard, something foreign about it. I, I've seen him, or, or I've seen his picture, or... Oh, Ron, please. What's wrong? It's the elevator. Somebody's coming up. Oh, please don't let people see you. Your hat smashed in and your tie's untied. And you, you look like nothing on earth. Well, look here, Anita. If it comes to that, what are you doing out in the hall in negligee and pajamas? Well, I wanted to make sure you got home safely. Ron, the elevator, it's Tom Evans and your Uncle Rufus. All right, I can take it. But your uncle can't. Now, don't say anything to him about this dead man. Promise me. Hold on, I've got it. Pierre Duroc. Who? Pierre Duroc. That's the dead man's name. He... And furthermore, Evans, you may have in this year of 1938, the prospect of a European war is so remote as not to be worth serious consideration. Excuse me, sir, but isn't that a little strong? Now, don't argue with me, Evans. No, sir. You may tell my secretary to... Look here. What's this? Well, now, look, Uncle Rufus. Oh, I can't stand any more of this. I'm fed up. Well, I don't blame you, my dear. Has this nephew of mine been annoying you again? Oh, no, of course not. But please don't pay any attention to him. He's... He's drunk. For the last time, I am not drunk. I just want to ask Uncle Rufus, before I go completely nuts, whether he hasn't heard of Pierre Duroc. What is that, Ronald? What'd you say? Pierre Duroc, the French millionaire. Well, what about him? He's the man who always deals in cash on the line. Spot cash, even if it's a million. I saw his picture in the paper. He's in New York to put through a business deal with you, isn't he? Oh, indeed, Ronald. Now, you show a commendable interest in my affairs. Well, that's what you want me to do, isn't it? Well, I believe Duroc does want to buy some property I own, but uh, he hasn't approached me and I haven't approached him. It's a bad business. Uh, why have you developed this sudden interest in Duroc? Because he's dead. Dead? Somebody shot him in a room full of canaries and then slugged me over the head. Do you believe me, Evan? If your uncle will excuse me, old man, I don't see any reason not to believe you. Where's the body? Well, that's the trouble. Ron claims he found it in a flat that doesn't exist. Listen. What's that? Oh, like somebody running upstairs in the devil of a hurry. Maybe it's a dead man. Well, as a matter of fact, it's the night porter. He's the one who can tell us. Tell us what? Well, maybe I did get off at a different floor, but that flat's got to be somewhere in this building. Pearson! Oh, just a minute. Pearson! I'm very sorry, sir. I can't stop now. Please stand aside. I've got to go upstairs and get the manager. Why, Pearson? Is anything wrong? Well, Mr. Evans... Speak up, man. Is anything wrong? It's the police, sir. We found a dead man in the palm garden downstairs. Now do you believe me? You will oblige me, all of you, if you remain quiet and allow me to deal with this. Uh, <clears throat> oh, what does this man look like, Pearson? Uh, he's a foreign-looking gentleman, sir. Never saw him before. He doesn't live in the building. Well, then how did he get to the palm garden? Uh, well, sir, that's what we don't know. He... Certainly wasn't there when I looked in half an hour ago, but I went back to the palm garden just by chance, and there he was in a wicker chair with the singing birds in cages all around him. Birds again? Oh, be quiet, Ronald. He'd, uh, he'd been shot, sir. The police think he was brought down in the service elevator from somewhere upstairs. Why do they think that? Because they found a revolver in that elevator and a little paper band of the, the kind that goes around banknotes. If they could tell where the dead man came from... You can tell us where he came from. Huh? I, I can, sir. Yes, you've been in most of the flats in this building, haven't you? Uh, I've been inside all of them, sir. Why? Well, would you recognize any given flat if I described it? Oh, well, uh, yes, sir, certainly, but... Uh... Well, then, for the love of Mike, think. Who lives in a flat with five canary cages in the dining room? Ronald, are you out of your mind? In case you don't happen to remember, you're describing my place. No, it, it was like your place, but it wasn't at all the same. Oriental prints on the walls. In the living room... 
uh, bronze bookends and, and bronze lamps, uh, dragon patterns on the lampshades. There was a, a queer kind of clock on the mantelpiece, shaped like a figure of Father Time. And what's the matter with you, Pearson? Uh, nothing, sir. But you, you're sure you saw all that? Yes, of course I'm sure. Why not? Because I'm sorry, sir, but you couldn't have seen it. What do you mean I couldn't have seen it? I did see it. Who lives in the blasted place? Nobody. Well, you mean the flat's vacant? Uh, no, sir. I mean, there, there's no such flat in the whole building. And that's the position I was in when the police took us down to that palm garden to see the body. I never did like the palm garden much. The big, dimly lighted hollow of a place. The bird cages beside the palms and an artificial goldfish pond in the middle. I liked it even less at three o'clock in the morning with a dead man looking at me from his chair. They sent us in one at a time. I was first to see the homicide squad officer. And there was Inspector Braddock, a big sleepy-looking hulk with a hat like a pirate, sitting on a bench throwing pebbles at that pond. Back would go his arm and a pebble would hit the water. Back would go his arm and a pebble would hit the water. And that's all you've got to tell me, Mr. Dunham? Yeah, that's all, Inspector. It happens to be true. Oh, I believe you. After all, son, we've got corroboration. Corroboration? From whom? From your other girlfriend, Fifi Latour. But Fifi's not here. She ran out of here as soon as Duroc's body fell through that door. Yes, but she didn't run far. A cop wondered why she was running and brought her back. Where's Fifi now? In that room there, talking to your official girlfriend. Oh, that's fine. That's beautiful. The one thing I didn't tell Anita. Why don't you wake up? Wake up? How? This isn't post office any longer. It's murder. And one of that gang out there shot Pierre de Rock. Are you serious? Serious. Sure, I'm serious. This is as clever and slick and mean a trick as ever went on the blotter. Pierre de Rock was one of the goats. You were the other. This uncle of yours is a fairly important guy, isn't he? Wait a minute. Just exactly what are you saying about the old man? I'm saying he gets lots of publicity. This hobby of his, keeping dicky birds, must be pretty well known. Yes, I suppose so. All right. So if Duroc came to visit your uncle tonight... You say, if Duroc came to visit my uncle. What you're forgetting, son, is that Duroc's an important man, too. He's a visiting foreigner. Capital letters. And the department's got to keep an eye on him. Duroc did go to visit your uncle tonight. And he was carrying $20,000 in cash. What are you intimating? Murder. Inspector Braddock. Yes, Sergeant. That crowd out there is raising cane, especially the old man and the French gal. Shall I let him in? Yeah, you can let him in now. Now... No, more than an hour. Sitting in an ante room without even hearing why we're here. I tell you, Evans, this is intolerable. It's all right, sir. They probably know what they're doing. You think so, my friend? But I still don't know why I'm here. How very interesting, Miss Latour. Such extreme absent mindedness. Or oh, perhaps wrong to tell you why you're here. Oh, listen, Anita, I can explain everything. Can you explain the disappearing apartment? <laughs> well, that's better. I'd like, if you don't mind, to have a little quiet here. Now, which one of you is Mr. Rufus Denham? I am Rufus Denham, sir. Rufus Denham of Denham and Company. Can there be any doubt whatever about that? No, but I thought I'd ask. I was just telling your nephew, Mr. Denham, that Pierre de Rock came here tonight to see you. To see me, Inspector? That's right. <laughs> I can only characterize that statement, sir, as a flat and downright lie. I've never met that man. I didn't say you met him. I said he came here to see you. De Rock wanted to buy some property from you, didn't he? Well... Well, I suppose he did. And Duroc always paid spot cash, didn't he? Yes, I believe so. Just one more question. I imagine you've got a secretary. Yes, naturally I've got a secretary. Miss Helen Gardner. What about her? Somebody posing as your secretary telephoned Duroc at the Metropolis Hotel and spoke to him in very good French. Well, Inspector, don't stop there. Go on. This person, pretending to represent Rufus Dunham, asked Duroc to come here with the money... And said they could settle the deal immediately. Don't you see the trick now? Don't you see Duroc was lured into a dummy apartment? A dummy apartment? What does this man mean? I'll tell you. All the flats are furnished exactly alike except for personal things. Pictures, books, lampshades, ornaments. Is that correct? Yes, of course it is. The murderer didn't dare use Rufus Dunham's real flat. But the murderer could always decorate an imitation flat. So that Pierre Duroc would be deceived when he saw... Five canary birds. That's it, son. But what was the idea? A very neat swindle. Look at Duroc's body now. Oh, I can't look at it. Look at his thick glasses. The man was half blind. 
The so-called secretary, disguised, would meet Duroc in an imitation flat. Duroc would hand over the money and get forged title deeds in return. When Duroc had gone, the flat could be put right again and no evidence left. But, uh, something went wrong, That's huh? right. Something went wrong. Duroc suspected. And it had to be killed. Right again. Inspector Braddock, who is the murderer? Can't you guess? No, I think I know how it all happened. Do you, Miss Latour? Well, it's very smart of you. Uh, this poor Ronald of mine, he is at a bachelor party. They do not think that he will be home until daylight. Um, but he gets reformed and come home early. He blundered straight into that flag in time to interrupt... In time to interrupt the murder, yes. Afterwards, when you were supposed to run away... But I did run away! Sure, Miss Latour, I'm admitting you did. Then why do you look at me as though I didn't? Afterwards, as I was saying, the murderer had to hit Ronald Denham over the head and drag him out in the hall. The rock's body was brought down here along with the canary cages that had been borrowed from here. And the dummy flat was set right again. Uh, just one moment, Inspector Raddock. I, I'm not disputing anything you say, but... Uh, well, sir, what's on your mind? The murderer. What about the murderer? Well, all this. Uh, wouldn't it have been much too heavy a job for a woman? Who said the murderer was a woman? Well, didn't you? I don't think I did. I said the murderer was somebody who planned to swindle. And you still don't see it, any of you, because you can't find the dummy flat. No, and I can't find it myself. That's one question you've got to answer here and now. Where in Satan's name did I go? Whose flat was I in? Your own. What? My, my own? Naturally. If you'd been cold sober, you might have made a mistake. But your instinct brought you home to your own flat. And the only possible murderer is the man who shares that flat with you. The man who thought you'd be away until daylight. The man who knows enough about Dunham's business affairs to plan this swindle against Duroc. Look out, Inspector Braddock! Grab him, Sergeant! Thomas Evans, I arrest you for the murder of Pierre Duroc. Good Lord! Well, that's about all there is to the story. Anita and I were married last week. She's a wonderful girl. I tried to talk her into our staying on in my old flat, but she said she just have to, had to have an apartment which didn't have such a habit of disappearing. But we're very happy. We agree about everything, don't we, dear? Oh, practically everything, darling. But I still don't think it was cute of Fifi to send up three dozen canaries for a wedding present. <laughs> So closes Five Canaries in the Room, starring Ona Munson, Lee Bowman, and Osa Masson. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, when our suspense play will be Last Night by Cornell Woolrich, and will star more of your Hollywood favorites. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight, Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our starring Hollywood cast of characters reads as follows for tonight. As Aunt Julie, one of those stark, severe, and terrifying women who is encountered ever so often along the grimmer outposts of the American countryside, Miss Agnes Moorhead. As Kara Linden, the girl who returned to a scene of childhood happiness and found terror living in the house, Miss Ellen Drew. As Paul, Carol's husband, who had his own ideas... As to the explanation of these strange events, Mr. Ted Reed. A first radio play by Larry Roman called Uncle Henry's Rosebush is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. 
And so it is with Uncle Henry's Rosebush and the performances of Agnes Moorhead as Aunt Julie, Ellen Drew as Carol, and Ted Reed as Paul. We again hope to keep you in suspense. I shall tell you the story exactly as it happened. There's no use pretending. I'll never forget, and I know I'll not awake and find it all a dream. It's real, and for the rest of my life, I shall know it's real. Paul was to have his first vacation since we were married. I suggested we visit my Aunt Julie and Uncle Henry, who had a small farm upstate. They had always been very kind to me. When I was a child, I used to spend my summer vacations with them. They loved children. I've often wondered why they never had any of their own. Some time ago, I had lost track of them. They had never seen Paul, and I was certain they'd like to. Paul said it would be fine. We'll surprise them, I thought. We were the ones who were surprised. <laughs> Just a few more miles, Paul. I remember this road. We used to hike along it going to the village. Ah, this country air is wonderful. Two weeks of green grass and wicker chairs. I can't think of anything better. How oh, you'll love Aunt Julie and Uncle Henry. They live alone, quiet and peaceful. It'd be quite a change from the city. Yeah. Now well, they must be happy together. Oh, they are, but they're lonely. Smooth lawns and orchards. And flowers. Uncle Henry planted huge rose bushes around the porch. Every night as I crawled in the bed, he used to bring me a rose. They're his favorite flowers. Ah, uh, vacation, here we come. Come on, car, let's go. Just around the bend. Here we go. There it is. Uh... Carol, look. My Paul. Are you sure this is the place? Yes, but all the weeds and the broken shutters. Looks as though it's been neglected for months. I don't understand. Perhaps it's deserted. But it can't be. It's their home. Well, come on. Let's go up and see. The dirt on this porch must be an inch thick. No answer. Nobody here. Look, Paul, over there at the end of the porch. The rose bush. Uncle Henry's rose bush. Why, it's trimmed and neat. It's the only thing that seems to be taken care of. Well, then somebody must be here. Maybe they can tell us what happened to Aunt Julie and Uncle Henry. Knock again. Mm -hmm. Someone's coming. Well? We're looking for a Mr. and Mrs. Connors. They used to live... Uh, why, Aunt Julie, I didn't recognize you. But it's me, Aunt Julie. It's, it's Carol. I wasn't expecting you. Oh, Paul's vacation. We thought we'd spend it here. Well, you've been asking for us for years. This is Paul, my husband. Oh, Carol's told me so much Why did you, you come? What? I said, why did you come? <laughs> well, aren't you glad to see us? Aunt Julie, something's happened. Nothing's happened. Oh, but it did. Tell me, Aunt Julie, we'll help. Well, of course we will. You shouldn't have come. Well, Carol, if she doesn't want us, let's go. No, Paul. This isn't like you, Aunt Julie. Something dreadful has happened, I know. Go, Carol, please go. Listen, if it's money, Aunt Julie, well, well we haven't got too much, but you're welcome to I it. tell you, nothing's wrong. Oh, but there must be. This house... You're is... her husband. I'm asking you to take her and go away. Oh. Come on, Carol. We're not wanted. Let's go. We're going to stay. Well, there you are. She's your niece, and you know how stubborn she can be. We're going to stay. Where's Uncle Henry? I say, where's Uncle Henry? He's... He's not here. But where is he? He's not here. Isn't that enough? Well, he's back. He won't be. Oh, but Aunt Julie... He won't ever be back. I stood there bewildered. Aunt Julie had run out of the room. Perhaps she was crying. I don't know. I just knew that Uncle Henry was gone. He had left her. It seemed strangely impossible. They'd always been so happy. So supremely happy that it seemed that the only thing that could separate them on this earth was death. <laughs> 
And now this. I couldn't believe it. Paul and I walked into the living room. It was almost as dusty as the outside. The curtains were dirty, the floor littered with old newspapers. The entire room showed the same signs of neglect as the outside. And when I recalled how neat Aunt Julie had always been with her housework, a feeling of apprehension crawled up my back. Frankly, I was fright, frightfully worried, and, and I could tell by the look on Paul's face that he was worried, too. I don't like it, Paul. There's something strange here. Yeah. I never saw a house in such a mess. It's not just the house. It's more than that. Something much more. I'm sure of it. Well, really, Carol, it's none of our business, don't you? Well, perhaps not, but you don't know Aunt Julie like I do. She'd never ask for help, no matter how much she needed it. I'm just not prying, Paul. It's... I suppose you're right. They've always been so kind to me, I've got to help them. But how can we, Carol? We don't even know what's wrong. They were always so happy together. Somehow I can't believe they've broken up. Something else has happened. Something terrible. And I'm going to stay until I find out what. <laughs> well, in that case, we'd better find a place to sleep. All well, the bedrooms are upstairs. Come on. Right. Well, look at the dust on the banister. I bet this place hasn't been cleaned in a month. Paul. Huh? Did you see the way she looks? Yeah. She, her face seems completely wrinkled with worry. No wonder I didn't recognize her. She seems much older and, and frightened. Well, do you think she's ill? I don't know. I wish I did. Wow, look at that hall. Gloomy and dirty. Uh, where do these doors go to? That one's to Aunt Julie's room, and this one's Uncle Henry's. The one across the way is the spare. I guess that's ours. Well, let's go in. What a mess. Well, might as well get busy cleaning. Yeah, there's nothing like a good round of house cleaning before supper. Paul, so long as Uncle Henry's not here, maybe we can take his room. It's got an adjoining door to Aunt Julie's, and then in case she needs us, we'll be near. Okay, it doesn't matter to me which room we clean. Let's go. Yeah, it's this one over here. Well, this is... Paul, look, it's, it's all clean and neat. Well, I'll be darned. It's the only clean place in the whole house. I don't understand. Every room is inches in dirt, except this one. The outside is completely neglected. Except the rose bush. Uncle Henry's room and Uncle Henry's rose bush. I don't get it. Well, look, uh, on the dresser there. Aunt Julie's picture and a pipe and tobacco. Why, that's Uncle Henry's favorite pipe. <clears throat> Drawers full of shirts, socks, underwear... Carol, if your uncle went away, why did he leave this? I don't know. Strange, but... What's that paper, Paul? Why, it looks like... It is an, an insurance policy for $30,000 payable to your Aunt Julie in case Uncle Henry dies. Carol, what this is... What are you is... two doing here? Uh, Aunt Julia. What I'm are here. you doing here? Well, we thought... Put that in your hand. An insurance... Get to me. But I... And keep out of this room. Well, we didn't need her. Her. I didn't know how to take this. Uncle Henry's pipe and all his clothes were still in his room. And yet, Uncle Henry was gone. And I couldn't understand why Aunt Julie got so angry. I looked to Paul for an explanation. I could tell he had something on his mind, but I didn't dare ask him what it was, and he didn't say. After Aunt Julie's outburst, we went back to the spare room and cleaned it. Then we washed and started downstairs for supper. Watch your step, Carol. These aren't the strongest-looking stairs. It'll be all right. Paul, what do you make of Aunt Julie's behavior? Frankly, Carol, I'm worried. I'm frightened. May as well admit it. There's something strange here that frightens me to death. Well, I, I don't think there's anything to be frightened of. It's just that... Oh, yeah, that's the last step. This way to the kitchen. Right. Oh, as I was saying, I, I don't think there's... Look out, Carol! <laughs> was close. That vase just missed you. A vase? Yes, and it was a heavy one. The one at the top of the stairway. Oh, it would have hit me. Yeah. Oh, Paul, I'm frightened. Look, coming down the stairs. What happened? The vase fell. Just missed Carol. Oh, don't worry about it. I didn't like the vase anyway. The vase? What about Carol? She almost got killed. Never mind, Paul. It was an accident. 
An accident. We were just going in for supper, Aunt Julie. Care to join us? Well, I... Come on, Aunt Julie. It'll do you good. Oh, all right. Here. You two sit right down. I'll have something prepared in a minute. I'm not very hungry. Oh, nonsense, Aunt Julie. I'll, I'll fix something that'll make your mouth water. <clears throat> you know, when, uh, when Carol and I get through cleaning this place up, it'll look just like new. Yeah? Sure, I... I think when Carol and I have a family, we'll take them to a farm. Really? Yes, yes. You know, this this place would be swell for children. Oh, uh, what do you mean? Uh, what? Oh. <laughs> what did I say? What's the matter? Uh, what's the matter with Aunt Julie? Uh, where is she going? I don't know. I, I was just trying to make conversation. Just talked about children on a farm, that's all. Oh, Paul, I'm frightfully worried. Do you think we ought to call a doctor for her? I don't know. We have to do something. She certainly doesn't look too well. But maybe she isn't really sick. What do you mean? Well, maybe if your Uncle Henry did leave her, well, then maybe... You mean you mean she still loves him? It's possible, but... Oh, but you don't really believe it. Oh, Carol, I don't know what to believe. I just know something's wrong. Uh-huh. I'm not hungry, Paul. Me either. Let's go for a walk. Maybe we can figure something out. Mm, country so peaceful and beautiful in the night. Yes, it is. I wish you could enjoy it. But I can. Oh, don't try to fool me. Your first vacation in years and you run into this. Well, we have to help her. Of course. But how? Yes, we don't even know what's wrong. She not only won't tell, but... We can't get near her long enough to talk to her. Suppose Uncle Henry really did leave her. He may have gone off in a huff. That would account for the clothes being here. Well, perhaps. And, and suppose she still is in love with him. Well, that would account oh, for... Oh, but even if that's so, could that make her feel so badly? Make her act like this? Not, not talking, neglecting everything? Everything except his room and his flowers. Yeah, I don't know. A woman's love is a strange thing. If you left me, I, I don't know what I'd do. Well, if that is the case, the thing to do is to make her forget. That won't be easy. No, I don't imagine it would be. But suppose... Suppose we take her to the city with us. Until she forgets. Well, we could ask her at least. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Let's go find her. Oh, hey, watch out. Oh. You almost fell. Oh, I tripped. I'm all right. Let's... Look, Paul. What? Look what I tripped over. It's a mound of freshly dug earth. Well, what's that for? Paul. Paul, it looks like a, a grave. Oh, don't be silly. Why, right, it's just a, a... Forget it. Come on, let's find Aunt Julie. Paul, that... Forget it. Say, uh... Oh, what's that building over there? That's the barn. There used to be a swell old cow there with a bell around her neck and chickens and ducks and all sorts of pets. Yeah, this must have been a happy place. It was, but now... Paul, standing by the barn, it's Aunt Julie. Come on, let's ask her now. Aunt Julie! What are you two doing? Following me? How could you? Well, it was a nuisance. Oh, Aunt Julie. Oh, a cat with its neck wrung. This was the first indication of Aunt Julie's ruthlessness. It seemed so unlike the Aunt Julie that I knew. She was always kind. There was no mistaking the anger in her eyes as she stood there in the dim moonlight, the strangled cat in her hands. She killed it, she said, because it was a nuisance. If she could do that, what else was she capable of doing? Paul and I went into the house. We went upstairs and put the finishing touches in our room and went to bed. I couldn't sleep. And as I watched the moon make its slow, solitary way across the heaven, I kept thinking, Paul and I are also a nuisance. Paul and I are also a nuisance. Toward midnight, I became drowsy and was just beginning to fall off to sleep when I, I heard footsteps in the hall. Paul. Oh. Uh. Anything? There. 
Garrett? Yeah. Must be Aunt Julie. What, what, what would she be doing up this time of night? I don't know, but who else could it be? Well, I'll go see. I'm coming with you. Now, quiet. Don't put on the light. I can't see. Yes. Now I can. It is Aunt Julie. She's walking down the hall. I think she's coming this way. Quiet. I think she's... What's she got in her hand? Looks like a scissors. Scissors? Yes. What would she be doing with... Carol, she's coming this way. <gasps> Get back in bed, quick. What? Get in bed. All right, now. Quiet. She went out. What? Yeah. She just looked in and left. You think she knew we were awake? I don't see how. Let's follow her. All right. Where's my other slipper? Oh, there. All right, come on. She's going downstairs. Come on and be quiet. I think she's going outside. Let's go. Not so fast. Give her a chance to get out. There she's out. Come on. a bunch of roses off the bush. She's taking them around to the back of the house. Come on. Here. Now get down behind this bush. <gasps> Look! Oh. She's going over to that... that mound and placing the roses on it. Oh! But, Paul, it... it looks like... A... Quiet, Carol. She's kneeling beside it. Now she's getting up and coming back. what that is. I got a pretty good idea. Uncle Harry's roses with Uncle Harry's grave. I said it. I said it without thinking. Of course, we had no way of knowing Uncle Henry was dead. We had no way of knowing that that was Uncle Henry's grave or that it was a grave at all. But at that moment, stooping behind the bush in the blackness of the country, we felt it. Not knowing why. Paul and I went back to our room as quickly and as silently as possible. Needless to say, we didn't sleep anymore. We just kept looking at each other, asking ourselves questions, trying to analyze our feelings. Soon we could see the streaks of dawn coming up over the treetops. And we slept the early morning hours trying to... We were trying to convince each other that our thoughts were ridiculous. Frankly, I don't think we succeeded... Finally, we decided not to mention it. To go on with the cleaning the next day as we'd planned. To make believe nothing had happened until we had proof. That day we spent cleaning and all day Aunt Julie was nowhere to be seen. Yet I had a strange feeling that something, someone was watching our every move. Toward evening, Paul and I sat down for a bite to eat. More coffee? Oh, thanks. I wonder where Aunt Julie is. I don't know, Carol. That's a strange aunt you've got. Yes. Oh, look. The window. What is it? Oh, oh I, I saw someone looking in. What? There's no one there now. But I, I'm sure I saw... Probably just a shadow. Oh, yes. Probably just a shadow. You're on edge, Carol. I'll be all right. Finish your coffee. I'll start cleaning the bathroom. You know, both work on the kitchen. And I'll take care of the downstairs. All right. Paul, you look worried. You know, this... This whole crazy business. Let's not talk about it. But putting roses on a... I'm sorry, Carol. It's you I'm really worried about. If, if something should happen to you, I'll never forgive myself. Well, nothing will happen. I'll finish your coffee. I'll start cleaning the bathroom. Okay, Carol. I won't be long. Mm -hmm. Well, it isn't too bad. There's the sink. Some hot water. There, that's it. A wash rag around the sink bowl. Oh! Oh! Dear, just 
the wind. Yes, I'm getting jumpy. Mm -hmm. This place won't be half bad when it's clean. Uh, the medicine chest. Clean the mirror. And shelves. Oh. Uh, Paul. Paul. What is it, Carol? Come here. What is it, Carol? What's the matter? Look. Here in the medicine chest. Where? It's a hypodermic needle. What would a hypodermic needle be doing here? Well, it's not likely to be here for nothing. Look, alongside of it. A bottle of... What's it say? I... I can't read it. It's awful looking stuff. Open the bottle. All right. That cork's in tight. There, there. Oh, nauseating. <laughs> stuff like that would kill a person. Paul, it's not a joke. I'm sorry, Carol. Do you really think Aunt Julie... I don't know. Oh, it can't be, Paul. It can't be. Maybe not, but we better find out. And quickly, Carol, there's one more thing to do. I'm going to see if that's really Uncle Henry's grave. I'm going to dig it up. Look, Paul, you can't. Don't you see? I have to. If it is, we're in danger. Oh, of course. I'm still not sure that falling vase was an accident. We have to find out about this business once and for all. Well, I'm coming with you. We walked out toward the back of the house. And through my mind flashed the succession of events. Neglected house, Aunt Julie's insistence that we leave, the roses, the grave, the insurance policy, and now the hypodermic needle and that infernal oil. All the evidence pointed to but one conclusion. I couldn't believe it, and yet, there it was, motive and method. And now we were going outside to dig up the last remaining evidence. Well, this is it, Cal. Sure you want to watch? I won't stay in this house alone. Look at the beautiful roses around it. Oh, hurry up, Paul. Let's get it over with. Okay. Here goes. I never thought I'd turn into a grave digger. Oh, this dirt isn't packed tight. Easy to dig. It's getting dark. Yeah. Well, oh, I think I'll run in and get a lantern. I'll be right back, Carol. All right. Every one of those lengthening shadows looked like a ghost. It gets dark quickly in the country. I was afraid, but I knew Paul would be back in a minute. I picked up the shovel and began to dig. Oh, there. That's better. I'm not so nervous. I'm working. Is that you behind me, Paul? Bring the lantern closer. Gee, it's so dark. Paul... Paul, I... Ah! Uncle Henry! What are you doing? What are you doing? Ah! What are you doing to my grave? Put it back. Put it back. Oh, my flowers, my beautiful flowers, my lovely roses. You've hurt them. You've hurt my roses, and I won't let you. I won't. I Keep won't. Away. Huh? Keep away, Uncle I won't Henry. let you hurt my roses. My sweet, delicate roses. Take your hands away. Take them. Oh. Oh. You broke them. Oh. You killed them. Stop it. I'm going to kill her Stop just it. as she did my roses. Stop it. Take my hands away. Henry. 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 Oh. oh, forgive me, Henry. I didn't mean... Are you all right, Carol? Yes. Oh, yes, I think so. What happened? What? Oh. Uncle Henry? Aunt Julie saved my life, Paul. And we thought she... Oh, can you ever forgive us, Aunt Julie? You didn't know. Then you didn't know. dead at all? No. No, he wasn't. Oh, I don't understand. He was living in his room all the time, Carol. I was taking care of him. When you two insisted on staying here, I, I kept him out of sight. Oh, I, I, I didn't want to kill him, and I had to. He would have killed Carol. Aunt Julie. Oh, if you only had left when I asked you to. But perhaps it's better this way. He never got that violent before. I could always take care of him. The hypodermic needle and the sedative calmed him when he got a little wild, but then... Then when I saw him strangle the cat, I knew he was getting completely out of hand. Yes, it, it's better this way. He's better off dead. <laughs> Poor Uncle Henry. The grave and the roses were a whim of his. <laughs> a whim. <laughs> and look, he fell right in his own grave. <laughs> Thank you. 
And so closes the story, Uncle Henry's Rosebush, starring Agnes Moorhead, Ellen Drew, and Ted Reed. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week, same time, when we will present another flowery bouquet of suspicion and terror and a homicidal maniac at large. Only this time, the roses will be white. The story will be The White Rose Murders by Cornell Woolrich. The tale of a killer who trademarked his crimes by leaving a white rose on the victim. Our star will be Maureen O'Hara. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, with Ted Bliss, the director, Bernard Herman, and Lucian Maho, with conductor and composer, and Larry Roman, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. This is the man in black. Here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star this evening is Miss Maureen O'Hara, whom you've seen rise to stardom in Hollywood within the short space of a year. Her performances in the 20th Century Fox production, How Green Was My Valley, then more recently in The Immortal Sergeant, and now currently in the RKO production, This Land Is Mine, have given her an enviable place in the ranks of America's new film favorites. Miss O'Hara makes her first appearance on our suspense stage tonight as the heroine of A Study in Homicidal Mania, The White Rose Murders by Cornell Woolrich, which is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with the White Rose murders and the performance of Maureen O'Hara. We again hope to keep you in suspense. He stood there waiting. He knew that presently they would come out of the second-rate dance hall, out into the dimly lit street. He listened a while and smiled as the orchestra played that tune inside. And then they came out, the two girls, and still he waited, close enough to hear what they were saying. Well, I'll see you at the office tomorrow, Sally. Oh, I don't know how I'll get up. It's after one o'clock. Six hours sleep. Oh, I'll be dead tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Me too. Oh, gosh. Uh, I gotta have at least eight hours or I'm no good at all. I wish I had someone to walk me to the bus. Four long blocks. I'll walk you down, Sally. Oh, don't bother. We go in different directions. What's no trouble? Really, I don't mind. Really, it's not necessary. In the narrow alley that divided the dance hall from an ugly office building... He stood smiling. Just a little inside the alley, he stood stiffly against the wall, his head back, eyes closed, arms straight down, and in his left hand, a white rose. Well, all right then, Sally. Good night. Good night, Joan. See you in the morning. hope I don't have to wait long for the bus. <gasps> Who are you? Keep away. Keep away from me. Let me go. Let me go. Oh. 
the girl is dead. Tenderly, the figure straightens her hair and gently places the limp body on the ground. Then he opens her clenched fist and carefully so that the thorns will not bruise her flesh. He places in her hand the white rosebud. Pardon me, my good man. Is it true that you are the famous detective Terence Riley? Huh? Oh, Jenny, I didn't see you come in. Well, now that I'm here, how about offering to buy a cup of coffee for the girl you're going to marry? You can never get up enough nerve to ask her. Oh, it's no use, Jenny. I guess we better call it quits. I'm just a dick on the homicide squad, and that's all I'll ever be. And I'm a rich debutante. We don't belong together. Oh, you've been reading too many of those romantic stories, Terry. What is it this time? What's wrong? Well, they call him the White Rose Killer. And he's got to be caught. It's a general demotion coming on if he isn't, and that's all I need to get back into uniform. Oh, don't worry, darling. You always look good in blue. Yeah. Just to match the way I feel. Tell me more about the White Rose Killer. What's he like? That's the stumble. He, he could be anybody. No one's ever seen him except the dead. And they don't talk about it afterwards. Just slips out of the shadows and kills and then slips back again. How many has he murdered? Four. And he's not through yet. It's going to be one of those chain things if he's allowed to keep on. Are you sure it's always the same one? Yeah. That part of it we're sure of. It's the same touch. The same way of operating every time. How do you know that? Well, it's a rose. A white rosebud. A death rose. Puts it into each victim's hand after he kills her. Her? Yep. It's always a woman. A young woman between 19 and 23. What's behind it? Do you have any idea? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. But here's what I figured out. You know what a rose stands for. Symbolically, I mean. Why, yes. It's, uh, it's the flower of love. The white rose, uh, the bud, has another meaning. Purity, loyalty, devotion. And especially it stands for a young girl. That's right. And that's about the way I see it. So maybe it's a double cross committed against our murderer by some young girl whom he worshipped and who betrayed his faith in her. You ought to be a detective, not me. <laughs> Thanks, darling. I've got a very fine teacher. Ah, <laughs> sweet. There's another thing. The murders were all committed near places where there was music, dance halls, and cabarets and the like. There's a song that brings back the original shock that, you know, gives him the final push over into the darkness. As far as we can figure out, it's the beer barrel polka. Well, how does he commit the murder? Is it always the same way? Mm, always. Strangulation between the hands, with the thumb into the windpipe to keep his victims from crying out. But isn't there anything else you know about him? No, that's why it's so hopeless. He's insane, of course. But there's only this one phase to his insanity. Probably perfectly normal in appearance and behavior. You can pass him on the street and even know it. Well, it's only when he sees someone vaguely like the girl he loved and hears that song... But the one defective wire in him is jangled and short circuit. But, Terry, the flowers, don't flowers tell you? He must get them somewhere you could trace. Well, we don't know where he gets them. Maybe he steals them or... Terry, what if you were the one to get him? Well, I mean a citation and a promotion. And then all the things that stand between us would disappear? We could get married? Well, the chances would be a lot better anyway. But what chance have I... Everyone in the department has been working their heads off for weeks and they've all failed. Uh-huh. Uh, Terry, what were the girls like? The ones he killed? Well, as, as I told you, they were all between 19 and 23. Their heights were pretty much the same, too. They're all tall girls, around five feet, six or seven. A little taller than you. And all dark-haired. How did they wear their hair? Why, they... Say, what is this? Oh, nothing, darling. Just, just interested. How did they wear their hair? Well, from what I remember, they uh, wore it sort of loose and curly down the back. I suppose each one had a resemblance to that long dead love of his. That's probably it. Well, anyway, that's how the record stands. And we're all waiting for it to happen again. I see. Uh, Terry, um, I'd like to go home now. I shouldn't have told you all that stuff. I've given you the creeps. Oh, come on, Terry. Take me home. <laughs> Later, 
Jenny stands by the window in her room, looking out, thinking. She doesn't move for a long time. Then suddenly, quickly, she goes to her closet and begins to rummage through her many pairs of shoes. Carefully, she picks one pair with three-inch heels. Five foot six and seven. Then she walks quickly to the dresser, opens a drawer, takes out a comb, and starts redoing her hair. Worn loose and curly down the back. Well, here we go. Edward! Edward! Yes, miss? Is the car ready? Yes, Miss Virginia. I've been waiting for you. Let's go before Mother sees me. Your mother's been looking for you, miss. I hope you didn't tell her. No, Miss Virginia, I didn't. Good. Come on, Edward. Where do you wish to go, Miss Virginia? The Starlight Dance Hall on Grove and Second Street. The Starlight, miss? Yes, Edward, that's the place. I wouldn't go there unescorted if I were you, miss. It's one of the worst places in the city. It has a very bad reputation. The Starlight Dance Hall, Edward. Very good, miss. Very good. Jenny walks slowly around the low light of dance hall, trying to make herself conspicuous. A tall figure leaning against a pillar watches her intently as he idly smokes a cigarette. He doesn't seem to belong there. His clothes don't have the nattiness of a dance lover. Jenny pauses not far from him. Deliberately, he throws his cigarette on the floor, steps on it, and slowly walks over to her. Hello. Oh. Oh, hello. You're not with anyone, are you? Oh, no, I, I'm alone. I thought so. I've been watching you all the time. Have you? I haven't seen you dance yet. I don't know anyone here. How about dancing with me, then? All right. Come on, let's go out on the floor. Do you come here often? No. I never go to the same place twice. You don't? Why? I'm always looking for new places. I'm restless. Do you find the faces you're looking for? Listen. Listen to that song. I like that. I like it very much. Yes, it, it is a nice song. You know, you remind me of someone I used to know. I'm trying to think who. I do? Yeah. Do you mind if we stop dancing and go over and get a drink? No. Uh, let's go. Oh, look. They sell flowers here. Yes, I see. I'll get you some. What kind would you like? Oh, uh, any kind. Uh, you pick it out. All right. Let's see. There's something kind of innocent and young about you. Different from most of the girls that come here. I think... Yeah. I know just the flower that would suit you. May I have a white rose, please? Certainly. Here you are. Thanks. Keep the change. Here you are, beautiful. A rose for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. How about you and me getting out of here? I know a nice place just two blocks away. Uh, a nice place? Sure. This is a dive. Can't we stay here a little longer? It's intermission now. They won't play again for ten minutes. Come on. But I, I, I like it here. Let's stay a little while longer. Well, then let's get down for some air. We can come back in a few minutes. Come on. But... We'll be back before the music starts. Oh, you're hurting my arm. Am I? I'm sorry. <sighs> Fresh air smells good, doesn't it? It's so dark here. Let's go back. You're not scared, are you? Oh, no, it's... It, it, Let's walk down this alley and back. Well, please, please. No, you Let me go. Thanks. That's a lovely necklace, beautiful. Why, you're just a cheap... Shut thing. up. All you wanted was my necklace. So long, beautiful. Look out. What's the matter? Behind you, look. Holy... She's dead. A girl. Murdered. With a white rosebud in her hand. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, Jenny, happened again last night. Just like the other time. A girl strangled in an alley and a white rose in her hand. Any news of the killer? No. He might just as well float through the air for all the trace he leaves. He must have brought the flower upstairs in the dance hall. He must have been there earlier, bought it, and saved it. No, there was only one rose sold up there all night. And to a man who had a different girl with him. We had the flower girl. How did you know that they sold flowers there? I didn't tell you. Well, I... I must have read it somewhere. You couldn't have. It wasn't in any of the papers. No details were given, just the statement that an unidentified body was found. Well, I... Well, I just imagined that they'd sell flowers in a place like that. Well, I'm glad you don't go near those dance halls. Why, with this nut running around loose... Oh, don't bother about that. We'd better catch this killer. And fast. Where do you get this wee stuff? To hear you talk, you'd think that you were on the case, too. Wouldn't you think so? To hear me talk? Again, Jenny tours the low dives, hunting for the white rose killer. Her search carries her to the waterfront. And as she walks past each dingy bar, she listens to the jukebox music. A little after midnight, she passes a dirty windowed saloon. The thin music catches her ear. She pauses and listens, her eyes alive for some sign, some indication of the person she's looking for. Then suddenly her body becomes rigid as her eyes fall upon a figure huddled in the shadows. Someone's watching me. Slowly she starts to walk up the street. Behind her, the heavy tread of a man's footsteps keep pace with hers. It's a quiet tread, unhurried but deliberate. For several blocks, it keeps the exact distance. Jenny starts to walk faster. I've got to know if he's really following me. The man quickens his pace. Jenny starts across the street. The man follows. She's sure now, sure that the man is following her. She fumbles for something in her purse. Her hand closes around a gun. If he tries anything, I'll shoot. You in any trouble, lady? Oh, no, officer. It's it's all right. You scared him away. Scared who away? Oh, just a man who wanted to bring me flowers. That's all. Well, he brought you one anyhow, lady. What do you mean? Right there on the ground, right by your feet. A white rose. Coffee, Mabel. Sure, coming right up. Here you are. Terry. Terry. Hello, Jenny. Sit down. Thank you. Say, what's the matter with you? Look, darling, read the gossip column in this paper. What daughter of a socially prominent family sat way about a detective and waits for him outside the station house in her limousine every night? Private chauffeur and all. But Mama says no. That's not so funny. Oh, they held a big family war council over me just now. Indian powwow, feathered headdress and everything. They did, huh? Well, what did they decide? Oh, I was asked to give my word that I wouldn't see you anymore. I refused, of course, so I'm to be exiled. Where to? Our summer home. It's just a few hours out of town, but I'll be there all by myself. Just with Mrs. Crosby, the housekeeper. Oh, maybe they're right. Why don't you listen to them? Are you on their side, too? No. When are you leaving? Right away. Edward is driving me out. I just slipped out to let you know. Here's the address and phone number of the place in case you want to reach me. Don't lose it. I won't. Well, what's new and exciting about the White Rose Killer? Our famous lover of flowers? <laughs> We're still trying to track him down. I suppose I'll go looking for him at the flower show that's just opened. Oh, a flower show just opened? Yeah. Well, uh... 
Goodbye now. I'll be seeing you. What uh, floor is the flower show, please? Third floor, miss. Three, please. Third floor. Where's the rose display, please? Uh, to your left, over there. See where the man in the gray coat is? In the gray coat? Oh, yes, thank you. They are lovely, aren't they? Oh, you... You startled me. I... I'm sorry. I was just admiring the roses. Oh, yes, the nicest flowers here. I, I just can't keep my eyes off them. Yes, you, you can feel that way about some flowers. Now, that's the way I feel about white roses. Have you been here long? I really don't know. I suppose so. You, you see, I've come here every day since the show opened. I like to be near the roses, the white roses. Those big ones are nice. No, I, I like the little ones best, the little tightly curled rosebuds. They're so little and innocent. Oh, well, I, I really better be going. Are you going down? Yes. Down, please. Here, miss, I... I took a rose for you. Thank you. It's lovely. Would you... Would you care to have a drink with me? Why, yes, thank you. I know the little place a block or two down there. They have nice music. We'll go there. All right, whatever you say. <laughs> This is it. Where's the music? A nickel in the jukebox does it. Any special song you'd like? No. Uh, go ahead and pick one. Okay. There we are. Oh, that's my favorite song. Reminds me of a, a girl I used to know. Oh, uh, excuse me. I, uh, I want to powder my nose. I'll be right back. Do you mind? No, of course not. Seven police precinct. Sergeant Thomas speaking. Hello, I is Terry Riley there? Uh, just a moment, I'll see. Please hurry, it's important. No. Sorry, miss. Terry Riley's not here just now. Oh. Uh, will you, uh, will you tell him... Tell him that I can't keep that date with him. Goodbye. <laughs> Do you always go to the phone booth when you want to powder your nose? Why, I, uh... Well, I, I had to make a call. Uh-huh. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to leave you. Oh, wait. Uh, let me come with you. I'm sorry, miss, but I've got other things to do. Oh. What's the matter? That car. Someone that knows me. Let's get away from here. That's just what I'm going to do. So long, lady. Wait, wait. Please don't go. Miss Virginia. Miss Virginia. I'm sorry, Miss Virginia, but I must speak to you for a minute. Oh, Edward, what do you want? I'm sorry, miss. You'd better come with me at once. I've been looking for you everywhere. Your mother's been taken seriously ill. Mother? Where is she? She's out at the country place, miss. I drove her there shortly before dinner. She wanted to pay you a surprise visit. Oh, I believe the shock of not finding you there upset her, miss. Is she very bad? She had the doctor with her when I left. Mrs. Crosby has gone away for the day. Your mother needs you, miss. Well, let's go. Hurry, Edward, please. Right, miss. Where is Mother Edward? In her room, miss. You'd better hurry. Mother? Mother? It's Ginny. Is the doctor in there with you? Mother! Why, there's no one here. The room's empty. The bed hasn't been touched. Edwards, what are you doing? Merely playing a song, miss. A favorite of mine. Uh, a favorite? Yes, Miss Virginia. Where's Mother? She's in the city, miss. You lied to me. I'm afraid I did, Miss Virginia. Why are you locking the door? You know why, Miss Virginia. It, 
It can't be. You're not the... The White Rose Killer? But you see, I am, Miss Virginia. Driving you and your family around day after day. Sitting there right in front of you all the time. It was amusing to watch you hunting for me. Hunting for someone you saw several times a day. It can't be. You're not insane. Of course not. Who said I was? Edward, you know I'm not the girl who betrayed you. Yes, I know that. Well, then unlock the door and let me out. Please, Edward. I've killed five times. I've never regretted it. I'm going to kill you, Miss Virginia. Why, Edwards? Why? Because you've been so clever. Too clever. You made yourself look like her, the girl who deceived me. I could have killed you the day you first went out looking for me. But I had to be careful. Oh. I almost caught you that night at the waterfront. The night I dropped the white rose when that police car came. Edwards, I... I... I've never done you any harm. Your sweetheart, Terry... He loves you, doesn't he? Yes. That's good. Because now you won't be able to deceive him like my girl deceived me. Keep away, Edward. Keep away, or I'll... <laughs> you oh. thought you'd use your gun, eh? Well, don't think I was fool enough to overlook that. I took your gun out of your purse. It won't do you any good to kill me, Edward. I didn't have anything to do with... <laughs> no. And you're not going to have a chance to break another man's heart like she broke mine. Jenny! Jenny! Where are you? Terry, Terry! It won't do you any good to call to him. He can't get in here without breaking down the door. Keep away from me. Terry! It will be too late then, because I'm going to kill you now. Jenny, where are you? Terry! Yes, let me get my hands on that pretty white throat. Oh, keep away. Keep away from me. Terry! 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 Jenny, are you all right? Yes, Terry, I... I'm all right. Oh, Take it easy. Here. Sit down. Oh, Terry, I was so scared. There was nobody here but Edwards and I. How... How did you know where I was? Oh, it was simple. You were supposed to meet me at the coffee shop. You never broke an appointment, and when you didn't show up, I called the number you gave me. You told me the housekeeper was here all the time. And when there was no answer, I got suspicious and came down. Besides, when I got a message down at headquarters that you had to break a date with me, I knew something was wrong. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, I... I'm, uh... Terry! Look! On the floor beside Edward. A white rose. Must have fallen out of his pocket. That was meant for me. Oh, Terry, it... It's all crushed. Yeah. Crushed and dead. Just like the white rose killer. So closes The White Rose Murders, starring Maureen O'Hara. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who, speaking for Columbia, hopes you have enjoyed Miss O'Hara's performance and our play. Next week, because of a special broadcast of the All-Star Baseball game, suspense will not be heard. But again the following week, we will be back with another play on this series and more of your Hollywood favorites. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Bernard Herman and Lucien Marowick, conductor and composer, and Cornell Woolrich, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Heading our starring Hollywood cast tonight is Mr. Laird Kriegar, who will be seen shortly in the 20th Century Fox production of one of the great suspense stories of all time, The Lodger. Tonight, Mr. Kriegar appears as a cynical gentleman who made an unusual bet with death. With Mr. Kriegar is a cast of the screen's most distinguished and characteristic players, Miss Helen Vinson, Mr. Walter Kingsford, Mr. George Coloris, Mr. Harold Huber, and Mr. Ian Wolfe. Here to bring us the suspense play called The Last Letter of Dr. Bronson. And so with the performance of Laird Kriegar as he writes for us this last letter of Dr. Bronson. And with the performances of, in the order of their appearance, Walter Kingsford, Ian Wolfe, Harold Huber, Helen Vinson, and George Coloris, we again hope to keep you in. Suspense. My dear Dr. Mosher, forgive me if I dash this letter off rather hurriedly. There are but a very few minutes remaining for me. The few minutes between now and midnight. You have always protested my fascination with the subject of death. It irked you to hear me discuss the latest electrocution or hanging. I remember your sarcasm the day you found me staring down from the top of the Empire State Building speculating on the thoughts of a man about to leap from that pinnacle. You alone, Moshe, know how this fascination led to my latest experiment. I should say, my last experiment. I promised you a complete account of it all. Here is that account. First of all, let me recall a conversation which we held here in my study a little over a year ago. There you go again, Bronson. Death and murder. Really, you're unhealthy. Please, you're... answer my question, Moshe. Why do men behave as they do? What keeps them from breaking loose? Why Why don't they kill one another as animals do? Why, because, uh, because they aren't animals. But my dear Moshe, being neither vegetable nor mineral, they must be animals. But what I mean that is... That you uh... do not know the answer. I do. So? I have been studying the question for some time. And I've concluded that there are five basic checks which serve to restrain man from murdering his fellow man. Oh, really, Bronson? The obvious corollary is that murder occurs only when some stronger drive overrides these five basic checks. Oh, you make it sound very simple. It is simple. And what are these five basic checks? Well, I'm not prepared to reveal the outcome of my study as yet. I must put my theory to the test. Uh, that would seem to be a difficult undertaking. Difficult, yes. But intriguing. Oh, well, I take it you're about to embark upon another of your experiments. Correct. Bronson, why must you keep on? These studies invariably bring you some physical, or what is more dangerous, some nervous disaster. And in turn, your handsome bill for putting me in shape to conduct the next. Sooner or later, you will experiment yourself into a position beyond my power to aid you. Oh, let it be later, then. Meanwhile, I shall continue to pursue my sole interest in life. And how do you propose to conduct this, uh, this restraint from murder experiment? Well, a murder is composed of four elements. The murderer, the motive, the opportunity, and the victim. My first step will be to select five men, each of whom will be restrained from murder by the particular check that I'm testing on him. That's no easy task. By no means. It will require an extensive search. But having found my men, I must then supply each with a motive. Greed, revenge, jealousy... I see, and, and your next step must be to give each man an opportunity. Precisely. An opportunity which precludes all checks but the one being tested. Well, not knowing what your checks are, I can't help you there. Well, that'll be relatively simple. And finally, I must supply an intended victim. And you'll ask this victim to face five men, each standing to profit handsomely by murdering him? Correct. His only chance of survival being the correctness of your theory of checks? In all five instances? Yes. And do you imagine you will discover a man with such utter confidence in your reckoning? There is one such man. Who? Myself. Bronson, this is folly. No, no, sir. I never hesitate to risk high stakes on a sure thing, not even my life. Now, look here, Bronson. You're a doctor yourself. You told me to speak to you like a Dutch uncle. Now, as your physician... I, I haven't advise... consulted my physician. But you will take precautions... Provide yourself for emergencies. I tell you, there's no danger. Oh, well, 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 well. Well, when will you begin your experiment? Well, I suppose in about 
Well, why wait? Why don't we begin right now? Moshe, I invite you to kill me. What? There's a revolver right here in my desk. And I want you to take this revolver... Oh, you're, 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 you're joking, Bronson. What, what possible motive could I have for murdering you? Motive? Uh, why, we're known to be associated rather closely in our work. You'll come naturally into my entire practice. I'll put that in writing. Why, it's, it's, it's preposterous. Why? Why won't you kill me then, Moshe? Why, there, there, there are dozens of reasons. In the first place, I'd go to the electric chair for it. Thank you, Dr. And... Moshe. You've given me an admirable illustration of the first and most obvious of the five checks in my theory. Man refrains from murdering his fellow being because he himself will be killed by law. Remember, Moshe? Remember how it began? That was more than a year ago. Yes, I've spent more than a year in selecting my other four subjects. Because the checks I wanted them to prove were not so simple. In selecting my people, it was necessary that I cultivate the friendship of each. So that when the time should come to confront him with my proposition, I should be certain of how he would act. first of my four potential murders was a clerk named Totten. Totten was badly in debt, his wife in the hospital about to undergo an expensive operation, and he was a deeply religious man. We went to church together on Sunday evenings at St. Luke's, right around the corner from my apartment. One Sunday evening after the service, I asked him to come to my apartment, and we talked as we walked along. You know, Dr. Brunson, I was talking about you to my wife the other day, before they took her to the hospital. I was saying what a great comfort it was to be with you these Sunday nights. Now, come, Mr. Totten, you embarrass me. No, I mean it. In the world today, too many people seem to feel that they no longer need their God. Yes, but their lives are void of the great thing you have in your face. The church is a great comfort to me. And I do need something to cling to in times like these. Uh, Mr. Totten, uh, you could make rather good use of $5,000, couldn't you? It isn't like you to make fun of my poverty. No, I'm quite sincere. You know what even $100 would mean to me? And at present, more than ever. Yes, with your wife's misfortune. Oh, isn't this your apartment we're passing? Oh, I want to go in the sideway. We shall be unobserved. Unobserved? Oh, you'll understand presently. Please, come into my study. Ah, here we are. And now if you'll take this chair opposite my desk. Ah, thank you. Mr. Totten... You said that even a hundred dollars would be a great help to you. Here in my desk, I have this package containing five thousand dollars. Well, what could I do for you that would be worth all that money? Let me explain. My doctor called on me yesterday and he told me... Well, to be quite frank with you, Mr. Totten, he said that I was slowly going mad. Oh, no, that couldn't be. I'm quite all right at present, but it's only a matter of time and I'd rather not have to face it. I believe you can understand that. But there must be something you can do knowing in advance. There is. And I want you to help me. I I don't understand. Put on these gloves. Take them. But why? As soon as you have them on, I shall hand you this paper knife. Notice how very sharp it is. I grip it firmly, thus, and clearly impress my fingerprints on the handle. Finally, here on the desk, I am leaving this note. Explaining that I have committed suicide. Suicide? When the knife is in your hand, I want you to drive it into my heart. Then you may leave by the same way we came in. You will be quite unnoticed. And with the $5,000 in your pocket. You can't mean this. But I do. You see, I don't have the nerve to... Well, I can't quite make the final move myself. You would greatly oblige me. And with the $5,000, you will be able to give your wife the treatment she needs. What do you say? You can't die yet. You're not ready. Won't you have me wait until I've gone mad? You can't take the matter of life and death into your own hands. I'm not asking you to pass judgment upon my actions. Whether I wish to live or die is my own concern, and my mind is resolved. Is that clear? I'm sorry for you. I'm merely asking you to do something for which I will pay you very well. You will, of course, be killing me. But if you could realize what life would be like for me, otherwise... I'm very sorry, but I can't oblige you. If it's the law you fear... No, it's not that. You seem to have arranged that perfectly. Then 
What is it? I'm an honest Christian, and I thought you were, Dr. Bronson. If you don't understand why I can't do this monstrous thing, I suggest you look up the Sixth Commandment. Good night. So, Moshe, my second point was proved. Man refrains from killing because it is against his religious principles. The hands of the clock now read 15 minutes to midnight. One quarter of an hour in which to complete this report. My third proposition called for an entirely different sort of man. In fact, the very reverse of Totten. A man who believed neither in heaven nor hell. And also a man of little intelligence. It required careful search. For a number of nights, I frequented the rougher district of the city. At first, I had no luck. Then one night, I came upon my man very unexpectedly. I was walking along one of the darker streets. There was no one in view. Oh! Oh, oh. He was slumped down beside an ash can. He'd been shot in the chest and left arm, severing an artery. He was bleeding profusely. I tore off his shirt and made a tunic for his arm. Oddly, no one came into the alley to investigate. Never mind me. Get away. Was this a gang shooting? What do you think? I think you're going to the hospital. No. They'll blab to the cop. Come on, I'll help you to your feet. Uh, I ain't going. You'll die, man, if you're not treated quickly. I ain't going. I tell you, no cop's gonna... No cop's... They ain't gonna... Gonna... Uh. His name was Matt Doyle. I visited Doyle in the hospital almost every day. Several months later, I decided to put him to the test. I found Doyle in one of his hangouts and brought him to my apartment. Hey, this sure is a fancy roost you got yourself, Doc. <laughs> I find it very pleasant. May I have a cigarette? Mm, thanks. Doyle, how many men have you killed? That's all right, Doyle. I understand. Now, suppose we get down to business. Yeah. I've been wondering what you want me for. I want you to do something for me. And I'm going to give you $5,000 to do it. Will you do what I ask you? For five grand? <laughs> Spell it. I want you to put on these gloves so there won't be any fingerprints. Then I'm going to hand you this knife and you're going to kill me with it. Huh? I've arranged everything so it will appear to be suicide. You nuts. Not yet, but I will be before very long. That's why I want to die. All you have to do is stab me and slip out with this 5000 Is this on the level? Absolutely. This want of dough is mine if I kill you? That's right. And nobody will know I've done it? No one. These gloves is kind of big for me. That's all right. They'll do. Yeah. Yeah. Want me to put on the other one? It's safer. Yeah, I guess it is. Gee. What is it? I was just thinking. Five grand. Ah, oh, the boss is going to pay me more than that. I mean, I never got... I skip it. I want you to understand exactly what you're doing, Doyle. Without any justifiable cause, merely for the sake of money, you are going to murder me. You understand that? Yeah. You've been hired to do this before? Yeah. I suppose it don't hurt to talk about it now that you're going to... But you've never killed a friend, have you? Well, yeah, I have. Anyway, they was my pals till they got in the boss's way, but when the boss would say slip it to a mat, then they was just another job to me. But there's a little difference in this case, Doyle. I saved your life. Yeah. I don't know. What? I don't know. Nope. I can't do it. But I thought you said that Yeah, you... take these gloves. Afraid of the law? No. What's the matter, then? Is it because I'm your friend? That's more than that. I can't bump you off, even if you want it. It would be an act of true friendship. I ain't so sure. When a cat has fits, you put it out of its misery, don't you? That's what I want. Oblivion. Peace. Sorry, Doc, I ain't the guy. It's like you said. You saved my life, so that's that. I'm... Sorry, I wish you could help me. Oh, me too, but not that. Now, if you got some other punk you want to <laughs> care of... There's no one. Thanks, just the same. Oh, don't mention it. There was my third proposition. Man will not kill fellow man if a sufficient degree of gratitude has been invoked. Even a professional killer and one of the lowest examples of human life, such as Doyle could not bring himself to murder his benefactor. My
my next subject was altogether different in temperament. With Judith Ainsley, I used a special technique. I first encountered Judith Ainsley when I operated on Barrett Sheffield, the actor. You will recall that Sheffield was brought to the hospital with a lung abscess. As I prepared, the nurse standing beside me was greatly agitated. Oh, what? This is the nearest Morphin house. Listen. Miss Ainsley, another hemostat, please. But he's getting blue. Doctor, do you think you're really sure that he's fine on it? Miss Ainsley. I'm sorry, Doctor, but it's... Doctor, Doctor. Quickly, quickly, caffeine. Quickly! Stethoscope. Here he is. Well, that's that. Yes. Miss Ainsley, what's the matter with you? You've been acting strangely all through this operation. You killed him. You killed him. You shouldn't have gone ahead. You know that. I warned you. I shall see to it, Miss Ainsley, that you are never assigned to one of my cases again. What's the matter with you, anyway? Have you never seen a pulmonary before? Or does it upset you to see a handsome actor like Barrett Sheffield die? Yes, it did. Oh? Yes. We were going to be married next week. <laughs> I ever saw hate. Cold, undying hate. It was in that girl's eyes as she turned and left the operating room that day. I had made the most implacable enemy of my life. As I come to my third check, dear Moshe, it suddenly occurred to me that Judith Ainsley was the perfect subject. One day at the hospital, I inquired about Miss Ainsley and learned that she had done four years of medical and was now interning at Cedars of Lebanon in hope of picking up a resident fellowship. I went down to the hospital and sat in the doctor's lounge, waiting for her. Presently, she came in with another intern. I stood up. She turned and looked at me. I saw again in her eyes that inexorable hate. She had never forgiven me for what she felt was my negligence in the death of the man she loved. I walked toward her. Excuse me, please. I see you remember me, Miss Ainsley. Yes, will you excuse me, Miss please? Miss Ainsley, you may not believe this, but I've come here especially to talk to you today. To talk to me, Dr. Bronson? Yes. Come along with me, please. In this treatment room, please. We can talk privately. Dr. Bronson, I don't think there could be anything you and I can say to each other. Well, now, Miss Ainsley, that all depends. That all depends. Sit down, won't you? Um... Uh, Miss Ainsley... Dr. I... Ainsley, if you please. Oh, yes, of course. Doctor, I have a little proposition to make to you. First of all, there are two facts I'd like to be sure of. A, you are unable to set up your own practice because you don't have the money to get started. Is that right? I don't see what business that is of yours. But it happens to be true. Fine. Fact B, you still hate me and feel a strong desire to be revenged for the wrong which you consider I have done you. Yes, I'm afraid that's true, Dr. Bronson. Good. Good? Yes. You see, I want to pay someone to murder me. And I think you'd enjoy it more than anyone. And you need the money, too. Dr. Bronson, I'm very busy. There's a patient in 302. Will you... Wait a moment, Dr. Ainsley. I'm perfectly serious. Absolutely serious. You want to die? Yes. You see, I'm going mad. I can't face it. I wish to end my life immediately. You're smiling. Good, you're interested then. You going mental, Dr. Paresis? Yes, hopeless. I've been to five or six men about it. Are you far gone? Hallucinations? Delusions of grandeur? Yes, advanced stages. Agony. Well, it must be quite a temptation to get it over with. I wonder what I would do if it happened to me. I want you to understand, Doctor, that I'm not asking you to perform a crude murder. This would uh, look like a simple error, unavoidable. There would not be the slightest aspect of homicidal intent. Really? That's most interesting, Doctor. Go on. Uh, my heart. I've had considerable damage. Coronary occlusion. Had to spend some six weeks on my back. Just got up last week. Naturally, I was given digitalis. Oh, I see, Doctor. You've been heavily digitalized, and if someone were to give you an injection of calcium gluconate, you would have an immediate heart block, dead within a few minutes. Exactly. <sighs> I must compliment you, Dr. Ainsley. You've learned a great deal. What a pity you can't have your own practice. And that, of course, 
Reminds me. Ah, another inducement. Of course. I plan to pay you the sum of $5,000 for your professional services in this matter. And I think, unless times have changed greatly since I've been in practice myself, you ought to be able to set up handsomely with that. My own practice. You'd better be careful, Doctor. You may tempt me a little bit too far. I thought you'd find it an attractive proposition. It will be only an error. I will say that I'm feeling badly again. A recurrence of my pericardial pains. I'll go back to bed and ask that you be assigned to my case. The rest is simple. No one would ever expect you to know that I'd been digitalized. Well, if I were on my toes, I would naturally go over your case history before giving medication of any kind. Well, yes, I suppose that's true. Professional people might think you had been a little lax. Might not have the highest regard for a new doctor who launched her career with such an unfortunate, such an unprofessional incident. Just a slight stain on your reputation for just a short while. You're very clever, Doctor. You knew that would do it, didn't you? I want to thank you. You've done me a great service. You mean you'll do it? You've reminded me that nothing, no money, revenge, nothing, can be worth the slightest suspicion in a doctor's career. I've worked too hard. I've waited too long for my practice. When I get it, it won't be soiled by any single act of carelessness. They'll never say that I lost any patient because of an error in judgment. You see, I once knew a doctor... Who did? There, Moshe, is my fourth check. Man, or in this case, woman, refrains from killing because of the fear of loss of reputation. Now I come to the testing of my fifth subject. A man who would not murder because he couldn't bear the sight of blood, much less the responsibility for shedding it. Ladern was my man, and I found him shortly after my search began. On that day, I saw him turn a ghastly white as a fast-moving car almost ran over a small dog which had run into the street. It wasn't a particularly frightening sight, but Ladern clutched at his throat and fell in a dead faint. I, of course, made it my business to become acquainted with him. I hadn't seen him for more than four months until tonight. He's changed, I noticed, as he took his place at my desk. He's thinner. His dark eyes seem blacker than ever. Laden, I want you to do me a favor. It's a little peculiar, but I'm perfectly sincere about it. Well? Circumstances require that my life be ended. But I can't quite reach the point to kill myself. I've arranged everything necessary to give the appearance of suicide. Here is the farewell note which I have written. I see. And here is the knife with which, apparently, I shall have killed myself. Notice I am carefully putting my fingerprints on it. Yes. Here are the gloves for you to wear. And here is $5,000 for you if you will drive this knife into my heart. What do you say? You've arranged everything? Everything. No one knows I'm here? No one. And uh, you want me to kill you? I... Yes. Of course, it will be a bit messy. When a person is stabbed, his blood usually splurts out. But if you keep to one side, I don't think much will get on you. Why do you want to die? My doctor says that I'm going insane... And that I haven't got much longer. <laughs> That's strange. <laughs> About going mad. About him saying that you're going mad. Oh, yes. It was a shock. No, I don't mean that. What do you mean? That's the same thing they told me. Oh, well, that strange. They what? They told me over a year ago that I was going mad. <laughs> I only laughed at them. Over a year? Well, well uh, do you... Uh, have you noticed any change? Not much. At least, no change for the worse. That's good. In fact, I, I'm very much better. I've been having fewer and fewer of those six spells. You remember how I was the day that dog was almost run over? You've gotten over those six spells? I haven't had one in three months. Then there isn't any check. Check? Well, what check? Uh, nothing. Oh. Uh, well, this is going to be a pretty messy business. We might as well get it over with. Oh, nice gloves you've got here. Nice and smooth on my hand. Then you're... Going through with it? Yes, can't let you down. Oh, never mind the knife. I've got my gun right here. 
Look, 38. Beauty, isn't it? Yes. Uh, then, if you'll give me back the knife... No, I... no, no, I'll keep it for you. <laughs> yeah, I've used this gun a lot in the past three months. I've bumped off about 50 dogs. You... Done what? Bronson, it's very interesting. I, I do it after midnight. It's fun watching the dogs. You have to know just where to hit them. <laughs> it kills them instantly. But the noise in here... Aren't you afraid that somebody will... Well, silence, hello. I don't like to wake people up when I kill their mutts. But they'll find the bullet. They'll trace to your gun. They're sure to get you. In a suicide, the weapon stays right beside the body where it falls. Suicide? Who says this is suicide? It's murder. I'm going to murder you. That's what you asked me to do. Look here, Laderne. This has gone far enough. I, I was only joking. I don't want you to kill me. Eh? Five thousand, eh? All here. Listen to me. I was only joking. You ready? Let turn. Shall I shoot now? No, wait. You want it through the heart or brain? Not yet. Can't you wait? Just a little while. Wait? What for? Uh, well, I've been conducting a little experiment. I'd like to write an account of it before I go. Well, what, what sort of an experiment? I don't think you'd understand. Oh. Okay. I'll wait. Till midnight. <laughs> then I've got to go. There's a German police dog I've been wanting to get. Big, ugly brute. <laughs> It'll be fun. Yes. I'll wait. Thank you. The clock says ten minutes past eleven. Yes. You've got fifty minutes. I'll wait by the window. And so, Moshe, my experiment has ended. As you predicted, I have finally placed myself in a position beyond your power to aid. <laughs> Strange, isn't it? That the one thing I didn't count on was the choosing of a subject who would not respond to my checks. Who, in fact, had no checks at all. For insanity knows no restraint. Ronson, midnight. Oh, yes, Ladon, I'm hurrying. He is still at the window. And he is sure to shoot me. There is nothing I can do to say or stop him. I know that. I'm beginning to understand exactly what is going on in his twisted mind. I wonder why. Now I shall sign my name for the last time and lay down my pen. Then I shall look up and say, All right, the day. All right, Ladern. closes the last letter of Dr. Bronson. Tonight's tale of Suspense. In our Hollywood cast tonight, Laird Kriegar played Dr. Bronson. Walter Kingsford played Dr. Moja. Ian Wolfe was Mr. Totten. Harold Huber played Doyle. Helen Vinson was Nurse Ainsley. And George Coloris played Ladern. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week when Robert Young will star in an adaptation of a story by James Thurber called A Friend to Alexander. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Robert Louis Cheon, guest director, Richard Paulette Craig, author, Bud Gluskin and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. This is the Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, we bring you two of America's most artful and distinguished stars. From the Metro Goldwyn Mayer Lot Stop Studios comes Mr. Robert Young. And from Warner Brothers, Miss Geraldine Fitzgerald. Mr. Young and Miss Fitzgerald are with us to play in an unusual tale by the unusual James Thurber. 
an excerpt from the book My World and Welcome to It called A Friend to Alexander, adapted for radio by Freya Howard, is tonight's study in Suspense. If you've been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with Mr. Thurber's poignant and strange story and the performances of Robert Young as the man who was a friend to Alexander and of Geraldine Fitzgerald as his wife, Bess, who relates these events to us. We again hope to keep you in... Suspense. Harry was a laughing, happy-go-lucky fellow before he began to have those dreams. I guess he was pretty much like dozens of other men who go to work every morning, settle down in soft chairs with their newspapers after dinner, and like a weekend in the country now and then. He was fond of easy living and good times. Like everyone else, he talked of the war, rationing tires, and his golf scores. Until... Until those nightmares began to plague him. At first, I was amused. You know... I've been dreaming about Aaron Burr every night. What for? Well, how do I know what for? <laughs> Aaron Burr is a funny person to be dreaming about nowadays. Why? I mean, with all the countries in the world at war with each other. What's so funny about dreaming? Maybe you're upset. Well, everybody dreams, don't they? Uh, I don't see why you'd see Aaron Burr in your dreams. Well, I do. Where do you see him? Oh, well, places. In Washington Square or Bowling Green or... On Broadway? Even here on 55th Street? Mostly downtown. I'll be talking to a woman in a Victoria. A woman holding a white lace parasol. Oh. And suddenly there will be Aaron Burr. Bowing and smiling and smelling like a carnation. Telling his stories about France and getting off his insults. Who is the woman in the Victoria? Hmm? What? The woman. Who is she? Well, how do I know? You know about people in dreams, don't you? They're nobody at all, or everybody. Ah, but you see Aaron Burr plainly enough, though. I mean, he isn't anybody or nobody, or everybody. All right, all right, you have me there, but I, I don't know who the woman is. Are you sure? What's more, I don't care. Maybe it's Madame Jumel, or Mittens Willett, or a girl I knew in high school. Who's Mittens Willett? She was a famous New York actress in her day, 50 years ago or so. She's buried in an old cemetery on 2nd Avenue. I've seen the tombstone. That's very sad. Why is it? Oh, I mean, she, she probably died young. Almost all women did in those days. He's a vile, cynical cad. I was standing and talking to Alexander Hamilton when Burr stepped up and slapped him in the face. When I looked at Hamilton, who do you suppose it was? <laughs> I don't know. Who? My brother, Walter. The one I told you about. The one who was killed by that drunk in the cemetery. Harry, I never could get that story straight. I've told you about it a dozen times. This drunk came up to him when his back was turned and... What was he doing in the cemetery? That's not the point. He was killed. That's what's important. And I loved him very much. I don't understand what What's you... the use of telling you every time I mention it? You start asking the same questions. I understand now, dear. When you looked at Hamilton, he was your brother, Walter. Yes. Harry, maybe... Maybe we ought to go to the country for more weekends. Weekends? Yes. I'm going to bed. For a time that evening, I worried about Harry. Not about his dream. Why shouldn't he dream? But I wondered about his health. He looked so, so worried somehow, so unlike himself. I was glad when he went to bed. A good night's sleep was just what he needed, I thought. How could I know? The next morning, we were quietly eating our grapefruit when Harry flung down his spoon. I wish he'd go back to France and stay there, him and his la-la. Who, dear? Oh, oh, you mean Aaron Burr. Did you dream about him again? Yes, he said la-la to me. Why should he say la-la? I was at the tavern and we were drinking ale and I said something funny. I I don't remember what it was. Something amusing about what uh, Ben Franklin had said to Washington once. It was one of those things, you know. No, I don't. Have some, have some more coffee, dear. I don't want any coffee. I made this remark and everyone laughed. Everyone but Burr, that is. He sort of sniffed. And then he said, la-la. 
Well, why not? I mean, is there anything wrong about him saying la-la? It was the way he said it. He was sneering at me. They all noticed it. Who, dear? Who noticed it? The others, all of them. And Hamilton. I was there with Hamilton. It was swell until Burr came in. Aaron Burr. I don't see why you dream about him all the time. Don't you think you should take some luminal? I'm not sick, I tell you. I know what I'm dreaming. I just thought, well, it's always Burr, and that seems odd. Well, why? Why shouldn't I dream about Burr if I want to? But you don't want to. No, but I can't help it. Everywhere I go with Alexander, sooner or later Burr shows up and makes those nasty remarks. Last night he elbowed Alexander out of his way, did it deliberately. Alexander? Hamilton. Oh, Alexander Hamilton. Yes, goodness knows I'm familiar enough with him by this time to call him by his first name. Uh, Harry, you know, we might go to the old Rovers Inn this weekend. You like it there. Hamilton has become not only my brother, Walter, but practically every other guy I've ever liked. Don't you like the old Rovers Inn anymore? Isn't it natural that Hamilton should represent my brother and guys I like? That's natural, isn't it? Yes. I suppose it is. Well, then why are you looking at me like that? You know, dear, I I wish you'd go and see Dr. Fox. I don't want to see Dr. Fox. I want Aaron Burr to stop sneering at me in my clothes. He looks at me and his lips curl up and he says, The law, Mr. Andrews, what odd taste you have. Mm. I wish you'd go and see Dr. Fox. I'm going to the zoo and feed popcorn to the rhinoceros. That makes thing, things seem right for a little while anyway. I thought he'd forgotten all about that ancient pistol duel, because for two days after that, he lost his haggard, tired look and actually seemed cheerful. But one night, about five in the morning, he came into my room in pajamas and bare feet, his hair disheveled and his eyes wild. He got him. He got him. The rotter got him. Alexander fired in the air and smiled at him, just like Walter must have smiled. Like Walter? Oh, yes, dear. Your brother, Walter. Who was killed in the cemetery. This was at Weehawken in New Jersey. What? Your brother? No, Hamilton and Burr. The duel. Hamilton had a white ruff around his neck. Burr was in black tights. French clothes. Alexander lifted his pistol and fired in the air and then smiled at Burr. And then that fiend from hell took deliberate aim. He took so long. He meant to take his time about it. I saw him grin. And then he pointed his pistol at Alexander and fired. He killed him in cold blood, the foul scum. Oh, darling. <laughs> Don't, darling. Here. Here, dear. Take some of these pills. I don't want any. Oh, take it. You'll feel better. I don't want any, I tell you. Here, darling. Swallow. Please, swallow. All right. There. That's better. Poor cad. A rotten, sneaking cad. He grinned just as he fired. And Alexander clutched himself at the stomach. Then shook his head and uh, tried to walk forward. Then he fell. With his mouth open as though he wanted to say something. And Burr stood there. Grinning. He was better after that. But I kept urging him to see Dr. Fox. At first he refused, but later he decided to humor me. <laughs> he was humoring me by this time, and Dr. Fox, too. How have you been feeling, Doc? Oh, fairly well, Mr. Andrews. My pulse has been a st- <clears throat> Now, uh, just what seems to be the trouble? Nothing. Nothing wrong with me. He has nightmares. Hmm. You look a little underweight. Perhaps your diet. Oh, I'm not underweight. Overweight, maybe. But not underweight. Mm-hmm. Uh, getting enough exercise? Same as usual. He's, he's worried about something. He always has this same dream. Aha. A dream, eh? What kind of a dream? Just a plain old dream. Aha. No, it isn't. It's about his brother Walter, who was killed in a cemetery by a drunken man. Only it isn't really about him. Really? Well, very few people are actually killed in cemeteries. Ah, it's an interesting coincidence, if I may say so. You mean... You know somebody who was killed in a cemetery, too? Is that the coincidence? No, I... I meant your brother being killed in a cemetery. You know, dead in a cemetery. A sort of, uh... Do you follow me? No. I think you should go see Dr. Fox, Dr. Fox. Hmm. Interesting. 
Yes, very interesting. I, uh, I wonder if you'd mind stepping into the next room, Mr. Andrews. I want to give you a thorough examination. Uh, right in here, sir, and we'll just have a look. Well, I hope you're satisfied. You heard what he said. There's nothing the matter with me at all. I'm glad your heart is so fine. He said so, you know. He said your heart is fine. Sure it's fine. My heart's fine. Everything's fine. And, and you know, you know what I was thinking? No, what? I was just thinking that now that Alexander Hamilton is dead, why, you won't see any more of Aaron Burr. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. But I was wrong. Aaron Burr did not leave my husband to sweeter or more peaceful dreams. Harry said nothing about it for several mornings, but I could tell he was still being tortured by those ghosts. He brooded over his breakfast. He didn't answer me when I spoke to him. I dropped my butter knife, and he jumped. What was that? Only my knife. Oh. Harry, are you still dreaming about that man? Oh, I wish I hadn't told you about it. Forget it, will you? I can't forget it with you going on this way. Can't you forget I mentioned it? Maybe you should see a psychiatrist. Oh, bosh. What, what does he do now? What does who do? Aaron Burr. I don't see why he keeps coming into your dreams now. He goes around bragging that he did it with his eyes closed. Says he didn't even look. Didn't look when? When he killed Alexander in that duel. Well, what? He claims he can hit the ace of spades at 30 paces blindfolded. Furthermore, since you ask what he does, he, he jostles me at parties now. I think you should stay out of this, Harry. It wasn't any business of yours anyway. And it happened so long ago. I'm not getting into anything. It's getting into me. Can't you see that? I see that we've got to get you away from here. Oh, maybe if you slept someplace else for a few nights, you wouldn't dream about him anymore. I don't know. Let's go to the country tomorrow. We'll stay at the Lime Rock Lodge. Uh, this. Why can't we visit the Crowleys? They live in the country. All right, fine. Bob has a pistol and we could do a little target shooting. What do you want a pistol for? There's plenty of open space. I think you'd want to get away from shooting. Yes. Sure, dear. The vacation seemed a success at first. When we arrived at the Crowley's house in the cab, I thought I'd left my suitcase at the railroad station. Harry laughed his... Old normal laugh for the first time in many days as he found the bag and handed it to me. And then he leaned over and kissed me. Ah, good old Kennedy. Oh, Harry, this is wonderful. <laughs> oh, we'll have a grand time then. Yes, dear. Hello, Matt. Hi, Harry. Here they come. Good old Bob. Remind me to tell him that rabbit joke. Mm, hello, Madison. I'll take your bags, Mr. Andrews. Thank sir. you, Madison. Good to see you. Uh, thank you, sir. Hello there. Oh, Fizz, what a wonderful Well, day. Bob, Hi, how's Harry. the old country squire? Oh, fine. How have you been? Never better. Boy, it's good to be here. Hello, Alice. Well, you two, I'm so glad you've come. Get kind of dull here in the hinterland. Oh, I'm glad, too. <laughs> hey, wait till you get one of our extra special cold martinis into you. Mm. You'll feel ship shape. Still know how to mix them, huh? Better never. Get lots of practice these long country winters. <laughs> oh, it was grand, seeing Harry's face relaxed and smiling over his cocktail glass. When I went to bed that night, I felt that at last that nasty old business of the dream was over. And I was happy. But when I awoke the next morning, when I awoke, I saw my husband lying rigid on his back, staring at the ceiling. One Henry Andrews, an architect. What's the matter, dear? Nothing. Oh, why don't you go back to sleep, Harry? It's only eight o'clock, and this is the country. One Henry Andrews, an architect. What are you talking That's about? That's what he calls me. Calls you who? One Henry Andrews, an architect. He's saying in his nasty little sneering voice, one Henry Andrews! Harry, Harry, please don't yell. You'll wake the whole house. Darling, people want to sleep. I'm beneath him. I'm just anybody. I'm a man in a gray suit. Be on your good behavior, my good man, he says to me. Or I shall have one of my lackeys give you a taste of the riding crop. Why should he say that to you? You ask me why. He wasn't such a great man, was he? I mean, didn't he try to sell Louisiana to the French or something behind Washington's back? He was a traitor. Then why worry what he said? He was a scoundrel. But a very brilliant mind. I was in hopes you, you weren't going to dream about him anymore. 
I thought if we came up here... It's him or me. I can't stand this forever. Neither can I. As I had expected, Harry spent most of the afternoon with Bob shooting at targets. At first, they just aimed at the paper squares. It all seemed to be good-natured and in fun. After a while, Harry stood with his back to the dead tree trunk on which the targets were nailed. Then he walked 30 paces ahead in a stiff-legged manner, and his face was set in stern lines. His revolver was at arm's length above his head when he turned suddenly and fired. Bob dropped to the ground, scared. Hey, what's the big idea, Harry? But Harry didn't answer. He started to walk back to that dead tree trunk again. Then with his back to the target, he began marking off the 30 paces. Bob called to him. I think they kept their arms hanging straight down. I don't think they stuck them up in the air. But my husband continued to count off. At the 30th step, he lowered his arm, wheeled about suddenly and fired from his hip. Hey there, watch out! Two of the shots missed the tree, but the last one hit it. Like a mechanical man or someone in a trance, Harry began to walk back to the tree again without a word. His lips tight, his eyes bright, his breathing coming fast. And look, it's my turn! But Harry about faced and stalked on. This time when he fired, his eyes were closed. Poor Bob didn't know what to make of this strange behavior. Hey, good heavens, man, give me that gun, will you? Without a protest, Harry let him have it. For the first time, he spoke. I... I need a lot more practice, I guess. Well, not with me standing around. Come on, let's get back to the house and shake up a drink. Gee, I've got the jumps. I need a lot more practice. I guess I must have slept soundly that night because I didn't hear him leave the room. He must have crawled out of bed dressed silently and crept out of the room. The sun was just coming up and the light was hard and the air was cold. Then I heard the shot. I threw on the dressing gown and ran downstairs. The Crowleys were in the hall. Oh, good heavens, sir. Is Harry all right? It sounds like it. Where is he? What's he doing? It sounds as though he's out behind the studio shooting. <sighs> Alice. Oh, no, no. Take it easy, Jess. Bob will go out and get him. Maybe, maybe he had a nightmare or walked in his sleep. No, no. He never walks in his sleep. He's awake, all right. Now, let's go down and get some coffee. He'll need some. Yes, I'll need some, too. Hey, what the dickens is the matter with him, anyway? I don't know. I'm so sorry. Bob, to... you go get him. At your service, madam. Alive or dead. Bob, stop it. Okay. I'll do my best. Come on, Bess. We'll go to the kitchen. What's that noise? Where? In the kitchen. <clears throat> oh, oh, it's you, Madison. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, you're shaking. I, I was just wondering, ma'am. No, I... no, no, it's all right, Madison. You go on back to bed. Uh, Clotheda was scared, ma'am, and I oh, thought... Oh, well, you tell Clotheda that it's all right. Mr. Andrews is uh, shooting a little. He couldn't sleep. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know what to do, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the Crowleys were relieved when the cab came to drive us to the station early that day. Their maid had threatened to leave. The neighbors were complaining about the early morning disturbance. And their own nerves were ragged. Boy, I need a drink after that. Yes, and make mine a stiff one. Gee, I'm sure glad he's gone. Well, it was either he or Clotheda. You can't afford to lose a good cook these days. But what do you think's the matter with him? I don't know. It's what Clotheda would call the shoots, I guess. You know... He said a funny thing when I went out and got him this morning. Well, let's have it. I could stand a funny thing. I asked him what the deuce he was doing out there in that freezing air with only his pants and shirt and shoes on, and you know what he said? What? I'll get him one of these nights. That's just what he said. By this time, I was really frightened. When he returned to the city, Harry was a picture of gloom. Our first night back, I looked at him as he lay on the chaise long in my bedroom in his blue dressing gown, smoking a cigarette. He was haggard and tired, 
And he kept biting his lower lip. I mixed a scotch and water nightcap for him. No thanks, no liquor. I need a steady hand. Watch my hand. Does it tremble? No. Is it steady? Yes, very. That's good. That's very good. You need a steady hand, you know. For what, dear? Oh, things. Harry, will you sleep in my room tonight? No, you keep shaking me all night to keep me awake. You're afraid to let me meet you. Are you still on that? Why do you think everybody's better than I? I can outshoot him the best day he ever lived. Oh, of course, In the dear. waistcoat. Right next to the middle button. He has three big pearl buttons on his waistcoat. Came from France. Why don't you dream about somebody else? Anybody else. Please. You'd like that, wouldn't you? You'd like to have me dream about somebody who wouldn't hurt a fly. Somebody like that. Because you'd know I'd never get in a duel with him. A duel? You're dreaming of a duel now? Ever since Hamilton died. Burr knows I hate him. Nearly over now. Harry. It's him or me. I'll get him the rotter. But Harry... I know I'll get him. See, I have a modern pistol. He has to use an old-fashioned single-shot muzzle loader. <laughs> Is that quite fair? Fair? What do I care if it's fair or not? Was it fair the way he shot Alexander? Was it? Don't be mad with me, <laughs> Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, darling. I'm very unhappy. I'm sorry, darling. And I'm worried sick. Well, I'm sorry, darling. Don't cry. Please don't cry. It upsets me when you cry. I mustn't be upset. I must be very calm and rested. My hand must be steady tonight. Especially tonight. I'm so worried, Harry. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. I'll be fine. My hand is like a rock. Later, when I kissed him goodnight, I knew it was really goodbye. He didn't say anything, and neither did I. It's just that he seemed so far away, in in another world. And each moment, I felt that he was becoming more and more remote. Something told me he wasn't coming back. He couldn't sleep. After an hour of tossing and turning, I went to Harry's room. He was sleeping peacefully. I sat down in his chair and watched over him for a long while. Then, finally, I must have fallen asleep. A beautiful morning. It was about five in the morning when I awoke. Harry was talking in his sleep. Oh, yes, the doctor. Good of you to come, doctor. Yes, often misty at this hour. Harry. Are they loaded? Splendid. Harry, wake up. Yes, I'm perfectly ready. Is Mr. Burr? He is good. Shall we proceed? No, I do not care to make a statement. Very well. Yes, I understand perfectly. Ten paces. Turn and fire at the dropping of the handkerchief. Yes, ten paces. Harry. Thank Harry. you for acting as my second, Mr. J. Of course, extremely good of you. Very well, then I'm quite ready. One, Harry. two, three, Harry. four, Harry, five, Don't, Harry. six, seven. Harry. Eight, nine, ten. <gasps> Harry. Harry, dear. Harry. <laughs> Dr. Fox was puzzled when he examined Harry the next morning. Hmm. Extraordinary. His heart was as sound as a dollar when I saw him the other day. He seemed to be fine, Dr. Fox. I can't understand it. What? Why his heart stopped as if he'd been shot. Shot? Yes. Of course, there are no gunshot wounds and no... Shot. Now, Mrs. Andrews. That's it. Shot. Now, now, you'll have to calm yourself. You can't help him now. I should have known it would happen. I kept staring at Harry's right hand. The three fingers next to the index finger were closed stiffly on the palm as if gripping the handle of a pistol. The taut thumb was doing its part to hold that invisible handle tightly and unwaveringly. But it was the index finger which held my eye the longest. I looked carefully to make sure I was right. Yes. Yes, it was so. That index finger was curved inward slightly, as if it were about to press the trigger of a pistol. So there had been a duel after all. Perhaps there was no gunshot wound. 
But Harry had been shot as surely as he was dead. Dr. Fox saw me staring and spoke to me. What are you looking at, Mrs. Andrews? Harry never even fired a shot. Aaron Burr killed him the way he killed Hamilton. What are you talking about? Aaron Burr shot him through the heart. I knew he would. Yes, but there's no evidence. I knew he would. Then Dr. Fox put an arm around me. He looked at me gently and and a bit frightened, the way I used to look at Harry when he told me about his dream. He led me to his assistant and whispered something. He thought I didn't hear him, but I did. She was crazy. Dark, raving crazy. I let the assistant take me away. Maybe he thought I was crazy, too. But now, I knew. Aaron Burr got Harry. Just as he had killed Hamilton in that old quarrel long ago. Ah, I knew he was! I knew he was! And so closes. A Friend to Alexander, starring Robert Young and Geraldine Fitzgerald. The James Thurber story, which was tonight's tale of Suspense. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Robert Louis Cheon, guest director, Priya Howard, author, and Bernard Herman and Lucien Marowick, conductor and composer, collaborated in presenting A Friend to Alexander. Now CBS is pleased to announce that beginning August 17th at 10 to 10.30 Eastern War Time, Mr. Robert Young, whom you've heard as star of tonight's suspense, will begin a brand new CBS series entitled Passport for Hunter. Passport for Hunter will bring you each week the adventures of an American newspaper reporter among the people of the United Nations. Next week's broadcast will be written and directed by Norman Corwin with music by Bernard Herman. And the stars, we have said, will be Robert Young. This is your narrator, the man in black, inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when with Miss Agnes Moorhead and with a repeat performance by popular request of the play called Sorry, Wrong Number, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. by his distinguished compatriot, Miss Dorothy Sayers. The story called The Fountain Plays is tonight's tale of suspense. Currently appearing in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Technicolor production, Lassie Come Home, following such successes as foreign correspondent from the stage plays The Wookiee and The Three Sisters, it is Mr. Gwen's particular pleasure to embody on the stage and the screen the eternal middle-class Englishman, the common man of Britain, and proud of it. The character Mr. Gwen portrays in our play tonight, Mr. Archibald Spiller, conservative John Bull that he may be, has lately had a bit of luck. Mr. Spiller lives on a little country estate with a cook and a manservant, and in the garden, yes, a fountain. Of all these little luxuries, it is the fountain which pleases him the most. An interesting sort of hobby for such a man, a fountain perhaps more interesting than even Mr. Spiller himself realized at the beginning of that memorable evening. These events were really quite unusual, and with their publication, and with the performance of Mr. Edmund Gwynn as Archie Spiller, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. The Fountain Plays. Now then, 
Mr. Spiller. What about it? Ah, have a care of the fountain, Sam. Get wet if you stand too close. Fountain? You yeah. and your blasted fountain. Wasting your money on a doodad. Oh, it's expensive, Sam. It's very ingenious, really. Uses the same water over and over again, you see? Don't try and put me off. What about it? Well, I told you. I talked to you about it later this evening. Later? Hmm. Later. Well, I want to talk about it now. I want a straight answer to my question. I've Mr. given you an answer. Spiller, you've given me nothing but bluff and bluster. Do I get it or don't I? That's what I want to know. And if no, I no, 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 don't... Please, please, my guests are arriving. I'll talk to you tonight. You'd better talk straight, too. It'll be your last chance, my lad. Hello! Hello there, everybody. They're just in time for a cocktail. Come in, come Master in. Master Seb oh. would find you here, Daddy. I hope we're not interrupting. Certainly not. Certainly oh, not. You know Mr. Gooch, don't you, my dear? Of course. And this uh, this is my neighbor, Mrs. Digby, Mr. Gooch. How do you do, Mr. Gooch? Uh. And Ronald Proudfoot, my daughter's fiancé. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Do help yourselves, everybody. You'll find all the fixings right there on the stone settee. Oh, 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 Betty, you play hostess, will you, dear? All right, dear. I'll take my neat. <laughs> I was just showing Mr. Gooch the, the wonders of my little fountain. Oh, Daddy, you do make such a fuss over that fountain. Oh, well, even so, I always say that there's nothing quite like a bit of ornamental water to set a place off. Sort of like the Versailles Gardens, what? Oh, it's really lovely, Mr. Spiller. And so secluded with the rhododendrons and the lilac hedge all around. Ah, you like that, eh? Oh, you know, I was thinking of cutting out some of these lilacs. Oh, I would Well, to make a vista, so to speak. You can't even see it from the house with these bushes on all four sides. Well, now, perhaps that might add something. But if you like the lilacs, Mrs. Digby, the lilacs shall stay. Oh, Mr. Spiller. <laughs> I'm no authority, I'm sure. Well, if you want an authority, I'd say it's a mess. Plaster, backstop, and all. A mess, see? A mess? Yes, a mess. Oh, maybe Mr. Gooch means uh, the way the backstop arches up above the straight. It rather overshadows it, Oh, you know? have to have that, you know, my dear. Prevailing winds from the south. Blows the jet of water right out onto the grass. If it weren't for that backstop, I'd have a regular swamp over there. Wasteful, too. Well, I'm glad I know that. You always were a fool, Archie, squandering money on a fountain. <laughs> oh, no, 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 indeed. It uses the same water over and over again. Like the ones in Trafalgar Square, you know. It's most ingenious, really. Why, isn't that a wonderful idea? Well, I have to be careful, of course, even so. I turn it off every night to save leakage and waste and so on. <laughs> Same old spiller. A proper miser, if ever there was one. Oh, I, I say now, it... Mr. Spiller, sir. Yeah? The dinner is served. Uh... What? Oh, thank you, master. Thank you. Well, what do you say? Everybody ready for a bit of dinner? Hey? Are we going then? Shall we? Come on, let's go in there. I got it, I got it. You can get some, yeah. Why, Mr. Spiller, your modest little fountain. When you're past the bushes, why, all at once you can scarcely hear it at all. Yes, quite impossible to hear it from the house. Can't hear it at all. <laughs> Another glass of port. Won't you have one here? Hmm? What is it, Masters? Will that be all then, sir? Yes, thank you, Masters, yes. Excellent dinner. My compliments to the cook, please. Yes, sir. And a coffee in the drawing room. Very good, sir. Well, shall we adjourn? Shall we what? Adjourn. Going to the drawing room, what? <laughs> Quite a tough you've become, eh, Archie? Big change from the old days. Adjourn to the drawing room. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Well, we'll all have a spot of coffee now, eh? Coffee? Is that the best you've got to offer? Oh, no, no, by no means. Have anything you like, old man. That's better. Um, what would you think, Mr. Spiller, about a rubber or two of bridge? Oh, excellent suggestion. Splendid. Uh, good thing I don't play, eh, Archie? I see I'm counted out before we start. Oh, Mr. Gooch, I'm so sorry. Do take my place. I'm really very tired. No, thanks. We didn't play bridge where I come from, and neither did Archie. Although I see he picked it up quick enough once he got... Well, it's never too late to learn, you know. <laughs> oh, I've got better ways than that to spend my time when I visit an old pal. Where's that fellow Masters? Was there something you wished, sir? Oh, yeah, well, take the whiskey and soda down by that fountain. Whiskey and moonlight and jolly old fountain. That's the proper way to spend an evening, eh, my lad? Uh, quite, sir. Mind you bring the full decanter. One drink's only a starter for a chap like yours, truly. Very good, sir. Uh, while I'm at it, uh, better take a few of these here Coronas. <laughs> only the best for your old pals, eh, Archie? Yes, yes. Uh, see you folks later. 
See you later on. Oh, Mr. Digby, should it be you and me against the youngsters? Daddy. Eh? Yes, sir? Will you tell me why you put up with that man? Gooch? Oh, come. He's not a bad sort, really. Had a drop too much this evening, perhaps. But... He always has a drop too much. And he is a bad sort. He's a rude, unpleasant, terrible man. Well, old friend, you know, not much a chap can do. Oh, Daddy, you're so soft-hearted. But if you can't do anything, I can. Now, please, dear, please. He'll be gone in a day or two. High time. What does he mean talking to you that way in your own home? Uh, uh, sh- shall we uh, cut for deals? Yes. Shall I, um... Uh... Well, I don't care. You shan't put me off. This is the last time that man is going to come into this house. <laughs> there you are, game and rubber. I guess the old folks aren't so slow after all, eh, Parson? <laughs> now, don't get Daddy all puffed up. You did have all the cards. Oh, not a bit of it. Jolly well played, sir. Say one more. Oh, I'm afraid not. I don't want to put a damper on the party, but it's ten thirty. My word, so it is. Last hour or so passed in no time. Oh, that's probably because we were spared the company of the charming Mr. Gooch. <laughs> Wonder where he is. I could guess. He said he was going out by the fountain. Dead to the world, that's what he is. Why, oh, Betty? Oh, from drink, silly. Oh, of course. Well, I- I'm not superstitious, you know, but. Oh, I... Gooch will take care of himself, I dare say. <laughs> well, Mrs. Digby, if you really must. I'm afraid I really must. Well, then perhaps I can see you home. Well, if it wouldn't be inconvenient. Oh, not a bit of it. It's a pleasure I've been looking forward to all the evening. Yes. It's been such a lovely evening, Mr. Spiller. Yeah, you know, I've been thinking, I'm awfully lucky to have found a neighbor like you, at my time of life, I mean. <laughs> Maybe it's not luck at all. It's fate, you mean? Eh, hey, Mrs. Digby? Hmm? Or may I, may I call you Rosalind? Oh, of course. And you call me Archibald, eh? <laughs> Silly name, but it's the only one I've got there. <laughs> all right. You know, it was true what I said tonight. That the place will be needing a new hostess soon. With Betty getting married, you mean? Mm. You must be very happy for her. Oh, I am, I am. But what I mean is, I mean that, well, we're both alone in the world now, and... and yes? Uh, Rosalind, there's something I want to talk to you about uh, soon. I, 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 I can't just now. There, there, there are arrangements I have to make, but, but, but I do want to talk to you really seriously. Well, I'll always be here, you know. Oh. Uh, but it, it's late now. Yes, yes, it is. Well, uh, good night, uh, Rosalind. It has been a lovely evening. Good night, Archibald. Hello, Masters. Tell me, where's everybody? Mr. Ronald left five or ten minutes since, sir, and Miss Elizabeth has retired. Oh. Mm. Well, oh, uh, has Mr. Gooch come in yet? I couldn't say, sir. Shall I go to see? No, no, no. Never mind. You can cut along to bed now. I'll lock up. Very good, sir. Mm. Oh, by the way, Masters, is the fountain turned off? Uh, yes, sir. I turned it off myself at half past ten, seeing you were engaged. Oh, fine, fine. Well, uh, good night, Masters. Good night, Oh, hello there. Just coming out to look for you, Gooch. Hello. You have a nice evening? A oh, nice evening. Not as nice an evening as you had with the obliging little widow, eh? No, no, that's enough of that right now, Sam. Oh, it is, is it? That's enough, is it? It's a good one. Do you think I am talking to me like that? One of your ruddy servants? Well, I'm not. I'm the boss here. Get that into your head. I'm the boss, and you know it. All right, all right. But buzz off to bed now, a good fellow. It's getting late. I'm tired. Oh, no, you don't. Think I'm drunk, don't you? <laughs> well, I'm not drunk enough so I don't remember the little business I've got with you. Well, can't we talk about it in the morning? No. We'll talk about it right now. I'm short of cash. It's high time you kicked in with some more. Now, look here, Sam. I pay you your allowance as we agreed, and you stay here whenever you like. But that's all. Oh, it is, is it? Yes. Getting pretty high and mighty, aren't you, number 4132? Sam, quiet. Heaven's sake. You're in a fine spot to tell me what you're going to do, aren't you? Quiet. The servants, my dear. 
Quiet, Betty, my dear, or Ronald Fatfield, or whatever his name is. Sam, you're drunk. Sure, I'm drunk. I'm not an escaped jailbird, am I? I'm not liable to be all back to work out ten years of labor for forgery, am I? Sam, listen, I'll give you a little extra. Just this once. When I think a man like me, that was only in for a short stretch anyway, worked it out all good and proper, dependent on the charity, mind you, of a pal what's rolling in wealth. I'm not rolling in wealth, and you know it. But if you'll promise me, faithfully, that this is the last time... Sure, I'll promise. For an old pearl, I'll promise anything. You'll just give me 5,000 down. 5,000? That's right. You've got a great opportunity. All I need is a little ready cash. Now, don't be an idiot, Sam. What do you think I'm going to lay hands on that much? Just like that. I'll give you a check for 500. Oh, trying to rent it on your old pal, eh? I said 5,000 and 5,000 it is, or you'll find yourself back on the rock pile, see? I tell you, I haven't got it. I haven't got it. You've got enough to go buy him fancy fountains, playing around with the widow next now, door. Now, you leave Mr. Digby out of this. I'll leave around a bit, all right. I'll leave the old pastry to you. I'll what? Tell... You... I told you that was enough of that, and I meant it. Now, pull yourself together and get a bed. Go on. I'll talk to you in the morning. You hear me, Sam? Sam. Yeah, come on. Come on. I didn't hit you that hard, you know. Go on. Get up on your feet now, Sam. Go on. Sam. 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 Keep his head on the corner of the table. Sure. No blood. No, there it is, just over the temple. Soft. Spongy. Mr. Gooch's fall had made quite a racket, too. Somebody must have heard it. They'd be calling out in a moment. Footsteps coming down to find out what's the matter. Have to think fast. What was that? Oh. Oh, just the old clock. Nobody on this side of the house, anyway. Nobody could have heard. Steady now and face the facts. He's dead. Murdered. Oh, it didn't feel like murder. But the police won't care about that. First off, they'll take fingerprints. And then... If I could make them suspect somebody else. Confuse them. An alibi. Yes, that's what's needed. An alibi. Make it seem he was alive when he was already dead. Yes. How do they do it in the stories? You dress up like a dead man and impersonate him. You, no, 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 you imitate him, speaking over the phone, or... No, you make a gramophone record of his voice, or you forge a letter. Oh, 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 no, 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 forgery. No, I don't want to get mixed up in that old game again. No, 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 no. Oh, wait a minute, though. The time. The time. Earlier, not later, say 10.30, while everyone was playing bridge. If he could have died sometime before that. But how to prove it? What happened at 10.30? 10.30. Think. Think. The fountain. The fountain. Yes, the fountain. Mr. Spiller went out to the French windows to the garden, mm. then turned on the fountain, then down the garden path. Stopped and called a name. A name. Sam! Gooch! Gooch! Doing very well, Mr. Spiller was. Uh, careful with the flashlight. They can't hear the fountain from the house, but they can see that. Ah, there's the whiskey, still half full. Pour most of it out, so that it will look as though we had even more to drink. Now back to the house. That'll do. Now back into the house. Looked for him and didn't find him. It was dark. The moon had gone down. But from now on, quiet. Quiet as he is lying over there. The wheelchair. The whole closet. The wheelchair used to be Mrs. Spiller's. Remember how she... Oh, no, not time to think of that now. Just left him into it. Who'd have ever thought old Sam was so heavy? Now out the 
the other door, but quietly this time. Down the back path. Carefully. Feel like running. Feel as though every window in the house were thronged with white staring faces, watching, watching the manufacture of an alibi. Here we are. Now to lift him up again. There. Lay him down on the edge of it. One hand in the water. The bruise on his head right up against the stone corner of the basin. There. Mm. What's that? Mm. He's alive. Mm. Gooch is alive. After all that trouble, after committing practically the perfect crime... He's alive. <laughs> what? Bring him to life again? More blackmail for the rest of your life? What about Mrs. Digby? Rosalind? What about Betty? She at least deserves something better. Murder? All right, murder. He's dead already as far as the rest of the world is concerned. Mm. Now! Mm. Okay. Now or never. His face is right by the water's edge. Push him under. Now. Mm. Now. And so it's done. Remorse? Why remorse? Does the mouse feel remorse that the cat is killed? Does the prisoner feel remorse when he leaves his prison? No. No, it's done. And well done. Nothing left but the finishing touches now. Take back the wheelchair. Let the fountain run another hour. And then to bed. And when the police come in the morning, the perfect crime. Remorse? Nonsense. Congratulations would be more like it. Yes. Congratulations, Mr. Spiller. Inspector Francis. Eh? Oh, yes. Come in, Inspector. Come in. I hate to trouble you, Mr. Spiller. Regulations, you know. Of course, of course. Everyone here who was present the night of the... Uh, uh, that is, last night. Yes, Inspector, yes. Mrs. Digby, my neighbor, my daughter Elizabeth... Her fiancé, Mr. Ronald Proudfoot, and the servants, of course. Excellent. Well, now, if you'll all bear with me, I have to ask you all a few questions, you know. But, Inspector, it wasn't... That's what we have to find out. You know, there was a blow on the head. Oh. Now, as I understand it, the deceased was last seen alive at about 8.30, just after dinner. Let me see. You You were the last to see him, Amy, man? Yes, sir. I believe so, sir. You took the whiskey and soda down to the fountain in the garden and left it there with Mr. Gooch. And that was the last time he was seen alive by any of you, eh? Yes. Yes, yes that's The right. four of you then played cards, I believe. Yes. Until yes. what time? Oh, about 10.30. And no one left the room during those two hours? No, no, Then, no. Mr. Spiller, you accompanied Mrs. Digby to her home. Yes. Is that correct, Mrs. Digby? Yes, Inspector. Now, when you returned... You were met in the hall by Masters. Yeah. And what time was that, Masters? About 10.45, sir. And Mr. Spiller at that time inquired after Mr. Gooch? Yes, sir. He asked if I had seen him, and as I had not, he suggested I might retire, uh, that he himself would lock the house. And the others had all left? Yes, sir. That is to say, Mr. Ronald had left. I heard him drive off in his car, and Miss Elizabeth had retired. Then you were alone in the downstairs part of the house. Is that so, Mr. Spiller? Yes. You tell me, please, what you did then? Well, I was worried about Gooch. He'd been drinking quite a lot, and so I went to look for him. Went down to the end of the garden by the fountain. You didn't go through the lilac hedge to the fountain? No. No, it was dark by then. I couldn't see. I called Gooch several times. Did anyone here, here, Mr. Spiller, call? Oh, I did, sir. I was half asleep, as you might say. But I did hear Mr. Spiller call out. And then what did you do, Mr. Spiller? I came back into the house. Sat up in the library, read for a while, and about one o'clock I went to bed. Now, now this is very important. Who turned off the fountain? 
I did, sir. At what time? At 10.30, sir. You're quite sure of that? Yes, sir. It was the usual time. I see. And no one would have turned it on again, of course. I can't think why, sir. Hmm. Well, I think that makes everything very clear, Mr. Spiller. Yes, yes. When the body was found, it was still wet from the spray of the fountain. Hmm. Therefore, death must have occurred sometime before the fountain was turned off at 10.30. (sighs) And as all of you here were occupied till then, from from the time the deceased was last seen alive... An accident, of course. I said so from the beginning. Well, might have been either, you know. There had been a blow, and there was water in the lungs... Oh, well, the man apparently fell due to his intoxicated condition, struck his head, falling into the water, from which he was unable to rescue himself. Well, seems the obvious conclusion, doesn't it? Poor fellow. Well, thanks, everyone. I don't think we shall have to trouble you again, Mr. Spiller. Well, I hope not. And thank you, Inspector. It is the verdict of the coroner, Township of Alton, County of Hampshire... That in the case of the deceased Samuel Gooch, death was due solely to accidental causes. Oh, Daddy, I'm so glad. I was afraid for a while. Oh, there was nothing to be afraid of, dear. Poor old Gooch just lost his footing and fell, at all. I know. I was afraid of him. Of him? I know it was silly, but he was so, so strange... I thought he had some sort of hold over you. Oh, nonsense. Darling, just an old friend. And I'm a sentimental old fool. <laughs> You're an old dear. Oh. But I've got to run now. What off with Ronald? Uh-huh. Mm. Daddy, are you going to be awfully lonely when I've gone? Oh, you know I'll miss you. Maybe Mrs. Digby. No, no, no my dear. <laughs> oh, oh, she's such a oh, darling. Oh, she is rather nice, isn't she? In fact, I... Uh... <laughs> I thought I might pop over to stay this afternoon, as long as you're going to be out. Daddy, I knew it. I won't keep you another second. I'll go over to dinner. Well, perhaps I shall. You'll be on time, Lou. I will. Bye. Bye. Beg pardon, sir. Huh? Oh, Master, yes. If it's convenient to you, sir. I should like to have my bedroom changed. Hmm? I should like to sleep indoors in the main house. Oh, why is that, Masters? I'm a very light sleeper, sir. And noises keep me awake. Noises? The weather vane, sir, above the garage. When the wind changes, it creaks. Oh, well, a little oil perhaps will soon. <laughs> I hardly think that would do, sir. Because when the wind changes, there are other noises. They can be most disturbing. What other noises? The fountain, sir. Fountain? Yes, sir. Ordinarily, I'm quite unable to hear it any more than uh, than you can in the main house, sir. But when the wind is from the west, the plaster back stop acts uh, quite like a sounding board in the direction of my room, sir. In fact, I can hear not only the fountain itself, but I can hear even the faintest noises in the grove around it uh, quite clearly. I see. Quite, sir. For instance, uh, on the night Mr. Gooch sustained his unfortunate accident, the wind changed a little after eleven. The weather vane awakened me, and then I heard the fountain. I seem to hear other noises, too, if I may say so, sir. You heard? Yes, sir. I might add that after hearing the police inspector's observation, I took the precaution of of pressing your dinner jacket. The sleeve seemed quite wet, sir. Oh. Oh, 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 yes, yes, yes. I think, sir, all things taken into consideration, you might find it worth your while to retain me permanently in your service at, shall we say, double my present wage for now. Eh? Oh. Oh, yes, yeah, yes, of course. I'm very much obliged to you, sir. Is there anything else, sir? No. No, nothing else. I'm uh, going to sit here by the fountain. 
Very ingenious. The fountain. Yes. Most ingenious, my fountain. Costs so little to run because it uses the same water over and over again. Over and over again. Over and over again. So closes The Fountain Plays, starring Edmund Gwynn and the Dorothy Sayers story, which was tonight's tale of Suspense. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss director Bernard Herman and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and Robert L. Richards, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. Now CBS is pleased to announce that starting next week at the same time, Mr. Robert Young will begin a brand new series entitled Passport for Adams. Passport for Adams will bring you each week the adventures of an American newspaper reporter among the people of the United Nations. Next week's broadcast will be written and directed by Norman Corwin, with music by Bernard Herman, and the stars we've said will be Robert Young. This is your narrator, the man in black who invites you to be with us for suspense one week from Saturday at 7.30 to 8, Eastern War Time, and from 8 to 8.30, Pacific War Time, when with Miss Agnes Moorhead, and with a repeat performance by popular request of the play called Sorry, Wrong Number. We again hope to keep you in... Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Tonight, in one of her rare radio appearances, we bring you one of Hollywood's most idolized personalities, Mr. Loris Costello. With such noteworthy and distinguished players as Mr. Martin Cosman, Mr. George Zuko, and Mr. Ian Wolfe, Miss Costello appears in a story of today, played against the background of the new order in Europe, a story of an oppressed people who use strange and effective methods in dealing with their oppressors and with traitors. The story tonight is called The King's Birthday and was written by Corporal Louis Pelletier, AUS. And with the performances of Dolores Costello as the Danish Countess Elsa, of Martin Kosleck as the Nazi Goliter, Reichmann, of George Zuko as Dr. Erickson, and of Ian Wolfe as old Peter of Cronwald Castle, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense. They come to the castle almost every day now, the Gestapo, trying to question me. But it seems I'm very stupid. Somehow, I don't give the right answer. Perhaps it's my advanced age. When they ask me about the night of the king's birthday, I get confused. I ramble on in the fashion of old people. Gentlemen, Cronwald Castle is 300 years old. For all those years, Cronwall has been a symbol of Danish liberty. Gentlemen, the sea waves beat against the rocks of Cronwall. The sea is deep. Ah, the sea knows everything. Ask her. Stop babbling nonsense, you old fool. Answer my question. Did you know about those notes? 
But of course, Herr Lieutenant, everybody in the district knows about them. The note said Count Victor would kill himself on the night of the king's birthday. Did you see the notes? Oh, oh no, Herr Lieutenant. But the note said that Count Victor would kill himself because of his great shame. Uh, that I do know. And the note said the exact time, 12 midnight. So, so you know the exact time. Yes, yes, I, I'm fond of clocks, you see. My father had a clock that told the time with a bird jumping out. The bird whistled, like this. Stop that insane chirping. Uh, yes, sir, Lieutenant. I'll take care of you later. Perhaps I'll have something that will improve your memory. Stay there till I call you. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. <laughs> There's nothing the matter with my memory. I could tell them a thing or two if I wanted. I could tell them how it all happened. It began two days before the king's birthday. That was the day the new Nazi Gauleiter, Herr Rachman, came to the castle to see the Countess Elsa. I was told to show him into the library. It was cold and grey, and the sea was pounding on the rocks, very angry, like it always is in November. The new Gauleiter sat by the fireplace and warmed his hands and called for a glass of brandy. And bring some soda, too, please. Yes, Herr Reitman. How soon did your mistress say she would see me? In a few minutes, Herr Reitman. You told her it was most urgent. Oh, yes, yes, I told her. She'll be with you soon. I doubt it. Most women's idea of soon is the best part of an hour. In my country, we train our women to... Uh, the brandy, Herr Reitman. Oh, thank you. Yes, in Germany we... Hmm, Courvoisier. Where did you get brandy like this? Yeah, Count Victor can get many things that are forbidden to his countrymen, Herr Reitman. Count Victor's cellar is well stocked. Is it really? Yes. Yes, we have meat at the castle. Nobody in Denmark has meat. Only Kronwald Castle. You're lucky. So they say. Shall I leave the brandy, sir? Yes. But you stay here a minute. Tell me, what's your name? Peter, sir. Ah, yes, Peter. You have been at Kronwald since you were a child. Sixty-three years. Am I correct? Why, why, yes. How did you... It's my business to know a lot of things, Peter. You don't approve of Count Victor, do you? Mm, it's not my place, sir, to... Three days ago in the marketplace, you were heard to make an indiscreet remark concerning Count Victor's collaboration with Berlin. I think a word very close to traitor was used. Was it, sir? What do you think? I think, Herr Reichman, uh, the fire is in need of more wood. If you'll excuse me, I'll get some. Do, by all means. And Peter. Yes, sir? Tell your mistress that I do not intend to spend all afternoon here. My business is urgent, and... <coughs> you may tell the Countess yourself, sir. Herr Reichman. Oh, Countess Elsa, excuse me. I was just saying... That's quite all right, Herr Reichman. Sit down, please. Thank you. Peter told me your business was urgent. I hope I haven't kept you. Oh, not at all. My business is urgent, but as a new gallleiter of this district, I might combine social pleasure with business and... Oh, that's very kind of you. I had hoped that my wife, Frau uh, Reichman... Uh, of course. You must ask her to call sometime. Uh, yes, I will. Although I have never had the pleasure of meeting Count Victor, it would be a great honor if uh, he may call as soon as he returns from Berlin. Certainly, Herr Reichman. Thank you. And this urgent business? Yes, we come to that. Uh, do you mind if I smoke? Not at all. A good cigar always makes unpleasant things easier to tell. Sounds almost as if you had rehearsed that line on the way to the castle, Herr Reichman. I did. And since it was ineffective, I'll be blunt, Countess. I prefer it. Three days ago, Countess, to be exact, on the day I arrived at Kronwald to begin my duties as a gallatter of this district, I found this note on my desk. Read it, please. Count Victor of Kronwald will kill himself on the night of the king's birthday. That note was on my desk in the morning. At noon, I found this one. Read it, please. Count Victor of Kronwald will repudiate his Nazi collaborators. He will choose the night of the king's birthday for his death. I thought at first it was some crank, but the notes kept coming. Then I heard that everybody in the district believed what the notes said. In every house and shop and farm, they are saying that Count Victor is going to kill himself. You will see why I said my business was urgent. Oh, yes, yes, I see. It's not that I have the slightest fear for the Count's safety, 
but the writer of these notes must be found and treated with severe penalties. You have no fear for my husband's safety? Of course not. Certainly no anonymous letter writer could force a count to take his own life. Hmm. I wonder. What do you mean? Well, you wish me to be frank with you? Naturally. You know my husband is hated by the whole countryside. What of it? People here are too stupid to know what's good for them. Hmm, perhaps. But the writer of these notes seems to be a little less than stupid. You think so? If you knew Danish history, Herr Reichman, you might agree. For hundreds of years, the night of the king's birthday has been a special occasion at Gronwald. On that night, the castle renews its pledge of loyalty to the king and to Denmark's freedom. Hmm. A very theatrical gesture. Mm, quite. But if anyone wished to remind Count Victor of... If someone wished to remind the Count that he had chosen our glorious Führer for his leader. Yes. The night of the king's birthday would be, shall we say, the psychologically correct time to do it. You reason well, Countess. I know my countrymen. Evidently. I can see how these notes would inflame their imagination. If Count Victor were to take his own life as a public repudiation of his present political bonds, the whole country would be stirred to its depths. I see. You seem to view the possibility of your husband's death rather calmly, Countess. Like you, Herr Reichman, I have no fear for his safety. I am only presenting the political possibility. Quite so. And since you grasp the full significance of the notes, you understand that I must take certain liberties in order to track down the writer. Liberty? Yes. I shall ask your permission to talk with Dr. Erickson. Oh, Dr. Erickson? I'm told he lives here at the castle. Yes, but... I should like to talk with Dr. Erickson. Oh, as you wish. Peter will show you to the doctor's study. However, I My time is short, Countess. I understand Dr. Erickson is one of your country's able psychiatrists. I understand that Dr. Erickson is an authority on mass suggestion. His help should be invaluable. Dr. Erickson. Yes, Peter, show the gentleman in. Uh, sit down, Herr Reichman. Don't be alarmed about these mice. I'll remove them just as soon as Herman here gets through the maze. <laughs> Watch him. He's really quite clever. I've been trying him on liver extract and... Ah, he made it. Good night, Herman. Now, off to bed. I've been expecting you, Herr Reichman. Please sit down. Thank you. You've come to see me about the notes. Am I right? Yes, you're right, Doctor. When I first heard about them, I said to myself, the new gold lighter will want my theory concerning the type of mind which would be prompted to write such notes. I'll tell you my theory, Herr Reichman. I don't want your theory, Doctor. I want you to answer some questions. Oh, so it's like that. And perhaps you want a sample of my handwriting, too. I'm not a fool, Doctor. That's very possible. How long have you been treating Count Victor for a certain nervous disorder? Five years. What would you say is his condition now? You've never met Count Victor, have you, Herr Reichman? No. When you talk with him, you'll see no outward signs of his malady. It manifests itself only during periods of despondency. In the last few years, I'm happy to say that these periods have been infrequent. Count Victor depends a good deal on you, doesn't he, Doctor? Perhaps I've almost cured him. In return, he's given me this laboratory and... Also money for my experiments. But you do have a great deal of influence on his mental processes. Yes, Herr Reichman, I do. In fact, if I had decided to, shall we say, liquidate Count Victor, I would have written the notes exactly as the people say they are written. Like all nervous people, the Count would be highly susceptible to such a mental attack. That's what you want me to say, isn't it? Yes. We know then where we stand. Almost. One thing more I'll ask you, Doctor. Count Victor had a brother who left Kronwald when Denmark was occupied by our troops. That brother, Christian, is now known to be working with the Danish underground. Formerly, he was one of your students at the university. Is that right? Christian was one of my most brilliant students. Do you know where he is now? No, I don't. And neither does your Gestapo. 
That's the only thing we share in common. You're a very outspoken man, Doctor. I find it the best form of deception. Do you think it wise to try to deceive the lawful government of your country? Lawful government? You have a quaint sense of humor, Herr Reichman. You may not find it so quaint if Count Victor ever removes his protection from you. He won't. When you've informed him of his impending suicide, as I presume you will, you'll see that he will need me more than ever. You do intend to show the notes to the Count, don't you? Yes. I will present myself to His Excellency tonight on his return from Berlin. Yes, his reactions to the notes will be most interesting. Would it inconvenience you if I were to be present on the occasion? Oh, not at all, Doctor. I'd be delighted. Your own reactions should be most interesting, too. Count Victor asks that you and Dr. Erickson come into the library now, Countess. Thank you, Peter. Are you ready, Elsa? Just a moment, sir. This is going to be difficult for you. Very. Kurt. Yes? How must I think? How must I discipline my mind? I mean, in thinking of, of Victor... I don't know, Elsa. To me, Count Victor of Kronwald is no longer a man. He's become a symbol of fascism. The husband you once knew is dead. Yes. Yes, that's right. Count Victor is the new order. The man I once knew is dead. That's what the people think, eh? They think they can kill me with words? They can't do that to me, can they, Doctor? Easy, Count Victor, easy. Victor, please. Look at this childish note. Count Victor will kill himself on the night of the king's birthday. Because of his great shame, he'll... Oh, great shame them, all right. They'll see that... <coughs> Doctor, a little of the brandy, please. Yes, yes, of course, Count Victor. Now, you mustn't upset yourself. Who's upset? The whole thing is completely nonsensical, completely. Of course it is. Ask Herr Reichman. His police have practically caught the writer of the notes, haven't they, Herr Reichman? Practically, Doctor. You have nothing to worry about, Convictor. You see? Doctor, tonight, if I need a sanity... Certainly, Count. I'll show them. I'll give them a dinner here on the night of the King's birthday. Everyone will hear about it. They'll see who's afraid. I'll give a dinner. Herr Reichman... Will you be my guest at dinner? With pleasure, Convector. I'll light up this whole castle like a like a Christmas tree. And Elsa, you'll wear that gown you wore at the palace and your jewels. You understand? You'll wear all your jewels. Yes, Victor. Kill me with words, eh? It's words there. After all, give them words. Herr Reichman, I'll make a statement to your newspapers the night of the king's birthday. I'll stuff words down the people's throats. And there's someone in particular who'll read what I have to say. Yes. My brother Christian. I want him especially to read it. Herr Eichmann, have you ever seen my brother? No, Count Victor. His picture was in that empty frame up there next to mine. I destroyed his picture. Oh, Victor, you're getting excited. Dr. Erickson. Yes, you're right, Elsa. Sometimes the strain of my work is too much. Dr. Erickson, you'll, you'll talk to me for a while before I go to bed, won't you? Of course. Talk to you, Count Victor? Yes. The doctor has a way of calming my nerves. It's... It's slightly hypnotic, isn't that it, Doctor? You might call it that, Count Victor. Count Victor, I'd strongly no, advise... No, 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 It's the only thing that helps me. I just go quietly to sleep while the doctor talks. But, Count Victor... Good night, Herr Reichman. I'll expect you here for dinner on the night of the King's birthday. Of course, Count Victor. Elsa? Yes, Victor. Elsa, they... They can't hurt me with words, can they? No, no, Victor. They can't hurt me if I don't listen, can they? If I shut my ears, I'll be all right. That's it. I'll shut my ears. I won't listen. 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 Herr Gauleiter. Yes, Lieutenant? While you were out to lunch... Please tell me. It's another note. Yes, Herr Gauleiter. 
Where did you find it this time? I... I, I hesitate to... Speak up. Speak up! I found it, Herr Garleiter, in the pocket of my own tunic when I was about to go on duty. Never mind the details. I found one of them under my pillow this morning. Count Victor called me and said there was one delivered with his morning paper. A farmer came in here at eight o'clock. He found one near to his door. We shall start to stop, Lieutenant. Yes, Herr Garleiter. It's just as our Führer says. If you tell a lie often enough, everybody believes it. That's true, Herr Garleiter. Is it? Well... As the Gauleiter says... Uh, do you believe Count Victor will kill himself? Who knew her, Gauleiter? Neither do I. But the Countess was right about one thing. If he did kill himself after all these notes, the effect on the people would be electrifying. But you just said that... I am talking about effects, Lieutenant. From what I have seen of the Count, he is too much of a coward to take his own life. But if someone else killed him and made it look like suicide... Yes, yes, it could be done... Uh, but how? How? I don't know. There will be four of us uh, for dinner. I have ordered 50 guards to patrol the grounds. Four guards will be stationed in the dining room while we eat. No one can get near the Count. It's impossible to kill him. But in this strange country, you can't even trust the impossible. They say the castle is guarded tonight. Fifty soldiers. They say the Count locked himself up in his room all day writing. A message to the people, they say. They say the Gauleiter has five Gestapo men at the castle besides the soldiers. One Gestapo man is watching the food for poison. Wait a minute, you. Taste that wine before you bring it into the dining room. Uh, what did you say, sir? I said, taste that wine. Oh, oh taste it. Why, of course. Ah. It's very good, sir. Did you doubt its quality? Don't be insolent. All right. You take it in. Thank you, sir. And if there's any left after that proof... Well, I'll take care of you, sir. Ah, more wine. Good boy, Peter. Good boy. Set it right here. We'll drink another toast to the king. Victor, I think we've drunk enough toast. Nonsense. This is the king's birthday dinner. We've got to drink to the king. Oh, Peter. Yes, sir? Did they make you taste that wine before you brought it in? Yes, doctor, they did. What's this? What's this about tasting wine? A simple precaution of man, Count Victor. I hope you don't mind. Mind? No, I don't mind, but you don't think that... Well, now, Victor, you don't get upset. No, sir, for the love of heaven, stop repeating that inane phrase. You've been saying that all through dinner. I'm not upset. Not upset. I just want to know what's going on. What have I got to be upset about? Why, you're more nervous than I am. I can understand the Countess's feelings. This is the first dinner I've ever had with four soldiers observing my digestive processes. Don't you think, Harold? I must insist, Doctor, that the soldiers remain. Well, at least ask them to sit down. The fighter. Yes, Herr Garleiter. Your men may be seated. Thank you, Herr Garleiter. You can hint it. And Peter, go get some wine for the soldiers. Yes, sir. Everyone will have more wine, Peter. We're going to toast the king. Uh, what time is it, Doctor? Five minutes to twelve, Count Victor. <laughs> and I'm still alive. Peter, it's five minutes to twelve and I'm still alive. Go get the wine, Peter. Yes, sir. You know, Peter, Peter tells me everything they say down at the village. People say I have five minutes to live. So, Peter tells you the village got there. Oh, yes. Yes, he knows everything. It was Peter who discovered most of the notes and brought them to me. He brought you the note? Oh, yes. And the last one said... Uh, Oh, what did it say? Victor, can't we talk about something else? Why, it's a fascinating subject. Ask the doctor. He and I discuss it for hours. Well, the doctor told me about some sect over in the West Indies that disposes of an enemy by simply writing the victim's name on a piece of paper and sending it to him. Same sort of nonsense being tried on me. Isn't that your theory, Doctor? Well, I... Dr. Erickson, in view of the Count's nervous condition, don't you think... Herr Garleiter, my private life is my own affair. When you work for the Reich, Count Victor, you have no private life. I repeat, Dr. Erickson, in view of the Count's nervous disorder... As the Count's personal physician, I prescribe my own remedies. To know the truth about occult practices is the best way to guard against them. And surely you don't think that... In Haiti, Herr Reichman, I saw a man die after receiving a note with his name on it. I don't explain it. I tell you a fact. <laughs> you see? It's possible. It's a fact. Well, I could be murdered with pen and ink. It could be done in a... In exactly three minutes, if my watch is right. Three minutes to live. Where's Peter with that wine? Oh, Victor, 
If you will excuse me, I have a headache. You stay here, Elsa. No one leaves this room till midnight. Gefreiter! Yes, Herr Gauleiter. Lock the door. Fold all the windows. Yes, Herr Gauleiter. Two schließen. Yes. Yes, that's right. Bolt everything. They won't come in here after me. They won't touch me. Oh, Victor, you're being absurd. I no, ask yes, you. I think it's best to comply with Count Victor's wishes. Yes. Yeah. Humor me, my dear. You'd never forgive yourself if you treated me unkindly during the last two minutes of my life. Especially since you wished me dead so many times. Victor. It's the truth, isn't it? Count Victor. Two minutes to live, Doctor. This is a good time to hear Elsa's confession. If I may say a You word. may not. Well, Elsa. It's the truth, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, Victor. It's the truth. I wish you were dead. I hate every minute I live under your roof. I hate the things you've become. A Nazi puppet. I hate your sniveling, goose-stepping mind. Just as I loathe this fat specimen of the super race you've invited to dinner. Now let her finish her gala. Go on, Elsa. Go on. I despise you as a man. Your countrymen despise you. Even before the Nazis came, you were planning to sell us out. All that Gronwald has fought for down through the years. All that Dane should be. A proud and free people. You sold all that for a cast-iron Nazi cross. I wish you were dead, Victor. I wish your soul were rotting in the grave that's waiting for all these <sighs> madmen of Europe. Doctor... Listen. Twelve o'clock. May God grant wisdom to our king and freedom to our people. May Kronwald always keep the faith. Who turned out the lights? Who turned out the lights? The fighter! I hear a door opening. No, Herr Gauleiter. My hand is on the door. It is not moving. Count Victor. Yes? Gefreiter. Count Victor of Kronwald. I hear you. Who is speaking? I speak to Count Victor. He knows who speaks. Victor, this is your time. Are you ready? I am ready. Now you die like a soldier, Victor, but your name will live on. Victor! Don't do it, Victor! Goodbye, Elsa. Victor! Have they found the body yet? They say the body was washed out to sea, but yesterday on the rocks... They found the Count's wristwatch and a handkerchief with the initial V on it. They'll never find the body. Say what you will. Count Victor was a brave man to take his own life. Yes. He showed those Nazis that Dane could die for honor. You know what the Nazis say? They say someone forced the Count to kill himself. How could you force him? That's what the Nazis say. And listen, they've arrested old Peter. They're trying to make old Peter talk. <laughs> Peter won't talk. But if he did, I bet he could tell them a thing or two. <laughs> Yes, I could tell them a thing or two. I could tell them why they'll never find Count Victor's body. You know why? Because Count Victor didn't jump out of the window. How could he? Count Victor was dead six days before the king's birthday. No, I didn't kill him. He was shot through the head by his own brother Christian the night he came home unexpectedly from Berlin, six days before the king's birthday. Yes, I worked with the underground, and so did the Countess and Dr. Erickson. That's why Christian came here to see us. When the Count returned unexpectedly, Christian decided to try to reason with him. They quarreled and, well, Christian eliminated the slimiest traitor Denmark has ever known. It was then that Dr. Erickson got the idea for the note. Christian, we've got to try it. This new Goliath has never seen Count Victor. You'll pose as the Count and we'll stage your suicide. The moral effect on the people will be tremendous. Christian agreed, and we started sending the notes. The rest was easy. We all played our parts, and Dr. Erickson coached us on the exact thing to do at 12 midnight. At the last stroke of 12, Peter will turn out the lights from downstairs. You've got that, Peter? Yes, Doctor. 
Then what do you do? I go through the passageway that leads to the hidden door in the dining room fireplace. I open the door and call out, Count Victor, this is your time. Are you ready? And you, Christian? I say, I am ready. I call out, don't do it, Victor. Don't. Then I break one of the windows. And you, Christian? I uh, go through the fireplace door and disappear. Yes. And Count Victor of Kronwald has died for his country. Well, that's how it was done. We planned it well, even to the putting of Count Victor's wristwatch and handkerchief on the rock where the Nazis would find them. Presently, the Gauleiter will question me some more. But soon... Soon there will be a note on his desk, and I can hear him say... Lieutenant. Lieutenant. How did this note get on my desk? A note? I don't know, Herr Garletter. What does it say? Says. Says. Remember the night of the king's birthday. Your turn is next, Herr Garletter. Your turn is next. So closes The King's Birthday, starring Dolores Costello with Martin Kozlek, George Zuko, and Ian Wolfe. Tonight's tale of Suspense. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who, with Ted Bliss, director, Lud Bluskin and Lucien Marowick, conductor and composer, and Corporal Louis Pelletier, radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week. Suspense will be heard at a new time, Thursdays at 7.30 Pacific War Time. Perhaps you will want to note this time. Suspense will be heard on Thursdays, beginning next Thursday at 7.30 Pacific War Time, and our play next Thursday will be The Singing Walls, based on a story by Cornell Woolrich. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is The Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Tonight, heading our Hollywood cast are two noted leading men. One, Mr. Preston Foster, a star long established, the hero of many an adventurous film, the latest, the 20th Century Fox production, Guadalcanal Diary. The other, Mr. Dane Clark, a newcomer to the screen, whose auspicious debut in Action in the North Atlantic has made him warmly welcome in these parts. Mr. Clark appears tonight as a young man who awoke one morning to find himself in a very serious jam. And Mr. Foster is the San Francisco homicide detective who is willing to help his friend up to a point. The play called The Singing Walls by Robert L. Richards, adapted from a story by Cornell Woolrich, is tonight's tale of suspense. If you've been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with the performances of Preston Foster as Detective Denny Sullivan and Dane Clark as young Tom Cochran. We again hope to keep you in suspense. Don't 
know either. I never seen Joe before in my life. How you feeling now, kid, huh? Sure, have a little more. It's good for what ails you. Ah, that's nothing. You're all right. Sure, I know. Let's get out of here. I know a better place. Come on, come on, I'll help you. <laughs> no, that's not a window. It's bricked up. They put a building up right behind this one. That's right. It comes right out of the walls. Singing walls. Yeah. We got hot and cold running water here and singing walls. <laughs> Something. Yeah, I, I... What time is it? Well, it's way afternoon. You came in pretty late. Did I? Uh, toss me my bathrobe, will you, sis? Don't you know what time you got in? Not exactly. Oh, Tommy. I know it's tough not having a job all these months. And I know you've tried. But this isn't doing you any good. I know, sis, but... Last night was the first time in a month, and anyway, it, it was different. I had a few drinks, but it was different. Something happened. What do you mean, something happened? Well, it wasn't just the drinks. They were doped or something. Oh, Tom. No, look, sis, it's not just an alibi. I don't remember where I was or anything, only that just now I seem to be dreaming about it. About what? About last night. I could, I could hear you banging on the door all the time I was dreaming. And then it seemed as though I wasn't dreaming at all, that I was remembering a lot of things. What sort of things? Well, it was all mixed up. There was a guy with a kind of a frog voice that kept giving me drinks. And I was sort of floating. And then there was a place that music came out of the walls. And there was something about blood on my shirt. The key to a closet. My tummy is shaking like a leaf. Yeah. It was a pretty scary dream. If it was a dream. What you need is some good hot coffee. Now hurry up and get dressed and come on downstairs. Here, I'll get you out a clean shirt. Yeah, I, I, I'd better wear the old one. I've only worn it once. Oh, but it's all messy. Yeah, it does look kind of... Mildred. What? My shirt. Give it to me. No, what's the matter? Look, Mildred, that's blood. Well, I guess it is. I know it is, just like it was in the dream. Oh, Tommy, don't be so silly. You must have hurt yourself somewhere. Well, I didn't. Look, there isn't a scratch on me. Well, then he got in a fight. Maybe. What else could it have been? Well, that's what I'm trying to think. Well, stop thinking and hurry up and get dressed. My goodness, look at the way you threw your clothes around last night. Trousers on the floor. Here. Oh, dear, everything's falling out of the pockets. I'll pick it up. You get dressed. Thanks. <laughs> you didn't come home with much, did you? Well, I didn't have much to start with. Well, I'll put it all up here on the bureau. Twenty-five cents in change and your keys. Now, hurry. What'd you say? I said, hurry. No, no, no. Before that, what'd you say? I said, I put your change and your keys up in the bureau. 
keys? Yes. Mildred, I only have one key. Well, there are two there now. I know. Let me see them. Here. Well, one's the key to the front door. Yeah, but the other one... Doesn't belong to any door in this house. It's the key to the closet. What closet? Last night, it wasn't a dream. Tommy, what are you talking about? <laughs> Mildred, you better call Denny right away. But he's on duty. I know, but get him over here right away. Tommy, what is it? Last night, I think I killed a man. <laughs> Look at your eyes. Listen, Denny, I... Mm-hmm. You were doped, all right. Well, I didn't know what it was. Never mind that now. How much do you remember? Look, Denny, I hated to bring you in on this, and I... I didn't know who else to go to. Skip it. What's the use of having a brother-in-law who's a cop if he can't help you once in a while? How much do you remember? Well, just what I've told you. Just like it wasn't a dream, only it wasn't a dream. You see, there was this guy, Joe. Just some guy I'd known from someplace. I don't know where. See, I met him on the street, and he took me to the party. And then the guy with the frog voice began giving me drinks. And then everything got confused. And I was in another place with the singing walls. In some harmonica playing or something. I, I, I don't even know whether it was in the same apartment even, but that's where the closet was. What about the guy you... The dead guy. Well, at first he wasn't there, and then he was. He was sort of slumped over in a big armchair. And then frog voice put him in a closet. That's what I remember. And then he left. And then I suddenly seemed to realize that the guy in the closet was dead, and that's why I got out of there. I don't know how. You don't have any idea where it was? No, no, I don't even know where the party was. And you'd never seen any of these people before? Except this guy, Joe, who took me to the party. And that's all I know about him, Denny. Just a guy named Joe that I knew from by sight from someplace. I don't know where or his last name or anything. Not much to go on, is there, kid? No, not much. A guy named Joe singing walls in a closet. Another guy with a froggy voice. But I'd recognize him or his voice if I ever saw him again. Tommy... You're in a jam. The way it looks right now, there's a dead man in a closet somewhere in this town. And you killed him. Oh, but Denny, I... Well, maybe you didn't. And if we find him before somebody else does, maybe we can figure out what did happen. The way it stands now, you're it. I know. We haven't got much time, either. If the place is an apartment, they probably would have found the body already and I'd know about it. It's a hotel. They check the guests out by 6 o'clock. That gives us about four hours. <laughs> four hours. For the murderer to find the guy he murdered. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Tommy, you know how I feel about Mildred. And you know I don't exactly hate you either. You know I'll do everything in the world I possibly can to clear you. Sure, Denny, I know. But I'm a cop, Tommy. If you did it, you know I'm going to turn you in, don't you? Sure. I know that, too. Okay, kid. Now, let's start from the beginning. What about this Joe? I... I, I don't know anything about him. You know his name, you know his face. Think, Tommy, think. I'm trying to. If I could only remember. If I could only remember. So a guy named Joe brought you, huh? You come up here from Joe's place? What's that? Oh, you don't even know where Joe lives, huh? Me? No, I don't know either. I never seen Joe before in my life. You still don't get it, Tommy? No, no, I don't. You told me where Joe is. I have? Sure, you see the sign over that saloon? Yeah, it's Joe's place. But how do you know that, Tommy... That... You were playing with bad boys last night. And this is where bad boys hang out, among other places. It's got a name. It's run by a guy named Joe. He minds his own business, as far as we know, but his customers don't. So? It all clicked when I remembered you said the guy with the frog voice asked you if you came up there from Joe's place. He didn't mean where Joe lived or anything. He meant this place. He thought maybe you were one of the boys. Yeah, but how did I ever meet this Joe? I've never been here in my life. He runs another joint, a respectable saloon. a sort of cover, about three blocks from our house, the town tavern. Hey, that's right. Remember? Yeah. Now, Joe may or may not be in on this. Frog Voice made a big play to you that he didn't know Joe. He'd never seen him before in his life. His customers always cover him. It's better for them that way. 
If my hunch is right, Joe is going to be plenty surprised when he sees you walk in there. Me? Walk in there? Ah, don't worry. Just walk in and sit down at the bar. If you're not out in a couple of minutes, I'll, sh- I'll know you recognize the guy and we're on the right track. I'll come in as though I didn't see you and go into the phone booth. And then what? Then we'll see. Okay, kid? Okay. Oh, one thing. Huh? If he offers you a drink on the house, take it. Sure. Well, here goes. What a big man. Here. Well, we got you. Oh, it doesn't matter. Do it yourself. Well, well, what do you know? Tell me. Hiya, Joe. Hey, what are you doing down in this part of town, kid? Oh, I... I, uh, had to come down and see a guy. I, I didn't know you had this place. Oh, just a little sideline? It's where I first started, you know. Sure, I know. One beer, that'll be ten cents. Hey, no, no, none of that. You gotta have one on me, kid. A real drink. What do you have? Well, I... Scotch? Okay. Scotch for the gentleman, Larry. The very best. You understand? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll take rye. Hey, Tommy. That was some party last night, huh? Part... Yeah. Hey, where'd you disappear to? I was looking all over for you. You know, that's a funny thing. I don't even remember. <laughs> I get it. Well, a guy has to cut loose once in a while, huh? Yeah, yeah. One scotch, the very best. And one right. Well, here's to you. Wait a minute. Hey, who are you? Uh, uh, uh this is my brother-in-law. Denny, this is Joe. Oh. Say, you must have got those drinks mixed up. You never drink scotch, Tommy. You only drink rye. Yeah, that's right. Here, you take the rye and give Joe the scotch, and I'll take your beer. No, I don't like scotch. I never touch it. Okay, I'll take it. Thanks. By the way, Joe, you haven't got a little bottle I could pour this into, have you? Say, who do you think you're kidding, bud? I'm from headquarters. There's my badge. Oh. Oh, now, wait a minute. I didn't know that you... I suppose you don't know what I'd find in this drink if I took it down to be analyzed, either. Hey, now, look, I don't want any trouble. I never had any. They can tell you down at headquarters. Of course, it's a matter of dough. You can't buy your way out of this one, chum. I want talk, and I want it quick. What kind of talk? Where'd you take Tommy last night? It was just a little party, a private party. Yeah, and they slip things in people's drinks there, too. Now, I don't know anything about that. Now, honest, I, I hardly know the people. Who's the guy with the frog voice? Voice? I don't know any guy with a frog voice. Now, look, I told you I don't want any trouble. I can tell you that down at headquarters. Listen, there's a narcotics wrap in this for somebody, and it could be you. Where was the party? Courtney Square West, number 75. Some people named Sorrell. Though. Come on, Tommy. You're coming too, Joe, just in case. Sorrell, hey, Jay. This look like the place, Tommy? Uh, looks like it. Could be. Everything has been so confused since last night, I... Well, this is it. It better be. Mrs. Sorrell? Yeah? I'm from police headquarters. Oh? Mind if we come in and look around? Why, no. Come on, Tommy. You too, Joe. By the way, you two know each other? Oh, his face familiar. I think he's been here on a couple of parties. We kind of get crazy parties. All kinds of people wander in and out. Is that what the trouble is? It might be. You know anyone with a froggy voice? No. Not that I can remember. Okay. Let's look at the apartment. Well, this is the hall, of course. And here's the living room. Joe, you stay here in the hall. And you better be here when I get back. I'll be here. So this is the living room. Uh Uh-huh. This is the bedroom. It's kind of messy now. See anything? No. No, Over here is the kitchenette. I see. That's about all there is to it. Uh, what's that room there? Oh, that's just a sort of storeroom. Uh, Well, I think we better look at it, though. Come on. Well, all right. You... There, see? There's nothing much in it. An old armchair and a bed. We use it as a guest room sometimes. Jenny, that closet. Oh, there's nothing in there. A lot of old odds and ends. Open it. Well, it's locked. All right, unlock it. I, I'm not sure where the key is. And, lady, you better find it. Well, I'll try. Be right back. Is this it, Tommy? Well, there was a closet like that. And a window just over there where that one is. And the armchair and the bed. Don't you remember? Can't, Denny. Let me have that key. Wait a minute. Here she comes. I think this is it. Try it. It's sort of stick sometimes. I'll help you. Come. See? Just a lot of old junk. Uh-huh. Oh, come on, Denny. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. Come on. 
Well, I guess that's all, Mr. Sorrell. Thanks for showing us around. That's all right. Hello, Joe. Still here, huh? You don't mind if I stay here and visit a while, do you? No, I guess not. Well, goodbye. Bye. Thanks again. Well, goodbye and good luck, Copper. I'm sorry, Denny. Yeah, that was a try. Well, what do we do now? I don't know, Tommy. I don't know. Think, Tommy. Think. We found Joe. Now, what about those singing walls? The singing walls. The music I heard last night. You sure? Sure. I remember the piece, the harmonica, and everything. It's coming from right around here someplace. Kenny, it's coming from their apartment, the one we just left, Sorrell's. Well, come on. This must be the place, Tommy. The closet, and now the music. He must have been pulling a fast one on us. Well? All right, quit stalling. Come on, Tommy. Stalling? You heard me. You two brushed us off pretty slick, didn't you? Hey, now, listen. I told you I don't know anything about this, but if you... Where's the music coming from? Well, from the radio. The radio? Yes, I turned it on in the kitchen just now while I started to fix dinner. It's a little portable. Here, see? Okay. I don't get it. What did you mean by... Skip it. Well, Tommy, here we go again. I don't care. That was the music I heard. And that's the same number, and it sounds like the same band. Hey, wait a minute. Now what? Where's your phone? On the desk. Tommy, huh? let's see what station that's coming over. All right. WBTA. It's a local station. Thanks. Hello? Operator? Get me station WBTA. A radio station. I don't know what the number is. Just get it. This is a police call. Thanks. May be wrong, Tommy, but I got a hunch. Hello? WBTA? What's that band you've got on now? I don't care if it's an electrical transcription or a Mickey Mouse cartoon. What's the guy's name? What? Turn off that radio. Now, what was that guy's name? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, uh, where can we get a hold of this guy? Where does he hang out? I see. Five nights a week, huh? That include tonight? Thanks. It's a small-time band leader, Tom. Harmonica Hal and his harmoniers, he calls himself, and he plays at a place called the Silver Slipper out in the concourse. Come on. Coming. You better get on that phone, Joe. Uh, you dumb, you would have to turn on that radio. <laughs> There's a silver slipper right over there. Okay, let us out here. Right. There you are. Thank you, sir. Look familiar to you around here, Tommy? No. Oh, I'm afraid it's a bum steer, Denny. Look, kid, here's the way I figure this music deal. You may have heard a recording of this band the way you did a little while ago. But there's a good chance you actually heard the guy himself. You know what time it was when you heard it? Well, it was just night. That's all I know. All right. They don't make recordings often of unknown bands. And this silver slipper isn't on the air. So maybe you're out here someplace and heard the band itself. Maybe. I know it's kind of a long shot, kid, but right now it's the best we got. Let's case the joint. Okay. <laughs> don't look like there are any rooms with closets in a silver slipper. Say, what about that crummy-looking hotel next to it? Yeah, I was just thinking... If you were in a room in the closet and all that, and you really did hear this band, that hotel's the only place you could have been. Oh, I wish I could remember something. The shape you were in, you probably signed your own name, too. Come on. By the way, what time you got? Uh, uh, ten to six. Ten to six. Deadline's pretty close, kid. Yeah. This better be right. What a dump. If I could only remember. Well, there's a the clerk. We'll see. Say, you got a guy named Tom Cochran here? Tom Cochran? I don't know. It's all right. We're friends of his. Now, see, when did he register? Last night. Mm, sure, here it is. Tom Cochran and Ben Doyle, room 209. I don't think they're in, though. No? No. I've been ringing them to see if they were going to check out by six. I was just going to send somebody up. Well, they were out at a big party last night. Probably haven't pulled themselves together yet. As a matter of fact, that's why we came to see them. Should I ring again? No, we're sort of surprised. Okay, right up those stairs. But they've got to be out by six or pay for another night. Ah, uh, we'll take care of that. Let's go, Tom. Denny, did 
Did you see that handwriting on the register? Yeah. It was mine, all right. This is it, Tommy. One way or another. Yeah. Here's 209. Don't put your hand on that doorknob. Oh, fingerprints. Use your handkerchief. It's locked. I got some keys. It's an easy lock. Here we go, kid. Denny, this is it. Close that door. Yeah. There's the closet. Give me the key. Here, you better hold my gun on that door just in case. All right. Denny, look out. He was just squalling. He's dead. Oh. Gee, this is awful. You remember now? Yeah. But I can't put it together. Let's have a look. Oh. Hmm. Stabbed. Here's his driver's license. Benjamin Doyle. Oh, Give me it. Hello? Oh, yeah, we found him, all right. No, they're going to keep the room for another night. No, 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 there's not a thing we want. We're in for it now, kid. Then he look on the floor over there. Clasp knife, covered with blood. That's what did it, all right? Yeah. Hey. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know, it's mine. Tommy, why didn't you tell me? Honest, Denny, I didn't even know I'd lost it until I just saw it there now. Fingerprints all over it. It's clear as though they'd been made in sealing wax. Right-handed, aren't you, Tommy? Yeah, right-handed. Let me see your right hand. Doesn't take an expert to read these. Those prints are yours, all right, kid. Yeah, I guess they are. And you still don't remember? Honest, Denny, I don't. Can you think of any other explanation? No. There's the guy with the frog voice, but... I must have just dreamed them up. I don't know. Well, kid, I guess this is it. You did all you could, Denny. Don't feel bad. You can plead insanity or something. Maybe we can prove you were doped. Maybe. You better call headquarters, Denny. Let's get it over. All right. So where are you going? I don't want to phone from here. The clerk will listen in. There's no use getting all the wolves on us before we have to. Aren't you afraid that I'll... No, no. Well, I won't. I'll just have him send a detective car. You won't have to go in the wagon. Thanks. Better let me have my gun. Sure. I'll be back. Lie down for a couple of minutes. You look kind of sick. I am. Oh. That's the idea. Take a little snooze. I won't be gone long. Get a little sleep. Do you good. I'll be right back. Have a little trouble in here? Blood. Sure, blood. All over your shirt. Oh, he's all right. Put him in the closet. Lock that door. Key right in your pocket. I'm not going any place. Back in just a minute. Sure, I'll be right back. Be right back. Here he is. You! Yeah, me. Hey, what are you going to do with him, Froggy? Get him in the other room until his copper friend misses him and starts looking. Now, listen, I don't want to be in anything like this. Shut up. To... You're in it up to your neck. Come on, you. Get up. Okay. Get going. Up the hall here. Open the other door, Joe. Sure. Get in there. That's the guy, Frog? Yeah. Listen, Froggy, this don't look so good. There was people who knew you were getting ready to give it to Doyle and... Sure, sure, that's why I framed this guy. All the trouble I went to doped him and brought Doyle in there when he was out. Planted the key on him, bloodied him up, put a knife in his hand. I still don't see how he... how he ever came to in time. Yeah. But he did. So what? We frame him again. Music? You like music, don't you? You're pretty sweet about music, ain't you? Well, for your information, that's harmonica hell rehearsing for the night. And in this room, it comes through the window. On account of the reza window. But in the other room, it comes through the walls. On account of the rate no window. Catch on? Better close the window, Joe. No, no, wait a minute. Yeah, I do like music. Do you mind if a guy in a spot like I am hears a little music? What about it, Froggy? Sure, sure, leave it open. Let's have music while we work. It'll cover up the noise if he makes any fuss. So what's a new angle? Knock him off. Jump him in the park. Jump by his own hand. Lean more. Ah. We leave the gun beside him and plant some of Doyle's stuff on him. Yeah, yeah, I got it. All right, get going, get going. Tie him up. Right. Yeah. 
Put a handkerchief in his mouth. Yeah. Put a card around him. He's drunk, see? And we're taking care of him. Okay. Where's the car? Oh, around the back. Nobody will see us going out that way. Come on, All right, all right. You ready? Just a minute. Yeah, we... All right, take a look. Yeah. Okay. All right. Take a look at the door. Okay. All clear? Yeah. Let's go. Lock the door after we go on. Okay. Down the hall to the back stairs. Hey, what the... All right, drop those guns and right up. Cover them, you guys. I got it. What is this? Go find out, Graziani. You... Get that gag out of the guy's mouth and untie him, Mike. Sure. Denny, I heard the music. I hoped you would. I asked him to leave the window open. I heard the conversation, too. Enough. Okay, boys, take him down. All right, come, come on, come on. on. Say, who are those guys? Graziani's a mobster. Doyle was one of his boys who double-crossed him. How you feeling? Okay, I guess. That was kind of close. Yeah, all the way around. Yeah. Look, kid, I... Uh, skip it, Denny. I'm sorry, Tommy. Honest. I thought you did it. Denny, until just now, so did I. And so closes The Singing Wall, starring Preston Foster with Dane Clark. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week at this same time, when Miss Lillian Gish and Mr. Otto Kruger will star in the suspense play, Marry for Murder. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who, with Ted Bliss, the director... Bernard Herman and Lucien Marowick, conductor and composer, and Robert L. Richards, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. a unique place in the affections of moviegoers ever since the screen first became of age, Miss Lillian Gish. Appearing with Miss Gish are two distinguished players, Mr. Ray Collins of the Metro Goldwyn Mayer Fold, whose current release is Thousands Cheer, and Mr. Bramwell Fletcher, who has ornamented many a stage and film success. There are only three players in Marry for Murder, which is tonight's tale of suspense. Only three characters in this story whose beginning and end are shrouded in a dense down-east fog. A story of slow terror and swift death, planned by a brilliant murderer. And so were the performances of Lillian Gish as Letty Hawthorne, a frightened neurotic creature who seemed destined to be a perfect victim. Of Bramwell Fletcher as Mark Taylor, so handsome and attentive. And of Ray Collins as the lawyer, Philip Alden, who relates these events to us. We again hope to keep you in... Suspense. I used to love the sound of foghorns on the bay, especially at night when I sat before the fire, let their lonely wail weave a contrast between my snug comfort and the gray immensity outside. But I've lost my taste for them now, lost it on the night I heard them moan a dirge of death. hard enough to lose a friend. But to lose one as I lost Letty Hawthorne is the kind of blow you never quite forget. I remember the first time I met her. It had fogged up all of a sudden, as it does here on the Cape. But Anne Wentworth held her Sunday night supper as usual. Letty was the only stranger there, a newcomer to the Cape. I looked at her and thought, 
she'd be an attractive woman if she only didn't flutter so much. She was a trim, pretty woman of about my own age, which is 40. You're Philip Alden, the lawyer, aren't you? Oh, what a pleasure to meet so many nice people. There go those foghorns again. Yes, uh, Does one really get used to them in time? Well, I, I... I love the cape, but I can hardly bear that sound. So, so depressing, isn't it? So morbid. Well, to your first question, yes, uh, I'm Alden, an attorney. As for the foghorns, well, if you stay with us for a few years, you won't be able to live without them, Mrs. Hawthorne. Um, it is Mrs. Hawthorne, isn't it? Mm. Anne never gets around to introducing people. It's her only fault. Oh, I never stand on ceremony. That's my fault if you consider it one. Besides, I knew you at once, you see, and you knew me. Don't you think that's a promising beginning? Um, I, I never thought of it that way. Oh, oh dearie me, there it goes again. It, it makes me think of ghosts walking over my grave. How can you bear it? They uh, do serve a very important purpose, you know. Oh, I suppose they do, but they give me the shutters. As a matter of fact, I find them comforting. Mm. I made jo- Jane Hart promise to stay with me tonight if the fog doesn't lift. I... I daren't be alone. You see, I'm still a bit nervous. Oh. I've been ill, you know, and the doctor prescribed complete rest and quiet. I see. That's why I came up here. Well, you'll find what you're looking for here, I'm sure. Oh, do you think so? I... I do hope I will. My nerves are simply shattered. Mr. Hawthorne's death, you see. Such a tragedy. I'm terribly sorry. You see, it happened so suddenly. I can't quite believe it. Can that. I get you some of Anne's cider cup? That's oh. one of her, our Sunday night features. Oh, thank you. That would be so nice. It's such a comfort to have a man take care of one again. <laughs> you make me feel so, uh, so protected. I... I know we're going to be great friends, aren't we? I can tell you I worried a bit for a while after that first party. Letty Hawthorne was a charming woman, a bit fluttery, as I said, but still attractive and rather pathetic. I was afraid she was setting her cap for me. You see, I'm a crusty old bachelor, but even my friends were beginning to wonder. So it was with mingled relief and regret that I learned one day that Letty Hawthorne had transferred her attentions to another newcomer to the Cape, Mark Taylor. He was eight or ten years younger than she, a handsome fellow, but somewhat dissolute looking. I didn't like him. I may as well admit that from the start. But short of marrying her myself, there wasn't much I could do. Anyway, they seemed happy enough at first. One day after the wedding, Letty called me on a matter of business. I went down there after sundown. The three of us sat out on the beach in front of her cottage. I'm so glad you were able to come, Philip. You see, Mark and I were counting on you. Always glad to oblige you, Letty. As a matter of fact, Alden, we want you to attend to a legal matter for us. Yes? (laughs) Yes, Philip. Mark wants to make a will. I told him I don't like wills. There's something so... What's so unhealthy about them? But Mark simply insists upon it. Very sensible, I'm sure. Oh, you men. You're all alive. It needn't be a very elaborate affair, Alden. Just a simple document stating that I leave all my property to Letty. Well, if he does that, Philip, I want you to make out a will for me, too. Leaving everything I have to Mark. But Letty, that's... uh, No, no I insist. Oh, well. Alden here is going to think I married you for your money. Money? Oh, why, I really don't know anything at all about my affairs. Really, I don't. Frank, uh, Mr. Hawthorne always used to say, Letty, I really think you know less about business than a child. <laughs> I left the management of his estate entirely to his secretary, you know. Well, just some simple document that makes my intention clear. You know the form, Alden. And, of course, if Letty insists... But I so... do. We'll have twin will. Hmm. It doesn't sound so frightening that way. The way Letty talks about wills, you can tell she has a secret vice, can't you? <laughs> a secret vice? My wife's a murder mystery fan, Alden. I didn't find out until it was too late. Oh, Mark, you (laughs) When you say that, Taylor, smile. I'm a detective fan myself. (laughs) Uh, It's a busman's holiday, of course, but I always read the latest whodunits. If my father hadn't insisted that I follow in his footsteps, I'd have been a detective instead of a lawyer. Really? How Mm. interesting. Tell us, Philip, do you ever get any cases like the ones we read about? Well, if you want my opinion, Mm -hmm. 
The chief difference between fact and fiction is that the author of a novel wants you to see the pattern and the author of a murder tries to hide it. Oh. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, take your case, for example. You and Letty are making out your wills. I heard her say that she wanted to leave her money to you. But how do I know the idea just sprang into her head of its own accord? How do I know that you didn't plant it there? Plant it? What do you mean? Why, what possible reason could I have? Well, as things stand now, there's no reason for me to ask if you planted the idea in her head. But if Letty were found dead... Dead? Oh, Philip, how dreadful. How can you even think such thoughts? Mark, darling, how terrible for you. Philip, you're to apologize this minute. Now, 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 Letty. Philip was just trying to explain. Well, I won't have him talking about such horrible things. Of course, I didn't mean you to. I was just using you as an example. Well, I didn't mean to be rude, Philip, but... Well, you know my nerves, and... It's getting dark, and... Oh, the bay is beautiful at night, of course, but... I've always been afraid of the water. That's why I've had such a time persuading her to come out for a sail. The Artemis has been tied up all summer, waiting. It's just silly, I know. And I will go with you, Mark. But let's do wait for a calm day. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Letty's idea of a sail is to sit becalmed half a mile offshore. My wife has perfect confidence in me, you see. Oh, Margaret, isn't that? You're making fun of me, aren't you? <laughs> of course, I trust you completely, but well, I'm not very athletic. You're and... missing one of the treats of the Cape if you don't sail. But I shall. Of course I shall, and soon. And what's more, I'm going to get Mark to teach me to handle the Artemis. Well, I'll be looking forward to seeing your sails on the bay, then. <clears throat> oh, Mark, a storm. I'd better be getting home before it breaks. Are you sure you'll be all right? Oh, I'm simply terrified of thunder. Wouldn't you rather stop with us? Oh, I can make it to town. Stop by tomorrow, won't you, Alden? Or as soon as you have those papers. Right. Now, you you won't be nervous after our talk of wills and, and murders. <laughs> but of course you won't. I'm such a coward myself that I can never understand how other people can be so brave. You know, Philip, Letty's helplessness is one of her chief charms. Sometimes I suspect she exaggerates it. Just to make me feel important. Oh, Mark, you mustn't. (laughs) Giving all my secrets away. Well, don't worry about me or the wills, Letty. Someday, you will frighten yourself to death. There was little enough for me to go by. Gradually, I found myself worrying about Letty and Mark. They didn't seem to be hitting it off. Oh, on the surface, everything was smooth. But I was haunted by a premonition of what I didn't know. It was only a a nameless dread of something, some undercurrent of feeling. Letty's nerves were getting no better. In fact, she seemed more tense, more frightened than ever. Yet she was making an effort to meet Mark halfway. Many times I saw them out sailing. Only when Letty returned after a day on the water, she seemed pinched and white. While Mark appeared to be glowing with vitality, Letty grew paler and more distracted. I realized suddenly that she was a middle-aged woman. One day in town, I met them in the general store. They'd been quarreling. But I tell you, Mark, you're just imagining it. I hate to have that stuff around, as you very well know. You read all kinds of stories about, well, about the way it gets mixed up in food. Oh, nonsense. Well, I'm sure there aren't any rats around the boathouse. I'd know if there were. I'm simply terrified of them. But I, well, I can't bear thinking of having poison around. Well, I'd be worried all the time. Oh, Letty, for heaven's sake, stop being childish. I didn't put traps around because you didn't want them. Now that I'm trying to get rid of them in another way, you make a scene. I don't see why we have to go into a three-act tragedy just because I want to buy some rat poison. Hello, hello, you two. Oh, hello, Alden. Why, Philip, how nice to see you. Mark and I were just doing a little shopping. Philip, will you do me a favor? Hmm? Will you please reason with Letty and try to get some sense into her head? Say, wait a minute. This sounds serious. Well, it isn't really. But, Philip, you know my nerves and... And the way things upset me, and Mark just doesn't understand. Oh, I know I'm just a silly woman, but the doctor says I have to be humored. And now Mark is so unreasonable, and it's such a little thing. Of course it's a little thing, and that's why I can't understand your attitude. Now look here, Philip. 
The boathouse is infested with rats. Wouldn't you say the obvious course of action would be to get rid of them? Why, of course. But poison. Rat poison. Oh, Philip, don't you see how horrible it is? I mean, accidents do happen. I've always hated to have anything like that around just in case. I've heard of children eating this stuff by accident. But you two people can take care of yourselves. Mm. Frankly, Letty, I think you're making a fuss over nothing. Yes, yes, that's right, Philip. That's just what I told her. Well, very well then. But if I'm found dead, I hope you realize you'll both be under suspicion. Seemed a foolish quarrel at the time. Yet when I left them, I kept hearing Letty's voice. Very well, then. But if I'm found dead... Very well, then. But if I'm found dead... Very well, then. But if I'm found dead... Suddenly, a monstrous idea occurred to me. I wondered if Letty had been trying to warn me. And then the horrible suspicion broke. All the trifling things began to add up. Letty's nervousness. Her fear of sailing with Mark. Her terror of having the poison in the house. But why? Why should she be afraid of Mark? What motive had he? And then, I knew. I had helped to give him the motive when I drew up Letty's will. Yet my whole case was founded on thin air. Figment of a nervous imagination. I had to be sure. I had to keep an eye on them. I found myself making excuses. Excuses to drop by at their cottage. Who is it, Letty? Who's there? It's Philip. Oh, Philip. Well, well, well. Hello. You're almost getting to be a member of the family. Well, I... I just thought I'd ask you to help me eat the first bluefish of the season. There's too much here for an old bachelor like me. Why, Philip Alden, if you aren't the most thoughtful person, how perfectly sweet of you. Of course you'll stay to dinner. We'll have a real feast. Yes, yes, you might as well stay as long as you're here. Oh, thank you. If you're sure I won't be intruding. Intruding? Why, of course not. And you can help me get the dinner ready. Well, I'd be glad to, but won't I be in Anna's way? Anna's gone. Gone? Boy, I, I thought you were well satisfied with her. And so we were, Philip. But Anna didn't seem to be satisfied with us. In fact, they've all gone. All? Yes. Anna and Elsie and Otto, the handyman. They just walked out and left us. Well, for heaven's sake. Well, since the ship and engine place opened on the heights, nobody can keep a servant. Can't blame them myself. I wonder. I don't believe Anna would take a job at the ship and engine. Anyhow, it does seem strange they all went at once, doesn't it? Mm. Letty, I do wish you'd stop dramatizing everything. Ship and engine just opened. The call went out for help. I don't see any mystery in the servants answering. In fact, it's their patriotic duty. And it's our patriotic duty to get along without them. But it's so lonely here. Especially at night. Now, Letty, you're not living here by yourself, you know. Mm, No, of course not. But all the same, we are isolated. Just the two of us. And you know how tricky my nerves are. I always feel so much better if the servants are around. After all, if anything were to happen, and anything might happen... Letty, this isn't getting us any closer to our dinner. Oh, of course. (laughs) Now, you boys wear these aprons. Philip, since it's your fish, you may have the honor of cooking it. All right, you ask for it. (laughs) It'll be your funeral. Uh, Now, uh, Philip... uh, Oh, uh, Mark. You hold the berries for the dessert. I'll do the vegetables and set the table. Well, for a seasoned bachelor, this dinner's a rare treat, Letty. Oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed it, Philip. Oh, I don't deserve the credit. That bluefish was simply delicious. How did you manage to catch it all by yourself? I always think men are so wonderful. Well, I'd be glad to take you both the next time I go fishing. It's good fun. Fresh air would be good for you, Letty. Oh, no, I couldn't. Well, I'm still just a wee bit nervous about the water. 
So I tried terribly hard, haven't I, Ma? Yes, yes, yes. Mm, I've been good about the sailing. As you know, I'm learning to manage the Artemis all by myself, well, aren't I, Ma? Mm-hmm. I don't write my name in the wake anymore, do I? Yes, Letty's a real hand at the tiller. She'll be a better sailor than I am soon, you see. <laughs> You'd have seen her take the Artemis into harbor the other day. She did, all right. Yes, yeah, she came through that channel with a breeze against her. <laughs> I wanted to take it over, afraid she'd run into the mud flats. But no, she coaxed it all the way, and we came in under sail. Yes, and I wanted to do it all by myself, even though I was terrified. Well, good for you. Why, that's really a splendid accomplishment. I've been negotiating the harbor for years, but I confess that I, I have trouble every now and then. Uh, well, since nobody wants any more berries, I guess it's time to do the dishes. Now, I'll show you what a good hand I am as a dishwasher. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's my job. Here. No, nope. Here. I'll clear it, clean and wash. You two can dry, and you can dry. Letty, what is it? Well, you shouldn't have tried to carry that tray. No. It's not that. Why, Letty, what's happened to you? You look ghastly. I'm... I'm afraid I... Something I ate. Here. You better lie down. Oh, I'll carry her upstairs. Get a doctor, will you? I'm afraid, Ma... I'm afraid I've been poisoned. <laughs> But great heavens, Philip, I, I just can't believe it. Arsenic poisoning? Do you think Dr. Potter knows what he's talking about? I'm sure he does. Of course, we can't be sure till the tests are made, but I don't see. I, I don't understand. It's not very hard to understand. Letty ate arsenic. How or where she got it, we don't know, but it's not difficult to guess. But we all ate the same meal, you and I and she. Why, good Lord, Philip, do you think we're poisoned too? I feel perfectly all right. You appear to be comfortable. I think we'd feel it by now. But then how on Let's earth Let's be she... perfectly logical about it. We, we all ate the bluefish. Yes. I prepared it. We all had potatoes and string beans. Um, Letty cooked those. Yes, yes. Then we all ate strawberries. You prepared them. Why? Now, the fish and the vegetables were all served in large platters, and each one of us helped ourselves. Therefore, if any poison were in the food, we'd all be sick. But the strawberries, Mark... See here, Alden, are you suggesting... Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're just following this through logically. The strawberries were put on the table in separate dishes. The poison could have been slipped into Letty's plate in the kitchen. Alden, you have no right to accuse me of this. Why, you're fixing up a case against me. I'm doing nothing of the sort. In any event, I think you might... Worry less about your own skin and more about Letty. Thanks. I think I can take care of my own wife. Nevertheless, I suggest you get someone to help you. I'm perfectly well able to nurse her myself. If I were you, I'd have someone else as well. I'll send Mrs. Halstead over from town. She's an experienced, practical nurse. What I've always appreciated about you, Philip, is the way you mind your own business. I'll be going now. Mrs. Halstead will be along as soon as I can get her. doctor's analysis came, it was arsenic poisoning, all right. There were traces of arsenic and the sugar on Letty's dish. Letty was recovering. The dose wasn't large enough to kill her. Mrs. Halstead was installed as nurse and housekeeper. Just then, business called me to New York, where I found myself worrying about Letty. I... I couldn't get her out of my mind. She will. I was bothered by a few loose ends in Letty's problem. The sort of questions that would occur to a legal mind. So I decided to spend an evening in the reference room of the law library among the files, where I found out enough about Mark and Letty Taylor to send me racing back to the Cape. And I knew I had to hurry if I was to prevent a devilish murder. One of those dull gray afternoons when I arrived at the station. Fog was so thick over the bay that it seemed to cloud the whole town. Cold fear gripped me. 
Letty and Mark, I learned, had left at dawn for a weekend sale. I could picture them. Murderer and victim. Shrouded in the gray veils of the fog. Drifting. Waiting. While the foghorns called a hoarse warning of murder. So, I was too late. The trap was sprung. With my newly gained insight into the affairs of Letty and Mark, I could have averted the tragedy, but I was too late. Or, or was I? If only they hadn't really left for that sale. I took the chance. Feeling my way along the Cape Road, I reached the Taylor Cottage. Nobody was there. Then I... I heard noises in the boathouse. I crept down the slope and listened. Oh, Mark, you fool. Philip Alden will be sure you plan to murder me for my money. I saw the suspicion dawn in his mind that day we made out our twin wills. I saw it grow when I was seen in the general store and you brought the rat poison. And that night when I was taken ill, he was sure. Do you hear me? Sure! <laughs> you wanted to teach me to sail the Artemis. Thought I was afraid of the water. Well, Mark Taylor, when your body drifts ashore, Philip Alden will swear that only an accident prevented you from murdering me. <laughs> what fools you men are, aren't you? Aren't you? Why wouldn't you like to answer me, Mark? Don't you wish you could talk to me again? To your helpless little left. But you can, can you? Dead men can't talk, can they? But they say that in the instant of dying, a man can understand many things. Did you understand, Mark? But how could you? You are really a stupid man, Mark. Didn't you ever wonder about my former husband and his tragic death? Didn't you ever want to know about Frank Hawthorne? He did. At the very end, he wondered about his predecessor, George Martin... Strange how both died in a yachting accident, isn't it? <laughs> Frank died off the coast of California, and George was drowned in the Gulf of Mexico. And now you, Mark, your body will be found someplace along the Cape here, I suppose. Oh, what bad luck I've had with my husband. But how thoughtful all of you were to leave me your property. <laughs> Too bad I'm such an extravagant widow, isn't it? For I do run through money. I wasn't lying about that. Oh, dear, I wish I could... I wish you could help me get your body to the Artemis. If only you hadn't insisted on turning back when the fog rose. I could have killed you so much more neatly. A sudden gust of wind while I was at the wheel. And the Artemis jibes. And the boom catches you and off you go to the bottom of the sea. But now, I've got to lug you back on board. And pitch you overboard somewhere. It was really inconsiderate, Mark. To make me kill you in the boathouse here. You will have to drag the body aboard, Letty. Oh, Philip, I'm so glad you've come. Are you, Letty? Something dreadful's happened to Mark. I'm, I'm so upset, I hardly know how to tell you. Oh, Philip, I think I... You needn't pull a phony face this time, Letty. I fell for it before when you made me think that Mark had poisoned you. That is, almost. Why, what do you mean, Philip? That was a little too smart, Letty, that poison scene. Because when I left you, I wondered about two things. Why anyone should be foolish enough to attempt that type of murder before an audience, and why, having attempted it, he should fail to make the dose large enough. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. 
You see, while I was in New York, I took the trouble to look up a few matters that were bothering me. And I found the newspaper clippings of your two previous, um, shall we say, accidents. Oh, Philip, isn't it dreadful? Still pretending. You're a clever woman, Letty. But I overheard you just now. You'll never prove anything. I think I will. You see, I found the motive, too. It was marry for money, marry for murder, wasn't it? I wouldn't try to run away, Letty. I brought a gun. You're coming with me to the police station. Don't wonder that you hate the sound of foghorns, Letty Taylor. You've spoiled them for me, too. And so closes Marry for Murder, starring Lillian Gish with Ray Collins and Bramwell Fletcher. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week, same time, when Virginia Bruce and John Loder will star in the Dorothy B. Hughes suspense thriller, The Cross-Eyed Bear. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Bernard Herman and Lucien Marowick, conductor and composer, and Walker T. Field, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. It is a principle of law that a man cannot be charged, convicted, and sentenced twice for the same crime. But there is no law in the books that says a man cannot murder his wife over and over again in his fantasy. For a man of sufficient imagination, repetitive oxoricide can indeed become a pleasant way of bringing time to a stop, as Vincent Price accomplishes it. In present tense, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Beyond, below the stars, are black and sharp. Dead hills, dark sky. Cold steel below my feet. Cold as the face of the officer at my side. Cold as the cuffs which link my arm to his, which join us on this journey to the prison where I die. Want a cigarette? No. Come on, take one. No, I don't smoke cigarettes. Okay. Has this happened to you before? What? Being handcuffed to a murderer. Has it happened to you before? Sure, plenty of times. To an axe murderer? Yep. You're not the special, brother. Lots of guys axe their wives. Lots of them. I could have escaped after I killed her, but I... I didn't. Now it's too late. 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 Never too late. Never too late. Too late. Too late. Escape. Escape. The train would be wrecked. If the detective were to be killed. Late, late. The sweet escape, the light escape, the crash escape. Oh, no. 
No. Oh, no. Oh, oh the darkness. Where am I? The, the cars must have gone down the gully. No light. And those people in pain. This thing fastened to my wrist. Oh, we must have gone halfway through the glass door. Keep back. Keep back from his blood. Uh, I, I, I don't seem to be hurt. No broken bones. Escape. Now the key in his pocket. In his bloody pocket and... The cuffs are off. His gun and the wallet. His face. His face is gone. His own mother would know him. I'm free. Fire. Fuel oil. I must get away. Here. Now my ring onto his finger. And that completes it. Bus number 63 from Bakersfield now arriving. Please claim your luggage at the curb. That's number 14. Taxi, mister. Yes. Yes. Where to? Up Beverly Glen above Sunset. Huh? I'll show you where. That's it. Hey, read about a big train wreck. Yes. Understand almost a hundred were killed. My home. It looks so small. So shabby. No one took care of it during the trial. No one cared. No one. No one cares now. But that's good. I like that. I'll be alone, and I won't let the neighbors see me, and I'll sleep and figure out where I go next. The lights are on. Someone is there. Hey, this slick, huh? <laughs> the whole thing was so slick. <laughs> You'll always be the brains for both of us, won't you, honey, huh? Always. No, no, it can't be. She's dead. I know she's dead. I killed her. Want another bottle of beer, honey, huh? Yeah, sure. Is it cold? You bet it's cold, honey. <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> you said a mouthful there. Mm, that husband of mine was never able to make me feel like this. Well, it takes a man, baby. All he would do was sit around and write those poems all the time. We framed it so good that he even thought he killed you. Hmm. What was that? I, I heard a noise. Mice. <laughs> You're funny, you know that? Real funny. Open the kitchen door so quietly and walk softly. Here on the wall by the stove, the cleaver. Honest, I hear something. Uh, you're nervous. Yeah. Relax just a little bit more. I see them now. It is she. How did they do it? How did they trick me into imagining the murder? I, I am innocent. Sweet meats. That's what you are. Sweet meats. Lover man. The pig in his dirty undershirt. Soft, weak, white neck. Fat on his arms. Pink. Grip the cleaver and walk like a feather. He shall be the first. Soft, white neck. I... Honestly, I hear some... What's the matter, sweet meats? What's it... <laughs> You killed him! Yes. And now you... No! I was innocent. And I thought myself guilty. And now I am truly guilty. And never in my life have I felt so innocent. Like a dream, like a nightmare, the confession, the conviction, the sentence. And now once more, dark night, cold steel, the sound of wheels. Just as I lived it before. Why, even the cold face of the silent officer at my side. Hard, cold face, so much like that other face. Want a cigarette? No. Now go on, take no, one. No, I don't use them. Okay. Has this happened to you before? What? being handcuffed to a murderer? Has it happened to you before? Oh, sure. Plenty of times. 
to an axe murderer? Yep. You're not the special brother. Lots of guys axe their wives. Lots of them. But were you ever cuffed to an axe murderer who killed two people, two people at once? What are you talking about? My sin, my crime, what I did, I, I killed them both. Them? Oh, take it easy, brother. You only killed your wife. Just her, just one, that's all. In a moment, we continue with William N. Robeson's production of Suspense. Looking for a new lease on life? Never mind the legal language, just tune in on the happy things that happen six times a week on the Amos and Andy Music Hall. New and old song favorites say cheerful things with music. Remember, the fun is on the house every Monday through Friday evening and each Saturday in the daytime. When the Amos and Andy Music Hall comes your way. We continue with Present Tense, starring Mr. Vincent Price. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. It had been raining for some days now. And beyond the barred window, the leaden sky bleeds sorrow on the barren land. The lonely land. The land beyond the prison wall. The sky was blue when first I came here. Blue. So blue. And now it has become as the walls of my cell, of all our cells. Dark, cheerless cells. These lifeless cells. These cells of men who wait to die. That wet sky. Gray sky. Cheerless But it is beautiful. I have 12 hours left of life. 12 hours left to live. Beautiful sky. Beautiful, beautiful. Wet and fresh and alive. Oh, rather would I spend eternity at the bottom of a well with but one patch of that to gaze upon than leave this life. Than leave this earth. Than leave this sky. But leave it, I must. The guard told me no man has ever escaped San Quentin's death row. Blocks and bars, guards and guns lie between me and the world beyond. No escape, not from here. But wouldn't it be nobler to gamble my life in bold attempt than lay it down in reckless resignation, eh? So... Now to get out of this super-guarded area. Oh, 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 guard, guard. Oh, hey, guard, hey, pipe me. down. What's guard. wrong? Hey, what's the matter with you? Guard, my gut, my gut. Here, it's killing me. I'll call a medic. <laughs> now, uh, as I press, you tell me where it hurts. <coughs> Everywhere, Doc. It, oh, all over down here. The air. Oh, 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 don't touch that place again. No. Call the ambulance. This man's got appendicitis. Oh, do something, please. Hey, do hey, something. what do I do? Why didn't they send somebody with you? Well, the interns are all tied up. Shots today. Oh, look, he's oh. acting kind of crazy. Let's get him over to the hospital in a hurry. I can't drive any faster. My windshield steam. So, wife, you got a rag? Oh, uh, look here. You can use my handkerchief. Hey, what's going on back there? Your pal's out cold. And I've got his gun now. So keep right on driving or the top of your head comes off. You won't get away with this. I will. I'm betting my life that I will. How far back is the prison? How about, oh, 15 miles, at least that. Okay, pull over. Okay, I'm taking her from here. And you, I want your money and your clothes. And then you can take your pal back and explain about me. They won't find that ambulance for days, not at the bottom of that canyon. And now, I cross the border on foot and into Mexico. A little card bought in a back room with no questions asked, and I became a tourist. Four days growth a beard, and I became poor. 
An empty suitcase with a butterfly net strapped to its outside, and I became a source of merriment, a, a funny, dumb gringo. And who looks with suspicion on the funny, dumb gringo tourist who is poor? Mexico City is beautiful. But not when you're hungry. Not when you are an American who is hungry. Americans aren't supposed to be hungry. But what can I do? All I know is writing, the writing of poetry. There, there is one place I might sell some poems. Pollen. His magazine prints some English stuff. Perhaps, well, well, why not? I have three pesos left. Buy some paper, a pencil, sit in the park, write, and storm the bastions. <laughs> Yeah. Good. Sehr good. Do you do you like them, Mr. Parlin? Well, excuse me. Lucita? Si, sí, Parlin. I have some poems here. Let me see. The river dappled, dreaming droppled, fester passion of my soul. Mm, muy bonito, muy bonito. Yeah, yeah. Just what I thought. Oh, you're too kind. The poet should read his own word. Oh. <laughs> well, that drips, sweet droplets, passions, goblets, fates, thy lord. Lucita likes your stuff. A rare woman. And I like what Lucita likes. Aha. Uh -huh. She says we do a book of your stuff. Oh? So here's... An advance. Too much. Take it. When the book. Thirty days. Right. Got the poems? I'll get them. Your name is... Smith. No good. Too dull. That's so true. I'll make a new one. Please do. And so... Good day, and I'll be back... In thirty days. With the poems. America. Miles below. The bleak brown mountains. The desert yellow and red. My own mystic land. My advance money went for new clothing and a round-trip plane ticket to Los Angeles and my new lease on life. In a small file under the eaves of the little house in Beverly Glen, there are poems. More than a thousand of them. Poems which no one has ever seen. Poems written in the evenings after work on Sundays. And now, with the beard and the hat and the glasses, no one will recognize me. <laughs> a cane. Yes, I ought to carry a cane, too. Get the poems. Does someone live there in the house? Has someone bought it? No matter. Get the poems and then get back to Mexico City. Hmm. Someone is living here. I wonder who? The hedge is trimmed in my hammock. Somebody's put a new canvas cover on it. Get it yourself, baby. I'm shaving. Oh, all right. Yes? Oh, no. No, it can't be. Well, what do you want? It's Mary, but I... I... I thought I... I, I killed her. Who is it, baby? What is it, mister? What do you want here? Are... Are you the lady of the house? Huh? Who's that at the door? Some creep with a beard. Yes, I'm the lady of the house, but I don't want to buy nothing. Huh. Well, what is it, Santa? What do you want? Are you the man of the house? Yeah. I'm the man of the house. That's sweet mates. I'll say. So, what of it? Well, I'm making a survey. I'd like to ask a few questions. May I come in? I don't know. I'll let him. What's the difference? Thank you. Well, first your name. My name? Yes, please. Fred Sneed. Where is he going? Mister, what do you want in my kitchen? The cleaver, Mary. Don't you know me? Mary? Hey, who are you, mister? Look close, Mary. Oh! The cleaver. Put it down. You know me? Sure. Know the man you tricked into uh, San Quentin? No, don't. Put down that... You killed him. Yes. And now you... No! Confession, conviction, sentence, transportation, and again, again the death house, as before. But, 
When I came here, they promised I could keep the beard. They promised I could keep the beard. And it's gone. Gone. I, I can't remember when. What's that? Who's coming? Ready? Ready. It's time to go, my son. Time to go? You've refused my help up to now. But perhaps you'd like to walk with me. Rather beside you, Padre, than beside one of these mercenaries. My... my legs. The muscles quiver. Not with fear, no. But with the desire to feel themselves moving, straining, acting, while yet there is time. I am not afraid, but this body... I hate the thought of its being killed by these men. My beautiful body, soon it will be dead, cold, rotting, dead... It will rot. No. No, they must not do this to me. You must be brave, my son. My body. Years I spent with the great corporeal master, the yogi, learning my bodily purpose, my bodily care, the use of willpower to control my body. The yogi, my teacher. Yes. Yes, I shall use yoga. Suspend my breathing and become invulnerable to their gas. Suspend my body functions to the point of death and fool their doctor. Of course. Oh, yes. The greatest escape of them all. And this time I must succeed. All right, here we are. The room is so small. Somehow I had imagined it would be larger. And here is the chair. All right, now just sit down. straps, hood... And over yeah, there, your arms along the, the glass, air. small pane with the dark faces seen dimly yeah, first through, the witnesses. There. The whole room is like some strange yeah, no, sort right. of time machine. Yeah, like machine for yeah, launching right. a man into another dimension. Yeah. <laughs> and so true. Yeah. I'd best begin to prepare myself. There we are. Relax. You must relax. It won't be easy. Have you any last words, my son? Yes. Yes, one request. Do not allow my beautiful body to be dissected or embalmed. But on the third day after my death, cremate it. That will be arranged as you desire. Thank you. And God be with you, my son. Remember what Jesus Christ said to the two criminals. In this day shalt thou be with me. Uh, Move your head forward a little while I pull the hood down. There. Now, uh, when you hear the pellets drop into the acid, don't try any tricks. Just breathe deeply, see? The fumes don't hurt, you see? Uh, Cooperate with us. Make it easy on yourself, kid. Know what I mean? So dark here under the hood. Now, the last breath as the yogi taught me. And the lungs hold it. Body limp, all muscles, tendons, joints. Relax all, slow the bloodstream, lock the breath. Hold, hold. Slow, slow, hold. Suspend all bodily functions, hold. Fix the eye in, suspended animation gently. Fix the mind on time. Ease the beating of my heart. Time is a picture on the screen of my mind. Slower. Slower. My perception is slower. The time seems to spin by now. Go slow, my heart. Ventilators go on, clearing the air of the poisonous fumes. Now the doctor will come with his stethoscope. I will my limbs to stiffness, my flesh to coldness. It's clear, Doctor. You can go in now. Well, let's see now. Respiration has ceased. Heart has stopped. <clears throat> by the authority vested in me by the state of California, I pronounce this man dead. I will myself to consciousness in six hours' time. Uh, where am I? It's dark here and... Cold. So cold. Let's get up and see. 
Oh, the prison morgue. It worked. But I'm, I'm cold. I'm so cold. What's this on my toe? Tag? It's too dark to read it, but I know what it says. It has my name, prison number, time of execution. Yes. And now, to look around. Because the next step must be played just right. This should be it. A coffin crate ready for shipping. Some cadaver being returned to a sentimental family. Well, that ought to be just right. (laughs) And with him on my slab, my tag on his toe, and the most perfect escape of all time underway, here we go. I will my body to return from its state of suspended animation and to come immediately out of trance when next this coffin shall be opened. have a bad heart. Oh, let's see. No, it's going. Well, let's hope he's out for a while. This must be the workroom. Light hanging over the work table and there a... a locker. Ha! With a suit. Fine. And here, in the desk, might there not be some sort of... Yes, here. A petty cash box. And it's quite full. The old boy apparently doesn't believe in banks. <laughs> And now, now that Lazarus has returned from the dead, this newspaper dateline, I was executed four days ago, and now I find myself resurrected in Indianapolis, Indiana. Los Angeles, California. This is Los Angeles. You can claim your baggage in the station or on the platform. I had returned to my home. A beautiful time to return home. My old hammock is there. My flowers, my yard. (laughs) The house is empty. The lawyer said he'd had it cleaned up. My books, my pictures. Here, my old pipe, I... I haven't smoked it in years. Mary didn't like it. But now she's gone. I don't hate her anymore. Tobacco's still fairly fresh. Fill the pipe. (laughs) There's that detective story I never got to finish. Now I'll have time. Now I'll have lots of time. Time to smoke and read and write and rest. It's almost down. Twilight. Wonderful time to get outside. Cool, sweet air. Wonder what kind of birds those are. My hammock. Oh, so nice. <laughs> Light the pipe. Oh, and relax. Wish I could remember what page I was on. <laughs> but no matter. I can begin again. I've got all the time in the world the rest of my life. The birds. The sun is slipping out of sight. Death of the sun. How red the sky. How soft those clouds. So lovely. So lovely. What's that? Birds playing in the fish pond. Look at them. Happy birds. That hissing. Oh, the man next door is turning on his lawn sprinkling system. Lie here and smell the cool air. Evening coming on, the sky grows darker. Lie in the gathering twilight. Death of the day, birth of the night. Sweet softness of the summer night coming. Soon the stars. Oh, it's lovely. Heavenly, just like heaven. Lie and swing to and fro. To and fro. Heavenly.
By the authority vested in me by the state of California, I pronounce this man dead. Mr. Vincent Price starred in William N. Robeson's production of Present Tense by James Poe. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with Raymond Burr in the Peralta map. Another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Supporting Mr. Price in present tense were Ellen Morgan, Peg LaCentra, Jack Crucian, Dawes Butler, Joe DeSantis, Charles Rodlack, and Sam Pierce. Original score composed and conducted by Amerigo Marie. engagement as guest of these proceedings. In the interest of prime suspense, Mr. Wells and the producer of this series have scheduled four radio stories which they feel are particularly distinguished in our chosen field. The first of these is The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell. And so with the performance of Orson Wells in the character of General Zaroff and Keenan Wynn as Sanger Rainsford, who learned from Zaroff what was the most dangerous game, we again hope to keep you in suspense. I haven't much time. Any moment now he may come in and when he does, I'm going to kill him. It's him or me. And I'm going to do my best to make it him. Oh, maybe it sounds crazy to you. I guess it does. It would have sounded crazy to me a few days ago when I was with Whitney on the yacht. I was on a pleasure trip. <laughs> a pleasure trip? How were I, how could I or anyone realize then the horror and torment I was to go through? How was I to know of Yvonne? And the death swamp? And the hounds? How was I to know of Zaroff? Think of it. It was only four nights ago that the ship went down. We've been talking about this island, Ship Trap Island, Whitney said it was called on the charts. I was sleepy and started on down below to turn in. I was mixing myself a nightcap when I looked up and saw it. A tremendous reef racing at us out of the fog. I screamed out a warning, but it was too late. We were right upon it. Seems to be awakening. 
I... Where, where is this? Where am I? Do not where be can... alarmed, my friend. My man Ivan found you out on the cliff. And brought you here to be taken care of. Well, thank God there's life on this island. I hardly believed. Few people do. <laughs> you are quite safe here in my castle, Mr. Uh, Rainsford. Uh, yes. Rainsford. I'm Sanger Rainsford of New York. Rainsford? Sanger Rainsford? Yes. Well, it is indeed a very great pleasure and honor to welcome you, Mr. Sanger Rainsford. You're the celebrated hunter, are you not? Yes, yes. You know me? Uh, by reputation only. I've read your book about hunting snow leopards in Tibet, you see. My name is General Zaroff. I am not English, Mr. Rainsford, but I went to a good school. Perhaps you recognize the colors of my tie. Uh, no, it makes no difference. I've lived too long in the jungle to be a snob. <laughs> well, I... Uh, well, I can't tell you how happy I am to meet you, General. And I can't tell you how happy I am to meet you, Mr. Rainsford. But come, we shouldn't be chatting here. We can talk later. You must be hungry. Yes, I am, rather. Uh, 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 what? Uh, Ivan thought you'd like a robe. He's drying your clothes for you. Oh, thank you. Ivan's an incredibly strong fellow, but you mustn't mind his looks. His ears were cut off in battle, and he has the misfortune to be deaf and dumb. He is sensitive about his appearance. A simple fellow, really, but I'm afraid a bit savage. Oh? He's been in our family for years. <laughs> Follow Ivan, if you please, Mr. Rainsford. I was about to have my luncheon just before you awoke. You can have it together now. Does the robe fit you all right? Oh, yes, yes, perfectly, thanks. I am so glad. You uh, have quite a collection of heads here. Lions, tigers, mm -hmm. elephants, moose, bears. Oh, I don't believe I've ever seen a more perfect specimen. They are nice. I take great pride in them. You have good cause. Coming from you, Mr. Rainsford, that is a great compliment. Here we are. You sit over there. Thank you. Oh, right, Ivan. <laughs> we do our best to preserve the amenities of civilization here. Please forgive my any lapses. Oh, of course. Yes. Well off the beaten track, you know. Uh, shoo shoo. Shoo shoo. Shoo shoo. <laughs> <laughs> This is my little pet, Mr. Rainsford. As a hunting falcon, Shushu is of no further usefulness in the field. But I am fond of its company. Am I not, little sweetheart? <coughs> Patience, my darling. I know you're hungry, my dear. We hunt tonight. Your, uh... Your heads are really remarkable, General. Mm. That, uh... That Cape Buffalo is the largest I've ever seen. Ah, uh, that fellow. He's a monster. Mm. Did he charge you? Hurled me against a tree, fractured my skull, left me the scar. And I got the brute. <laughs> I've, uh, I've always thought the Cape Buffalo is the most dangerous of all games. Oh, uh, no, no. You're wrong. Wrong, sir. The Cape Buffalo is not the most dangerous game. Ivan, the wine. Uh, how does he understand you? He reads my lips. If you like this champagne, Mr. Rainsford, Ivan chills it expertly. Uh, no, no, the, the Cape of Buffalo is not the most dangerous game. Here in my preserve on this island, I hunt more dangerous game. Oh, is there a big game on this island? The biggest. Oh, really? Oh, it isn't here naturally, of course. I have to stock the island. Uh, what have you imported, General? Uh, jaguars? Jaguars. I hope you like filet mignon, Mr. Ray. Oh, I do very much, thank you. Uh, is it jaguars, General? No, 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 no. Hunting jaguars ceased to interest me some years ago. I exhausted their possibilities, you see. I... No thrill left in jaguars, you understand? No real danger. I live for danger, Mr. Rainsford. And we will have some capital hunting. You and I. I shall be most glad to have your company. Yes, but I'll tell you, you'll be amused, I know. I think you may say in all modesty that I've done a rare thing. Yes, I've invented a new sensation. May I pour you another glass of champagne, Mr. Rainsford? Thank you, General. God makes some men poets. Some he makes kings, some beggars. Me, he made a hunter. My hand was made for the trigger. My father once said that. Made for the trigger. My whole life has been one prolonged hunt. 
I've hunted every kind of game in every land. It's impossible for me to tell you how many animals I've killed. Grizzlies in your Rockies, crocodiles in the Ganges, rhinoceroses in East Africa. This is in Africa, by the way. That Cape Buffalo hit me and laid me up for six months. Mm. As soon as I recovered, I started the Amazon to hunt jaguars when I'd heard they were unusually cunning. <laughs> they weren't. They were no match at all for a hunter with his wits about him. The high-powered rifle. I was bitterly disappointed. I was lying in my tent with a splitting headache one night. And a terrible thought pushed its way into my head. Hunting was beginning to bore me. And hunting, remember, had been my life. I've heard that in America, businessmen often go to pieces when they give up the business in their life. Yes, yes, that's yes. so. I had no wish to go to pieces. <laughs> I, I, I must do something. Uh, now, mine is an analytical mind, Mr. Rainsford. Doubtless, that is why I enjoy the problems of the chase. Oh, no doubt, General. So I asked myself why the hunt no longer fascinated me. You are much younger than I am, Mr. Rainsford, and have not hunted as much, but you perhaps can guess the answer. Well, what is it? Simply this. Hunting had ceased to be what you call a sporting proposition. It had become too easy. I always got my quarry. Always. It's no greater bore than perfection. Cigarettes? No, no thank you. Uh, no animal had a chance of me anymore. Not a chance. That is no boast. It is a mathematical certainty. The animal had nothing but his legs and his instinct. Instinct is no match for reason. When I thought of this, it was a tragic moment for me, I can tell you. It came to me as an inspiration... What I must do. And that was? I had to invent a new animal to hunt. New animal? Oh, you're joking. Not at all. I never joke about hunting. I needed a new animal. I found one. So I bought this island, built this castle, and here I do my hunting. The island's perfect for my purposes. There are jungles with a maze of trails in them. Hills, swamps... Yes, but the me. animal... The animal generals are... It supplies me with the most exciting hunting in the world. No other hunting compares with it, for instance. Every day I hunt. I never grow bored now. For I have a quarry with which I can match my wits. Yes, but you still have I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, so I said... What are the attributes of an ideal quarry? And the answer was, of course, it must have courage, cunning, and above all, it must be able to reason. Well, no animal can reason. Dear fellow, there is one that can. One? But you can't mean... And why not? Well, I... I can't believe you're serious, General Zaro. You're just joking. Joking? I'm quite serious. Speaking about hunting. Hunting? You're speaking about murder. Oh, dear me, that unpleasant word. I think I can show you that your scruples are quite ill-founded. Yes? I hunt the scum of the earth. Sailors from tramp ships, Laskars, Japs, mongrels, a thoroughbred horse, a hound is worth more than a score. But these are men. Precisely, that is why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They can reason after a fashion, so they are dangerous. But where do you get them? Oh, we visit my training school. It is in the cellar. I have about a dozen pupils down there now. They're from the Spanish park San Lucar that had the bad luck to go to the rocks up there. A very inferior lot, I regret to say. Poor specimens, more accustomed to the deck than to the jungle. Another glass? No. It's a game, you see. Sort of game. I, I suggest to one of them that we go hunting. I give him a supply of food and uh, an excellent hunting knife. I give him three hours start. I'm to follow, armed only with a pistol of the smallest caliber and range. If my quarry eludes me for three whole days, he wins the game. If I find him, he loses. 
Suppose he refuses to be hunted. Who oh, won't give him his choice? Of course. He need not play that game if he does not wish to. If he does not wish to hunt, I turn him over to Ivan. Mm, Ivan once had the honor of serving as official knouter to my old king, and he has his own ideas of sport. Invariably, Mr. Rainsford, invariably they choose the hunt. And if they win? Uh, to date, I have not lost. I do not wish you to think me a braggart, Mr. Rainsford. Many of them afford only the most elementary sort of problem, I assure you. Occasionally I strike a tartar. <laughs> You so remembers the Tata, don't you, darling? Yes. Yes, he almost did win. I eventually had to use the hounds. See? Wait a moment. I'll open the window. Hello, boys! <laughs> a rather good lot, I think. They're let out at seven every night. If anyone should try to get into my castle or out of it, something extremely regrettable to occur to uh, But enough of this. Come, I'll show you a collection of heads I'm quite sure you've never seen before. Join me in the library for coffee. I uh, hope that you will excuse me tonight, General. Oh. I, I'm really not feeling well at all. Indeed. I know what it is. My old complaints. <laughs> On you, we boredom. You need some excitement. Tonight we'll hunt. Hey, Mr. Rainford. You and I. You're wrong, General. I won't hunt. I won't murder. As you wish, my friend. The choice rests entirely with you. But may I not venture to suggest that you will find my idea of sport more diverting than Ivan's? <laughs> Oh, oh, you... My dear fellow, you don't mean that you plan to hunt me. My dear fellow, have I not told you I always mean what I say about hunting? This is really an inspiration. I drink to a foeman worthy of my steel at last. But I simply can't believe this must be some sort of dream. You'll find the game worth playing, Mr. Rainsford. Think of it. Your brain against mine. Your woodcraft against mine. Your strength, your stamina against mine. Outdoor chess. <laughs> and the stake is not without value, eh? And if I win... I'll cheerfully acknowledge myself defeated if I do not find you by midnight of the third day. My sloop will place you on the mainland near a town. Or you can trust me. I'll give you my word as a gentleman and a sportsman. Of course, you in turn must agree to say nothing of your visit here. I will agree to nothing of the kind. Oh. Well, in that case... Hmm, but why discuss that now? Uh, three days hence, we can discuss it over a bottle of Vuftico, unless... Uh... Well, your choice, Mr. Rainsford. I'm a hunter. You know my choice. Mm -hmm. Yvonne here will supply you with hunting clothes, food, and knife. I suggest you wear moccasins. They leave a poorer trail. I suggest, too, that you avoid the big swamp in the southeast corner of the island. We call it Death Swamp. This quicksand there. Well, I must beg you to excuse me now. We always take our siesta after our lunch. Don't we, Shushu? <laughs> Come, my little pet. You'll hardly have time for a nap, I fear, Mr. Rainsford. Uh, you, you'll want to start, of course. I shall not follow till dusk. Hunting at night is so much more exciting than by day, don't you think? <clears throat> well, au revoir, Mr. Rainsford. Au revoir. I... <laughs> I'd fought my way through the bush for two hours, repeating to myself over and over again, I must keep my nerve, I must keep my nerve. My whole idea at first was to put distance between myself and General Zarov. And to this end, I had plunged along through the thicket, spurred on by the sharp rowls of something very much like panic. Now I had got a grip on myself. 
I'd stopped. I was taking stock of the situation. I saw that straight flight was futile. Inevitably, it would bring me face to face with the sea. Well, I'll give him a trail, I muttered. And I struck off from the rude path I had been following and into the trackless wilderness. I made a series of intricate loops. I doubled back on my trail again and again, recalling all the lore of the fox hunt, all the dodges of the fox. Night found me exhausted, my hands and face lashed by the branches on a thickly wooded ridge. My need for rest was imperative, and I thought, I played the fox, now I must play the cat of the fable. A big tree with a thick trunk and outspread branches was nearby, and taking care not to leave the slightest mark, I climbed up and stretched out among the broad limbs. Rest brought me new confidence and almost a feeling of security. Even so expert a hunter as General Zaroff cannot face me here, I assured myself. An apprehensive night crawled slowly by, my mind keenly alert for any sound, any warning. Towards the dawn, an instinct I never knew existed, like an animal must possess, and held me to a far off in the distance on a westerly direction. Sure enough, following the trail with the sureness of a bloodhound came General Zaroff. Nothing escaped those searching black eyes. No crushed blade of grass, no bent twig, no mark, no matter how fine in the moss. My heart pounding furiously, I slid down quickly from the tree and struck off again into the woods. I knew I had to do something desperate. I knew that I had little time in which to do it. Three hundred yards from my hiding place, I stopped where a huge dead tree leaned precariously on a smaller living one. Throwing off my sack of food, I took my knife from its sheath and began to work with all my energy. The job was finished at last, and I threw myself down behind a fallen log 300 feet away. I did not have to wait long. Patience. Patience, my darling. You'll be fed. Rainsford. Great Got him. Well, What? If, uh, if you are within sound of my voice, as I suppose you are, let me congratulate you. Not many men know how to make a Malay man-catcher. Luckily for me, I too have hunted in Malacca. You are proving interesting, Mr. Rainsford. Hmm. Very interesting. The tree brushed my shoulders. I jumped back. I'm going to have the wound rest. So does slight. So I shall be back, Mr. Rainsford. I should be back. It was flight now, a desperate, hopeless flight that carried me on for hours. I don't know where I got the strength. I kept telling myself over and over again that I must keep my nerve. That I was competing with a monster, a super huntsman. Dusk came, then darkness, and still I managed to press on. The ground grew softer under my moccasins. The vegetation grew ranker, denser. Insects bit at me savagely. Suddenly, as I stepped forward, my foot sank into the ooze. I tried to wrench it back, but the muck sucked viciously at my foot like a giant leech. With a violent effort, I tore my foot loose. I knew where I was then. Death swamp in its quicksand. The softness of the earth had given me an idea. I stepped back from the quicksand a dozen feet or so and began to dig. When the pit was above my shoulders, I climbed out and from some hard saplings cut stakes and sharpened them to fine points. These stakes I planted in the bottom of the pit with the points sticking upwards. As fast as I could, I wove a rough carpet of weeds and branches and with it covered the mouth of the pit. And wet with sweat and aching with tiredness, I crouched behind the stump of a lightning charm tree. Oh, I knew Zaroff was coming. I could hear the paddling sound of his feet in the soft earth. Zaroff was coming and coming fast. He was not feeling his way along foot by foot. Crouching there, I couldn't either see him nor see the pit. I lived a year and a minute, frozen, every muscle tensed. Good, Rainsford. 
very good. You've done well. Your Burmese tiger pit has claimed one of my finest pounds. Again, you score. I think, Mr. Rainsford, I'll see what you can do against my whole pack. I'm going back to get them now. Thank you for a most amusing evening. <laughs> Daybreak, lying near the swamp, I was awakened by a sound that made me know I had new things to learn about fear. It was a distant sound, faint and wavering, but I knew it. It was the baying of a pack of hounds. I could do one of two things. I could stay where I was and wait. That was suicide. I could flee. That was postponing the inevitable. I had put my very last hope into that tiger pit. For a moment, I stood there thinking... All at once, an idea that held a wild chance came to me, and tightening my belt, I headed away from the swamp. The being of the hounds drew nearer. They would be on me any minute now. My mind worked frantically. I thought of a native trick I had learned in Uganda. I caught hold of a springy young sapling, and to it fastened my hunting knife with the blade pointing down the trail. With a bit of wild grapevine, I tied back the sapling. Then I ran for my life. I was raised that terrifying voices as they heard them and felt the fresh scent. I knew then how an animal at bay feels. At last, I had to stop to get my breath. The baying of the hounds stopped just as suddenly. And with it, my heart stopped too. They must have reached the knife. Excitedly, I shinned up a tree and looked back. My pursuers had stopped all right. But the hope that had been in my brain when I climbed died. For in the shallow valley, I saw that General Zarok was still on his feet. But Ivan was not. The currently had come along to hold the hounds. The knife, driven by the recoil of the springing tree, had splintered through his chest. I'd hardly tumbled to the ground when the pack took up the cry again. Nerve, 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 I panted as I dashed along. A blue gap showed between the trees dead ahead. The hounds were almost on top of me. I forced myself on towards that gap. I reached it. It was the shore of the sea. Across the cove, I could see the gloomy gray stone of the castle. Twenty feet below me, the sea rumbled and hissed. I hesitated. I heard the hounds. Then I leaped far out into the sea. to me, and I'm here safe in the general's bedroom waiting for him. Three days are up, and I've eluded him, but now I must go further. In a moment, we will meet, he and I, and he will be unarmed. Only one of us is going to live. You understand that now. Uh, quiet, Shushu. Shushu! Be patient, dear. You must forgive me. You're hungry, I know. <laughs> Shush. Rainsford. Jen. Rainsford. How on earth did you get it? I swam. I found it easier and quicker than walking through the jungle. I congratulate you. You've won the game. Oh, no, General. I'm still a beast at bay. Here. <coughs> Get ready, General Zaroff. Swords? Yes. Two of them. I see. Oh, very good. Very good, Rainsford. One of us, then, is to furnish a repast for the hounds. The other will sleep in this... this very excellent bed. Huh. Excellent. On guard, Rensford.
just as my late host said it would be. A very excellent bed. <laughs> And so closes The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell, starring Orson Welles. Tonight's tale of suspense. Mr. Wells was General Zaroff and Keenan Wynn, Rainsford. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense next week, same time, when Orson Welles will again be our star. In Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Lost Special, the producer of suspense is William Spear, who tonight also directed the broadcast, and who with Bernard Herman, the conductor, Lucian Marowick, who composed the original score, and Private Jacques Anson Fink, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's suspense. is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. women in the armed forces of the United Nations, we present one of America's top spine tinglers, a radio rebroadcast of a program dedicated to the mysterious, the unusual, and sometimes the supernatural, a program of suspense. The producer of suspense asks you to almost believe that the following is true. Very well. Standing beside me, surrounded by two guards, is a man who in a few short hours is to be put to death in the electric chair. His last request to the warden was that he be allowed to speak on this program and reveal what he calls some startling information. The warden naturally turned to us and we at once complied, anxious at all times to do anything, however strange that will hold our listeners in suspense. All right, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm speaking correctly. Yes, right here, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this broadcast will never be completed. I'm going to tell you a story. The story involves a number of famous and influential people here as well as abroad. These people have received warning from me, and I am sure all of them are making it a point to listen to me now. I shall not name these great, these rich, these influential gentlemen until my story is over. They will recognize the story. They will remember me. They will take the necessary steps for my reprieve. I shall expect a full pardon and safe conduct to a neutral country. These are my terms. I shall expect word of this to be brought to this studio during this broadcast. But as I have warned you, this broadcast will never be finished. You will never hear those names. It is certain my price will be paid. I am presently under sentence of death for my activities in the matter of refueling German submarines in the Caribbean. My full confession has been reproduced in the popular press. You have read it and you know the details. It is the least ingenious of my exploits and my first failure. So much for it. The story I shall tell you tonight occurred many years ago, but concerns, as I have said, many now living. It will interest you, I hope. I know it will interest them. Very well, then. 
Uh, on the 3rd of June, 1925, in Liverpool, a man who gave his name as Monsieur Louis Caratel asked to see Mr. James Bland, the superintendent of the London and West Coast Railway. He was a small man, this Caratel, middle-aged, darkened, with a stoop so pronounced that it suggested some deformity of the spine. He was accompanied by a friend, a man of imposing physique, who from his swarthy complexion was probably either a Spaniard or a South American. It turned out later that his name was Gomez. One peculiarity was observed in him. He carried in his left hand, fastened to his wrist by a strap, a small leather dispatch case. No importance was attached to this fact at the time, but later events endowed it with much significance. Monsieur Caratel was shown to Mr. Blant's office while his companion remained outside. <laughs> My name is Louis Caratel. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? I have just arrived from Central America this afternoon. It is extremely urgent that I reach Paris without a moment's delay. Paris, eh? Hmm. It's too bad. Just missed the London Express. I am not interested in the London Express. Could you provide me with a special train? Yes, I think that could be arranged. Oh? It's quite an expensive proposition. Uh, money is of a small importance, monsieur. Time is everything. If you can arrange a special for me in a hurry, you may make your own terms. Very well. Mr. Hood, will you step over here a moment, please? Yes, Mr. Bland. Uh, Mr. Hood, uh, here's our traffic manager, Mr. Caratel. Mm. Mr. Hood, I want you to arrange a special for him. He's going to Paris. How's the line? Can you fix him up in a hurry? Why, yes, I believe so, Mr. Bland. The line is clear through Manchester, and engine 247 at the Rochdale is on the tracks now. It could be ready, say, in 15 minutes. Good. Who's available for the trip? Uh, engineer Smith, sir. And I can put James McPherson on as conductor. Well, there you are, Mr. Caratel. Simple as that. Tend to everything right away, will you, Hood? Yes, sir. Uh, these men, uh, Mr. Smith and... Uh, uh, Mc McPherson? Uh, McPherson. Are they trustworthy? Oh, yes. Of course. McPherson's been with the company for years. And I'm sure Smith, although new, is an expert engineer. Well, thank you, monsieur. I am deeply indebted. You have been most considerate. At 4.31 exactly by the station clock, the special train with Caratel and Gomez steamed out of the Liverpool station. The line at that time was clear and there should have been no stoppage between Manchester. At a quarter after six, considerable surprise and some consternation was caused among the officials at Liverpool. They received a wire from Manchester to say that the special had not yet arrived. An inquiry directed at once to St. Helens, which is a third of the way between the two cities. We elicited the following reply. To James Bland, Superintendent Liverpool. Special passed here at 4.52. Well up to time. Dowser, St. Helens. The wire was received at 6.40. At 6.50, a second message was received from Manchester. No sign of special is advised by you. And then, ten minutes later, a third, more bewildering. Presume some mistake is proposed running of special. Local train from St. Helens, time to follow it, has just arrived and has seen nothing of it. Kindly wire advice it. Manchester. The matter was assuming a most amazing aspect. Although in some respects the last telegram was a relief to the authorities at Liverpool, if an accident had occurred to the special, it seemed hardly possible that the local train could have passed down the same line without observing it. And yet, what was the alternative? Where could the train be? A telegram was dispatched to each of the stations between St. Helens and Manchester, and the superintendent and his traffic manager waited in the utmost suspense at the instrument for the series of replies. The answers came back in the order of questions, which was the order of the stations beginning at St. Helens. Special passed here, five o'clock, Collins Green. Special passed here, six past five, Earl Stout. Special passed here, five ten, Newton. Special passed here, 5.20, Kenyon Junction. No special train is passed here, Barton Moss. Hood, this is unique in my 30 years of experience. I can't understand it, Mr. Bland. The special has gone wrong between Kenyon Junction and Barton Moss. And yet there's no siding between the two stations. Special must have run off the rails, jumped the track. But how could the 450 parliamentary pass over the same line without seeing it? There's no alternative, Hood. Absolutely must be so. 
possibly the local naval preserved hunting which may throw sunlight on the matter. We'll wire to Manchester for more information and to Kenyon Junction with instructions that the line be examined intently as far as Bath and Moss. <laughs> The answer from Manchester came within a few minutes. No news of missing special. Driver and guard of local train positive. No accident between Kenyon Junction and Barton Moss. Line quite clear and no sign of anything unusual. Manchester. This is lunacyhood. Does a train vanish into thin air in England in broad daylight? The thing's preposterous. An engine, a tender, a car, five human beings, and all lost on a straight line of railway. It's impossible. A month elapsed, during which both the police and the company prosecuted their inquiries without the slightest success. Mr. Bland, at the end of this period, offered his resignation. It was accepted. The affair remained unsolved. A reward was offered and a pardon promised in case of crime, but they were both unclaimed. Every day the public opened their papers with the conviction that so grotesque a mystery would at last be solved, but week after week passed by and a solution remained as far off as ever. Then a new and most unexpected incident occurred. This was nothing less than the receipt by Mrs. McPherson of a letter from her husband, James McPherson, who had been conductor of the missing train. The letter, which was dated July 5, 1925, was posted from Mozambique, Portuguese East Africa, and came to hand upon the July 14th. My dear wife, I've been thinking a great deal, and I find it very hard to give you up. I try to fight against it, but it will always come back to me. I send you some money, which will change into 20 English pounds. This should be enough to bring you here. Things are very difficult with me at present, and I'm not very happy, finding it so hard to give you up. So no more at present. From your loving husband, James McPherson. For a time, it was confidently anticipated that the letter would lead to the clearing up of the whole incident. As directed, Mrs. McPherson sailed to Portuguese East Africa. She stayed in Mozambique for some time, but heard nothing from the missing man. Finally, she returned to Liverpool, and so the matter stood. And has continued to stand right up to the present moment. Incredible as it may seem, nothing has transpired during those 18 years which has shed the least light upon the extraordinary disappearance of this special train which contained Monsieur Caratel and his companion, Mr. Gomez, and McPherson, the conductor, Smith, the engineer, the fireman named Slater. And now, after all this time, I shall clear up the entire affair. And unless I hear from those so highly respectable gentlemen who were my employers and who are completely implicated in the crime, unless I hear from them before I'm finished... Their names will be revealed on this broadcast. Take final warning, gentlemen. You know I mean what I say. If you are smart, you are at this moment arranging my reprieve. I must remind you, time is short. You have just uh, six minutes. <clears throat> now, for the interest of my other listeners, I shall resume the story of the lost special. In a word... There was a famous trial in Paris in the year 1925, perhaps you recall it, in connection with a monstrous scandal, a scandal in politics and finance. How monstrous that scandal was can never be known except by such confidential agents as myself. At stake were the honor and careers of many of the chief men of Europe and the United States. A secret committee was formed to manage the business. Some subscribed to the committee who hardly understood what were its objects, but others understood very well... They can rely upon it that I have not forgotten their names. You think I could forget your names, gentlemen? You uh, pillars of the community, great, rich, respected, honorable men. Hmm? You remember that day in May 1925? The fashionable country club, remember? And the golf game that was played there that spring morning? Ladies and gentlemen, that was the strangest golf game ever played in the history of this world. Oh, Ratch, look at that drive. I've been playing badly all morning. <laughs> you topped it, Senator. 
Perhaps you're a little nervous. I beg your pardon? May I join your game? Uh, well, I'm not sure... Not sure should... of what? Of me? <laughs> I promise you, gentlemen, you can be very sure of me. I'm the man you're supposed to meet. The distinguished congressman here can vouch for me. Yeah, he's the one, all right. Yes. This is the Lerniak. Uh, Mr. Delerniak, may I present... Uh, the... My name is not really Delerniak, gentlemen, but I am sure that bothers you no less than it does me. Besides, there is no need for introductions. I know everyone present by sight and by reputation. <clears throat> my drive, I believe. Thank you. <clears throat> not so good. Two hundred and, uh, what, about fifty yards... <laughs> I hope I'm not going to continue in this way. You're, you're sure we can talk safely here, Frank? Uh, How do please we know that... set your mind at ease. We shan't be overheard in the middle of a golf course. Mm -hmm. There's no convenient hiding place here for dictaphones, even in the rough, where I notice you're playing the greater part of your game, Senator. You must be nervous this morning. I know, but I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Well, it's, it's not the superlative uh... course you are accustomed to on your own enormous... Uh, California estate, sir, but it's going to have to serve our particular purpose. Oh, by the way, let me compliment you on the way you've had your syndicate of newspapers handle the recent strike situation and the editorial which appeared under your own signature this morning. Yes, well calculated to stir up please, trouble please, with the uh, labor. Let's get on with our business. We... Yes, I, uh, uh, Mr. Delenac... At your service, sir, and may I suggest we... Continue our game. I know the absence of caddies is an inconvenience. Uh, Mr. Delognac, in June, a month from now in Paris, there will be a most uh, important trial. Ah, yes. During its progress... Uh, pardon me, are you referring to the Sarinsky trial? Oh. Yes. Uh, I... You know about it, then? Well, certain interesting details. I know something of It's my business, after all, to keep myself informed about these matters. It is not for nothing that I am known as the most... Then let me continue, please. This trial, yes. I'm speaking in the utmost confidence, you understand. Uh, this trial could, if certain evidence were introduced, could have a very serious effect upon the prestige and standing of some most important men. Yeah, I'm sure in fact, it. it could even... You're shivering, Senator. You find it cold out uh, here? No, no, no. Get on with it, Frank. Get to the point. For heaven's sake, please. The evidence which one man could bring to the trial could ruin these men. Without it, the trial will collapse for want of facts. Mm -hmm. But if this one man arrives in yeah, Paris, uh, I... Quite evidently, you do not wish him to arrive in Paris. No. Uh, gentlemen, you have come to the man. This uh, sounds indeed like the sort of thing which no one in the world can manage with such skill and success as myself. I must admit, however, that my services come rather high. Well, but... It's only natural, since there is only the one... The money makes no difference. We have formed a group, a committee, and we have the command of an unlimited amount of money. Absolutely ah, unlimited, and you hear. We will name people in places now. Who is the gentleman whose appearance in Paris would uh, cause such regrettable embarrassment? His name is Caratal, Louis ah, Caratal. Right. He knows everything. He has papers, yes, documents, yes, I, all I the understand. evidence. Where would... is this Monsieur Caratal uh, at present? Well, he's sailing from somewhere in Central America Central within America. the next few days. Uh, that much we know. Good, good. Central America. I have an excellent man down there in Central America. This Caratel, uh, you know anything about him, uh, person, his personal well, habits? Well, uh, no, very little. He's a small man, dark. Uh, he yes. has a bodyguard, a great big bruiser named uh, Lopez. Let Gomez me see from Central like America. That would be the Americano Tropicana. Well, those are my uh, ships. You do. Trips uh, all commence at Liverpool, mm. I believe. Uh, that's where the ships dock and our famous trial is to begin in three weeks. That would mean that Monsieur Caratel would go directly to London, and I imagine that once there he would be heavily guarded, since it can be no surprise to him that you gentlemen are not without uh, connections in the British uh, capital. Uh, that's good, clean you see, thinking. this is not so simple as some of my other exploits, a simple assassination. Huh? Uh, there's your ball, sir. You're playing a Dunlop 38, aren't you? Huh? Uh. Oh, yes, yes, to be sure, yes. <laughs> Quite. Uh, as I said, a simple assassination, the usual clumsy job will not do here. The documents might, after all, be found. The bodyguard might survive somehow, and then we have accomplished nothing, that's all. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, are you going to play? Yes, yes, of course, of course. Topped it again, I'm afraid. <laughs> Shall we proceed? I already have three plans in my head, gentlemen. I have a plan for nailing him at the Central American port from which he embarks. I have a plan for his disposal aboard the ship. But in each of these cases, I, Delaniac, will be unable to be present. So there is the chance of failure. <clears throat> I will think of a third plan, gentlemen. I shall sail immediately to Liverpool on my way there, sitting on the deck in the May sunshine. I shall conceive my third plan. It must be something special. Something very special. Ah, there I am. Is this your famous water hazard? Well, 
I think a number seven iron will do it. And thus I undertook to bring about the complete destruction of Monsieur Caratelli's bodyguard companion Gomez and his documents. Plan one was already out the window as I found out the next day. The Lerniak, White Sulphur Springs, Virginia. Baby Lou, unable to sleep the last few nights, have sent him to visit Aunt Henriette. We'll rejoin him on 21st. Love, Jenny. Uh, this telegram from Matagalpa conveyed to me the information that Caratel, possibly sensing danger, had moved from his hotel and gone to stay with friends until his ship sailed. So it was impossible to carry out the idea of the fire in the hotel. His ship leaving on the 21st was the Henriette. On my fourth day at sea, I heard from her. The Lanark, Barangaria. Ship-to-ship communication from Henriette, Tropicana Line. Presented Grace your box of chocolates. Louise has given up candy for Lent. Grace still wants us all together for 29th birthday party. Will be really special. Ralph. This meant that poison had been given to Gomez, the bodyguard, in an effort to get him at least out of the way. He'd been unable to succumb to it. He'd thrown off the effects, and it was evidenced by the report that we would all be together on the 29th. Now, Caratel had refused to eat the food containing the poison. So much for plan two, which was not worthy of me anyway, since there was always the possibility of the bodies being found in the ocean. The man Gomez was carrying the documents in a dispatch case strapped to his wrist, and I must tell you something now. I was glad, glad, mind you, that we had failed so far, for the plan I had conceived on the night I arrived in Liverpool was so magnificent, so absolutely unprecedented in the annals of crime, that I owed it to myself, to my employers, and to history to carry it through. The inspiration came from the words in the code telegram which indicated that Cartel would arrive uh, in London and hire a special train there to convey him uh, from Liverpool. My British agent, Mr. Moore, and I contrived to buy over several officials of the railway. Now, here begins the story. First, the division head who helped us employ James McPherson, whom we contrived to be the conductor of any special train we designated. Then further, at a sum that would make them independent for life, we bought over an engine driver named Oswald Smith and the fireman John Slater. These men we arranged with the division head would be assigned to whatever special train was hired by Caratel. On the afternoon of June 3rd, as I was sitting in my room at the inn at Barton Moss, the call I had been awaiting came through. It was McPherson reporting. Hello, Mr. Delaniac. We shall be leaving in a few minutes. Mm. He's hired the special. Good. Smith will be engine driver and Slater fireman. And, of course, I'll be in charge. What about Moore? Will he be aboard? I'm afraid not, sir. He gave him quite a story about having to reach his sick wife and all. But Caratel would have none of it. You said, though, sir, that it didn't matter. It, it does not matter. What uh, time will you pass Kenyon Junction? Mm. Let me see, sir. If we leave the next few minutes, we should be there at 5.10. 5.10. It's a 49-minute run, sir. Uh, 45 minutes. I, I, I can make it, but delay all you can before you start. Uh, yes, sir. I guess it's all up to you from now on. Best of luck, sir. Oh, uh, here they come, sir. Goodbye. <laughs> And now I went to work. Everything had been prepared for days before. And only the finishing touches were needed. The side track, just before Gorton Moss, leading to the abandoned Hartsey's Mine, had once joined the main line. But it had been disconnected when the mine had been worked out some years before. We had only to replace a few rails to connect it once more. With my small but competent band of workers, we had everything ready well before the special arrived. When it did arrive, it ran off upon the small sideline so easily that the jolting of the switch points appears to have been entirely unnoticed by the two travelers. So, now I have our special train upon the small line, which leads, or rather used to lead, to the abandoned mine. 
You will ask how it is that no one saw the train upon this unused line. I answer that along its entire length it runs through a deep cutting, and that unless someone had been on the edge of that cutting, he could not have seen it. There was someone on the edge of that cutting. I was there. And now I will tell you what I saw. The moment the train was fairly on the sideline, Smith slowed down the engine, and then having turned it on full speed ahead, he and McPherson with Slater, the fireman, sprang off before it was too late. It may be that it was this slowing down which first attracted the attention of the travelers, but the train was running at top speed before their heads appeared at the open window. It makes me smile to think how bewildered they must have been. What a catch must have come to their breath as it flashed upon them that it was not Manchester that was awaiting them, but death. The train was now running at frantic speed, rolling and rocking over the rough and rusty line, while the wheels made a frightful screaming sound on the corroded surface. I was close to them and could see their faces. Caratel was praying, I think. There was something like a rosary dangling out of his hand. The other Gomez roared like a bull, but was drowned out by the incredible noise of the train. He saw me standing on the bank, and when he realized he couldn't be heard, he beckoned to me like a madman, tearing at his wrist and hurling the dispatch box out of the window in my direction. Of course, his meaning was obvious. Here was the evidence that they would promise to be silent if their lives were spared. Would have been very agreeable if it could have been done so, but business is business. Besides, the train was now so much beyond our control as it was dangerous. He ceased his howling and gesturing when the train rattled around the curve and they saw the black mouth of the mine yawning before them. They were struck silent by what they saw, and yet they could not withdraw their heads. The sight seemed to have paralyzed them. I had wondered how the train running at a great speed would take the pit and I was much interested in watching it. One of my colleagues, who had joined me there, thought it actually would jump it, and indeed it was not very far from doing so. It leaped into the air and seemed to hang suspended for a moment. The funnel flew off into the air, and then the van, the car, and the engine were all smashed up into one jumble, which choked the mouth of the great pit, and something gave way in the middle, and the whole mass of iron coal fittings, wheels, woodwork, and cushions crumbled together and crashed into the mine. It was perfect. The deep muddy water standing in the bottom of the pit 200 feet below responded to the intense heat of the engine boilers. It hissed loudly and blew great bubbles of black mire into the air. At the same time, the walls of the pit loosened by the impact of the train as it struck the opposite side, gave way, and a mighty avalanche of rock and dirt thundered down upon the wreckage of the train as it settled with a low, hissing sigh and was covered forever by the mud and mire, the vapor hanging in the air shredded off into thin, small wisps, and all was quiet again. In the heart's is mine. <laughs> and now, having carried out our plan so successfully, it remained only to leave no trace behind us. Our little band of workers at the other end had already ripped up the rails and disconnected the sideline, replacing everything as it had been before. We were equally busy at the mine. The lines which led to it were torn up and taken away. Then, without flurry but without delay, we all made our way out of the country, most of us to Paris, my English agent, to Manchester and McPherson to East Africa. A word in passing about McPherson, who was foolish enough to write to his wife and tell her to meet him in Mozambique. And naturally, we took steps to ensure that this meeting would ever come about. I have sometimes thought it would be a kindness to write to Mrs. McPherson and to assure her that there is no impediment to her marrying again. <clears throat> but of the lost special, let the English papers of that date tell how thoroughly we had done our work and how completely we had thrown the cleverest of their detectives off our track. You will remember that Gomez threw his bag of papers out of the window... And I need not say that I secured that bag and brought them to my employers. It may interest my employers now, however, to learn that out of that bag, 
I took one or two little painters as a souvenir of that occasion. I had no wish to read the information obtained by these papers, but it is now... Oh, it's less than a minute before my broadcast is over. And I have received no word. It is the final hour. I see at the other end of the studio the engineer waving his hands at me that my time is almost up. Well, I gave you warning. You had your chance, gentlemen. Very well. Now I reveal your names. And the first name I reveal is that of Charles Fox. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, they're trying murder. I want you to hear these names quickly. I know you will avenge me. The names are... <coughs> Kalanya, Kalanya, can you hear me? Are you all right? Hey, Bill, play something quick. Will you theme curtain music? Anything? And so closes the last special by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, starring Orson Welles. Tonight's tale of. Suspense. This rebroadcast of Suspense was produced in the United States of America. This is the Man in Black, here to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. In Hollywood this evening, our star is the young American actor who, within a single year, has become one of the most provocative of Hollywood's leading men, Mr. Gene Kelly. Mr. Kelly appears tonight as a gentleman named Art Kramer, a gentleman of most uncertain scruples, engaged with other gentlemen of similar disrespectability in distinctly unlawful practices. Our suspense play by Robert L. Richards is called Thieves Fall Out. And in it, in support of our star, you will hear Hans Conried as a racetrack devotee by name Canelli and William John Stone as Sam Gross. And so with Thieves Fall Out and with the performance of Gene Kelly as Art Kramer, we again hope to keep you in suspense. ABC Enterprises... No, he's not in. No, I don't know where you can locate him. Yes, yes I'll tell him you called. ABC Enterprises, ABC Enterprises. Why does he give all these guys his phone number if he wants to keep this business so quiet? Yeah, uh, you know, wants to do favors for people he meets in bars, brags how he can get things for him. You know. Sure, I know. And the next day I have to give him the brush off. He's going to brag to the wrong guy someday. Hi, Yachty. Hello. Hello, Arthur. Hiya, babe. Where you been the last couple of days? Uh, ducking all the guys I owe money to. What time is Sam getting the boys together? About a half an hour. Down at the warehouse. You better start down there pretty soon. What's the difference? I won't get enough out of it to buy a round trip to Coney Island. Any calls? 
Yeah, Canelli called a little while ago. That punk. Another guy who wants dough I haven't got. Did you stall him? I tried, but he said he was coming up anyway. Oh, would you let him do that for you? No, I don't want to see that guy. I couldn't help it. He knows the way he Okay, is. okay. Anything else? No. Arthur, if you're not going down right away, can I talk to you for a minute? What about? Oh, something. Joe, watch this switchboard for me, will you, while I talk to Arthur in the next room? What's he got that I haven't got? No cracks out of you. Please, Arthur? All right, but make it snappy. Now what? Oh, Arthur, what, what's the matter lately? You know what's been the matter, everything. Me too. Oh, don't start that again. Rita, it's no use. Look, you're a good kid, but it's no use. You didn't used to say that. All right. So now I own nearly ten grand around this town. And there's some plenty tough monkeys. If I don't get it up pretty soon, it's going to be too bad. Top of that, I had a loaded truck and a trailer hijacked last week, and there goes my take for the month and more. And you want to know what's the matter. Oh, Arthur, honey, why don't you quit? Why don't you get out while you still can? Why don't I quit? What are you talking about? Oh, you used to have a decent business, Arthur. Sure, sure, and I didn't eat. Well, what about now? It's making a wreck of you. It's, it's dangerous. You know what's going to happen. This whole black market thing's going to crack pretty soon, and when it does, you Ah, you're... don't be silly. Yeah? Canelli's outside to see you, Artie. That punk. All right, let him come in. What's one more? Okay. Uh, better let me talk to him alone, baby. All right. Think about I, what I said, will you? Sure. Oh, hi, Ozzy. I thought I might catch you. Yeah, I'll bet. Close the door. Sure. Hey, listen, Arthur. I need that dough. Well, I haven't got it. I told you that. Uh, no, 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 look. I don't want there should be no trouble. With There's you. not going to be any trouble. Take it easy. I didn't mean that. But I took them bets from you on my own. Now my boss is after me. If I don't get that dough by Monday, I'm going to be in trouble. Well, I haven't got it, and I won't have it for another month. Uh, can't you get it from Sam? No, I'm into him as far as I can be now. What do you mean? Sam must have plenty sold it down in some safe deposit vault by now. It huh? isn't in a vault. It's up at his place in Connecticut. Anyway, he won't give me any more. Connecticut, huh? I didn't know he had a place in Connecticut. Uh, near Riverside. It's a hideout, way away from everything. Oh. McPhail has one, too, about five miles away. When's he go there? He's hardly ever there. Nobody's there. What do you care? You're thinking of the days when you used to climb through second-story windows? Oh, you shouldn't ought to say that, Art. I don't even know where the junk is. No, I was kidding. Anyway, listen, I'm I'm sorry about the dough, but you'll have to wait. Uh, Art, you don't know the spot I'm in. You... You'll get it from me when I've got it. I'm uh, leaving. Uh, Art, listen. You coming? Where you going? Down to the warehouse to watch my share of last month's take go down the drain. Where is it? Artie. Okay. You late. Yeah, I stopped in at the office. Hi, McPhail. Hi, Mo. Uh, you uh, weren't waiting just for me to hand out the chips, were you? Yeah, right. We weren't. I just wanted you to know how it worked out. It was a good month out. Except for you. I know, I know. Come on, Sam, come on. Pass around the sugar. Let's get it over with. Well, here it is. In cash. Total take was 53 grand. 17 goes to you, McPhail. I got the figures all here if you want to see. I know you wouldn't double-cross me, Sam. I wouldn't double-cross anybody. And well, don't forget it. You should do. Oh, yours is six. You understand you didn't bring in as much business as McPhail. I ain't complaining. And I get 21. Part of that is paying expenses. The rest is my percentage. Don't I get anything? What? Your cut would have been nine grand. But there was that truck and trailer. Those things cost dough, you know. To say nothing of a whole load of prime meat. You have to take it all out now? I already have. I'll give you 500 to keep going on. Oh, that's fine. 500. Listen, Sam, I need dough. You always need dough and never have none. Listen, He's you... He's right, Art. You've got to get yourself straightened out. If I give you any more, it'll just go to the bookies and gambling joints like the rest of us. Listen, Sam, I tell you, I got to have it. This guy's after me. I think he's yellow, Sam. You keep your big mouth out of this. Yeah. I was a respectable businessman when you were running a lousy clip joint on Sands. Yeah, yeah, and you're starving. You're still starving. 
Because you haven't the guts to keep a couple of mugs from hijacking your stuff. Why, you... Cut it out now. Cut it out. There's not going to be any trouble in this organization. There's plenty for everybody. Now, listen, Art. Yeah? Why don't you go up to my place in Connecticut for a few days? Take it easy. And let me talk to these guys who are looking for you. I know who they are. They don't want any more talk. Anyway, I go nuts up there in the country. Go on. Pick up my car at the station. No, thanks. Well, I'm going. I'm going out to the country and tend to my victory garden. Your victory garden? Yeah. I see you about Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, hey, Mac. Yeah? Uh, wait a minute. So long, Art. Uh, so long. Uh, say, uh, Mac, uh, I'm sorry I made any cracks. Yeah, <laughs> forget it. Uh, Mac, you uh, going up to the country? Yeah, bet your life. Going down and get on the 520 right now. Say, uh, you know, uh, I think I'll take Mac up, uh, Mac, I, uh, well, I kind of need a rest. I, I, yeah, I think... Yeah, you'll need something. Uh, do you mind if I ride up on the train with you? Why not? Why not? It's a public train. Oh, you know, uh, Mac, I was sorry about Say, that. Say, Artie, Artie. Yeah? Don't mind me. I talk a lot. And I don't mean it. Ah, oh, forget it, Mac. I know. Hey, you want to see my victory garden? Are you kidding? No, no, I got a garden. It's a view, too. Want to see it? Sure, sure I would. I, I always like gardens. Well, well, in that case, you'll have to stop over at my place on your, on your way to Sam's, huh? It'll be a pleasure. Come on in, Artie. I want to put this dough in the safe, and then I'll then I'll show you around. Sure. <laughs> ah, when the war is over and I'm legitimate, I'm gonna build onto it. Have a lot of lawn, gardener, real country gentleman. Uh, what's this? Your office? I do a little business here once in a while. Keep my dough in the safe there until I bank it. <laughs> Know anything about safes? No. Huh. It's good. It's good. Not that I don't trust you, Artie. Yeah. There she is. Put him up, Mac. What? You heard me. I'm not a movie. A stick up, huh? Why, you yellow little rat? You don't think you can pull this on me and live, do you? It's not a stick up, Mac. I just want you to do me a little favor, and I want to be sure you do it. Yeah? Yeah, get on that phone. This had better be a gag. It won't be unless you do exactly what I tell you. What? Call Reed in town. Ask her what Sam has lined up for Tuesday. Say you called me over at Sam's house just now and talked to me, but I didn't know. Come on, get going. Edward at three. Five, five, six, two. Listen, Art. I'm no guy to kid around with. And I don't like this. Talk. Yeah. Rita, this is Mac. What's Sam got lined up for Tuesday? I just talked to Artie over at Sam's place. Yeah. Yeah, up here in the country. He said he didn't know to call you. Oh, I say. Cut it short. No, 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 never mind. Okay. All right. Now, what's the gag? You never were very smart, were you, Mac? Huh? That's my alibi. You just told Rita you talked to me at Sam's place. You get it? Why, you... <laughs> Neatly done, Art Kramer. Virtually a perfect alibi. And $17,000 in cold cash. There was someone else who thought he had a perfect setup, too. Canelli, the little bookie, whose former occupations were even less savory. It wasn't hard for Canelli to find where Sam's place was in Connecticut, in New York's underground of petty crime, and find out anything. And it wasn't hard to jimmy a window, and that often enough. Ah, and then to find the money. There was a wad of money here at Sam's place somewhere. Art Kramer had said so, probably in a safe. That wouldn't be any trouble either. Not in the living room, of course. 
Yes, maybe this room. Yeah. An office, a desk and phone, and the safe there in the wall. And just as he thought, old-fashioned, easy to crack. <laughs> First to drill a little hole, then the soup. There'd be a quick, neat little explosion, and the safe would fall apart in his hands. Huh? But wait, what's that? A car driving up, stopping. Who? Art Kramer had said nobody ever came up here. Mm. But it was leaving now, driving away. Probably just a mistake. No, no. Steps outside. Somebody coming in. What to do? Escape cut off. Hide. Here in the office, behind the door. Hide the bag of tools, quick. He's coming in here. Hello, operator. Now, what New York City? At water three... Five, five, six, two. Yeah, that's right. Hello, Rita. Sam. Listen, Rita, get a hold of everybody. Artie, Mac, Moe, everybody you can. I've got a tip off. There's going to be a raid. Yeah, cops. Tell the boys to duck. Lay low until they hear from me. Find out where they're going to be and call me right back as soon as you contact everybody. Got it? Yeah? Oh, okay. I'll get hold of Mac myself as long as he's up here. Artie, too? Well, I'm calling from my place now. I don't see him anywhere. Well, he must have changed his mind. Well, I didn't look in the garage. He came by cab. He's probably around someplace, yeah. Well, I'll wait for your call, then. Okay, Rita. And make it snappy now. Hey. Connelly. What are you no, doing? No, Sam. I'll just... The safe. Why are you... No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sam. Sam. Hit him too hard. He's dead. Dead. Yes, hit him too hard. Murder. That's a lot different from housebreaking. Murder. The phone. Somebody calling Sam. Fear, blind, unreasoning fear. Smash it, rip it out of the wall. As though whoever was on the other end could actually hear, actually see what was in this room. Murder and a murderer. Oh. There. Why, oh, why had he done that? Foolish. Just nerves. You've got to get hold of yourself. Think, think, think. What now? The money. Yes, have to have the money now. Make a getaway. Mexico, South America. Maybe Sam. Huh? Yes, the body. He to even touch him. But turn him over. There, the wallet. Empty. That's funny. Other pockets. No, no, nothing. The safe, then. Finish the job quick. Then get out. Find the drill again. Hurry. Again, somebody coming. Who? Never mind. Not going to be caught this time. Can't be. A murderer. Close the door. Lock it quick. Lock it. Key. Hide. Maybe whoever it is will go away. Then come back and get the money later. Hi, quickly, kitchen. Get out the back window again if you have to, but wait, wait. He's not following. Wonder who it is. Just have a look through the crack of the door. Careful, there. Art. Art Kramer. The suitcase must be going to stay. But wait, why not? Art wouldn't know anything. Couldn't with the office door locked. Give him a plausible story. Stay overnight and get the money when he's asleep. A chance but have to take it. Yeah. Have to have the money now. Why not tell Art he'd come looking for Sam to borrow? Then, looking through the house for him, call him. Yes, make it look natural. He can't answer now. Call him. Sam. Sam. Hello, anybody here? Hello. Who is it? Who is it yourself? I, I'm looking for Mr. Gross, Sam Gross. Well, what are you doing here? Hello, Arthur. I was looking for Sam. I thought you didn't know where this place was. Oh, I found out. Yeah? Uh, what made you think Sam was going to be up here? Why, well, I, I heard a tip in town. There might be some trouble. I figured he might come up here to duck out. What kind of trouble? Cops. Yeah? I didn't hear anything. I don't know, but I'd do something. You know, I'd need dough the worst way. I figured Sam might let me have a little. He paid off today, didn't he? That's right. Art, did you get any? Me? Well, if you did, 
I don't like to keep asking you, but I need it, Arthur. Why, uh, why, uh, look, uh, Canelli. Huh? You know, I meant to get in touch with you about that. I wanted to talk to you this afternoon. You mean you got some, huh? Uh, come on inside, I'll tell you. Oh, sure, sure. I, uh, got an idea. An idea came like a flash to Art Kramer. Frame Canelli for the murder of McPhail. Plant some of McPhail's money on him as evidence. And who would ever believe Canelli's word, a man with a criminal record against Art's? Why, Rita would swear that McPhail himself had said Art was at Sam's place, simply denied that he'd ever seen Canelli, and Canelli would be McPhail's murderer, and Art Kramer would be safe forever. Now, uh, about that money. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did get some. Not much, understand? Well, even a little would help. Uh, how much do I owe you all together? Nearly 4000 huh? Well, uh, suppose I gave you two. I shouldn't give you that much, the way I'm fixed. Well, it ain't what I need, but it'll help. Okay, uh, here's two grand on account. Oh. You know, it uh, doesn't leave me with much. I appreciate it, Aunt, really. Say, uh, you're uh, really on a spot, huh? Yeah. How much more do you need? Oh, not a four or five, anyway. Oh, oh well, uh, you know, I just thought I know where you can get it if you work it right. You do? Yeah. You uh, know McPhail? Oh, I know him. Not well. Well, I do. He took in plenty this month. What good does that do me? I tell you, I know the guy. What? He's the softest touch in the world. He'd give the shirt off his back to anybody if they told him the right story. Yeah? How come you don't put the bite on him? He doesn't like me, but anyone else. <laughs> you mean, uh, I just ask you? Sure. You get anything you want. I'm not kidding. If you ask for ten, even twenty, you, you'd get it if he had it. No four. Sure. He's up here in the country now, too. Right up the same back road, four and a half miles. Hey, uh, how do I recognize the place? It's a big place on the right. The only house for a mile. You can't miss it. Say, I'd, I'd run up there if I were you. Uh, maybe I will, huh? Maybe I will. A break. The kind of break Canelli had prayed for. Get the money from McPhail. Yes, quicker and safer than trying to get back in that room with a dead body on the floor. Get it from McPhail and have a good head start. Art won't find Sam's body in there for at least a day or two. The door's locked and Canelli has the key. He can be on a plane with McPhail's money and be out of the country by tomorrow. A break, the perfect break. Uh, well, thanks for the tip, Art. <laughs> You sure McPhail's up there, huh? Sure, he's always there, every weekend. He's got a garden, <laughs> a victory garden. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lie. Well, I guess I better get going, huh? Yeah, look around the grounds for him first. If sure. he isn't outside, just walk right in. Uh, the door's always open. He's a simple guy, trust anybody. Uh, okay, uh, thanks, Arthur. Skip it. Maybe someday you can do the same for me. Yeah. Yeah, maybe someday I can. Well, so long. So long. And now, Art has a job to finish. Phone the cops. From here? No, better not. They might trace it. The gas station at the crossroad. Plenty of time. Canelli will be there five or ten minutes before he finds what he'll find as the cops find him. How easy he fell for it. But never mind that now. The gas station. The phone. <laughs> Hello. I want the police. Uh, hurry, please. Hello, uh, Riverside Police? Uh, listen, I, I was just driving down Nine Mile Road. I was going by the old McPhail place. You know the place I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. I, I was going slow and I heard something. It sounded like someone was being killed. Yeah, yes, a murder. There were shots and somebody screaming and more shots. A man's voice. Oh, it was terrible. You better get up there right away. Oh, never mind who I am. I don't want to get in any trouble. No, but get up there. Yes, murder. Get your call all right, sir? Yeah, thanks. ABC Enterprises. Yes, did you locate him yet? 
Oh, well, keep trying and call me back. Joe, I'm worried. Hey, don't worry about him. If you can't find Mo, neither can the cop. I'm not thinking about him. I'm worried about Sam and, and Arthur. Maybe they went out. Sam said he'd wait for my call. It isn't that. It's the phone's dead. I've got to get in touch with him somehow. Can it wait? No, it can't. Not with the cops raiding the warehouse and arresting everyone in sight. Well, how about a telegram? Oh, too slow. I hate to send anyone around to the house, but Sam will understand this time. What are you going to do? Get the telephone company to help. Hello? I want the Riverside, Connecticut traffic operator, please. Yes. You know, it's funny about that phone. It rang two or three times, and then suddenly it went dead. I... Oh, hello, traffic operator? Have you a phone listed under the name of Gross? Samuel Gross. Well, there's something wrong with it, and it's very important that I get in touch with Mr. Gross right away. I'm his secretary. Will you send a man up right away? Thanks. And would you tell Mr. Gross that I've been trying to reach him? Thank you. Oh, see? When Sam finds out there's something wrong with his phone, he can phone me from outside. You're a pretty smart girl sometimes, Rita. Yeah. Don't you believe me? I just wish I was smart enough to get some sense across to that guy, Art Kramer, once in a while. You kind of like him, don't you? Oh, cut it out. Eh, don't worry about Artie. He'll be all right. Sure. I suppose. I suppose he'll be all right. <laughs> Mr. Gross, I'm from the telephone company. Mr. Gross isn't here. Oh. Well, we just got word from New York that his secretary's been trying to reach him, but his phone is out of order. I was sent up to look at it. Sure, go right ahead. I'm a friend of Mr. Gross. I know he'd want you to fix it. Okay. Where is it? First door to your right. Well, looks like we've got more visitors. Yeah, cops. Well, I'd better get after this phone here. I'm sorry to trouble you. I wonder if we could use your phone. It's out of order, I'm afraid. There's a man here fixing it now. What's the matter, officer? Trouble? Yeah, a little killing up the road. We didn't want to handle the phone there. Might be fingerprints on it. A uh, murder? That's right, up at the old McPhail place. Caught the guy red-handed. Murder and robbery. We even found the dough on him. Yeah? Who did it? Says his name is Canelli from New York. I wouldn't tell you all this, except it's an open-shut case. Couldn't explain what he was doing there or how he got the money or anything. Well, you'll read about it in the papers tomorrow. You, uh, have him outside now? Yep. Well, we'd better be going. Hey, mister, that door you got, you got, it's locked. You got a key? Why, no. Well, what's the matter? You lost a key someplace? Well, I, I, I must have. The, the, the room with the phone in it. Oh, well, maybe I can help you out. I got a little gimmick here that might open it. Uh, thanks. Yeah. We gotta have things like that in this line of business, you know. Uh, is this the door? Yeah, that's it. There you are. Oh, thanks. You uh, don't need me in there for anything, do you? No, sir. Well, good night. Good night. Hey, say, officer. Yeah. You better come in here a minute. Uh, wait a second, will you, Jim? Uh, sure. What's the matter? Hey, Mister. You been here all day? That's right. Why? Nobody else been here all afternoon? No, sir. Oh, what's this? You find something wrong in there? You said it, mister. Put up your hands. Hey, what's the idea? You know, huh? Jim, take a look at what we got here. Yeah. Well, uh... Cover him, Jim. Okay. Oh, uh, what is... Hey, let me see that. Sure. Sam. No. Robbery, too. Been through his wallet and started on the safe. Just like the other guy. Let's risk him. No, no, I didn't do this, I tell you. I didn't do it, I tell you. Yeah, here's the dough, all right. A roll big enough to choke a horse. Look, you guys. I tell you, I didn't do this. Yeah, kind of interrupted you, didn't we? Come on. Look, I didn't do this, I tell you. I didn't. I didn't do this. I did, I did. I did. I did. And the story ends with a newspaper clipping. I'll read it to you. Bridgeport, Connecticut. Arthur Kramer and George Kennelly were executed here today within ten minutes of each other to bring to a fitting conclusion one of the strangest series of coincidences in the criminal records of this state. Both men committed the same crime, murder and robbery, within a few miles of each other, on the same day 
and at almost the same time. Both victims were operators in the New York black market. Kramer was convicted of the murder of Samuel Gross. Canelli killed Edward McPhail. Both killers were caught on the scene of the crime, were arrested by the same officers, taken together in the same police car to the same jail. Both proclaimed their innocence, yet pleaded guilty in the face of the overwhelming evidence against them. A curious factor in the case was that though both men denied knowing the other, they tried repeatedly to attack each other in the prison yard, until guards were forced to keep them out of sight of each other at all times. Police have always believed there was some connection between the two crimes, but have never been able to find out what it was. And so closes Thieves Fall Out, starring Gene Kelly. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Appearing with Gene Kelly, who is to be seen currently in Metro-Golden-Mayer's Technicolor musical Thousands Cheer, were Hans Conried as Canelli and William Johnstone as Sam Gross. This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week, same time, when our star will be Mr. Vincent Price. Mr. Price will be heard in a suspense play by E. Jack Newman, dealing with the Gestapo and called... The Strange Death of Charles Umberstein. The producer and director of suspense is William Spear, who with Lud Gluskin and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and Robert L. Richards, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. Don't miss Suspense when this series moves to a new day and time. The day, Thursdays, beginning December the 2nd. The time, 8 p.m. Eastern War Time and 7 p.m. Central War Time. In the Mountain and Pacific time zones, listeners will hear suspense on Mondays beginning December the 6th at 9 p.m. Pacific War Time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. the man in black, here to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Heading our Hollywood cast tonight is the distinguished American actor, the star of the Broadway suspense drama, Angel Street, who has recently returned to this coast to resume his film career, Mr. Vincent Price. Tonight's suspense play, which presents Mr. Price, and which is produced and directed by William Spear, relates an episode of recent years in the unfriendly Nazi capital of Berlin. The Strange Death of Charles Umberstein by E. Jack Newman is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so, with The Strange Death of Charles Umberstein and with the performance of Vincent Price, we again hope to keep you in suspense. I was infuriated to think I had been trapped. The thought that someone had discovered my intentions maddened me to the breaking point. Nothing had slipped. Everything had run smoothly as I had planned. No evidence, not the slightest trace. Nothing. And yet, I was trapped. Trapped? But why? How? Let me see. Papers in my briefcase. Train ticket. Information forwarded safely to my office. And he knew. How? 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 But he did know. I stood quietly in my room watching him. Watching him watching me. Waiting for me. Standing by the lamppost beneath my window. Knowing, knowing he had trapped me. Waiting for me. I recognized him almost immediately Captain von Heinz Once before I had seen him briefly in Herr Miller's office 
I'd been working on some corrections. Elmira was escorting him through the plant on an inspection tour. They stopped for a moment outside my office. I glanced up as Herr Miller gestured my way through the partially open door. Uh Aha, Herr Hoffman. Well, here it was. They were talking about me. My heart stopped. He was explaining how I had been recommended by the Fuhrer himself, my qualifications. They continued on their tour. Herr Miller explained later when I went to his office. Aha, Umberstein, there you are. Herr Miller, you sent for me? Yes, Umberstein. This morning when Captain von Heim and myself passed by your office, I knew it was you. You knew it was me? Yes. Captain von Heim is head of Gestapo intelligence in this area. Uh, He was conducting a routine inspection this morning, and it was he who suggested that... What? Well, uh, since your recommendations were by the Führer himself... Yes? Your work here has been excellent. I knew you were the man when I passed by today. My work? Huh? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 of course, not that. Uh, why, you have become one of our best men. Oh, thank you, Herr Miller. No, this is it. Yes, Herr Miller. Through various posts, we are releasing more prints on munitions areas in this country uh, and other countries. Huh? <laughs> you are to be in complete charge of their release from the law. I understand, Herr Miller. As a citizen of the Reich, I am greatly honored that I have been given such an opportunity. An opportunity to show your loyalty. And honor. I will give you the combination. You will see that no other person enters the war. Of course, Herr Miller. Uh-huh. Uh, one moment, Umberstein. Yes? I think I should tell you that a few months ago in one of the neighboring plants, the Gestapo apprehended a spy. Yes? He was working for an enemy espionage service, found in possession of certain vital documents which he had access to in his work. And uh, what did they learn from him? Oh, many things. He was reluctant to speak at first, but it's difficult to hold out indefinitely. <laughs> so he finally gave them enough information to locate other agents who had filtered in. It was well he was detected. Oh, yes. The uh, Gestapo is still on the alert for some of his co-workers still expected to arrive. Of course, they are ignorant of his confession and his faith. So, Herr Umberstein, I must warn you to take all the necessary steps against the possibility of espionage. We cannot be too careful. I shall be careful. The new Umberstein is exemplified the efficiency of the Third Reich. I closed my suitcase and looked down on the street. I watched him standing there. I kept asking myself, how, 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 how could he know? This Captain von Hein. How could he know? The plan was perfect, the best yet, and yet I was discovered, trapped. It was a late Saturday afternoon, and the silence of the day hung heavy in the room. Outside it was cold, very cold, but in my room it was warm, stuffy. The radiator hissed and spewed as though it were the judge of the events to come. I was almost angry at it. A radiator. It was still light enough that he might see me if I crossed and raised the window. He wasn't aware that I was in the room. I hadn't turned on the light. Now he stood there, waiting for me to return. I lay down on the bed, smoking. My thoughts troubled by the one question, how? How? How had he discovered me? Safely, I had avoided all connections with anyone who might have a chance to spy on my work. There was not the least cause for suspicion. An established citizen of the right, well-recommended, pure Aryan, employed as an architect in one of the country's largest munitions plants, certainly there was no reason for him to suspect me... The Gestapo, this Captain von Hein, waiting to take me? Fräulein Keller. Fräulein Keller. Absurd. Oh, of course not. Not she. But could you ever trust a woman? Fräulein Keller. Did I give her any reason, any reason at all? Good morning, Fräulein. Oh, good morning. My name is Charles Umberstein, and... I am to be at the munition factory near here. I wish to take a room. Oh? One facing the outer street, Fräulein. You can accommodate me? Oh, I think so. We have one which is on the second floor. Overlooks the street corner. Oh, fine. I'm glad. It looks comfortable here. Small and comfortable. Oh, yes. You will like it, I'm sure. Uh, I am the owner and manager here. Fräulein. Uh, fine, dear, please. Yes, of course. 
There you are. Thank you. Otto, would you show Herr Umberstein to his room? Yes, who is it? It's I, Fräulein Keller. Oh, just a moment. Yes, Fräulein? I I have brought you some extra blanks. Oh. You may be cold. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you, Fräulein. And uh, Herr Umberstein, down the street, the little cafe. You may find nice meals and a little music, too. Oh, wonderful. I am indebted to you, Fräulein. Oh, but you are my charge. I look after my guests. It is my job. Oh, that is most kind, Fräulein. Uh, Herr Umberstein, yes. I... I also dine at the little cafe often. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> for you, Fräulein, oh, for yes. your wonderful hospitality. Oh, to you, Herr Umberstein. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Fräulein, it's growing late. I must be off. I have a great many things to do tomorrow. Oh, and so do I. Oh, it has been a wonderful evening. Yes, wonderful. wonderful. Here's your coat. Hi, it's growing colder now, isn't it? Yes, the winter will be here soon. Too soon. Yes, but I won't be. Eh? Uh, you won't be? Oh, nothing, Fräulein, nothing. You will be here long. Certainly, Fräulein, certainly. I was just uh, wishing. Wishing? For what? Now I've done it. I'd started to thinking. Perhaps she could... Oh, here for what? Oh, nothing, Fräulein, nothing important. Only the hopes of every man... They become so near sometimes. They're almost reality. So? What else could I do? I had to lead her thoughts away somehow. She took the lead. You mean a woman? Yes. Yes, Fräulein. You. Oh, but we have known each other for such a short time. Only two weeks. That's I... true, but I've been aware of you for a longer time, though I've just met you. Oh, oh, Herr Umberstein, I... <sighs> Charles. Oh, Charles? First, I was uneasy about the whole affair. Then after a while, I, I did grow rather fond of her. She was so accommodating, and we dined together each evening, and I, I played my role to the letter. Never once did she mention my work. Oh! Fräulein Keller, what are you doing in my room? But I was... I, Anna, I was... You've been looking through my papers. Why? I was looking for something. But what right has she? What are you looking for? I was... Well, I oh, was looking for a letter. For? A letter? What letter? One that you haven't got. I thought perhaps you might have it. Now, out with it. A letter from a woman. Very well, Charles, if you must know, I, I suspect you of nothing else. She was actually looking for a letter from some woman. Any woman. She didn't trust me. She didn't trust her child. <laughs> no. No, it couldn't have been Fräulein Keller. Who then could it have been? I walked over to the window and looked down at the figure who so patiently kept his vigil there. Captain von Heinz, wait. Why? There had been something wrong with the passport, but no, that was perfect, not the passport. All passengers will report to the train master for passport examination. Yeah, all in order. You can take your luggage to Berlin. Yeah, this way. Next. Yes. Next. Here you are. Name? Charles Umberstein. President? Berlin. Nationality? German. Hmm. Mm-hmm. All in order? Fix your luggage. All in order. Thank you, train much. We must be careful, you know. Uh, when may I catch my train for Berlin? It should be by any moment. Next. As I stood there in the shadows waiting for my train, I, I examined my passport again, as I had done a hundred times before. No one would have any reason to doubt anything so genuine as that. I'm passing for Berlin. I'm passing for Berlin. God. God, must we stand passport inspection again? Uh, yeah. The Army Intelligence will accommodate you on the train. Yeah, boy. Three stops, my passport was inspected. A good test? If the passport had been suspected or investigated, it would only prove that I was Charles Umberstein. I had come by the passport through Hans. At the time, Hans was employed as an Austrian customs inspector. This gave him access to many such passports. According to Hans, there had been a person named Charles Umberstein who had suddenly disappeared in 1936. Since there had been no friends or relatives to make an inquest, well, you can see. No. No, I was Charles Umberstein. 
Why, I even resembled the badly scarred photograph on the identification card. From the front view, he was evidently a large man, big shoulders, large head, wore a short Prussian haircut. Yes, I certainly looked enough like the photograph. Passport was flawless. He couldn't have discovered me through that. Von Heinz. Something else. What else? Plan? No, 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 of course not. They couldn't have discovered that. I merely made copies and left the originals. No, 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 not the plan. By Hans and I... Hans. Oh, no, no, not Hans. Never. We'd worked so well together. Oh, no, no, not Hans. A strange, silent boy, perhaps, but surely... That night in 1936, when he gave me the passport, he was our man in Austria, but... Strange things happen even to the most loyal. All set, Trump. Then I, when I see you again, Hans. Until? Until I arrive, eh? I will be attached to an army ordnance division in the city. You will receive additional information on the first day of each month. From you? Yes. There's a hotel not far from the factory. Here is the address. Colin Keller runs this hotel. Now, on the second floor in one corner sits a mahogany table. On it are a set of silver candlesticks. Four of them. Beneath candlestick nearest the right. You may find your information on the first day of each month. It will be written in code? Naturally. Be very careful when you pick it up, I see. And make no effort to contact me in any other way. And can I leave anything I might learn in the same place? Is it safe? Yes. Now, remember, sooner or later we are bound to be introduced, you and I. My duties with the Ordnance Division will, of course... Near and yet so far kind of thing, eh? Yeah, very far. Once inside the city, I'm Oberleutnant Hans Neumann of Army Ordnance, understand? I am Herr Charles Unterstein. Okay. Right. Well, time grows short. I must go. Everything checked. Your passport? Perfect. I even resembled the photograph. <laughs> but Hans, does you think so? Yes, no fair. <laughs> Very considerate of Unterstein to have looked this way. Ticket? I hear through to Berlin. I report to Franz Miller in the munitions factory, produce my credentials. He's been expecting me. I haggle a little about the salary, then I accept that first opportunity to become acquainted with M.D. Plan. And I will see that you are highly recommended from a reliable source. Just as a matter of curiosity, Hans, who will recommend me? Oh, you needn't worry, Herr Umberstein. It'll be good, I assure you. Then goodbye, Hans. Oberleutnant Neumann, if you please. Oberleutnant Hans Neumann. Well, then, my Herr Charles Umberstein, I'll be the same. Heil Hitler. Heil <laughs> Hitler. <Hail it. laughs> Everything Hans had said came about. I picked up my information each month at the little hotel. I left an occasional report for Hans. It was the only way we ever communicated. And then, Oberleutnant and Hans Neumann began to appear in Franz Müller's office. And eventually, Müller introduced us. In fact, Hans was with Müller quite frequently, and they dined together regularly. Hans played his part well. But one day, something was worrying him. I will wait here for you, Müller. I'll be with you in a moment. Ah, I almost signed. It's going to see you again. Well, Leutnant Neumann. And Miller speaks very high of your work here. Thank you. Be very careful of this Captain Van Heim. There's something wrong. I don't know what it is. He looks at me very strangely. And there is something I recognize about the man. The eyes oh, are... Yes, yes, yes. We were just chatting a moment. Uh, I've seen Van Heim somewhere before. Be very careful. And don't come with us in case they ask you. Well, well, well. You are ready? Why, yes, of course. Umberstein. Uh, would you care to join us oh. at luncheon? No, no, thank you. I, I have some work to do. Oh. Always work. Yeah. <laughs> well, then, let's go, Hans, yeah? Yeah, certainly. Oh, by the way, will Captain Von Hein be joining us today? Oh, Von Hein sends his regrets. Something is delayed. Oh, that's too bad. Von Hein, a remarkable man. No one like him in the service. No one like him. Goodbye, Leutnant. Bye. Von Hein. <laughs> a brief one. Curt and sinister. Hans was frightened. He would never have taken the chance to speak to me if he had not been frightened. Something that he recognized about von Hein. Saturday was the first of the month and there was no information at the hotel. Hans didn't appear again to lunch with Herr Miller. Something was wrong. Something had happened to Hans. Today I found out. Uh, we will enjoy ourselves today, eh, Umberstein? Yes. We should lunch together more often, you and I. I like good company when I eat. Good food, good company, good digestion. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a wonderful restaurant that we are going to. You know, they serve Norwegian smoked salmon. That is exquisite. And, and, and cheap, too. 
Nothing like these new foods we are getting from Norway. <laughs> I've heard of Norwegian salmon. Uh, and this is the best. <laughs> you and Oberleutnant Neumann dine here often, don't you? Hans Neumann, uh, yes. yeah, we came here often, yes. Yeah. Hans Neumann will not come here for a long, long time again, I'm afraid. I, I don't understand. Uh, yeah, you don't. You remember Captain von Hein? Oh, oh, yes, the Gestapo man who was infecting our factory a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah, most efficient man. He has apparently been observing Hans Neumann for some time. Oberleutnant Neumann is being detained by Captain von Hein now. Was he? He was a spy. A spy? Uh, how do you know? Von Hein arrests only spies. And von Hein never makes a mistake. The man is incredible. Oh, was there something suspicious about Hans? There's something suspicious about everyone to von Hein. He himself asked me to cultivate Oberleutnant Neumann so that he could better observe his actions. Yes, I, I noticed that you two lunched together very often. Uh, we lunched together at this very same restaurant you and I are going to now. It made it easy for von Hein. Easy? Well, to study the man in leisure. Von Hein always wants to be certain of his quarry. And uh, where is Hans now? Who knows? Who knows what happens when Captain von Hein takes a man? Don't you admire such efficiency, Umberstein? Well, of course. Yeah, well, the captain did indicate that there were others to be rounded up, too. Well, here we are. Oh, look. Look, you see them in the window? Norwegian salmon. Oh, they are beautiful. So red, so delicious. Are you hungry, Umberstein? What? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, they, they do look delicious. <laughs> Captain von Heidt. I looked at him out of the window again. I could see his breath now. It was growing very cold. He was well dressed in a neatly tailored overcoat and dark hat. It was too dark to tell the exact color. The only thing I was sure of were hands and the gloves on the hands. Heavy, thick, powerfully mounted prongs encased in a gray, tightly fitting material. Style, lines running across the back. I noticed when he lifted them to light a cigarette. What beautiful weapon. His back was to me. I couldn't help but admire the fine breadth of his shoulders and the thick, closely barbered neck. He stood quietly by the lamppost, smoking, watching his breath and the smoke battle for existence in the icy air. Once when he turned to look up at my window, the single eyeglass he wore caught the reflection of the light. I wondered how much he weighed. Carefully, I retraced each step over again in my mind. I couldn't find the flaw that made me a marked man. The absurdly easy way I had gone through Mueller's office carrying an innocent-looking bundle of blueprints. Then to the vault, the super... superficial copies. No one could suspect what I had done. No one had any reason to. Why? Why, then, was I trapped? Of course he was after me, waiting down there. I wondered why he didn't come up and wait in my room. Surely he didn't know I was in the room. Perhaps he had searched my room one day while I was out. But what could he find? Nothing, absolutely nothing. A passport proving I was Charles Umberstein. A monogram suitcase bearing the initials C.U. A few letters and old papers. Nothing, nothing at all. I had never talked. I had never known anyone else in service except Hans. Franz Müller was too stupid to suspect anything. Fräulein Keller? No. The passport? Perfect. Only one other way. Only one other way could he possibly know. For an instant, the possible answer flashed through my brain. For a full five minutes, I watched him, watched him very discerningly. Could it be? Could it possibly be? The stillness of the street below was broken from time to time by the blare of an occasional horn and the rattle of armored cars carrying soldiers to different parts of the city. Turning from the window, I groped about in the darkness of my room, searching for the automatic I had concealed in the slit compartment of my traveling bag. When I found it, I tested the chamber. It was loaded. I jammed it in my coat pocket, and putting on my hat, I stood there by the window, watching him. He seemed very ominous, very assured, waiting for me. He must have been getting anxious with his long vigil. I watched him signal to an accomplice across the street, walking back and forth under the streetlight. I noticed something familiar. Very 
very familiar. A bolt from off the bed, tied to a piece of cord attached to the light switch. Ah, near the radiator pipe, room enough to pass it through, the weighted end dragging the string to the lobby below. I picked up my suitcase and stepped out of the door. The hall was dark and quiet. I walked down the stairs. The lobby was empty. Deserted. At the bottom of the stairs, I placed the suitcase by the door, and I crossed to the desk. Hastily, I jammed a few bills in an envelope and addressed it to Fraulein Keller. Now, as I picked up my suitcase, I could see him very plainly on the corner. He was only a few feet from the entrance. The cord with its weighted end had fallen just short of the door. I stood there quiet. He looked up at my room. I pulled the cord. <laughs> startled when the light went on upstairs, searching the window for a view of the occupants. I walked to the door. As I opened it, he looked at me, looked my way, gazed at me, point blank, in surprise. And assuring himself, he took a step toward me. Herr Umberstein! Herr Umberstein! Oh, you are... You are Charles Umberstein? Why, yes, I... Charles Umberstein, who entered Germany in 1936 from Austria? Here's my passport. Your passport? Yes. I have always wanted to meet you, Charles Umberstein. I have always wanted to meet you face to face. You know who I am? Why, yes, you are. <laughs> I wonder. You know the others I have had my men pick up. But you, I wanted to attend to personally. It's because you are Charles Umberstein. Now we will uh, just... I'm sorry, my friend. <laughs> Sat down hard on the curb. He looked up at me, mumbled strangely, then fell over with his head in the gutter. Half fell off, and I saw that his hair was closely cropped. There were other people on the street. I ran till I was out of breath. I picked up a Berlin paper on the railroad station. On the second page, I read the headline, Gestapo official murdered. Saturday, January 25th, Captain Charles von Hein, high-ranking official of the Gestapo intelligence service, was instantly killed last night by the bullets of an unknown assailant whom he was attempting to arrest on charges of espionage. Captain von Hein had been connected with the Gestapo since 1936. Prior to his affiliation with the Gestapo intelligence, he had been known by his real name, Charles Umberstein. His entry into such dangerous work made necessary a complete retirement from all public life. The Reich will long honor the memory of Charles Umberstein. I wired flowers from Geneva with a card marked Sympathy, signed C.U. And so closes The Strange Death of Charles Umberstein by E. Jack Newman, starring Vincent Price. Tonight's tale of suspense. Vincent Price will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, Song of Bernadette. The producer and director of suspense is William Spear. Music was composed by Lucian Malowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. This is The Man in Black would like to draw your attention to the new day in time for suspense beginning next week when Cary Grant will be our star. Beginning next week, listeners in the Eastern and Central time zones will hear suspense on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern wartime and 7 p.m. Central wartime. Listeners in the Mountain and Pacific time zones will be brought their next story of suspense on Monday, December the 6th. And each Monday thereafter at 9 p.m. Pacific Wartime. Don't forget suspense on Thursdays beginning December the 2nd if you live in Eastern and Central Time Zones and Mondays beginning December the 6th for listeners in the Mountain and Pacific Time Zones with Cary Grant, our opening guest star. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. The world toasts Roma, and Roma toasts the world. The wine for your table is Roma. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black. Here for Roma Wines to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, we are honored and happy to have with us one of the entertainment world's most distinguished gentlemen, Mr. Cary Grant. The suspense play which stars Cary Grant and which is produced and directed by William Spear is the exciting and tense bestseller by Cornell Woolrich called The Black Curtain. Suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series, Roma brings you tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so, with the Black Curtain and with the performance of Cary Grant, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! Again, or rather, life began again for me, I guess you'd say, that day, on that street. My head was pounding terribly. I could hear all the noise and the people milling around. Everything was a jumble at first. All right. Gangway there now. Let the doc throw. I see that happen, Mr. Policeman. He was running. Boy, he really gave himself a clunk on the beat. All right, son. Now get back there. Everybody back there. Oh, oh, my Take head. Easy, his wallet fell out of his pocket, and a big boy grabbed it and ran away. He All went right, up... now. Back, everybody. Let the doctor throw. Give him no, air here. I'm okay. No, never mind, Doc. I'm okay. Seems to be nothing much the matter with you, sir. No, I'm all right. Yes, I can talk to him now, Doc. Oh, go ahead, officer. Just a bad bump on the head, I think. That's right. We can walk all right, can't you? No, I think so. Ah, sure. Here, now let me brush you on. Huh? Thanks, thanks. Well, I'll be fine. Hey. hey, wait a minute. What am I doing with an overcoat? All on? right now, mister. Just so they got it on the blotter. What's your name? Where do you live? Uh, Townsend. Frank Townsend. 820 Rutherford Street. I uh, want a cigarette. You're still shaky. No, no, thanks. I don't smoke. Well, I'll be getting back then. Drop in at the receiving hospital if you want us to check you off. Right? Yeah, I will. Hey, here's your hat, mister. I found it. Oh, thanks, That's kid. That's all. Now, come on. Move along. The guy's all right. Come on. Oh, well, thanks. I'm sorry about the fellow that got your wallet. Anyway, here's your cigar hey. case, Mr. Townsend. Guy found it right alongside of you. Hey. Now, wait a minute. This isn't my hat. D.N. Those aren't my initials, D.N. Sure, that's your hat. I seen it roll off you when you went down. Try it on. You see? It fits. Looks good. Yeah. But, but what am I doing with a cigar case? D.N. Same initials as the hat. Eh, don't you even know your own hat, mister? Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm trying to think. Where is this? What? This street. You're on Tillery Street. T- Tillery Street? What am I doing on Tillery Street? <laughs> All right, now, sir. My suggestion is that you go on home and go lie down. It's cold and starting to snow. No, no, please, wait a minute. Don't leave me. Tell me. What happened? Why, you slipped on this icy sidewalk. Fell down and hit your head good and hard on the curb. You're out for about 20 minutes and then you... Wait, wait, Ice on a sidewalk? Well, look at it. That street cleaning department ought to clear away the snow there, too. Snow and ice? Sure, why? Snow? In July? July? Oh, it's December. December 1943. 1943? Uh, you better go on home, son. Good night. 1943? December 1943. The last I remember was July 1940. Three years just gone. Amnesia. A black curtain comes down over your mind. That black curtain had been over mine for three years. Where had I been? Who had I been? I hadn't been Frank Townsend. I'd been someone else. D.N. Someone whose initials were D.N. I walked along Tillery Street thinking about it those three years. 
<laughs> I could have been married. I could have been a thief. I could have... Something made me turn around on the street for a moment. That was when I first saw him. Gray eyes. He'd been talking to the cop who took my name. He looked up as I did. And then he started to walk rapidly in my direction. I backed away instinctively. Something about him spelled trouble. He called to me as he hey, came forward. Hey, you, stop! Townsend! Instinctively, I knew I should run, get away from him. Hey, you. I looked back as I rounded the corner. He had a gun in his hand. He raised it. Then I turned and ran for my life. What lay behind that black curtain which separated Townsend from his past? With this remarkable story, and with Hollywood's distinguished Cary Grant as our star, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, tonight assumes the sponsorship of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. This is the dinner hour at an exclusive yacht club in Latin America, and we discreetly eavesdrop on that gentleman and his lady there at the table. This has been a lovely dinner, Ramon. And only you would have thought to have such a delicious wine as the finale. It was so perfect. Is it truly a wine from California in North America? Yes, see? This is the noted Roma port of California in the United States. We were fortunate to have it tonight, for now, in time of war. Only occasional ships can bring us Roma wines. I knew that you would... Fortunate? Yes. For Roma wines please the exacting tastes of wine lovers in many countries. And we in the United States are most fortunate of all. For we can enjoy any of those delicious wines from the famous Roma wineries located in choice wine districts throughout California at prices unbelievably small for wines of such distinguished character. Because we do not have to pay heavy shipping costs and duty, here at home in America... Roma wines cost only a few cents a glass. What's more, you'll find Roma California wines just around the corner at your favorite dealers. Right there, waiting for you now. The types of Roma wines you most enjoy. So if you haven't yet discovered the delight of Roma wine regularly with meals or when entertaining friends, make your first purchases of Roma tomorrow. R-O-M-A. Roma. America's largest selling wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Kerry Grant and the Black Curtain, a story well calculated to keep you in suspense. Why was he following me? With a gun. What did Gray Eyes want with me? I must have done something. I beat it down the subway and hid. I had to think it all out carefully. I knew I was on the spot for something. Gray Eyes meant business. What could it be? Who had I been? During those last three years with that black curtain in front of them. Well, maybe I'd been a gangster. And he was one of a mob that wanted to rub me out. I didn't know. No identification, my wallet stolen. Nothing in my pockets that would help. Just D.N. in the hat. And D.N. on the cigar case. D.N. My head was aching with worry. My stomach had panic in it. I had to find out who I'd been, what I'd done. But how? Where? Tillery Street. That's where I'd been when I woke up. Tillery Street. Well, maybe gray eyes would go back there too looking for me. But I had to take that chance. Tillery Street. Yes? Oh, good evening, Pop. Oh, oh, hello there. Couldn't see you under that hat at first. Oh, you, you know me? Sure. What can I get you, son? Oh, well, uh, you got an evening paper I could look at? Nope. Sorry, never read them. Too much trouble in the world these days, anyhow. Yeah. See, how you been? You haven't been around two or three weeks. Oh, well, I've been kind of busy. Uh, look, Pop. Yeah? I made a bet with a guy that even though you see so many customers, you'd walk right up and give me my full name. Oh. Well, I'm sorry. I don't know it. I don't think I ever heard your name. Oh. But I know your girl. My girl? Mm-hmm. 
You do, huh? Yeah. Well, now maybe I can still win my bet if you'll give me her name. Gee, uh, I've heard you mention it. I, I'd know it if I heard it. Do I? Well, uh, see if I can steer you a little. Now, is it Mary? No. Nope. Uh, Alice? Lillian? Ah, uh, Margaret. Huh? No. Wait a minute. Wait. I know. Ruth. That's it, Ruth. Ruth? Yeah. Well, sure, you got it. Now, now, what's Ruth's last name? Gee, I don't know her... Li- I know where she lives, though. You do? Yeah, right across the street, the Tillery Apartments. Well, it's right. Ah, uh-uh. but now, now, what apartment? What's the number of Ruth's apartment? Mm. 3C, apartment 3C. <laughs> say, that's pretty good if I do say so. I was only there once, remember? The night I brought the sandwiches yeah, over... Yeah. I... Well, uh, thanks. Uh, will you win your bet, mister? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I think I will. Uh, what's your name so I'll know it next time? Oh, I'll tell you tomorrow. I hope. So long. So long, Pop, thank you. I'll be... What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing, I... Just tying my shoe. I'd just been going to walk out when I saw him standing across the street, gray eyes again. I ducked down behind the store window and watched him. He looked over in my direction and then up and down the street... Oh, then he lit a cigarette and strolled down the corner. The minute he disappeared, I yanked the door open, dashed out, ran across the Tillery Apartments and went in. Who is it? Ruth? Yes? It's me. Dan! Oh, Danny, where have you been? Get in here. Oh, darling, it's really you. I thought you... Hello, Ruth. Oh, Danny, why did you come here? He's been around here twice today. He may be in the neighborhood right now, for all you know. Who? Oh, well, Slattery, of course. Uh, has he got gray eyes? What? Yeah. Did you ever see a detective that didn't? Oh, I see. Sure, sure. Danny, what's the matter with you? You're acting so strangely. Well, I... I just want to look at you. You seem so different, so far away. You haven't kissed me. Well, that's easily fixed. Oh, darling, where have you been for three weeks? All around. Miss me? You know I did. Oh, Danny, do you suppose... Do you think we could get away a night? I've got $3,000 saved up. We could go to Mexico or South America. We could get married. Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Nearing tour the world. Daniel Nearing? Oh, yeah, and wife. Sounds plenty good to me. Oh, you'll never know how good. We'll get out of here tonight. I'll call up and tell them I'm quitting my job. I'll say I'm sick. All my stuff's here. Nothing's out there but a couple of uniforms. <laughs> I'll make Alma and Franklin a present of those. Uh, Alma and Franklin? Don't you bother your pretty head about those two charmers. Maybe they weren't glad when it happened. A couple of vultures. Bye-bye to them. Oh, with you back, Danny. Just think with my 3,000 we can... Could... <laughs> Do you think you ought to quit your job? Absolutely, I think so. I was never cut out to be a nurse anyway. I guess you weren't. Any more than uh, I was cut out... Any more than you were meant to be a secretary. Ah, That's right. (laughs) Well, I never wanted to be a secretary. Just drifted into it, I guess. Kind of got on my nerves, especially toward the end. You know, the the boss was no cinch to work for. He certainly wasn't. He was a rat. The whole Dietrich bunch are mean, rotten. The whole family. Yeah, that's right. Well, except the old man. Uh, oh, yeah, the old man. I, I, I sort of liked him, didn't I? And he loves you, Danny. I think he wished you'd been his son. Poor old man. He's the only reason I've stuck around out there this long. How are things out there? Oh, they've been questioning all of us. They've laid off lately, though, since you... Oh, Danny, don't let's talk anymore about it. You're back. That's the main thing. I just want to forget New Jericho and the whole... New Jericho, huh? Yes. Oh, Danny. Danny, if only it hadn't happened. What hadn't? You know what? Oh, Danny, what's going to become of you and me? I wish I knew. Danny, get away from that window. Leave that shade down. He's down there. Who? Gray eyes. He's standing in front of the hydrant. He's coming in here, in the building. Did he see you? Ruth, will you help me? What are you going to do? I'm going to give myself up. No, no. Well, it's better than getting shot at. What can they do to me? You crazy fool, they can send you to the chair. The chair? Well, what do you think happens to a man when he's guilty of murder? 
Murder? Ruth, listen to me. I'm not a murderer. If the whole world says I committed murder, I say I didn't. The me that's in me says I didn't. I never said you were, Danny. I always said you didn't do it. I hope you hadn't run away. So that's it. All right, Nearing. Open up. Why did you come here, Danny? Why? Ruth, wait. We gotta get out of here. How about the fire escape shaft? Dumb waiter. Dumb waiter. Here. All right, get in. I'll stand on top and work the ropes. I don't think it can hold us both. It's got to. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Danny. Danny, what do we do? We're going back there to New Jericho. New Jericho? No, Danny, don't, please, for me. I've got to. I've got to find out. We're going together. No. No, Danny, no. I've got the money. We can get out of here and we... Stop it. Danny, ouch. My arm. You're hurting me. From here on in, we're sticking together. You're going to take me back there. Back where it happened. All right, darling. It's crazy, but I'll go wherever you go. I can't lose you again. On the train, Ruth and I said very little to each other. While I hid in the telephone booth at the Pennsylvania station, she'd bought us a couple of cheap overcoats. I sat hunched up in mine, thinking, thinking. Ruth had brought along the newspaper clippings. I looked at what they said for the 20th time, trying to see if there was anything there that would help me. Dietrich Slayer's Salt, it said. Secretary wanted in brutal slaying at suburban estate. Police are pressing the search for Daniel Nearing, secretary and the employer of the late John Dietrich, 58, member of a well-known local family who was shot and killed in the drawing room of his new Jericho estate on the morning of November the 7th. Nearing disappeared November the 7th, on the morning of which date he is known to have had a bitter quarrel with the deceased. This last was attested to at the inquest by Alma and Franklin Dietrich, widow and brother of the murdered man. Well, I had all the facts now. <laughs> Wanted for murder. And yet everything that was in me told me that no matter who I'd been, however many memories I'd lost, that I was no killer, that I couldn't have. I had to get into that Dietrich house and stand again in the room in which it had all happened. Maybe something would come back to me. Maybe there would be... Danny? Danny? Over here, Ruth. Oh, it's dark. I couldn't see you. Alma and Franklin just left. They drove down to the village. Did they say anything about you being out here on your day off? Yeah. Alma said something, but I said I had nothing to do in town and came out to write some letters. Let's go, then. Oh, Danny, I'm scared. Please, let's not stay out here. You said you loved me. I do, Danny, I do. That's why I'm scared. They're only going to the village. They'll be back in half an hour at the most. Go on, open the door, Ruth. Hurry. I've got to see the inside, that room, the place where it happened. It's wrong, Danny. I'm telling you, you're wrong. They'll find you. Open the door, Ruth. Quickly. All right. Now, let's have a look at that room. Please, Danny, please don't. Don't talk about it. So this is where I'm supposed to have murdered John Dietrich. Danny, please. Where was it? Show me exactly where it was, Ruth. I've got to know. It was there. Right there. He was standing by the grandfather's clock when... Oh, are you going crazy, Danny? If they get you, you'll hang. By the clock, huh? You still believe in me, don't you, Ruth? I believe you, Danny, but I'm scared. I love you. Ruth, wait a minute. What's that? Listen. It's only the old man. He's asleep in that room off there. Don't go in there, Danny. You'll wake him. I want to see him. No. No, don't, Danny. He can't help you. You know he's paralyzed and he can't talk. Turn on the light. I want to see him. There, you woke him. It's me, Mr. Dietrich. Ruth. Uh, This is Danny. You remember Danny, don't you? Hello, Mr. Dietrich. See how his eyes are shining? Yeah. Uh, Was he here when it happened? You know that, Danny. Why do you ask such funny questions? He's been in bed here for five years. That mirror. On the wall there. The clock. Look. You can see the grandfather's clock in the other room. What are you getting at, Danny? He could see it. The old man could see the murder through the mirror. Oh, if only he could talk. He can't talk. You scare me, Danny. He saw the man who killed John Dietrich. Look, look. 
He understands what I'm saying. He's blinking his eyes. Oh, stop torturing him, Danny. Can't you see what you're doing? Oh, he's trying to, to say something. Look. Look. His eyes are blinking. He's going to help me. Go outside and watch, Ruth. Go on. Now watch out at the entrance way. Be careful, Danny. Please, they'll be back any minute. All right, leave me alone with him. And I'll call if I hear them coming. Look now, Mr. Dietrich. Don't be afraid. I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to answer me. Are you trying to tell me something about the murder? Now, blink your eyes. Blink twice if you are. And that's it. Once. Twice. That's good. Did you see it happen? Here, in your mirror. Blink once if the answer is no. Twice if the answer is yes. Once. Twice. You did, huh? You saw it. Now then, is the murderer in this house? Danny. Danny, they're coming. Frank and Anna, get out of here. Hide. Run, Danny, run. Is the murderer in this house? Blink once for no, twice for yes. Yes. In this house. Danny. Danny, they're coming. Wait, wait. I've almost got it. Now, Mr. Dietrich, was it me? Once for no, twice for yes. Was it me? Get out of here, Danny. Into the big room behind the curtain. I'll talk to them. Oh, all right. All right. Well, thanks, Mr. Dietrich. I'll be back. Ruth? Ruth, is that you in Father's room? Yes. Are you here alone? Why, yes. Why? No, we thought we heard voices. What are you so jittery about, Ruth? I, I'm just tired, that's all. May I go to bed now? Father's still awake, Ruth. He'll go to sleep, all right. I'm going upstairs, Mrs. Dietrich, now. Good night, Ruth. And uh, take your flashlight with you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It was dark on the road tonight. Good night, Ruth. Good night. She's brought him back here with her. Him, I think. Who? Dan? Oh, Franklin. Well, take it easy. If he's here, we'll get him. After the evidence we gave against him at the hearing, I... Oh, I'm frightened. Let's get out of here fast. I'll go to the village for the police. Call the police. No, I'll do it. Hello? Hello? It's too late. It's dead. The wire is cut. Come on, we'll both drive to the village. Eh? But he may be waiting for us out by the car. Uh-uh. Oh. What? Yeah. What are you doing there, Franklin? I think I just might need my gun. Come along. When they left the house, I made for the old man's room. I called for Ruth, but she was gone. Maybe Franklin and Elma had caught her after she cut the telephone wire, but I couldn't wait. My life was hanging on minutes now. I shot the flashlight on the old man's face. Now, Mr. Dietrich, you're helping me fine. You know I'm trying to save my life, don't you? Now, the murderer. Was it me? Was it me who did it? Me, Danny Nearing. Blink once for no... Once. Once. Oh, you're sure. You're sure it wasn't me. Oh, you're smiling, Mr. Dietrich. Smiling. Now, it was somebody in this house. Then who was it? Oh, can't you make a sound? Help me, you've got to. Was it Elma? Twice for yes, once for no. Once. Not Elma. All right, then. Was it Franklin? Up with the hands, Neri. Up or you'll never go to trial. Franklin. Look, you've got to listen. You've got to. Shut up and drop that flashlight. Trying to kill the old man, too, huh? The murderer returns to the scene of his crime, huh? You know I didn't kill him. Well, you tell that to the police. Alma will have him here in a couple of minutes. Where's your girlfriend, Ruth? She's not here. I don't know where she went. Never mind. They'll find her. You're a dead duck, Neary. You killed my brother and beat it. What'd you get out of it? I thought it was puzzled us. You killed your brother. And now you're going to kill me. Oh, you've gone nuts, too. Why should I kill my own brother, you idiot? To get his share of the estate and his wife, Alma, amongst other things. But you can't stop with killing me. Someone else knows the truth. The old man saw it in the mirror. Right. You'll have to kill your own father, too. The old man saw it? How, how do you know? He told me. Oh, you're lying. He can't talk. He can't even move. He can hear. And he can blink his eyes. Come over here and look. Now, look here. I don't... <laughs> Rose! He'll be all right. I heard him. He was going to kill you. Here's the gun, Danny. Take it. Oh, Ruth, you shouldn't have. In another minute, I... I'm not sure it was Franklin. Oh, then, darling, please, let's run for it. They'll be here in a second. It's your last chance. They'll all swear you did it. Not if I can be with the old man in another half minute. Mr. Dietrich. Mr. Dietrich. It's Danny again. No, Danny, don't. Don't. What? 
Tell me, Mr. Dietrich, was it Franklin? Did Franklin kill your son, John? Blink once if he did. He's afraid. Well, why are you afraid? Oh, oh, there's this gun. Here, take the gun, Ruth. You take it. He's afraid. I'm not going to hurt you, Mr. Dietrich. What's the matter? Why don't you answer me? Who killed John Dietrich? It wasn't me. It wasn't Elma. It wasn't Franklin. But someone in the house. Was it? Ruth! Ruth! You! I told you. I told you not to come. Oh, I love you, Danny. I wanted you. I wouldn't have let them get you. Why? Why, Ruth? Why did you kill him? He was always after me. He wouldn't leave me alone. I hated him. Then that night he came at me, threatened me, said he'd kill me. If he couldn't have me, nobody could. He had a gun, and I got it away from him. It, it, he hit the clock. He leaned against it. I thought he'd never fall down and die. It was the day you ran away, and I was crazy. They thought it was you. They started looking. I love you, Danny. I still love you. I begged you not to come back here. Ruth! Put down that gun, Ruth. No. Stand back, Danny. Stay over there. Just want to look at you. I was hoping we could get away together. But you've been through enough, Danny. And all because of me. Now you're clear, Danny. And this is going to clear me. Darling. Oh, Ruth. Ruth! That's about all there is to tell. I tried to put it all behind me. To resume my life where it left off over three years ago. <laughs> Sometimes when it gets toward evening, I go and walk along Tillery Street. <laughs> Once in a while, somebody, somebody I don't know, will say, hello, Danny. And I just say hello and walk on. <laughs> I don't want to find out anything anymore. I want it all to die away and be still. And It will. All except Ruth. Because somewhere behind that black curtain I was loved. And loved someone. We must have known a love that I'll never know again. And so closes The Black Curtain, starring Mr. Cary Grant... Tonight's tale of Suspense. Since the beginnings of history, people have enjoyed wine. Ages ago, our ancestors found that wine made any food taste better. Wine is a simple pleasure that anyone can enjoy. That is why Roma has devoted all its winemaking skill to producing wines of fine quality at a price that means you can enjoy them often. Just a few cents a glass. Don't feel that you need fine crystal or a special occasion to serve Roma wines. Next time you have a quick supper, serve Roma wine in plain tumblers with your spaghetti or cold meats. And notice how much more enjoyment and zest it adds to the meal. Serve Roma wine often, cool or chilled. You'll quickly discover why Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Yes, Roma wines are true to type. Roma wines are faithful in flavor. Roma wines are sound of character. Roma wines are reasonable in cost. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Our thanks to Cary Grant for his suspenseful performance here tonight. And Mr. Grant wants us to say that he will be listening with you next week at the same hour to Mr. Robert Young in the story called The Night Reveals. Don't forget then, next week, same time, for Robert Young in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Presented by Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. The world toasts Roma and Roma toasts the world. The wine for your table is Roma. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black here for Roma Wines. To introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, our stars are Mr. Robert Young and Margot. The suspense play which stars Robert Young and Margot, and which is produced and directed by William Spear, is a tale of ordeal by fire by Cornell Woolrich. And so, with the night reveals and with the performances of Robert Young and Margot, Roma again hopes to keep you in suspense. Tell us the story, Mr. Jordan. Might help to get it out of your system. Yes. Go ahead, Harry. What? Tell it here, Marie, in front of you? Sure, I can stand it if you can. Well, all right. I'll tell it from when I first began to know, for sure, two weeks ago. I should have known before that something was wrong. I should have known by her eyes. There was a queer look in them, staring at me one minute and avoiding me the next. Well, I came home late one Monday night. They were asleep, my son Johnny and my wife here, Marie. I lay in bed reviewing my day's work. You see, I'm an investigator for the Herkimer Fire Insurance Company. And while thinking about the fire on 2nd Avenue, I fell asleep. Suddenly, I was sitting bolt upright, wide awake, with a strange feeling of being alone in the room. I looked towards Marie's bed. It was too dark to see. I called... Marie. Marie. There was no answer. I got up and walked to her bed. The quilt was bunched up. I pulled the covers down. The bed was empty. In the bathroom. No, she wasn't there. And not in Johnny's room either. Johnny was alone. Marie wasn't in the apartment. I put on the light and looked at my watch. It was two in the morning. Got dressed and walked out and, and rang for the elevator. It was nothing. Of course, it was nothing important, but... My heart kept hammering away. Morning, Mr. Jordan. Kind of late for the... Yes, good morning, Steve. Uh, did you see my wife go down? Yes, Mr. Jordan. About half an hour ago, I'd say. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, did you see which way she went? Yes, she went towards 3rd Avenue. Said she was going to... Went to the drugstore, I guess. Yes, that's right. There's one over on 96th Street. Open all night. Thanks. That was it. She went to the drugstore. I was worried over nothing at all. I didn't know what to do quite. I didn't want to follow her, but the elevator boy was watching me, so I strolled easily along towards 3rd Avenue. I stood on the deserted dark corner and looked up and down the street. Then I saw her coming. She was walking towards me briskly. Harry, what are you doing here? Well, I got up and saw you were gone, and I... I... couldn't sleep. I... I had a dreadful headache, so I decided to go down for some aspirin. Yes. Yes, of course. The drugstore on 96th Street. But you were coming from 98th Street. I took a little walk. I thought some fresh air would do me some good. Yes. It is a nice night. I've only been gone about ten minutes. Steve says you were gone about a half hour. It was only ten minutes. What time is it now? 2.35. I've been out for almost 15 minutes. Oh, it's more than... It was 15 minutes, no more than that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Everything seemed all right. Still, I felt something was wrong. We got into our apartment and we both went to bed. For a minute or so, we said nothing. You've been working hard, Harry. Don't you think you ought to take a week off and sort of rest up? Oh, I feel perfectly all right, dear. There's nothing wrong with me. Listen. A fire. A fire. Yes, not far. Over east a couple of blocks. By the river, I'd say. That's my district. A fire. Oh, what the... Hello. Hello, Harry. I'm sorry to wake you in the middle of the night. There's a bad one over near you, between 2nd and 3rd. Maybe a total loss. Between 2nd and 3rd, Mr. Parmenter? Uh, an apartment building? Yeah, 98th Street. 340 East 98. I called you because I'd like you to go there direct first thing in the morning instead of come at the office, Okay. I'll meet you there. Okay, Mr. Parmenter. Good night. 
A fire? On 98th Street? Yeah. I couldn't see Marie in the dark. I knew she was staring at me. I was very tired. Good night, Marie. Good night, Harry. This is a story of a husband and a wife. In a moment as the story continues, we shall learn how they came to know that death was living with them. Tonight, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, brings you Robert Young and Margot as stars of suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Somewhere tonight, perhaps in Havana, Cuba, a man and a girl sit at a table in a gay cafe. Music, laughter fill the big room. A tropic breeze stirs the palms in the terrace. As we watch, the young man pours wine into their glasses. They raise them in a toast to each other. Salud. Salud. Ah, an excellent wine, verdad? As pleasant to the taste as your beauty is to the eye. Do you know where this fine wine comes from? It comes from our good neighbor to the north, Los Estados Unidos. From America. His name is Roma. Yes, from our own America. From our own sunny California come Roma wines. Made in California for the enjoyment of the world. Doesn't that tell you all you need to know to make you want to choose Roma wines for your own use? Whether your particular preference is for a nut brown sherry, a delicious red claret, a full-bodied burgundy. When you choose Roma, you know you are getting the world's best wine value. For Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Only through such tremendous popularity can Roma afford to sell so reasonably wines into which have gone all the care and wine knowledge that produce wine masterpieces. There is a Roma wine for every taste. Simply choose the one you like best. Roma wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Robert Young as Harry Jordan and Margot as Marie, his wife, in The Night Reveals, a story well calculated to keep you in suspense. Go on, Mr. Jordan. Well, gentlemen, the... Next morning, I went over to 98th Street to inspect the remains of number 340 and to see if there was evidence of anything uh, suspicious about the origin of the fire. Mr. Parmenter was there. Well, there it is, gutted. I guess we'll be paying off on this one, all right. Yeah, completely burned out. Uh, anyone hurt? Well, a few, but no one dead. Lucky they just installed the new fire escapes. Just the walls left. Hmm. That fire must have been quite a sight in the height of its glory. Yeah, quite a sight. Man, those walls look pretty bad. They might collapse almost any time. Yeah, the building will have to be raised. That fire did a good job. Oh, here's the commissioner. Hello, Domino. How are you, Mr. Morrell? You know anything about the fire commissioner? No, not a thing. Well, we'll take a look. I wouldn't go in there, Jordan. Those walls are pretty bad. I can take care of myself. Maybe you better not go inside. Don't worry about me. I know fires as well as anyone. You stay outside, Mr. Parmenter. I'm going in. I walked gingerly into the blackened, ruined hallway in ashes up to my ankles until I reached the remains of the stairway. Underneath were several baby carriages, just twisted pieces of metal. A burned fragment of something fell nearby. Come on back, John. I'm all right. I poked around the carriages, sifting through the clean, fine ashes. Something caught my eye. A glob of yellow metal. I picked it up, and I worked my way out. Going through, isn't she? Yep. Clean through. Nothing left of her. Did you find anything, Harry? Nothing much. The fire started in the hallway, all right. The cellar's untouched. The fire works its way up. Uh, what's that in your hand? Well, that is just a piece of metal I found. Here. I just picked it up for my kid. He likes shiny things. What do you think, Commissioner? Uh, probably one of those gadgets they have on baby carriages. No, I guess you're right. It isn't anything. But it was something. I had run my fingernail across this glob of metal. It looked like gold. I decided to examine it in detail at home. <laughs> Hiya, Johnny. Mama says I was bad today. Harry, you're home early. Yes, I got through sooner than I expected, and I... 
What is it, Harry? Your locket. You're not wearing it. You never had it off before. My locket? Well, I... Don't you remember? Daddy, can I go over to see Davy Taylor for a minute? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Johnny. All right. Gee, thanks, Daddy. You shouldn't have done that. I didn't want him to go. He hasn't had his dinner. Never mind, Johnny. Uh, what did you say happened to the locket? Well, I gave it to you. To me? Yes, I, I put it in your pocket to have it fixed. The catch was loose. I don't remember. You've been very forgetful lately. Very forgetful. Maybe you thought you gave it to me. No, no, I, I put it in your pocket, Harry. I forgot to mention it to you. I wanted you to take it to the jewelers and get the catch fixed. I just put it in your coat pocket while you were shaving. When? Yesterday. Yes. Yesterday morning. Then it should be in my pocket now. I wore this suit yesterday, too. Nothing in my pockets, Marie. Well? Marie. Yes, Harry? Is anything uh, wrong with you? Don't you feel... With me? No, no, of course not. I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. There's not a thing wrong with me. You look worried, as if you've got something on your mind. Oh, it's nothing. I've just been having a headache. Maybe you ought to see a doctor. Oh, no, it really doesn't amount to much. Well, I think I'll take another look for the locket. Uh, Which suit did you say you put it in? Your blue suit, I think... Oh, maybe it was the gray, though. I, I don't... Quite... I couldn't make it out. What had she done with the locket? Had she pawned it? Had she given it away? Then I remembered something. I went into the bathroom and locked the door. I looked at this shapeless little glob of yellow metal. I rubbed the blackened spots away, all of it until it was gleaming. I studied it, turning it over and over. I noticed a thin crack. It was small, so I took a nail file out of the medicine chest and began to file it kept filing until I had enlarged the crack to the full length of a piece of gold. Then I slipped the nail file inside and pried, pried it open. Tiny fragments of glass, and then... Then I saw a piece of scorched paper. It was a photograph. Picture of my son, Johnny. This glob of metal was my wife's locket. I put the locket in the picture in my pocket and walked out. The next hour, I sat trying to read a book while Marie busied herself, first feeding Johnny and then helping him with his homework. What's the largest continent in the world? Oh, I know. It's, uh, it's Asia. And the next largest? Oh, that's easy. Africa. It's full of jungles. That's where Tarzan lives. Isn't it time for Johnny to be in bed? Oh, yes. I I had no idea it was so late. Run along to your room, Johnny. I'll be in in a minute. All right, Mother. Good night, Dad. Good night, Johnny. Sleep well. He's getting along very well in school, except for arithmetic. He seems to be having a little trouble. Oh, Johnny will be all right. Yes. Johnny will be all right. I know he'll be all right. I watched her. She seemed very uneasy. I walked over to my pipe rack where I kept several books of matches in a jar. There weren't any there. All this time, I knew she was watching me, watching me closely. I looked behind the rack. There wasn't a match around. What the devil happened to all my matches? I, I have a match here. Let me light it for you. Did you take the matches out of the jar, Marie? Well, I, uh... Did you? Yes, I, I, I needed them in the kitchen. Shall I, shall I light your pipe for you? No, I'll, I'll light it myself. I picked a match out of the booklet. It was a clean white match with a green head. I struck it against the side. The match sputtered up into a yellow flame, fringed on the bottom with blue. Marie stared at it until I felt the sharp bite of the flame on my thumb. Would would you like a cup of tea, Harry? No, dear, I don't think so. I watched her. Her hand casually brushed along the table and picked up the matches. Marie! Oh, oh. Leave the matches on the table. I need them. I'm rather short of matches, and the pilot light isn't working. Is this the only book of matches in the house? I, I, I'll have to get some tomorrow. Where are you going, Harry? Get a drink of water. No, no, I, I'll get it for you, Harry. Never mind, Marie, I'll get it myself. I went into the kitchen. There was a paper bag alongside the gas range. Matches. All thrown in, helter-skelter. Books of matches and safety matches, all mixed together. I walked back and sat down in my chair. She sat a few feet away, torturing a handkerchief. She looked so helpless and terrified that my anger passed away. Marie, you've been having headaches lately. 
Perhaps you ought to see a doctor. You, you haven't been looking too well. I'm just tired. It's nothing serious. Look, um, how would you like to go away for a few days? Take a vacation. I'll get a maid to take care of Johnny and me. It'll do you a lot of good. No, no, I don't need a vacation. There's nothing wrong with me, but, Harry, there is... Yes? Uh, there's nothing the matter with... You were about to say something else. I... I've got to go into Johnny's room and see that he's covered. He always throws the covers off. I sat there looking at the door. Then I glanced about the room. There was the pack of matches lying open on the table. I closed the cover and my eye caught her purse lying nearby. It was bulging. Harry! Well, what's the matter? My, my purse! Yes. Yes, your purse. Here, look. See, the handle's loose. And it's full of matches. A dozen books of them. And these newspaper clippings. Give it back to me. Why are you saving these clippings? Why do you carry matches with you? I bought the matches in a store. They were a dozen for five cents. These clippings. Look here. Fire on 112th Street causes severe damage. And these others. Why are you saving these clippings, Marie? But there's nothing wrong in that. I, I'm interested. Interested in your work. I, I intend to keep a file on fires. It'll help you in your work. Well, that's very considerate, Marie. Oh, Harry. You're so good. Why should this have to happen to us? Towards midnight, I went to bed. Marie didn't follow me. I lay in the semi-darkness, wide awake, trying to think what I should do. I couldn't collect my thoughts. Every time I closed my eyes, I could see the flame of the match, yellow and blue, crawling along the matchstick. Then Marie came in with a cup of steaming liquid. Drink this, Harry. It'll help you sleep. Oh, what is it? It's cocoa. It's very good for you. I'm not the one that's having trouble falling asleep. We both couldn't sleep last night. I'm taking some of this myself as soon as I go to bed. All right, leave it on the nightstand. Be sure to drink it while it's hot. Yes, Marie, I will. Good night, darling. Good night, Marie. Coco. Then suddenly I knew. I looked around quickly for something to pour it in. There was the radiator pan. It was empty. I poured the cup of liquid into it. Then I lay back and waited. Waited for her next move. About a half hour later, I heard the door open softly and Marie tiptoed towards my bed. Harry... Harry, are you asleep? I didn't answer, but breathed evenly. She hovered for a moment over me, then she tiptoed out, carefully closing the door behind her. I dashed out of bed and hurried into my clothes. Quickly, I poured the liquid from the pan into a bottle and put it into my pocket. Then I grabbed my coat and followed her. I rang for the elevator. She had only a few minutes headway. I would catch up to her easily, and then... Then we'd have a showdown. Steve looked at me with controlled amazement. Hello, Steve. Hello, Mr. Jordan. Uh, my wife went down a moment ago, didn't she? Yes, Mr. Jordan. Just took her down. She went towards Third Avenue, didn't she? Uh, I think so. She sort of stopped me for a minute and then turned towards Third. Had to get back to the elevator because you were ringing. When I reached the corner, I looked up and down Third Avenue, and I saw her. She was walking north. I crossed to the other side of the street and followed her, keeping at a distance. 98th Street, she turned east. Down the middle of the block was the remains of last night's fire. She paused in front of the gutted building for a long time, just stood there, looking at it. Then she walked inside. I waited for a few seconds and then followed her. It was pitch dark in the burnt-out hallway. Ahead of me, I could see the glow of a match. Then I saw what she was doing. She was collecting the charred debris near the baby carriages. How foolish. There wasn't anything that could burn there now. She lit another match. I watched the flame light up her face. A face so intent upon her work that she didn't hear me approach. Marie? Who's there? It's me, Harry. Harry, why did you... Come along, Marie. We'd better get out of here. The police. I took her hand, and without a word, she came along. We walked home in complete silence. We both knew. When we came to our apartment house, I stopped and rang for the elevator. In the light of the hallway, I could see her face. My wife's face, ashy gray, her eyes bright and painful. Uh, you run upstairs, Marie. I'll be along in a minute. Harry, where, where are you going? I'll be right back. Please, Harry, don't, don't do anything. You run along, Marie. You're not going to... No, I'm only going to the drugstore to get something. I'll be back in a few minutes. I 
came home a half hour later. She was waiting for me. Did you? Did you do it, Harry? Harry, please, please tell me. I've got to know. I had the cocoa you gave me analyzed. I'm sorry. I, I had to do it. Don't you see? I couldn't help it. It was very easy for the druggist, especially when I told him what I thought was in it. Sodium amatol. That's the stuff that makes you sleep through an earthquake. Please try to understand, Harry. You must understand. Is the kid asleep? Yes, Johnny's all right. I was sorry for Marie. She looked so haggard and worn. It wasn't her fault. I was sorry for myself. My head was roaring. I wasn't feeling too well. I kept seeing sparks in front of my eyes. I closed my eyes for a moment. Let's go to bed, Harry. Marie, we can do something. Let's, let's burn up every match. Every match in the house. We'll never bring another match in here. No, no, Harry, we can't do that. You don't want to? No, Harry, not now. See, this is the first book. It's turning black. We'll do it with every book of matches. It's no use. It's no use, Harry. Strange, isn't it, that this should happen to me? Me, a fire inspector. That's funny. Give me the matches, Marie. All the matches. No, I can't do it. I won't. Give them to me. Please, please, please don't take them. I'll do anything you want, anything. Where did you hide them? Tell me, where are they? Inside the range. Behind the paper bag. I dropped her hand and she sank to the floor in a huddle, weeping. <laughs> then I went into the kitchen and got all the matches. By now, my anger was cooling off. Look, Marie, look up. See, I'll light each book of matches one at a time until they're all gone up in smoke. The yellow flame licked its way down the matches. The cover caught fire and blackened. I watched her look at the flame with dazed eyes. Listen. Listen, Harry, do you hear? Just someone in the hall. Oh, it's more than someone. Something's happened. Something has happened. I'll take a look. Hey, Mr. Jordan, the house is on fire. The house, the house is on fire. Yes, Marie, wake up, Johnny. Johnny, Johnny. We'll have to hurry. The flames are coming up the stairs. There's an upward draft. <sighs> The house is on fire. We've got to get out, Johnny. Come on. It's too late to go down. We'll have to go up through the roof. Oh, I've, I've hurt my leg. Come along, Johnny. Mother, wait for Mother. She'll come along. No, no, I want to wait for Mother. It's all right, Johnny. Go along with Daddy. I'll follow you. No, no, I won't go. I won't go without you, Mother. Hold on to my arm, Marie. Come on. Give me your hand, Johnny. Don't be scared. The fire won't hurt you. It won't hurt you at all. You're safe with me. We made our way upstairs, very slowly because of Marie's sprained ankle. Finally, we got to the roof. There were some firemen on the next roof, about ten feet separated the two buildings. Don't get panicky. We'll get you off safely. How are we going to have to jump across, Daddy? Because Mother won't be able to jump her foot. It's all right, Johnny. Don't be scared. Uh, they're putting a board across the two roofs. We'll just walk across. All right, now. One at a time. Tie the rope around you and come across. Johnny, you go first. Don't be afraid. There, now the rope will hold you in case you slip. Mother, you gotta go first. I'll go right after you, Johnny. You, you promise? Go ahead, Johnny, and others will follow you. Uh, don't turn around, keep walking. All right, kids safe. Now you, lady, be careful, the board. Hey, the board slipped off. Hurry, one of you guys, get into the board. Mother, mother, I want my friend. Your mother's gonna be all right, kid. You pushed the board off, Harry. I saw you do it. No, no, I didn't, Marie, I didn't. We stood there, the three of us, watching the fire. Sparks were shooting up through the hole where it had bitten through. Great flames shot out, stabbing at the sky. The top of the roof was burning now. A red flame crawled along, searching out the inflammable spots. A wooden pole caught fire and blazed up in a long, narrow, curving arc. The wind was helping her. All this time, Marie was shaking, shaking violently, not with cold. I pitied her. And then she threw up her hands and shrieked. No, no, darling, don't. I don't. can't. I can't stand it. We can't go on this way. Police, police, come here. Don't do it, Marie. There's no oh. need to. Not the police. You don't know what you're saying. You. What is it, lady? You'd better calm down now. You, uh... Officer, please. No, no, it's no you... use, Harry. Officer, these awful fires. They're not accidental. There's a pyromaniac, a criminal. What? And I know who it is. You've got to arrest the person. Arrest. So there won't be any more. 
All right, lady. Now, what is this? Who is the pyromaniac? The criminal is my husband. Hurry, Jordan. This man here. Arrest him, officer. <laughs> That's about all there is to the story, gentlemen. Then I was brought here. Must have sounded kind of, well, painful for you to hear it all over again, Marie. No. It was all right, Harry. I wonder... Um, I got a cigarette. Could I... No, I'll light it for you, Harry. You don't have to worry. I won't try and keep the matches here. She's been awfully good to me, gentlemen. You'll take good care of her, won't you? She tried everything to help... She hid the matches so as to keep them from me. She even tried to give me sleeping pills so I wouldn't... It's all right, Harry. I'm sorry about the locket, dear. It must have fallen out of my coat when I was in that building in 98th Street. I... It's all right, Harry. You can buy me another one sometime. You... You can't blame anybody for liking fires. It's not their fault. Fires are beautiful to watch. So bright and clean. They burn up all the filth and dirt. And they're magnificent to watch. Especially the big ones. The way the flames roar and crackle, lighting up everything around you. The beautiful fire. The beautiful fire. And so closes The Night Reveals, starring Mr. Robert Young and Margot. Tonight's tale of Suspense. I want you to know that the distinguished Roma California wines include the most enjoyable types for every possible occasion. Dry table wines, red and white, appetizer and dessert wines, and also champagne and sparkling burgundy. Nothing can add more downright pleasure to your meals or to your entertainment of friends and no enjoyment could be more economical. For not only are they supremely delicious, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines, and they cost only a few cents a glass. The vast quantities regularly purchased and enjoyed by wine lovers, the advantageous locations of the great Roma wineries in the favored wine districts throughout California, these things permit truly modest prices that make Roma wines the world's outstanding wine values. Roma R-O-M-A. Roma wines are true to type. Roma wines are faithful in flavor. Roma wines are sound of character. Roma wines are reasonable in cost. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And this is Robert Young. It's been a great pleasure for me to appear tonight on Suspense, one of my very favorite programs. And I know you'll want to be listening next Thursday when my friend and colleague at metro Golden mayor Mr. Charles Lawton, will be your star. Don't forget then, next Thursday, same time, for Charles Lawton in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud, your health, senor. Roma toasts the world. The wine for your table is Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California to introduce this weekly half hour of suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, Roma brings you the MGM star, Mr. Charles Lawton. The 
suspense play which stars Charles Lawton and which is produced and directed by William Spear is called Wet Saturday. This remarkable and sardonic story is uh, rather difficult to describe. It, uh, well, it most certainly isn't a whodunit. Is it, Mr. Lawton? No, no, it, it definitely isn't. The question involved is not a, at all a matter of who done it. It's, it's a matter of whether or not the who who done it is going to get it in the neck. And if if not, then who is, regardless of who actually done it? It's very complicated. Very well put, sir. Now, before the curtain rises on suspense, will you eavesdrop with me a moment? Dinner is over. A delightful dinner in one of the great homes of a land far to the south. And one of the guests is complimenting his host. Ah, Raoul, your reputation as a host grows with each of your magnificent dinners. That superb wine tonight, where did you find such perfection? I will tell you a great secret. When I visited our good neighbor and ally, the United States, I tasted the wines of that California and knew instantly it was a great wine country. And I learned that some of their very choicest vineyards produced the wine we enjoyed tonight. Roma wine. Our good neighbor to the south is right. Our own sunny California provides perfect conditions of climate and soil to produce some of the world's finest wines. And note this. What your wine connoisseur of another land prized as an expensive import, with import duties and high shipping costs included in his purchase price, comes to you from the great Roma wineries in California as an inexpensive American product. Roma's wide varieties of types and Roma's modest cost means that you can enjoy these fine wines often when entertaining guests as a pre-meal appetizer to serve with meals or for after-dinner enjoyment. You will be amazed at how little your dealer will ask for an assortment of several types of these fine Roma wines. Visit your dealer tomorrow and ask him for Roma, R-O-M-A, America's largest selling wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now, with Wet Saturday, and with the performance of Charles Lawton, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! On this rainy afternoon... We should like you to meet the Princey family and their visitor. They are, of course, at home. Mrs. Princey, daughter Millicent, George, the son and heir, sprawled on a couch, and finally, Mr. Princey, biting on a dry pipe. Their living room is dull and overstuffed. Rain beats at the windows. They are any middle-class family at home on a wet day, except for one small item. As you sit with them in the living room, you can see through the door to the sun porch a pair of men's feet encased in high black shoes. They look like the feet of a curate. There is a tenseness in the room. The air is charged with excitement. But the feet are very still. Well, don't keep staring at him. Listen to me, all of you. Don't you see? They'd hang her. That's what they'd do. They'd hang her. Oh, Fred, it's too awful. Awful? It's catastrophic. A supposedly sweet, gentle, intelligent girl, respected and loved by the whole village, doing a thing like this. Oh. Think of the publicity and the disgrace. Do you think I'm going to resign from the bench, the vestry, and sell out and live in some foggy hotel abroad? Oh, no. No. Oh, no. I'll kill myself. I will, I will. Don't be a fool. Any more than you have been, the governor may. Oh. Will you be quiet? Wouldn't be so bad if it were you, George. Everybody in the village knows you're not responsible. <laughs> Get off that couch and oh. sit, sit up in your spine. You might be of a little use here if you could think. Oh, but I say, Governor, this this isn't uh, my funeral. Shut up. <laughs> as long as I can remember, George, you've been a trial and tribulation to me. Oh, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. You've got to stand it, my dear, and keep that hysterical note out of your voice. Do you hear? Yes. Yes. We are... We're talking about the weather. Now, George. Yeah? George, if he fell down the old well, say, striking his head several times, what about um, that? Hmm? I really don't know, Governor. What about it? Don't be an ass, George. I'm asking you to think. 
He'd, he'd have had to hit the side several times in 30 or 40 feet at all the correct angles. No, no, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid that won't do it. Oh, we'll have to go over it all again, Millicent. Oh, no, Father. No, I couldn't. I couldn't. Millicent, we must go over it all again. Fred, you're torturing her. Oh, face facts, Mater. With him lying there, no use pretending it's a picnic. Oh. <laughs> we might hang you, Millicent. Oh, do stop that shaking. Stop it, Millicent. Stop it. You must stop it. And you must keep your voice quiet, Millicent. Uh. We are talking about the weather. Now we will proceed. I can't. I can't. Not with those feet there. <laughs> you should have thought of that, Millie. I'm not moving her. Shut up, George. And stop shuffling your feet. Now, Millicent, look at me. And answer me truthfully. Do you hear? Answer me. You were in the croquet court? Yes. You, who, who knew you were in love with this wretched curate? <laughs> the whole village knows. They've been oh. sniggering about it in the pub for the three years past. Shut up, George. <laughs> Millicent, we continue. You were on the croquet court? Yes. You were putting the croquet set into its box? Yes, it... It was starting to rain. I was carrying the balls and mallets into the sun porch. The box was there. You heard someone enter the garden gate and come across the yard? Yes. Could you see who it was? Not at first. I was going into the sun porch. I threw down all the mallets but the red one and turned around. And it was Withers? Yes. So you called him? Yes. Loudly? <laughs> oh. Did you call him loudly? Could anyone have heard? <laughs> no, Father, I'm sure not. I didn't really call him. I just spoke his name. He saw me as I went to the door, and he just waved his hand and came over. Now, can I find out from you whether there was anyone about, whether he could have been seen? I'm sure not, Father. I'm, I'm quite sure. So you both went into the sun porch? Yes, it was raining hard then. What did he say? He said, hello, Millie, and excuse his coming in the back way, but he set out to walk over to Liston. Yes. And he said, passing the park, he'd seen the house, and suddenly thought of me, and he thought he'd just look in for a minute. He had something to tell me. Yes, go on. He said he was so happy he wanted me to share it. He'd heard from the bishop he was to have vicarage, and it wasn't only that. It meant he could marry. And he began to stutter and get all confused, and <laughs> because I thought it meant me. Don't tell me what you thought. Tell me exactly what he said, nothing else. Yes, yeah, answer, Governor. Well, well... Stop crying. <laughs> it's a luxury you can no longer afford. Tell me what happened. He said, no. He said it wasn't me. It's Ella Bragdon Davis. Oh. And, and he was sorry and all that. Then he went to go. And then? I got mad. He turned his back. I had the red mallet of the croak he set in my hand. I'd forgot to drop it in the box when I came, and I was just... Did you shout or scream? I mean, uh, as you hit him. No, I'm sure I didn't. Did he? Come on, speak up. You've got a tongue in your head. No, Father. And then? I... I threw it down. I came straight in here. I went to look for Mother, that's all. My poor baby. And you're sure no one else was about? No, no one, no Leave one. Leave the child alone, Fred. You're not such a <laughs> child, Mater. Oh, Millie, I had no idea. George, <laughs> will you keep quiet? I'm thinking. <laughs> you see, George, he probably told people he was going to listen. Certainly no, no one knows he came here, for he didn't decide until he crossed the park. He might have been attacked in the woods. We must consider every detail. A curate with his head battered in. Oh, don't, Father, don't. Oh, shut up. A curate with his head battered in. A curate with his head battered in. Well, who would want to kill with us? Who'd want to kill with us? Well, I would, with pleasure. How do you do, Mrs. Prince? Oh, Captain oh, Smiley, Smiley. Smiley. Well, 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 oh, well. Sit down, sit down. Pray you mustn't get up for me, Mrs. Prince. You are the Millicent, my word. I'm just being neighbourly on a bad day. I wanted to ask you about those dahlia bulbs, Princey. I took a shortcut on account of the rain and walked right in. I knew you wouldn't mind. He heard you, Father. Oh, my dear. <laughs> we can all have our little jokes, can't we? <laughs> now, don't you pretend to be shocked. Uh, this way, Smollett. The, this chair facing the fireplace, old man. Sit down, Mother. Just uh, straighten the curtain to the sun porch, dear. It looks so gloomy out there. 
Might as well shut the rain out. Well, <coughs> we were uh, just talking about a little theoretical cure at killing Smollett. Uh, mm. Young people these days like thrillers. Uh, Parsonicide? Justifiable Parsonicide. You heard about Ella Bragdon Davis? Mm. I should be a proper laughing stock. Why should you be a proper laughing stock, Smollett? <laughs> oh, I had a shot in that direction myself. Did you? She half said yes, too. Hadn't you heard? She told most people. Now I look as if I were jilted. Too bad. Oh, and the fortune of war. Yes, fortune of war. Yes, odd how that happens, isn't it? Yeah. Huh. Uh, sit down, Smollett, old man. Uh, Mother Millicent, uh, would you console Captain Smollett with your best light conversation? Uh, George and I have something to look at outside. The, the rain, you know. It's very bad, very bad. Come along, George. Right, uh, no, Governor. Perhaps we'll need raincoats, huh? Oh, I don't think so, George. Uh, just make yourself at home, Smollett. Make yes. yourself at home, old boy. A cigarette, to Captain Smollett. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. Nasty day to be going out. Oh, it's something about the old well uh, just off the sun porch door, oh. you know. Yeah. This terrible sudden weather uh, seems to have loosened some of the stones. Too bad, too dash bad. Spoils the tennis and the croquet. I mean, a day like this, uh, doesn't it, Millie? Yes, it does. She was practicing out on the croquet court earlier. But uh, uh, do pull your chair nearer the fire, Captain. It was so damp, we thought it would be cozy to light it. Uh, thank you. I'm quite comfortable. I... I hope you don't feel too bad about Ella Bragdon, David. Oh, can't always win, you know. Uh, can't understand, though, what you women see in these bloodless clerics. Oh, I always thought Mr. Withers was a, uh, is a very charming man. Uh, I quite agree, but why should anyone want to marry him? You wouldn't want to marry him, would you, Millie? Not now. Uh, that is, I... I used to... Oh, no, of course not. Uh, 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 yes, Prince. Good Lord, man. You, you come on a fellow suddenly. Yes, I suppose I did. <laughs> you, uh, you don't mind this old double barrel shotgun, do you, Small? Oh? I've been working on it. So. Uh, may, might I have your attention for a minute? There's something on the sun porch I'd like to show you. Uh, well, uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, Smollett, uh, George and I went out to see if we could shoot some rats which had been driven out of the old well by the high water. We were afraid they might get into the house. But you must listen to me very carefully, very carefully, or you'll be shot uh -oh. by accident. Prince, what's the matter with you? You heard me ask as you came in who would kill Withers. You also heard Millicent make a comment, an unguarded comment. Well, what of it? Very little, unless you were to hear that Withers had met with a violent end this afternoon. And that, my dear Smollett, is what you are going to hear. What? Withers dead? Yes. Who, who killed him? Millicent. Oh. Oh. Good Lord. Oh, shut up, sniveling Millie. Yes, it's a mess. And, of course, you would have remembered and guessed... Oh. Maybe, yes, I, I suppose I should. Therefore, you constitute a problem. Why did she kill him? It's one of those disgusting things. Pitiable, too, I think. She deluded herself that he was in love with her. Good heavens. Miller, yes, yes, of course, I see. He told her about the Davis girl, Ella Bragdon Davis. I understand. I have no wish, as you will comprehend, that she should be proved either a lunatic or a murderess. I could hardly go on living here after that, could I? Besides, I'm rather fond of Millie. Quite. On the other hand, you know about it. Yes, I see that makes me a problem. You were wondering if I could um, keep my mouth shut, uh, if I promised? I'm wondering if I could believe you. But uh, if I promised? If things went smoothly, yes. But not if there was any sort of suspicion or any questioning. You would be afraid of being an accessory. I don't know. I do. What are we going to do? I can't see anything else. I mean, you never be fool enough to do me in. You can't get rid of two corpses. Well, I regard it as a better risk than the other. It uh, could be an accident. Or you and Withers could both disappear. There are possibilities in that, of course. Uh, listen, you, you can't... You, I, I, uh, I can. But there may be a way out. There is, Smollett. Uh, you gave it to me yourself. I... I did? What? Well, you said you would kill Withers. You have a motive. Oh, uh, look here now. I, I was now guilty. Listen, Smollett, I can't trust you. You must trust me. Or else I will kill you now in the next minute. I mean that. You can choose between living 
and dying. Go on. There's the old well just outside the sun porch door. That's where I'm going to put with us. No one outside knows he's come up here this afternoon. No one will ever look there for him unless you tell them. Now, you must give me evidence that you have murdered with us. I, I, I murdered him? Why do you want that? So that I shall be dead sure that you'll never open your lips on the subject. I... I see. What evidence? George. Yes, Governor? Hit him in the face. Oh, sure. No, 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 no. <laughs> you keep out of this, man. Oh, Captain, you should be more careful. Look what your teeth did to my knuckle. <laughs> do it again, George. Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> Father, how can you... Now you keep quiet, Millie. Stop sniveling. I'm sorry, Smollett. But there must be traces of a struggle between you and Withers. Then it will be not altogether safe for you to go to the police. Mm. <laughs> now, George, uh, would you get the croaky mallet? Oh, right, yes. And, uh, George, take your handkerchief to it. You'll find it there on the sun porch oh. floor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got it, Captain. That's right, boy. Oh. There, Captain, there's the weapon. See, as I told you, Smollett, <laughs> there it was. Now, you, if you please, just grasp the end that mashed Withers' head. I shall shoot you if you don't. Uh, good Lord, you... You you can't... Uh... There. <laughs> All right. That's it, old boy. That's right. Now, deposit it by the side of the house. Out of the rain, of course. Now, uh, wait, uh, George. Huh? Uh, first, you'd better pull a few hairs out of his but, head uh... and put them under the nail of Wither's right hand. <laughs> uh, wait, I'm uh, sorry to mess your hair up, Captain. <clears throat> uh, 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 oh! Don't be a baby, <laughs> That's all we need. And I'll be with us, and we'll fix it right up. I'll be right with you, Governor. Uh, Smollett, uh, you may turn round now. Withers is just there in the sun porch. Draw back the curtain, old man. Good Lord. Yes. Messy. Uh, now, you, Smollett, now you've just got to drag him through the door and uh, dump him in the old uh, well. Just beyond the door, Captain. I... Uh, I won't touch him, I won't. All right, all right. Stand aside, George. Out of range, George. Just oh. over there. Oh, okay. There's only one place I want this charge of shot to go oh, to. Father. Now, father. Millie, you keep quiet and stop sniveling. My aim is... Oh, wait a minute, wait, wait, I'll... Uh... That's better. That's better, Smollett, much better. Now, go along now. In here. <laughs> You've got to take him outside, old boy. By the shoulders ought to do it, Captain. You keep quiet, George. Now, go on, Smollett. Go on. Under the arms. You've seen dead men before. Now, don't go green. Drag him out. Drag him, old boy. Do a little pulling. I'll just hold the gun here to make sure. Everything goes all right. Steady now. Mind the step there. Mother! Come away from the window, dear. Don't look. But Captain Smollett... Your father is a very resourceful man, Millicent. I'm sure what he's doing is... But the captain... I can't stand you it. You mustn't question your dear father. No, <laughs> you two still at it. There's enough trouble around here without blubbering. Don't you call me blubbering, George Princey. No, well, uh, <laughs> you see, Smollett, everything is perfectly safe. You, you remember, you see, that no one knows that Withers came here. Everyone thinks he walked off to Liston. And you see, that's five miles of country to search. They'll never look in our well. <laughs> Don't you see how safe it is? <laughs> I... I guess so. Good heavens, old boy, you're dripping wet. Why don't you slip your raincoat on? Uh, Is the uh, tea ready, dear? In just a minute, dear. I'll ring for Bridget. It's exactly what you need, Smollett. A nice, hot cup of tea. It's the best thing in the world to ward off a cold. Sit down, won't you, old man? Oh, don't you mind getting the chair wet. That's all right. Uh, would you have a cigarette? Uh, no. I hope so, old boy. See, I stick to my pipe. Funny how you get attached to pipes. My wife always says to me... Everything's hot, ma'am. Oh, Bridget, yes. Put the tray in front of me uh, here on the table. That's uh, it. Say, Captain, why, oh, you've cut your lip. Eh? Oh, uh, I uh, just knocked it. Why, how dreadful. Here, Bridget, give the captain this cup. Oh, no, 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 thank you. I, I, um, I rather think I'll be running along, if you don't mind. Why, oh. Captain Smollett, without any tea. If you don't mind, Mrs. Princey, I, if I could... Uh, just have my raincoat. Oh, I'll get it for you, Captain. This is very distressing, Smollett. Very odd. Oh. I'll be all right presently, I'm sure. Oh, here we are. Let me help you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, young man. Uh. There. You'd better go out the front way, Smollett. The walk is drier. Oh, let me hold the door for you, Captain. And don't worry, old fellow. Don't worry at all. No, no, I no. I, I, I won't. Good afternoon. It's uh, nothing serious, I imagine, dear. A little rest, of course. He'll be as right as rain. 
Oh, by the way, Millicent, you're not you're not looking any too well, dear. Not well at all. I'm sure it was that croquet court. Being outdoors in weather like this is simply foolhardy. Yes. Huh? Mate is right, Mary. You saw what happened to Captain Smollett. Come along, dear. I shall give you a hot foot bath and put you to bed. A couple of days in bed and you'll be fine again. Now, you get plenty of rest, Millicent, and don't you worry about a thing. That's the best cure for you, dear. Mm. I guess I'll have a little nap, too, Governor. Fine afternoon for a nap. Yes, it is. Nice. <laughs> Indeed it is, Sam. <laughs> well, enjoy yourself, boy. Uh-huh. I'll see you later. I'll see you all later. Your number, please. Oh, uh, would you get me to the police station? Police station? Right away, sir. Police headquarters, Sergeant Yancey speaking. Oh, hello, Sergeant. This is Princey of Abbott's Road. I believe you know me. Oh, oh indeed I do, Mr. Princey. Oh, Sergeant, a rather horrible thing has just occurred. Quite extraordinary. It's murder, in fact. Murder? I'm afraid it looks uh, rather bad. Well, for a close friend of ours, unfortunately, we saw him do it. I think you'd better send someone over right away. Oh, a man should be there right about now, Mr. Princey. I beg your pardon? I say, our man should be there now. Constable Martin has his post right below your house there, just rang in. Seems Captain Smollett was with him. Captain Smollett? He reported some rather queer goings on at your place, but I certainly didn't understand it was murder. But just don't touch anything, Mr. Princey, and don't worry. Don't worry at all. No, 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 Sergeant. I won't worry, thank you. Governor, where are you? Governor, Governor, where are you? I'm right here and stop shouting. uh, We we have some visitors, Governor. I can see that. Well, Constable, good afternoon. Hello, Smollett. See, what a remarkable fellow you are coming back like this, here to reenact the crime. Only the one against me, Princey. The one against the curate, I'll leave to you people. Extraordinary sense of humor you have. Uh, Mr. Princey, I just had a look at what's in your well. Not a pretty sight, that. Not pretty at all. Yes, Captain Smollett was thorough, if nothing else. You saw him when he did it, sir, out in the back? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, quite. (laughs) We were just returning from a walk, and Smollett had evidently been laying for the curate, hiding out in those bushes by the road, I imagine. Uh, He was never inside this house. Never. Ah, and you say, Captain? I say that while I was inside this house, a guest of the family, I was coerced into dragging the curate's body outside and uh, dumping it in the well. Well, there we are. Well, not entirely, Constable. I'll just uh, remove my raincoat here and uh, demonstrate how damp I got my clothes when I went outside without it. Hmm. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Yes, yes. He undoubtedly removed his coat at some point between here and your post. I might as well tell you that his weapon, a red croaky mallet, is out by the side of this house. I shouldn't be at all surprised that you'd find his fingerprints all over it. All over the end of the mallet, Constable. The end that mashed with his head. Uh, not the end I'd have to grasp in order to do the mashing. Governor, that's thanks, a sir. decent try, Smollett, but it won't work. There must be other evidence, Constable. You'll undoubtedly find it when you examine the body. He means the hair under Withers' nails. Well, sir, I happened to notice something when your young George there opened the door for me. If you'll carefully look, I believe you'll find a few of my precious hairs under his nails, too. Well, what are you trying Shut to up, say? George, will you? Oh. Constable, this is a complete waste of time. So far as a violent struggle between Smollett and Withers is concerned... Smollett's face speaks for itself quite eloquently. But no more eloquently than your son's knuckles. As you see, Constable, a fresh abrasion. He did that on uh, my teeth. Oh, uh, hmm. Or uh, did he? What? (laughs) I said, uh, or did he? He might have done that on uh, Withers' teeth. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. I see what you mean. Oh, but I didn't, Governor. He said that I didn't. Now, no, yeah, you Withers. keep still, you nitwit. Let me think, let me think. As a matter of fact, George, the more I think of it, the more I'm convinced it was your voice I heard. Quite a vigorous quarrel. Something about the uh, curate jilting your sister. Don't be ridiculous, Smollett. <laughs> Very well, Princey. If he didn't do it, 
Who did? Yes, that's what I'd like to know. How about it, Mr. Princey? Yes, that is a sticker, all right. George, my boy, it looks to me as if you're elected. Elected? Well, what do you mean? I didn't do it. Keep your mouth shut. Well, I won't, sir. I'm not going to take the blame for her. Millie did it. She did it with the mallet. I saw her. Me? Why, you... Millie? You could prove that? Prove it? Why, yes. Yes. Her her fingerprints on the mallet. Why, George? Don't you remember when you made me touch the mallet when you picked it up with your handkerchief? George, I'm sure you wiped that handle clean. Oh, well, I can hardly expect you to remember that if you can't even remember killing the curate. I told you to keep still, George. I am thinking. But, Governor, you're not going to let him say this. As long as I can remember, George, you have been a trial and tribulation to me. What? You shouldn't have done it, George. You shouldn't have done it. Now let's all have a nice hot cup of tea. Warms the cockles of the arse. Very good for you, Mother. Where was And so closes Wet Saturday, starring Mr. Charles Lawton, tonight's tale of Suspense. In just a moment, we shall hear again from Mr. Lawton. But first, let me ask you a question. Isn't it true that things we most enjoy are so often the little extra things, and more often than not, something that pleases the taste? That suggests a bottle of really good wine, Roma wine. It's so easy for you to make certain of high quality in your wine, because all you have to do is to go to your dealer and ask for Roma, America's largest selling wine. They are made in California, one of the world's greatest wine-producing sections. You'll have your choice of Roma's great variety of types, from a delicious tangy sherry, a brilliant claret, or a hearty burgundy to a sweeter, heavier port. And you will be so impressed by the modest cost of Roma wines, you will want to enjoy them regularly at home, as well as when you entertain. For this traditional form of hospitality is smart, yet inexpensive. A full measure of enjoyment yet moderation in its best sense. For wines with greatness of character, always ask for Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. But remember, before you buy wine, buy war bonds and stamps. Hello, this is Charles Lawton. I hope you enjoyed our play this evening. And next week, I'm told that Suspense will bring you another of John Collier's stories. It's one of my very particular favorites. It's called Back for Christmas. And your star will be Peter Lorre. Charles Lawton appeared by courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producer of the Technicolor musical Thousands Cheer. Don't forget, then, next Thursday, same time for Peter Lorre in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salute. Your health, senor. Roma toasts the world. The wine for your table is Roma. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black. Here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood, Roma brings you as star Mr. Peter Lorre. The 
a suspense play which stars Mr. Laurie and which is produced and directed by William Spear, is called Back for Christmas. In this series, Roma brings you tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so, with Back for Christmas, and with the performance of Peter Laurie, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Yes, Marie. What on earth are you doing down here in the cellar? Oh, yeah, just doing a little digging. And why, may I ask, have you chosen this day of all days to dig up the cellar floor? Oh, I thought because the weather has been so damp, this would be a good time to plant that little <laughs> devil's garden I told you about. Devil's garden? Whatever nonsense is that? <laughs> Don't you remember that was my little joke about it? You see, uh, I've managed to get hold of the spores of several unclassified wild orchids. In a wild state, they bloom under damp masses of leaf mold. The South American Indians call them devil flowers because they appear to bloom under the ground. Well, I'm sure the South American Indians will be very interested if you succeed in growing these ridiculous flowers under the cellar floor. <laughs> Whom else it will interest, I can't imagine. Oh, what the... Terrible smell. Oh, that's the leaf mold. Uh, chemically identical with the earth blanket they grow under in a wild state. And I want to get these started before we close the house. Do you realize that we're sailing for America a week from today and you've made no oh. arrangements whatever? Unless you call digging a hole in the cellar making arrangements. I certainly don't. Devil's garden, indeed. <laughs> Sometimes I think you're going soft in the head, Hubert. Oh, I, I suppose it is inconsiderate of me, you see. And I've been wanting to try this experiment for a long time, but uh, with all those lectures and seminars at the university, there, there never seemed to, uh, to be enough time. Well, there certainly isn't any time for it now. I suppose you've forgotten I made an appointment for you at the barber's this afternoon. Oh, oh must I shave my beard off, Hermione? I thought we'd been through all that. Of course oh. you must. They don't wear beards in America. Bad enough you're speaking with that accent. They'll probably think we're Germans as it is. Oh, I should think it would be quite easy just to explain that I'm Swiss. Now, Hubert, don't be argumentative. Mm. Go and get your jacket on and do as I tell you. Yes, Hermione. And don't forget to take your umbrella. It looks like rain. Yes, Hermione. And don't look so put upon, Hubert. Someone has to plan things in this house. Never even get to the university in time for your lectures, much less make arrangements for a trip to America. I know, but, but what about my specimens? There'll be plenty of time to plant your precious devil's garden when we get home from America. We're not going to be gone forever, you know. We'll be back here for Christmas. Yes, of course. Back for Christmas. I'd forgotten. We'll try to remember it. And if you can't do that, just do as I tell you. I've been making the plans in this house for 20 years. And mm. if there's any digging to be done, I'll manage that as well. You understand, Hubert? Yes, Hermione. Good. Now, you have just uh, 20 minutes to clean up this mess down here and keep your appointment at the barber's. And when you finish there, I want you to come straight home. All right. Oh, oh, I, I wanted to stop at Miss Markham's and pick up some books I ordered. Well, all right. But don't loiter there the whole afternoon moiling over those old books the way you usually do. Now hurry and clear up this rubbish. Get rid of that smelly stuff. And no more digging, mind you. No more digging. <laughs> I'll show her. I'll have my devil's garden, and if I... No more digging, eh? No more digging. Oh, 15 men on a dead man's chest. Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo! And a bottle of rum. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Miss Markham. Why, it is Professor Schumacher, isn't it? <laughs> Do you like me better this way? You look ever so much younger without the beard. Twenty years at least. Twenty years? Oh, you'll be glad to know those books you ordered have finally arrived. Twenty... 
Oh, yes, the books. Let me see. The, ph the phytotomy of phalloid gametophytes mm -hmm. and uh, coniferous shrubs of North America. Those are the very ones you ordered, good. aren't they? <laughs> yes, thank you. You're very kind, Miss Markham. Why kind, Professor Schumacher? Well, not, not many young ladies in bookshops would go out of their way to look up rare books for an old professor of botany. Why, you're not old, Professor Schumacher. Really, you look... What do I look like? And besides, I adore botany. It, it's my particular hobby. Oh, Really? You've never told me that before, Miss Markham. Well, I was afraid to. You looked so imposing with the beard and all. Oh, well, uh, Miss Markham, uh, forgive me if, if this sounds foolish, but since talking with you today, I, I feel that shaving off my beard is the most important thing I've done for 20 years. Oh, it yes. is. I, I, I'm sure it is. For 20 years. I'm, I'm so sorry that I've been so distant with you all this time. Oh, there were times when I almost spoke up. Oh, really? times when you came in here, tired after a day with your students at the university. You seemed so alone. The way I'm alone in the world. Alone. I'd like to have asked you to stay a while and talk with me, but some way or other I... I always wound up giving you your change and letting you go on your way. Say you... you're alone in the world? Since my father died. Oh, Miss, uh, Miss Markham, did, did you never think of marrying? My father was a very remarkable man. I never found anyone who seemed to... Measure up to what he led me to expect of men. Uh, Miss Markham... Oh, <laughs> it's been so long since anyone called me by my first name. Yeah. I'd like you to, if you want to. It, oh. It's Marion. Marion? Oh, how nice. Marian. And, and yours? Well, uh, Hubertus. <laughs> but, it, but in English, Hubert sounds better, huh? How long have you been alone, Hubert? Alone? I knew you were a widower, of course. I, a the first time I saw you. A widower? I can always tell this. There's a certain sadness in a man's eyes. Hmm. A sweet sadness, I think, when, when he's been married and then a lost... A widow. I never thought of it in quite that way. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have been talking like this, I suppose, but... I've often wondered what she must have been like. Your wife, I mean. Hermione? <laughs> Not an easy woman to forget. Very strong. Always managing things. The house, my wardrobe, my friends... Even when we dined at a restaurant, she even then ordered my food. She was always managing things. Her whole life managed herself to death. Poor woman. She must have loved you very much. But she needn't have put herself out so. It's plain to see you don't need things managed for you. No. You need companionship, I think. Someone sympathetic with your work. But the last thing on earth you need is a manager. How well you put it. The last thing on earth. Operator. Operator, are you there? I'm still waiting on that call to Salisbury. Well, put them on quickly. Hello. Is this Paul Holton, sons? It's Mrs. Hubert Schumacher. Did you receive my letter? Good. Now, remember, we'll be back for Christmas and I want the job done without fail. What's that? No. No, I'm sure he doesn't suspect anything. Send it to me in New York as I instructed you, addressed in my name, of course. Yes. I've already put them in the mail. You'll get them tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, here you are, Hubert. Where have you been? Oh, backstairs. I dismissed the servants. Dismissed the servants? Mm-hmm. But I've asked some friends of mine into a farewell lunch and go and tell them it's a mistake. Well, uh, I'm afraid it's too late now. They've packed and gone. You have messed things up properly. How many times have I told you to leave things to me? I make the plans around here. Yes, Hermione. You'll have to do better than this when I plan the trip home or we'll never in the world be back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Must you keep saying that? Why not? We are coming back for Christmas, aren't we? Well, supposing I, I were offered a professorship in one of those wealthy American universities. Nonsense. Americans care nothing for botany. Well, Luther Burbank was an American, wasn't That's he? That's different. What have you ever done except muck around in the dirt with a lot of roots and tubers? Well, they asked me to lecture, didn't uh, they? All right. All right. Now, there's no use getting yourself in a state about this, Hubert. No doubt this extra money will come in very handy when we arrive back, back for, for Christmas. Back for Christmas, I Precisely. know. Precisely. No good to make a joke of it. Heaven knows where you'd be today if I hadn't got a sense of time. Yes, Hermione. And as you've been so foolish as to dismiss the servants, you may empty the ashtrays and straighten up this room while we're waiting for the guests to arrive. Mm. 
I'm going in to have my bath. Call me when they get you. Marion? It's Hubert. No, no, darling, no, nothing is wrong. Oh, my plans are the same, uh, unless, unless you have changed. No? We'll meet in New York then and be married there. Huh? Oh, I'll explain to you why later. You just have to trust me. Yes. <laughs> yes, my darling. Hubert? I'm so sorry, I can't talk any longer. Yes, I'll meet you in New York, without fail. I'll be the same, man, Liebchen. Talking on the phone just uh, now? Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, Hermione. Whoever was it? Oh, <laughs> Freddie, Freddie Sinclair. But didn't I hear you say something about meeting somebody in New York? Uh, uh, why, yes. Uh, uh, Freddie said he might possibly get over there before we even leave. And, and I said, of course, we'd meet him there if he decided to go. Well, that seems very peculiar. But then all of your friends are peculiar. <laughs> yes, Hermione. And just look at your jacket. Have you been digging in that cellar again? Yes, Hermione. Well, there's no need for it. You can't possibly get that devil's garden thing finished before we sail for America. Go and change your clothes before the guests arrive. Oh, never mind. I see somebody coming up the walk now. Go and let them in. Yes. Uh, Hubert. Yes? Look out the window. There's Professor and Mrs. Goodenow, but who's that with them? Well, who... Uh... <laughs> Precisely. Freddy Sinclair. Peculiar, you should have been talking to him on the phone not three minutes ago, and now here he is. <laughs> yes, isn't it? <laughs> oh, but then, as you see, Hermione, all of my friends are peculiar. Not half so peculiar as you. Digging in the cellar the very day we leave for America. Just look at yourself. And now that I think of it... Yes? Oh, never mind. Uh, go and let them in. Oh, you were going to ask me something, Hermione, about uh, the hole I'm digging in a cellar. Good heavens, stop rolling your eyes about that way. One would think you were digging a grave down there instead of a storage bin. Yes, Hermione. What's that? I said yes, Hermione. Father, open the door and please stop saying yes, Hermione. I think, my dear, I have said it for the last time. <laughs> Professor of botany, his loving wife, and an oblong pit in the cellar. Just the right size for his botanical specimens, his devil's garden. With these ingredients for a story of a perfect crime, Back for Christmas by John Collier and starring Peter Lorre, the Roma Wine Company closes the curtain for a moment on another breathless study in suspense. In this brief intermission in the play, it's pleasant to think about the holidays. Not everyone celebrates the holidays against a background of snow and pine trees. Somewhere south of the Gulf and the Caribbean, in a gracious home surrounded by palm trees and a warm sun, you might find holiday dinners ending this way. One moment, please. Our North American guest wishes to propose a toast. Yes, mis amigos. I drink a toast in gratitude to you for your gracious hospitality and the enjoyment you've given me, an American so far from home. It is only a fair exchange, my friend. This wine in which you drink your toast, it brings enjoyment to us from your country, from America. It is Roma wine made in your own California. Yes, and when you choose the wine for your holiday table, remember this. Only a few wines are so fine that many countries of the world import them. And among these greatly enjoyable wines are the wines of Roma. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Yet here in America we are truly fortunate. For we may buy Roma wines at a very low cost. Since we don't have to pay import duty or costly shipping charges. So serve Roma wine with pride on any and all holiday occasions. Serve Roma, too, for everyday dinners. You can afford to. Ask your dealer tomorrow for your favorite Roma wine, America's largest selling wine. But before you buy wine, buy war bonds. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage Mr. Peter Lorre in Act Two of Back for Christmas 
A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Back for Christmas. Hermione was so positive we would be back for Christmas. That last afternoon, pouring tea out for a few friends who had come in to see her last-minute farewells, she kept reiterating it. Now, mind you, Hermione, don't let those Americans lure your husband with one of their fat university jobs. <laughs> we absolutely <laughs> must have you with us for Christmas. He shall be back, I promise you. Well, it's not absolutely certain, of course. <laughs> Hubert, now, what do you mean it's not certain? Of course it's certain. After all, Hubert, old boy, you've contracted to lecture for only three months. Oh, that's quite right, but then, uh, of course, anything may happen. Hubert adores being unpredictable. Now, what other man would decide the day, the very day, mind you, before leaving for America to dig a great hole in the floor of the cellar. In the cellar? Yes. He's going to put some unclassified wild orchids down there. A devil's garden, if you please. It sounds so mysterious. That's Hubert, though. It's really quite simple, however, once you find out what he's up to. Now, take that telephone call he put through to you a few minutes ago, Freddy. To me? Of course. <coughs> now, Hubert wanted to surprise me about your plan to meet us in New York next month. Wasn't that why he called? To ask you not to mention it? My dear Hermione, Hubert couldn't possibly have telephoned me within the past hour. I've been walking in the park since three. He didn't telephone you? Well, how could he? This for my going to America. No, 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 no. no. Come, Freddy, come. You may as well confess. <laughs> Hermione has just found me out again. But Hubert's old chap, I really do. You see what a poor liar Hubert makes. He's red as a beetroot. <laughs> Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Professor? Stringing poor Hermione along like that. And as for you, Freddy, I'm furious you said nothing to us about going to America. But, but look here, old girl, I've been trying to tell everyone here oh, that I'm... Oh, stuff and nonsense. The game's gone on long enough. Besides, we must start getting ready. Now, it was marvelous of all of you to come in to say goodbye. And don't worry about Hubert's little jokes. I will bring him back for Christmas. You may rely on it. They all believed her. For years, she had been promising me for dinner parties, garden parties, committees, and the promises had always been kept. This time, they would not be. I had seen to that. The servants were gone for good. The farewells all said. I had time to the minute how long it would take to fill in a hole in a cellar. My devil's garden... Upstairs in her bedroom, I undressed and put on my old bathrobe. And then I I opened the door into Hermione's room. Oh, uh, uh Hermione, uh, have you a moment to spare? Of course, dear. I'm just finished. Oh, then, uh, will you come in here for a moment, please? There's uh, something rather extraordinary here. Oh, good heavens, you. But what are you lounging about in that filthy old bathrobe for? I told you to put it into the furnace. Well, I'll do it. I'll do it today. Yes, really, I will. I well, high time. Now, what is it you want to show me? Oh, here, here, in the bathroom. Uh, just look, who in the world do you suppose dropped a gold chain down the bathtub drain? Nobody has, of course. Nobody wears such a thing. Then what is it doing in here? I don't see anything. Well, uh, look. I'll hold this flashlight here for you. If you if you lean right over, you can see it shining. It's deep down. Oh, such a lot of nonsense. Just as well. Well, I don't see it, Hubert. Well, go on looking, Hermione. In just a moment. Hubert, I absolutely refuse. Hubert, what are you doing? Take your hands off my neck. I will, Hermione. Just as soon as I've finished the arrangements for my trip to America. What are you talking about? You thought you were the only one who could plan things, didn't you? Didn't you, Hermione, huh? Oh. Well, I've been making some plans of my own this past week. In exactly two minutes and 16 seconds, you'll be dead. What? You see... You see, I have planned it very accurately. You'll never get away with it. Oh, I thought you would say that, Hermione, but I will get away with it. You won't mind the smell of the leaf mold down in a cellar when I take you down there today? <laughs> yes, that is where you are going, Hermione. Oh. Right into my devil's garden. That annoyed you so much. My friends all expect me back for Christmas. They do. If they don't hear from me, they'll start asking questions. No, they won't. Because you'll write them letters, Hermione. 
on the typewriter, as you always do. They'll be signed H in that neat, correcting way. You always sign your notes to your friends. Yeah. Let me up now. No! It won't work, Hubert. You were never any good at planning. Oh, but I have changed. I have learned from watching you all these years. The lecture people in America, they'll expect you to be traveling with your wife. I will be traveling with my wife, but not my present wife, Hermione. Hubert! It won't work, I tell you. That pit you dug in the cellar... Oh, it will work. It'll serve its purpose well. Hubert! No, no, I'm sorry, dear. This thing has to be done exactly as planned. <gasps> you have just five seconds to say your prayers. Hubert, you must listen. The cellar, it... Don't do it, Hubert! Hubert! Yes, Hermione! Oh, uh, uh, Stuart? Yes, sir? Oh, uh, my wife, she's in this post. She, she'll be taking her meals in our stateroom. For the whole voyage, sir? Yes, for the whole voyage. I trust your wife is feeling better this morning, Professor Schumacher. A, a little. Uh, not yet well enough to leave her cabin. Oh, what a shame. Oh, Professor Schumacher. Uh, yes? Here's a copy of the radiogram you sent for your wife last evening. Oh, thank you. I'll just check it over a bit. Oh, but, but look, look here. Why, what's the matter? Did the typist make a mistake? No, no. <laughs> it's nothing important. She can correct it later. For a moment, I had a feeling that Hermione had been leaning over my shoulder again, correcting what I had written as she always did. I had written a radiogram to Professor Goodenough and his wife. Haven't been out of my cabin the whole beastly trip, Hubert Well. Now, doubt, we'll be back for Christmas. But the operator had left out the W and, and it read, No, doubt, we'll be back for Christmas. Exactly what Hermione would have written. Well, the rest of the trip... It was uneventful. Marion and I met in New York just as we had planned. Just as we had planned. Oh, uh, uh, Professor and Mrs. Schumacher, uh, we have reservations, I believe. Oh, yes, we've been expecting you, sir. Boy, take Professor and Mrs. Schumacher's luggage up to their suite. You know, Mrs. Schumacher, you're quite a surprise. Oh. Your letter reserving the rooms was so thorough. I was expecting an older, more forbidding sort of person, oh. frankly, ma'am. <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, we're just married, but I... My letter reserving the rooms. Oh, oh. I wrote the letter, my dear, and, and I signed it Mrs. Hubert Schumacher. <laughs> just a joke. What a cunning old fox you are, Hubert. <laughs> now that I think of it, I... Oh, uh, I almost I forgot. Have... There's a letter for you, Mrs. Schumacher. That's peculiar. I wonder who on earth... Oh, well, we'll soon find out in good time. Come along, darling. Oh, we are keeping the boy waiting. Come on. Oh, wow. Nothing like a cold, brisk shower to put a man to rights. <laughs> Hubert, this letter. Oh, yes, the letter. Oh, uh, dry my hair, will you, darling? Please. It seems to be a bill of some sort from a building contractor in, in Salisbury. Oh, really? Oh, bother. Dry your own hair. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Uh, uh, let's see this bill or whatever it is. It's very puzzling. Hubert, you were a widower, weren't you? I mean, mm -hmm. Hermione isn't still alive. Um, good heavens, no. <laughs> well, let me read that. Mm-hmm. Dear madame, this is to acknowledge your order to g together with the keys to your house in Lonston Place. How a man... And no difficulty in finding the place where your husband had begun the excavation in a cellar, but apparently he changed his mind at the last moment and filled it in again. What is it, Hubert? Our men will begin digging tomorrow, and, and their job will be completed in ample time for your surprise. Christmas present to your husband, 
We are happy to be conspirators with you in this thoughtful gesture and hope that Professor Schumacher will be pleased at the results of our work on his devil's garden. Very truly yours, Paul Holtzans, contractors. What does it mean, Hubert? It means... means that Hermione was right. I will be back for Christmas. I will be back for Christmas. I will back for Christmas. Back for Christmas. Yes, the money. And so closes Back for Christmas. Starring Mr. Peter Lorre, tonight's tale of Suspense. In just a moment, we shall hear again from Mr. Lorre. But first, just a word that seems appropriate. One of the world's oldest customs is the Christmas toast. And traditionally, down through centuries of war and peace, the Christmas toast has been drunk in wine. This year, when the glasses are filled and raised once again, we know that in every home the toast will be to a speedy victory and a speedy return of those we love. And before we set the wine glasses down, let us all resolve to do everything within our power to help make that toast come true. Let us resolve to help supply the weapons of war by buying even more and more war bonds. Let us resolve to face our own inconveniences without complaining. And above all, let us resolve that when this war is at last over, each of us will exert all our effort to see that future Christmases truly express peace on earth, goodwill to men. This thought, together with our very best wishes of the season, is the Roma Wine Company's Christmas message for you, its friends, here in America and throughout the world. This is Peter Laurie. Thank you for listening to our suspense play this evening, and I know you are looking forward to next week's show as I am. It is called uh, Finishing School. And its subtitle might be the famous quotation, The female of the species is more deadly than the male. Don't forget then, next Thursday, same time, for Margot, Elsa Lanchester, Janet Beecher, and a distinguished all-feminine cast in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wine presents Suspense. Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud, your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight in Hollywood... Roma Wines bring you a distinguished all-feminine cast of stars headed by Margot, Miss Elsa Lanchester, and Miss Janet Beecher. The suspense play which stars these ladies and which is produced and directed by William Spear is called Finishing School. Despite the absence of male participants in Ethel Lena White's story, we can promise you there is nothing dainty about the proceedings. And so, with finishing school, and with the performances, in the order of their appearance of Margot as Caroline Watts, of Janet Beecher as Melody, and of Elsa Lanchester as Dean Sterling, Roma Wines again hope to keep you in... Suspense! (laughs) 
I can see them so vividly now, just as I saw them the very first time. Those high stone ivy draped walls of Miss Nash's school for girls, and the first person who greeted me, that amiable soul, Miss Melody. I can see her too. It was she, in fact, who showed me into my new room and who stood there watching me a moment, smiling. This is your first teaching job, isn't it? <laughs> How did you know? Well, if you've been around nothing but teachers for thirty years, you'd know too. Let me guess now. Your subject is either French or no, no, it's sports. On the nose. What's your subject, Miss Melody? Mine. Come in. Caroline Watts. Yes. I'm Miss Sterling, the dean. Welcome to the Nash School. Oh, how do you do, Miss Sterling? I've been looking forward to meeting you. Thank you. I wanted you to know about the general faculty meeting in my office at three this afternoon. I'll see you then at three o'clock. Oh, yes. Melody. Yes, Sterling. Miss Nash is a little concerned about the new students. She might just check up on supplies for the third floor. It's already taken care of. Oh, very well. I should answer your questions, Bob. You see, my subject is housekeeping. Oh, I, I didn't know. I just supposed that you were one of the teachers. I was, up until a year ago, when Miss Penelope passed away. Oh yes, that was Miss、uh, Nash's sister. Oh, changes like that are inevitable, I suppose. As inevitable as, well, that ugly rumor and the fact rumor? about Miss Penelope's death. But I, I haven't heard any rumor or anything about her death. Oh, then I'm sorry, Miss Watts. I, I assumed you were that familiar with the school. What was the rumor, Miss Melody? Oh, it was nothing really, not even worth repeating. But I imagine. I Wait, Miss Melody. Look, I'll I'll hear about it sooner or later. Well, it it was just a silly, stupid tale, but somehow it got around that Miss Nash's sister had been frightened to death. This then was Caroline Watts' introduction to the Nash Institution. A place which future events prove to be, with a vengeance, a finishing school. Thus, the prologue for tonight's tale of suspense. The narrative will be resumed in a moment. But first, let's take a little journey. We'll journey to a capital in Latin America. Here, at a gay legation party on a lantern-hung terrace beside a garden pool. Listen. Everything is perfect at your wonderful party, including this exquisite wine. It is a wine that helps to bring back pleasant memories. I, of course, agree. It helps good friends such as us to appreciate good food too. And this sherry has come far to add enjoyment to our legation party. It is of the famous vineyards of California in the faraway United States. See, it is the celebrated Roma wine. Yes, Roma wines are prized in other countries for the great enjoyment their superb quality affords. They are esteemed as something rare, a luxury. But you in America may enjoy Roma fine wines in all the variety of types as an inexpensive everyday delight. So trifling in cost are these fine Roma wines here in America. That you can be a most generous host, offering to each of your guests his or her favorite: a delicious tangy California sherry, a fine California claret or Burgundy, or a heavier, sweeter California port. You'll be delighted to learn from your dealer at what small cost you can get an assortment of several types, permitting you now to boast of your private wine cellar. Ask for Roma, R O M A. America's largest selling wine, Roma wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that Roma wines bring back to our sound stage Margot, Elsa Lanchester, and Janet Beecher in Finishing School, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Frightened to death, Miss Nash's sister. Well, if I had known then what I know now, I would have been able to judge with real accuracy the importance of Miss Melody's remark. But the excitement of my first classes left little room for other thoughts. A week or so later, out on the athletic field, one of my students, Flora Nash, the niece of the owner, became quite ill. I sent her to the infirmary, but within ten minutes she had returned. Miss Sterling, she said, had. Ordered her back. 
I was furious, and, well, I told her I was going to have it out with that woman. Miss Watts, wait. I, I know it isn't my place to say this, but please, for your own sake, don't antagonize Sterling. Oh, now, really? I tell you, I know what I'm talking about. Listen, you know Miss Melody, don't you? Of course. Miss Watts, she practically started this school with my two aunts. When Miss Penelope died, everybody thought she'd move up to take her place. But she didn't. Somehow or other, Sterling saw to it she was left with the job of housekeeper. Miss Watts, don't have any trouble with that woman. Please. Oh, all right, Flora. I'll go see Miss Nash. Oh, no. Why, Flora, Miss Nash is your own aunt. But Sterling would find out. Please, you mustn't. Oh, I never heard such nonsense in all my life. Hurry straight to bed. I went to the top floor of my building and entered the small waiting room of Miss Nash's quarters. It was empty, but just opposite was the door to the private apartment, almost halfway open, and I walked over to it, ready to announce myself. Then I stopped, dead still. Penelope! For it was then that I heard... Are you there, Miss Penelope? Sterling's voice. We're almost in touch. Yes, I hear her now. Very faint, but nearer, nearer. It was an incredible sight. Seated at a table wholly unlike the elderly but austere white-haired lady I'd seen before was Miss Nash. Her eyes were closed and swaying gently, she seemed utterly transfixed as she listened to Dean Sterling's low murmur. We're here, Miss Penelope. We're waiting. Yes. Speak to her, Miss Nash. Speak to her now. Oh, all right. Can can you hear us, Penelope? Uh, Miss Sterling says you says you have predicted some tragic accident for another of our loved ones. And then Sterling turned toward me. What? What are you doing here? I I'm sorry. I I wanted to speak. This is not the time or the place for that. Uh, What is it? Uh, Miss what? Miss Nash, it's about your niece. I really... I'm familiar with Miss Nash, about <laughs> Flora, Miss Nash. And at the moment, I don't want you to be disturbed by anything so trivial. Trivial? But I... Well, I don't see how you can call it trivial, Miss Sterling. Flora was ill today. Why did you send her back to the field? Because she was no more ill than you are. She was simply up to her old trick, playing on the sympathy of a new teacher. Come, we'll talk about this outside. No, I... Miss Nash, your niece... Uh, uh, Miss Sterling, she'll handle it. Uh, Miss Sterling knows best. Yes, Miss Nash. Good night. Good night. If you'll just step out here. No. Miss Sterling, you evidently don't realize that Flora Nash suffers from a slight heart condition. It's entered on her card. I'm sure it is, because I entered it. I'm a fairly competent judge of her state of health, Miss Watts, for the simple reason that I happen to be a registered nurse. Can you say the same? Well, no, I... After this, please be assured that I don't make a practice of deliberately murdering my students, especially the niece of my employer. I'm very sorry, Miss Sterling. Very well, Miss Watts. That will be all. But it wasn't all. I was bewildered. Even alarmed, I suppose, at the recollection of that voice calling out, Miss Penelope. And I went to the one person that I felt must be told. For quite a while, the housekeeper said nothing. Then she motioned me to a chair. You might as well know this, Miss Watts. Sterling, you see, has deluded Miss Nash into believing she can actually hear Miss Nash's sister. She then reports, relays, messages, which are supposed to come from Miss Penelope. But, Melody, I'm afraid I don't understand. My dear... These messages direct Miss Nash to delegate more and more power to Sterling. That's her grip on Miss Nash. That's the instrument she's using to get the whole school away from her. I I can't understand. Miss Melody, how could she ever delude Miss Nash that way? The head of a school, an intelligent... Also an old, grief-stricken woman, Miss Watts. More important, she's a woman who's been thoroughly sold on Sterling's clairvoyant power. You see, Sterling's made quite a number of predictions... And always they've come true. They've come true because she makes them come true. Miss Watts, there's a reason why I've told you this. I have the feeling that rather soon there'll be another prediction. 
And somehow, some way, it mustn't be allowed to come true. I want your help. Miss Melody, what could we do? Yes. Sterling. What? I'm perfectly aware that you regard me as a very ominous creature. A sort of Lady Macbeth. No doubt your special charge, Flora Nash, shares the same view. So, uh, bring her along when you come to my cottage tonight. Your cottage? Yes, there'll be some other girls. I'm having a little party. Well, I... I hadn't... What's the matter? Don't you want to? What? Oh, yes. Yes, of course I do, Miss Sterling. I, I, I'd love to come, thank you. Good. And you can come too, Melody. Eight o'clock sharp. We were prompt, Flora and I, and the sharp tenseness and alertness we carried with us into that cottage vanished almost at once. To my surprise, I discovered that when Sterling chose to be... She was one of the most compellingly charming women in the world. And that night, she chose to be. Flora, since you're the one student in the whole pack of teachers, we'll make you the guest of honor. Now, what would you like to do? Gee, I don't know, Miss Sterling. Anything, I guess. Have you any ideas, Miss Watt? Well, we can always play cards. Oh, yes. That, of course, is exactly why we shouldn't. <laughs> oh, Sterling, I've got it. What? Remember last spring, that seance you gave us? Oh, no. No, I don't think so, Helen. In the first place, I haven't picked up a single new trick. Oh, that's all right. It'll all be new to Watson Flora. Come on, give them a chance to see you demonstrate your real powers. Yes. All right, then. Oh, no, I... I'd rather not. Flora, you're not scared, are you? <laughs> a little, maybe. Well, don't be. It's all in fun, like watching card tricks. Need any help in here? Oh, thank you. Yes, we'll, we'll uh, use this large table. Come on, Flora, you stick with me. All right, Miss Watts. So presently, in a room quite dark, we ranged ourselves about a large bare table, Shh. at the very head of which sat the dean. And then, for several long moments, there was quiet, broken at last... Yes. ...by the low drone of Sterling's voice. Yes. I hear you. Yes. Yes. But you must announce your presence. Let us know you're here. Speak louder. Louder. Your name is Coleman. Miss Watts. Coleman Nash. That's my great uncle. And you're trying to warn? <gasps> to warn? <laughs> She's faded. She's faded. Turn on the lights Come quickly. Up. It's her heart. Get the doctor quick. Call him somebody. The phone's in the bedroom. And Helen? Yes? I want some digitalis. You'll find it in the medicine chest in the infirmary. Here are the keys and hurry. Hurry. Hurry back, Sterling. Here, what's... Here, let's pick her up. We'll put her on the sofa. That's it. You must have been frightened. Yes. Frightened nearly to death. There. Miss Sterling, you did this deliberately. Oh, deliberately? You knew that girl's heart condition. Why, what? You can't anticipate a thing like that. I was simply going to tease her, warn her not to not to fake any more illnesses. Yes, well, you see how she's faking this one. You planned this, Miss Sterling. The party, having her here, finding out her uncle's name. I happen to know her uncle's name. It was a joke, a game. Everybody knows that. A game? She's coming to You tell these women it was a game, but will you tell that to Miss Nash? You don't know what you're saying. No, yes, she does. You'll show Miss Nash the proof of another successful prediction. Melody. You'll have her completely at your mercy. Flora's the only remaining heir to this school. The only person who stands in your way. Caroline. Don't leave. Oh, it's all right, Flora. I'm only going to get my coat. We'll be right back. Please, don't worry about a thing. Come along, Miss Melody. It was five minutes later that Melody and I crossed the campus to Sterling's cottage and found it empty. We learned that the doctor had arrived, had prescribed for Flora, and ordered her to the infirmary. Sterling. Sterling alone was left in charge of the girl. That's where Melody and I found her, directly before Flora's room at the infirmary. We wasted no time. Literally, we pushed her aside and hurried into Flora. Can't you see she's asleep? The doctor gave her something to make her sleep. Is that what this is? What? 
This bottle on the nightstand. You can see from the label what it is. Digitalis. A heart stimulant, Miss Melody. And it's not, oddly enough, a deadly poison. The doctor left it here and it's been given to Flora every two hours. Now, will you please be good enough to leave? Yes, I'll leave. But I shan't go far. I expect to stay very close to this girl until she's safely under someone else's care. You're completely mad, aren't you? That's an odd remark, Sterling, coming from you. We maintained a watching post not far from the room. And from there, first Melody, then I made regular trips to the bedside. Flora was better, there was no doubt of that. And so at last I dropped off to sleep. A sleep that lasted for an hour or more. For dawn was filtering into the long infirmary corridor when I awoke. Suddenly, Melody was shaking me. Caroline, huh? it's happened. What, what What? are you saying? Caroline, it's happened. What, what are you saying? She's dead. Flora's dead. Oh, <laughs> oh Sterling, just tell us what happened. It was only a few minutes ago. It was time for her medicine, and I went over to wake her up for it. Her heart it had just stopped beating. <laughs> the medicine? The digitalis, you mean? That's right, Melody. Where is it? What? Where is it? Where's the bottle of medicine? Why? Well, why, it's... Uh... It used to be on that nightstand there, but it isn't now. Where is it, Sterling? What have you done with I, it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, under the bed. It might have rolled under... But it didn't. Nor under the chest of drawers, either. Perhaps you should look out of the window. Maybe Sterling decided not to give her any medicine at all. Miss Melody, this medicine chest, it's locked. Locked? Yes. Do you happen to know where the key is? <laughs> One of a housekeeper's major duties. See if this will work, Caroline. Being keeper of the keys. It works. Melody! Miss Nash, Look! What is it? It's Sterling's bottle of medicine. Unopened. Unopened? And unused. I was right, Sterling. You just sat there and watched her die. That's not true. Helen, you saw me give Flora some medicine early tonight, right after the doctor left. Helen, you remember that, don't you? Well, it, it looked like a different bottle, Sterling. A different bottle? Yes, and I can guess what was in it. A sleeping draught. That's what you gave us, Sterling. You knew that even a slight overdose would stop a weakened heart. All right, Sterling. We found one bottle. The one that would have saved Flora's life. Where's the one that took it? You should know that, Melody. What? You should know where that bottle is because you took it out of this room just a little while ago when I was calling Miss Nash. You are insane. What's more, you brought it into this room. Tonight, in one of your countless visits, you brought in a bottle of heavy sleeping draught and exchanged it for digi digitalis. You were hoping I couldn't tell the difference and that I'd give that to Flora instead of the heart stimulant. And that's what I did. You did it all right, but without any help. Sterling, just how, for example, could I produce a bottle of sleeping draught so exactly like the digitalis that you couldn't tell the difference? You had a whole medicine chest to work with. That's how you did it, oh. and that's how I knew you did it. Helen? You, yes, Jenny. I, I know what you're thinking. It just came to me. Go on. When we were at the cottage, when you sent me over here for the bottle of digitalis. That's it. And there wasn't any. There wasn't any in that chest. Of course not. Sterling didn't put it there until tonight. Well, that's not the point, Melody. She couldn't have put it there at all, because she had no way to get into the chest. You see, when Sterling sent me over here, she gave me her keys. Well, 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 I, I forgot to give them back to her. Here they are. I still have them. In other words, Melody, you were the only one who put the digitalis bottle there in the chest. It's very true what you said before. One of a housekeeper's major duties is being keeper of the keys. Miss Melody, that isn't true, is it? Miss Melody, it isn't true. Oh, no, of course it isn't. Don't listen to them, Caroline. They, they... No, Caroline, don't listen to us. Listen to Melody. Let her keep drugging you with lies until you see everything oh. she wants you to see no. and hear everything she wants you to hear. That's what she did to Flora, you know. She flooded that poor girl's imagination with absolute terror. And then she killed oh, her. I, I didn't kill her. Why should I? Why, why? would I want to? Why? <laughs> so you could get Flora out of your way. So you could accuse me of killing her and get me out of oh. your way, too. So you could have a clear path to Miss Nash. 
<laughs> well, yes. Melody, your plan backfired. But you're not getting me out of the school. Helen, what's... Go phone the police. I'll never leave. Do you hear that? I'll never leave. Never. Oh, yes, you will, Melody. Yes, you will. And Sterling was right, too. For within the month, Melody was an inmate of a quite different kind of institution than the Nash School... Life settled down then into a state of normalcy that lasted through the rest of the year. Lasted, in fact, up to just four hours ago. When I was crossing the grounds toward the main gate. All of the teachers had gone into town and I was on my way to join them. When I saw it there on the grass. A tiny object, glistening dully in the late afternoon sun. What made me pick it up, I... I don't know. But when I did, it was as... As though a rocket exploded in my brain. It was a small empty bottle, and its label bore the slightly faded letters of the word Digitalis. Then in the next instant... Find something? Sterling! Yes, I... I have found something, Sterling. This bottle labeled Digitalis. You know... I bet anything in the world a good chemist can find traces of a sleeping drug in it. You mean... Then you found it. Melody's bottle. Melody's bottle? My guess is that Melody's bottle, as you put it, never will be found because it never existed except in your mind. What? I picked this bottle up right here, Sterling, right where I'm standing, just three feet from the trash bin behind your cottage. That was careless of me, wasn't it? You used this bottle. You used it to get Flora Nash out of your way, to kill her and make good on your warning. You're taking it to the police, I suppose. I want to see if they can find your fingerprints on it, Sterling. Yes, I'm going to take it to the police as fast as I can get there. Certainly, Watts. And the best of luck. She went on inside her cottage, and I struck out across the grounds for the main gate and the road into town. I reached the gate just in time to hear the school caretaker clang it shut. Miss Sterling, he explained, had just telephoned the order. An early closing hour. I remembered the service driveway then. The other passageway through those high stone walls which encompassed the grounds. And I found that it too was locked. I was a prisoner. And then it was it was right then that the solution came to me. I, I should have thought of it before. Miss Nash herself was in those grounds right on the top floor of my own building. I would take the bottle to her. I would show her the proof. I flew up the stairs, down the corridor... Entered her small waiting room and then stopped. Just beyond me, through the open doorway of the darkened suite, was Sterling and Miss Nash. Tragedy before the school year ends. That's the warning I hear. A warning? From Flora, did you say? From my niece? From your niece. Oh. She says there will be more tragedy. Oh, no. Before this school year ends. Tragedy. Oh. For one more. One more woman here. My strength left me completely then. I don't know whether I fainted or not or how I got back to my room. But I'm here in it now. And it is just ten minutes before midnight. Ten minutes before this school year ends. My door is locked. She has locked it from the outside. But now, now that door is going to open. And she's coming in. What? What are you going to do with it? This revolver. I'm going to use it to fulfill a prediction. Oh, please, don't, please. Laura made a prediction to Miss Nash tonight. No. Laura made it through me. Do you understand that? Laura made it. I heard her. I really heard her. Saying that there would be one more death before the school year ends. Please. And that prediction is going to come true. No. <laughs> Hello, hello, the police station. 
You'd better send someone over to the Nash school right away. There's been a... Somebody's shot herself dead. And please, please tell Miss Melody, Miss Melody, that she'll be out soon. Tell her that Lady Macbeth is gone. And so closes Finishing School, starring Margot, Elsa Lanchester, and Janet Beecher. Tonight's tale of suspense. Before we tell you about our star and story for next week, a word about an American anniversary of 173 years this week. Still standing in California is a little winery founded in 1771. Settlers from foreign countries discovered early that California vineyards were among the world's finest. That in the rare combination of climate and soil which produces perfect wine grapes, California surpasses some of the most famous old world vineyards. Take Roma California Sherry or Port. They are magnificent wines, truly delightful. Yet, like all Roma wines, priced astonishingly low, because you pay no duty, no costly shipping charges. Toast the new year with Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. And let us hope that next New Year's we'll all be together, our sons and daughters, our husbands and fathers, in a world at peace. We help make this more certain with the war bonds and stamps we buy. So for 1944, increase your purchases of United States war bonds. Good luck and health to you one and all from the makers of Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Next week, Roma Wines take great pleasure in bringing to you, in his first radio appearance of the year, Mr. Alan Ladd. Mr. Ladd will be heard in a swift-moving action drama played against the colorful background of the Midway in an amusement park and called The One-Way Ride to Nowhere. Don't forget, then, next Thursday, same time, for Alan Ladd in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world.